Part 3, Chapter 12 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. The Slippervox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 12. Natasha was now 16, and the year, 1809, was the very one to which she had counted up on her fingers four years before, at the time when she and Boris had exchanged kisses. Since that time she had not once seen Boris. Before Sonia, and always with her mother, when Boris was mentioned, she had freely declared that all that had gone on before was childish nonsense, as though it were a settled matter, of which there was no use talking, and long ago forgotten. But in the deepest depths of her heart, she was tormented by the question whether the promise that bound her to Boris was to be considered in jest or in earnest. From the very time when Boris had first gone to join the army, he had not seen any of the Rostovs. He had been at Moscow several times, and had passed not very far from Otranoya, but not once had he been to see his old friends. Natasha had several times wondered why he had never been near them, and her surmises had been strengthened by the melancholy tone in which her elders spoke of him. In these degenerate days, old friends are easily forgotten, said the countess more than once, when Boris had been mentioned. Anna Mikhailovna had also been more rarely of late at the Rostovs. She seemed to hold herself especially on her dignity, and always spoke enthusiastically and boastfully of her son's merits and the glittering career which he was now pursuing. When the Rostovs came to Petersburg, Boris came to call upon them. The thought of meeting with them was not without emotion. His romance with Natasha was the most poetical recollection that he had of his youth, but at the same time he went there with a firm determination to give both her and her parents clearly to understand that those youthful relations between him and Natasha could not be considered binding upon either of them. He had a brilliant position in society, thanks to his intimacy with the Countess Buzokaya, a brilliant position in the service, thanks to the patronage of an eminent individual, whose confidence he fully enjoyed, and he had now fully elaborated plans for making a marriage with one of the wealthiest heiresses in Petersburg, which, indeed, he might very easily do. When Boris reached the Rostovs, Natasha was in her room. When she was informed of his presence, she went to the drawing-room almost on a run, blushing and beaming with a more than gracious smile. Boris remembered Natasha as a little girl who wore a short dress and had dark, flashing eyes under her bangs and with a wild, merry laugh. That was just as he had last seen her four years before, and consequently, when an entirely different Natasha came into the room, he was taken aback and his face expressed solemn amazement. This expression on his face was a triumph for Natasha. "'Well, would you have known your mischievous little playmate?' asked the Countess. Boris kissed Natasha's hand and said that he noticed a great change in her. "'How handsome you have grown!' "'Why shouldn't I?' replied Natasha's laughing eyes. "'Don't you think that Papa seems much older?' she asked. Natasha sat there, listening to the conversation between Boris and the Countess, and silently studying the husband of her childhood's ideal, even to the minutest particulars. Boris was conscious of her study and affectionate gaze fixed upon him, and occasionally he stole a glance at her. His uniform, his spurs, his cravat, the cut of his hair, all were most fashionable and comme fonte. Natasha instantly noticed this. He sat somewhat toward the edge of the easy chair, nearest the countess, with his right hand smoothing the immaculate, neat-fitting glove that he wore on his left. And he spoke, with a peculiarly delicate compression of the lips, about the gaieties of Petersburg high life, and he treated the old times in Moscow, and his Moscow acquaintances, with a gentle irony. It was not without design, Natasha felt sure, he mentioned the names of the highest aristocracy, whom he had met at the ball of the ambassadors, or his invitations to the N.N.s and the S.S.s. Natasha sat silent all the time, looking askance at him. This glance of hers confused and troubled Boris more and more. He kept turning frequently toward her, and stumbling in the midst of his stories. He did not stay more than ten minutes, and then got up to take his leave. All the time those keen eyes, full of mockery, looked at him with a peculiar challenging expression. After this first visit of his, Boris confessed to himself that Natasha was just as fascinating as ever, but that it was his duty to renounce this feeling, because to marry her, an almost dowerless maiden, would be the ruin of his career, and the renewal of their former friendship, without intention of marrying her, would be an ungrateful trick. Boris resolved in his own mind to avoid meeting Natasha, but, notwithstanding this resolution, he went again in a few days, and kept going more and more frequently, and at last spent whole days at the Rostovs. 
He kept trying to persuade himself that he would soon have a chance to come to an explanation with Natasha and tell her that what was past must be forgotten, that, in spite of everything, she could not be his wife, that he had no property, and their friends would never consent to their union. But he kept putting it off and finding it more and more awkward to bring about this explanation. Each day he became more and more perplexed. Natasha, so far as her mother and Sonya could judge, was in love with Boris just as much as ever she had been. She sang for him all her favorite pieces, showed him her album, begged him to write in it, and while she never cared to talk about the past, she always made him feel how charming the present was. Each day Boris was more and more involved in the fog of uncertainty, never saying what he had resolved to say, absolutely at sea as to what he should do, or why he went there, and how it would all end. He even ceased to frequent Ellen's, though he daily received reproachful notes from her, but still he spent most of his spare time at the Rostovs. End of chapter 12Part 3, Chapter 13 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 13. One evening, when the old countess, in nightcap and dressing sack, with her false curls removed, and with one thin strand of white hair escaping from under her white calico cap, was performing the low obsciences of her evening devotions on a rug, sighing and groaning, the door of her room creaked on its hinges, and Natasha came running in, with her bare feet in slippers, and also in a dressing jacket and curl papers. The countess glanced around, and a frown passed over her face. She went on repeating her last prayer. If this couch become my tomb. Her devotional frame of mind was destroyed, however. Natasha, with rosy cheeks, and full of animation, when she saw that her mother was saying her prayers, suddenly paused made a curtsy, and involuntarily poked out her tongue to express her annoyance at her carelessness. Then, perceiving that her mother still went on with her devotions, she ran to the bed on her tiptoes, kicked off her slippers, by rubbing one dainty little foot against the other, and sprang into that couch which the countess was so afraid would be her tomb. This couch was a lofty feather bed, with five pillows, each smaller than the other. Natasha jumped into the middle, sinking deep into the feather mattress, rolled over next to the wall, and began to creep under the bedclothes, snuggling down, tucking her knees up to her chin, then giving animated little kicks, and laughing almost aloud, now and again uncovering her head and looking at her mother. The countess finished her prayers, and with a stern face came to the bed, but seeing that Natasha's head was hidden under the bedclothes, she smiled her good, amiable smile. "'Nu, nu, nu,' said the mother. "'Can we talk now? Say yes,' cried Natasha." There, now, one kiss in thy neck, just one more, and that will satisfy me. And she threw her arms around her mother and kissed her under the chin. In her treatment of her mother, Natasha seemed to be very rough in her manner, but she was so dexterous and graceful that whenever she seized her mother in her arms, she always did it in such a way as not to hurt her or disturb her at all. Well, what have you to tell me tonight? asked the countess, settling back upon the pillows and waiting until Natasha, rolling over and over, should cuddle down close to her, drop her hands, and become serious. These visits from Natasha, which took place every night before the Count came from his club, were a great delight to both mother and daughter. "'What is there to tell tonight? I want to speak to you about—' Natasha stopped her mother's mouth with her hand. "'About Boris? I know,' said she gravely. "'That's what made me come. No, but you tell me,' she took away her hand." Go on, Mamma. He's nice, isn't he? Natasha, you are sixteen. At your age I was already married. You say that Boris is nice. He is very nice, and I love him like a son. But what do you wish? You have entirely turned his head, that's evident. As she said this, the Countess looked at her daughter. Natasha lay looking fixedly at one of the carved mahogany sphinxes which ornamented the bedposts. The Countess could only see her daughter's profile. It seemed to her that the sweet face had a particularly grave and thoughtful expression. Natasha was listening and pondering. Well, what is it? You have entirely turned his head. What made you do so? What do you want of him? You know that you cannot marry him. Why not? asked Natasha, without altering her expression. Because he is very young, because he is poor, because he is a relative, because you yourself are not in love with him. How do you know I am not in love with him? I know. 
Now, this is not proper, darling. But if I am determined on it, began Natasha. Do cease talking nonsense, said the countess. Yes, but suppose my mind is made up. Natasha, I am in earnest. Natasha did not allow her to finish. She seized the countess's plump hand and kissed it on the back, and then on the palm, then turned it over again and began to kiss it on the knuckle joint of each finger in succession, then on the middle joints, then again on the knuckles, repeating in a whisper, January, February, March, April, May. Tell me, Mamma, why don't you go on? Speak, said she, looking at her mother, who with affectionate eyes gazed at her daughter, becoming so engrossed in this contemplation that she forgot what she was going to say. It isn't proper, Dushamoya. People won't remember anything about your affection as children, but if he is seen to be so intimate with you now, it might injure you in the eyes of other young men who come to the house. And worst of all, it is torturing him all for nothing. Perhaps he might, by this time, have found some rich girl to marry, but now he is quite beside himself. Beside himself, repeated Natasha. I will tell you my own experience. I once had a cousin. I know, Kirill Matveyevich, but he is an old man, isn't he? He hasn't always been old. But see here, Natasha, I am going to talk with Boris. He must not come here so much. Why mustn't he, if he likes to? Because I know that this cannot come to any good end. How do you know? No, Mamma, you must not speak to him. What nonsense! exclaimed Natasha, in a tone of one who is about to be deprived of a possession. Well, I won't marry him, but do let him come, for he enjoys it, and so do I. Natasha looked at her mother with a smile. Not with any intentions, but this way, she repeated. What do you mean by this way, my dear? Yes, this way. It is perfectly understood that he is not to marry. Well, this way. Yes, this way, this way, repeated the countess, and she went into an unexpected fit of good-natured laughter, her whole body shaking, as old people will. Come, Mamma, stop laughing at me, cried Natasha. You make the whole bed shake. You are awfully like me. You laugh just as easily as I do. Do stop. She seized the countess's two hands, kissed the joint of the little finger of one of them, for June, and went on kissing July and August on the other hand. Mamma, but he's very... He's so very much in love. You think so, do you? Was anyone ever much in love with you? And he's very nice, very, very nice, isn't he? Only, he's not quite to my taste. He's so narrow, just like the dining-room clock. You know what I mean, don't you? Narrow, you know, grayish and serene. What nonsense you do talk, exclaimed the countess. Natasha pursued. Don't you understand what I mean? Nikolenko would understand me. There's Buzakoy. He's blue, dark blue and red, and he is four square. And are you coquetting with him, too? asked the countess, laughing again. No, he's a Freemason. I found it out. He is splendid, dark blue and red. How can I make you see it? Grevenyushka, little countess, aren't you asleep yet? cried the count at this moment at the door. Natasha jumped out of bed, seized her slippers in her hand, and escaped barefooted to her own room. It was long before she could go to sleep. She kept thinking how strange it was that no one could ever understand things as she understood them, or read what was in her mind. Sonia, she thought, gazing at the young girl who, with her tremendous long pigtail, lay asleep curled up like a little kitten. No, not even she. She is virtue itself. She is in love with Nikolenka, and that's all she cares about, and Mama can't understand, either. That is so strange, how intelligent she is, and how— She's pretty, Natasha went on, speaking of herself in the third person, and imagining that some very intelligent, extraordinarily intelligent, and most handsome man was saying this about her. She has everything, everything, this man of her imagination was saying. She is unusually intelligent, lovable, and pretty, besides, extraordinarily pretty and graceful. She can swim, she can ride horseback splendidly, and what a voice, one might say a marvelous voice. She sang her favorite snatch from a Cherubini opera, then threw herself into bed, smiling at the happy thought that she should be asleep in a moment, called to Dunyasha to put out the light, and even before Dunyasha had left the room, she had already passed across into that other, still happier world of dreams, 
where all things were just as bright and beautiful as in reality, but still more fascinating because so different. On the next day, the Countess, calling Boris to her, had a talk with him, and from that time forth he ceased to be a frequent visitor at the Rostovs. End of chapter 13「Part Three, Chapter Fourteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Fourteen. On the thirty first of December, O.S., on the very eve of the new year, nineteen ten, La Ravion, a ball was given by a grandee of Catherine's time. The diplomatic corps and the emperor had promised to be present. The grandee's splendid mansion on the English quay was illuminated, with countless windows all ablaze. At the brilliantly lighted, red-carpeted entrance stood a guard of police, comprising not alone gendarmes, but even the chief of police and half a score of officers. Carriages drove away, and new ones kept taking their places, with red-liveried lackeys, and lackeys with plumes in their hats. From the carriages descended men in uniforms, and men adorned with stars and laces, and as the steps were let down with a bang, ladies in satins and ermine cloaks hastily and noiselessly picked their way over the carpeted entrance. Almost every time when a new equipage drove up, a flurry of excitement ran through the crowd, and hats were removed. The sovereign? No, a minister, prince so-and-so, an ambassador. But did you see his plume? Such were the remarks heard in the crowd. There was one man better dressed than the rest, and he seemed to know who everybody was, and called by name the famous grandees of the time. Already a third of the guests had arrived, but at the Rostovs, who were also invited, hasty preparations were still in progress. Many had been the rumors and anticipations in the Rostov family about this ball, many the apprehensions lest they should not get their invitation, lest their dresses should not be ready, and everything ordered as it should be. Maria Ignatyevna Peronskaya, an old friend and relative of the Countess, was to accompany the Rostovs to the ball. She was a lean and sallow Frilina, who belonged to the Empress Dowager's court, and took charge of her country cousins, the Rostovs, in their entry into Petersburg high life. They were to call for her at ten o'clock in the evening, at her residence on the Taurid Gardens, and now it only lacked five minutes of ten, and still the ladies were not dressed. This was the first great ball to which Natasha had ever been in her life. She had got up at eight o'clock that morning, and had been all day long in a state of the wildest excitement and bustle. All her energies, from earliest morning, had been expended in the effort to have all of them, herself, Sonya, and her mamma, dressed to perfection. Sonya and the Countess trusted themselves entirely into her hands. The Countess was to wear a dark red, or masaka, dress of velvet. The two girls, gowns with pink silk overskirts and roses in their corsages, while their hair was to be coiffed à la griche. The most important part had been already done. Their feet, hands, arms, necks, and ears had been washed, perfumed, and powdered with extraordinary care. On their feet they wore open-work silk stockings and white satin slippers with bows. Their toilettes were almost finished. Sonya had her dress on, and so had the Countess, but Natasha, who had been helping the others, was behindhand. She was still sitting in front of the mirror in a pannier that covered her slender shoulders. Sonya, already dressed, was standing in the middle of the room, fastening on a last bow with a pin that hurt her dainty fingers as she tried to press it, squeaking through the ribbon. "'Not that way! Not that way, Sonya!' cried Natasha, turning her head suddenly and putting her hands up into her hair, which the maid, who was dressing it, did not have time to let go of. "'Don't pull the bow that way. Come here!' Sonya sat down in front of her. Natasha pinned the bow in a different position. "'If you please, Barishnya, I can't arrange your hair this way,' exclaimed the maid, still holding her dark locks. "'Oh, good gracious! Wait, then. There, that's the way, Sonya.' "'Are you almost ready?' asked the Countess. "'It's ten o'clock already.' "'In a minute! In a minute! And are you all ready, Mamma? "'Only have my headdress to put on.' "'Don't you do it without me,' cried Natasha. "'You won't get it right.' "'Yes, but it's ten o'clock.' It had been agreed upon that they should reach the ballroom at half-past ten, and Natasha still had to get on her dress, and they had to drive to the Torrid Gardens. As soon as her hair was done, Natasha, in her short petticoat, which showed her ball slippers, and wearing her mother's dressing-jacket, ran to Sonya and examined her critically. Then she hurried to her mother. 
Bending her head down, she put on it her headdress, and, giving her gray hair a hasty kiss, she scurried back to the maids, who were putting the last touches to her skirt. The delay had been caused by Natasha's skirt, which was too long. Two maids were at work on it, hastily biting off the ends of the thread. A third, with her mouth full of pins, was hastening from the Countess de Sonia, and a fourth was holding up high in the air the completed crepe gown. Mavrushka, hurry up, you old dove! Give me the thimble, Baryshnya. Are you almost ready? asked the Count, coming to the door. Here is some perfume for you. Peronskaya will be on a fume. There, it is done, cried the maid, lifting up with two fingers the completed crepe dress, and giving it a puff and a shake, by this motion expressing her sense of the airiness and purity of which she held. Natasha began to put the garment on. In a minute, in a minute, don't come, Papa, she cried to her father, who was just opening the door. Her head at that very moment was disappearing under the cloud of crape. Sonya closed the door, but in a moment the Count was admitted. He wore a blue dress coat, short clothes, and buckled shoes, and was scented and pomaded. Ach, Papa, how handsome you look! Charming! cried Natasha, as she stood in the middle of the chamber and adjusted the folds of her skirt. Excuse me, Varnishnya, excuse me, said one of the maids, who was on her knees, pulling the skirts and she shifted the pins from one side of her mouth to the other, with a deft motion of her tongue. "'It's too, too bad,' cried Sonya, with despair in her voice, scrutinizing Natasha's dress. "'It's too bad. It's over long now.' Natasha made a few steps so as to look into the pier-glass. The skirt was indeed too long. "'Good gracious,' said Arina. "'It isn't too long at all,' said Mavrusha, crawling along the floor after her young lady." "'Well, if it's too long, let us tack it up. We can do it in a second, said Danyusha, in a decisive tone, taking a needle from the bosom of her dress and again squatting down on the floor to baste up the bottom of the skirt. At this instant the countess in her headdress and velvet robe came timidly into the room with noiseless steps. "'Oh, oh, my beauty!' cried the count. "'You are the best of them all.' He tried to give her a hug and a kiss, but she blushed and pushed him away so as not to rumple her dress." "'Mama, your headdress wants to be more to one side,' cried Natasha. "'I will pin it on,' and she sprang forward so quickly that the maids who were at work on the skirt did not have time to let go, and a piece of the crepe was torn. "'Good gracious! What have you done? Truly it was not my fault.' "'No matter. It won't be seen,' said Dunyasha. "'Oh, my beauty! A real queen!' cried the old Nyanya, looking in at the door. "'And Sonyushka, too. Well, they are beauties.' By a quarter past ten, finally, all were seated in the carriage and on their way, but they had still to stop at the Torrid Gardens. Peronskaya was all ready and waiting for them. Notwithstanding her advanced age, and her lack of charms, almost exactly the same thing had taken place in her case as with the Rostovs, though, of course, with no haste and flurry, for this was an old story with her. But her scraggly old form had been washed and scented and powdered in just the same way, and she had been just as scrupulous in washing behind her ears, and just as at the Rostovs, her ancient maid had enthusiastically contemplated the adornment of her mistress, when dressed in her yellow robe with the imperial monogram she had come down into the drawing-room. Peronskaya could not find words enough to praise the Rostovs' toilet. The Rostovs also extolled her taste and her toilet, and at last, at eleven o'clock, carefully safeguarding their hair and their dresses, they stowed themselves away in the carriage and drove off. End of chapter 14
she realized all that was awaiting her only at the moment when, having passed along the red-carpeted entrance, she went into the vestibule and took off her furs, and, together with Sonya, preceded her mother up the grand staircase lined with flowering plants. Then only it came over her with what propriety she must behave at a ball, and she tried to assume that dignified manner which she felt to be the proper thing for girls on such an occasion. But, fortunately, she was conscious that her eyes were wandering, she could not distinguish anything clearly. Her heart was beating a hundred a minute. Her pulses throbbed almost painfully. It was impossible for her to assume any such manner, and it would have been ridiculous in her. And so she passed along, dying with excitement, and trying with all her might to hide it, and this was the very manner which was, most of all, becoming to her. Behind them, and in front of them, other guests were mounting the stairs, also talking in low tones, and dressed in ball costumes. Great mirrors on the landings reflected visions of ladies in white, blue, and pink gowns, with diamonds and pearls on their bare arms and bosoms. Natasha glanced into the mirrors, but she could not distinguish herself from among the others. All were commingled and confused in one glittering procession. As they reached the door leading into the first drawing-room, a continuous roar of voices, footsteps, and greetings deafened Natasha. The lights and brilliant toilets still more dazzled her. The host and hostess, who had already for hours been standing near the entrance and repeating over the same words of welcome, Chame de vous voir, met the Rostovs and Peronskaya in the same way. The two young girls, in their white dresses, each with a single rose in her dark locks, went in and curtsied exactly alike. But involuntarily the hostess let her glance rest longer on the gentle little Natasha. She gazed at her with a smile the expression of which had something in it quite different from the set smile of the hostess. As she looked at her, she perhaps remembered the golden days of her girlhood, which would never more return, and her own first ball. The host also followed Natasha with his glance, and asked the Count which of the two was his daughter. Charmant, said he, kissing his fingertips. In the great ballroom, the guests were crowded together near the entrance, awaiting the coming of the sovereign. The countess took her place in the front row of this group. Natasha had had her ears open, and she was conscious that several had asked who she was, and found it pleasant to look at her. She realized that she was making a pleasant impression on those whose eyes followed her, and this fact somewhat calmed her agitation. There are some just like ourselves, some not as good, she thought. Peronskaya was pointing out to the countess the most notable people in the ballroom. There, that's the Dutch ambassador, said Perinskoya, directing the countess's attention to a gentleman with crisp silver-white hair, closely trimmed. He was surrounded by ladies whom he had just set to laughing by some story or other. Ah, and there is the Staritsta of Petersburg, the Countess Buzakaya, she exclaimed, indicating Ellen, who had just entered. How handsome she is! She does not stand second even to Marya Anatovna. Just see how young and old stare after her. She is both handsome and intelligent. They say Prince has quite lost his heart to her. And see those two, there. They are not pretty at all. But what a following they have. She indicated a lady and her extremely plain daughter, who were just crossing the ballroom. That girl is the daughter of a millionaire, said Peronskaya. And there are her suitors. That's the Countess Buzakaya's brother, Anatole Kurigan, said she, referring to a handsome young cavalryman who was just then passing them holding his head very high and not deigning to give the ladies a look. How handsome he is, isn't he? They say he's going to marry this heiress. And your cousin, Drubetskoy, is also after her. They say she has millions. Who? That man there. That is the French ambassador himself, she replied to the countess, who had asked who Collincourt was. Just see, he is like some czar. And yet they are all so charming, these French, all very nice. Ah, there she is. No, after all, there is no one who can be compared to our Maria Anatovna. How simply she is dressed. Charming. And that stout man yonder, in spectacles, is the universal Freemason, said she, pointing out Buzakoy. Compare him with his wife. What a ridiculous creature. Pierre walked along, his stout form swaying and pushing through the throng, bowing to right and left, carelessly and good-naturedly, as though he were making his way through the swarms of a marketplace. He passed along, evidently in search of someone. Natasha was glad to see Pierre's well-known face, even if he was a ridiculous creature, 
to use the words of Peronskaya, and she knew that it was her party, and herself in particular, of whom Pierre was in search. Pierre had promised that he would attend the ball and find partners for her. But before he reached where they stood, Pierre stopped near a short and very handsome dark-featured cavalryman in a white uniform, who was standing by the window and conversing with a tall individual with stars and a ribbon. Natasha instantly recognized the shorter of the two men. It was Bolkonsky, who seemed to her to have grown younger, gayer, and handsomer. "'There's another of our acquaintance, Bolkonsky. Do you see him, Mamma? asked Natasha, pointing to Prince Andrei. "'Do you remember? He spent a night with us at Otranoya.' "'Ah, indeed. So you know him, then?' asked Peronskaya. I cannot endure him. Il fait de prendre le puri et le bouton. There's no end to his pride. He's exactly like his papenka. And now he's hand in glove with Speransky. They are concocting all sorts of schemes. See how he treats the ladies. One just spoke to him, and he turns his back on her. I'd give him a lesson if he treated me as he did those ladies. End of chapter 15「ワンピース」by Leo Tolstoy。Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Marianne。Chapter 16 Suddenly there was a general stir. A whisper ran through the throng, which pressed forward and then divided again, making two rows, between which came the sovereign, to the strains of the band which just then struck up. He was followed by the host and hostess. The sovereign passed along quickly, bowing to the right and the left, as though anxious to have done as soon as possible with these first formalities. The musicians played a polonaise, then famous, on account of the words which had been set to it. These words began, Alexander, Yelizaveta, you enrapture us. The sovereign entered the drawing-room. The throng pushed toward the doors. Several personages, with anxious faces, in great haste, rushed hither and thither, The throng again closed around the drawing-room door, where the sovereign made his appearance, engaged in conversation with the hostess. A young man, with an expression of annoyance on his face, came along and begged the ladies to step back. Several ladies, with eager faces showing absolute disregard of all the conventional rules of good breeding, pushed forward, to the imminent risk of their toilets. The gentlemen began to select partners and get into position for the polonaise. Space was cleared, and the sovereign, with a smile, stepping out of time, passed into the ballroom, leading the lady of the house by the hand. They were followed by the host, with Maria Antonovna Narishkina, then the ambassadors and ministers and various generals, whom Peronskaya indefatigably called by name. More than half of the ladies had partners and were already dancing or beginning to dance the polonaise. Natasha felt that she and Sonya, as well as her mother, were left in the lurch, with that minority of ladies who lined the walls and were not invited to take part in the polonaise. She stood with her slender arms hanging by her sides, with her maidenly bosom, as yet scarcely defined, regularly rising and falling with long inspirations, and she looked straight ahead with brilliant eyes full of alarm, indicating that she was ready for utter enjoyment or desperate disappointment. She was not interested now in the sovereign or in any of those distinguished personages whom Peronskaya was calling to their attention, She had only one thought. Isn't anyone coming to invite me? Can it be that I am not going to have a single dance? Won't any of those men notice me? Of those men who now do not seem to see me, or if they see me, look at me as much as if to say, Oh, she's nothing. She's nothing to look at. No, it cannot be, she said to herself. They must know how much I am longing to dance, and how splendidly I dance. And how much they would enjoy it if they danced with me. The strains of the polonaise, which had now lasted some little time, began to have a melancholy cadence in Natasha's ears, as though connected with sad memories. She felt like having a good cry. Peronskaya had left them. The count was at the other end of the ballroom. She and Sonya and the countess were as much alone in this throng of strangers as though they were in the woods. No one took any interest in them or looked out for them. Prince Andrei passed them with a lady on his arm, and evidently did not recollect them. The handsome Anatole, smiling, said something to the lady with whom he was promenading, and looked into Natasha's face as one looks at a wall. Twice Boris passed them, and each time turned his head away. Berg and his wife, who were not dancing, joined them. 
Natasha felt mortified to death at this family gathering, there at the ball, as though they had no other place for family confidences than in a ballroom. She did not look at Vera, or listen to what she had to say about her emerald green dress. At last the sovereign sat down, near his last partner. He had danced with three, and the music ceased. The officious adjutant bustled up to the Rostovs, begging them to move back a little more, and this although they almost touched the wall, and then from the gallery was heard the clear-cut rhythm of the smooth and enticing valse. The sovereign, with a smile, glanced down the ballroom. A moment passed, and no one had as yet begun. The adjutant, who acted as master of ceremonies, approached the Countess Buzakaya and asked her to dance. She accepted with a smile, and then, without looking at him, laid her hand on his shoulder. The adjutant, who knew what he was about, calmly, deliberately, and with all the self-confidence in the world, placing his arm firmly around her waist, at first started off with her in the glissade around the edge of the circle. Then, when they reached the end of the ballroom, he took her right hand with his left, turned her around, and, while the sounds of the valse grew more and more rapid, the clicking of the adjutant's spurs could be heard, as his agile and skillful feet beat the time of the rhythm. While on the third beat, at every turn, his partner's velvet dress floated out and seemed to fly. Natasha gazed at them, and was ready to weep that it was not she herself who was leading this first valse. Prince Andre, in the white uniform of a colonel of cavalry, in silk stockings and shoe buckles, stood, full of life and radiant with happiness, in the front row of the circle, not far from the Rostovs. Baron Firhoff was talking to him about the first meeting of the Imperial Council, which had been appointed for the next day. Prince Andre, as an intimate friend of Speransky, and one who had shared in the labors of the Legislative Committee, would be very likely to be able to give authentic information in regard to the approaching session, concerning which there were many conflicting rumors. But Prince Andre was not giving heed to what Firhoff was saying, and looked now at the sovereign, and now at the various gentlemen, who were all ready to dance, but had not the necessary courage to take the floor. Prince Andre was observing these gentlemen, who showed such timidity in the presence of their sovereign, and the ladies, whose hearts were sinking within them, with desire of being invited. Pierre came up to Prince Andre and took him by the arm. "'You are always ready for a dance. My protégé, the little Rostova, is here. Do invite her,' said he. "'Where?' asked Bolkonsky. "'I beg your pardon,' he added, turning to the baron. "'We will finish this conversation at another time. But at balls it is our duty to dance.' He went in the direction indicated by Pierre. Natasha's despairing, melancholy face attracted Prince Andre's attention. He recognized her and divined her feeling, and realizing that she was just coming out and remembering her conversation, he went with a beaming countenance up to the Countess Rostova. "'Allow me to make you acquainted with my daughter,' said the Countess, with a blush. "'I have had the pleasure of meeting her before, but perhaps the Countess does not remember me,' said Prince Andre, with a low and respectful bow." entirely belying Perinskaya's spiteful observation about his rudeness. Approaching Natasha, he started to put his arm around her waist, even before he had actually invited her to dance with him. Then he proposed that they should take a turn of the valse. Natasha's face, with its melancholy expression ready to sink to despair or become radiant, was suddenly lighted up with a happy, childlike smile of gratitude. "'I have been waiting long for you,' this timid and radiant young maiden seemed to say, by this smile flashing out from under the tears that had been almost ready to start as she put her hand on Prince Andre's shoulder. They were the second couple that ventured out upon the floor. Prince Andre was one of the best dancers of his time. Natasha danced exquisitely. Her dainty little feet, shod in her satin slippers, performed their duty with perfect ease and agility, as though they had wings, and her face was beaming with triumphant delight. Her neck was angular, and her arms were thin and far from pretty, compared with Ellen's charms. Her shoulders were slim, her figure undeveloped, her arms slender, but Ellen seemed to be already covered with an enamel left by the thousand glances that had glided over her form, while Natasha seemed like a maiden who for the first time appeared in a dress decollete, and who would feel very much ashamed if she were not assured that it was the proper thing. Prince Andre liked to dance, and as he was anxious to escape from the political and philosophical talk into which people insisted in dragging him, and anxious to break up, as soon as possible, that tiresome circle of people, abashed by the presence of the sovereign, he was ready to dance, and he chose Natasha because Pierre had suggested her, and because she happened to be the first among all the pretty women upon whom his eyes fell. 
but as soon as he held this slender, supple form in his arms, and she started away so close to him, and smiled up into his face, the effect of her charm mounted into his head like wine. When they stopped to get breath, and he released her, and they began to look at the dancers, he felt as though he had been inspired with new energy and fresh life. End of chapter 16「three, Chapter seventeen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter seventeen. Following Prince Andrei's example, Boris came and invited Natasha to dance with him. Also, the master of ceremonies who had opened the ball, and several other young men, and Natasha, turning her superfluity of partners over to Sonya, flushed and beamed with delight and did not miss a single dance throughout the rest of the evening. She did not notice, and she did not heed the incidents that attracted the attention of everybody else at the ball. She did not once remark how the emperor had a long conversation with the French ambassador, or how he showed signal favor to a certain lady who was present, or how the European prince so-and-so, and so-and-so, -and -so said and did this, that, and the other, or how Ellen enjoyed a brilliant success and attracted the special attention of such and such a person. She did not even see the sovereign, and only once noticed that he had withdrawn by the fact that after his departure the ball became livelier than ever. Just before supper Prince Andrei danced one of the jolliest of cotillions with Natasha. He took occasion to remind her of their first meeting, on the Otradnoya driveway, and how she could not go to sleep that moonlight night, and how he had involuntarily overheard what she said. Natasha blushed at this reminiscence, and tried to excuse herself, as though it were something of which she ought to be ashamed, that Prince Andrei had accidentally overheard her. Prince Andrei, like all men who have grown up in society, liked to meet anyone who was free from the stereotyped imprint of fashionable high life, and such a person was Natasha, with her naive astonishment, her enjoyment, and her modesty, and even her mistakes in speaking French. He treated her, and spoke to her, with a peculiar delicacy and affectionate courtesy. As he sat next to her, talking upon the simplest and most insignificant topics, Prince Andrei admired the radiant gleam in her eyes, and her smile, answering not what was said to her so much as to her inward happiness. If, by chance, Natasha were invited to dance, and got up with a smile, and went flying across the room, Prince Andrei found a special delight in watching her fawn-like grace. In the midst of the cotillion, Natasha, having just danced out one figure, came back to her place with a long sigh, all out of breath. A new cavalier again invited her out. She stood up panting and was apparently on the point of refusing, but instantly placed her hand on the cavalier's shoulder and gave Prince Andrei a smile. "'I should very much like to get my breath and sit with you. I am tired, but you see how I am in demand, and that pleases me, and I am happy, and I love you all.' and you and I understand it all. This, and much more besides, this smile of hers seemed to say. When her partner brought her back, Natasha chasseed across the room to choose two ladies for the figure. If she speaks to her cousin first, and then to the other lady, she shall be my wife, said Prince Andrei, unexpectedly even to himself, as he followed her. She went to her cousin first. What nonsense sometimes enters one's head, thought Prince Andrei but it is quite evident that this maiden is so sweet and so unlike anybody else that she won't be kept dancing here for a month. She'll be engaged or married. There's no one like her here, he thought, as Natasha, smoothing out the petals of a rose in her corsage that had been crushed, came back and resumed her place next to him. At the end of the cotillion, the old count, in his blue coat, came up to the dancers. He invited Prince Andrei to call and see them, and he asked his daughter if she had been having a good time. Natasha at first did not reply, except by a smile, which had a sort of reproach in it, as much as to say, How can you ask such a question? The jolliest time I ever had in my life, said she, and Prince Andrei noticed how she made a quick motion to raise her slender arms, as if to embrace her father, and instantly dropped them again. Natasha was happier than she had ever been in her life before. She had reached that lofty height of bliss, when a person becomes perfectly good and lovely, and cannot believe in the existence or possibility of wickedness, unhappiness, and sorrow. 
Pierre, at this ball, for the first time had a realizing sense of the false position in which he was placed by the status occupied by his wife in court society. He was morose and in despair. A deep frown furrowed his brow, and as he stood by the window, he glared through his spectacles and yet saw nothing. Natasha, as she went down to supper, passed by him. His gloomy, unhappy face struck her. She paused in front of him. She felt a desire to help him, to share with him the superfluity of her own happiness. How jolly is it, Count, said she, isn't it? Pierre gave her a distracted smile, evidently not understanding what she said. Yes, I am very glad, he replied. How can anyone be dissatisfied with anything, wondered Natasha, especially such a good fellow as at Buzakoy? In Natasha's eyes, all who were at the ball were alike good, sweet, lovely men, full of affection toward each other. Hatred was out of the question, and therefore all ought to be happy. End of chapter 17「Part three, Chapter eighteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter eighteen. On the next day, Prince Andre remembered the ball of the evening before, but it soon passed out of his mind. Yes, it was a very brilliant ball, and besides, yes, the little Rostov girl was very captivating. There's something peculiarly fresh about her very original and un-Petersburg-like. That was the extent of the thought that he gave to the ball, and, after he had drunk his tea, he sat down to his labors. But either because of his weariness or his sleepless night, the day was unpropitious for work, and he could not accomplish anything, and what he did was unsatisfactory, as was often the case with him, and he was glad when word was brought that someone had come to visit him. The visitor was Bitsky, who had served on various committees and frequented all the different cliques of Petersburg society. He was a zealous supporter of the new ideas and of Speransky, and was known about town as an indefatigable gossip-monger, one of those men who follow the fashion in their opinions as in their clothes, and who, accordingly, are regarded as the most eager partisans of the latest doctrines. Scarcely giving himself time to remove his hat, he rushed eagerly into Prince Andrei's room and, on the instant, rattled off into a stream of talk. He had only just learned the details of the session of the Imperial Council that had taken place that morning, opened by the Sovereign, and he began to tell about it with all enthusiasm. The Sovereign's speech had been extraordinary, the sort of speech as only a constitutional monarch could have given. The Emperor said in so many words, that the court and the senate were now the members of the government, and declared that the administration should have its basis not in arbitrary will, but on firm principles. The sovereign declared that the finances should be reorganized, and the budgets made public, said Bitsky, laying a special emphasis on the important words, and opening his eyes significantly. Yes, the event of today marks an era, a magnificent era, in our history, he said in conclusion. Prince Andrei listened to the story of the opening of the Imperial Council, which he had been looking forward to with much impatience, and to which he attributed so much importance, and he was amazed that this event, now that it was really accomplished, not only did not stir him, but seemed to him worse than idle. He listened to Bitsky's enthusiastic account with quiet irony. The most obvious thought that came into his head was, what concern is it to me or to Bitsky, indeed what concern is it of ours, that the sovereign deigned to say something in the council. Can it make me any happier, or any better? And this obvious criticism suddenly destroyed for Prince Andrei all the interests that he had formerly taken in the reforms. Prince Andrei had been invited to dine that day at Speransky's En Petit Comité, as he himself expressed it, when he gave him the invitation. The idea of this dinner, in the intimate and home circle of a man for whom he felt such an admiration, had before this been exceedingly attractive to Prince Andrei, the more from the fact that hitherto he had never seen Speransky in his family life, but now he lost all desire to go. At the hour set for the dinner, however, Prince Andrei reached Speransky's own small house, near the Torrid Gardens. Prince Andrei was a little late when he was shown into the parquetry-floored dining-room of the modest little residence, distinguished for its extraordinary, its rather monastic, primness, 
where all the gentlemen constituting Speransky's petit comité, being his most intimate friends, had promptly assembled at five o'clock. There were no ladies present except Speransky's young daughter and her governess. As Prince Andrei was in the vestibule, he heard a clear, precise, ha, 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 a laugh that, afterward, reminded him of actors on the stage. Someone, whose voice sounded like Speransky's, rang out distinctly, ha, ha, ha. Prince Andrei had never heard Speransky laugh heartily, and the clear, ringing laugh of the great statesman struck him strangely. Prince Andrei went into the dining room. All the company were gathered around a lunch table, standing between two windows, and spread with zakuska. Speransky, in a gray coat, with a star and wearing the same immaculate white waistcoat and high white stock, in which he had appeared at the memorable meeting of the Imperial Council, stood at the table, his face beaming with pleasure. The gentlemen formed a circle around him. Magnitsky, addressing Mikhail Mikhailovich, was relating an anecdote. Speransky listened and began to laugh even before Magnitsky reached the point of his story. At the moment Prince Andrei entered the room, Magnitsky's words were drowned in another roar of merriment. Stolupin's deep voice rang out as he bit up a morsel of bread and cheese. Zervaeus bubbled over with tinkling laughter, and above all rang out Speransky's loud, deliberate, ha, ha, ha. Speransky, still laughing, gave his soft white hand to Prince Andrei. Very glad to see you, Prince, said he. One minute, said he, turning to Magnitsky and interrupting the story he was telling. We have made an agreement this time. Dinner is for recreation and not a word about business. And again he turned to the narrator and again broke out into laughter. Prince Andrei, with amazement and sorrowful disenchantment, listened to this guffawing and gazed at the hilarious Speransky. It seemed to Prince Andrei that this was not Speransky, but another man. All the mystery and charm which he had hitherto discovered in Speransky suddenly seemed commonplace and repulsive. The conversation at the table did not flag for a moment, and seemed to consist of little more than a string of ludicrous stories. Magnitsky had scarcely time to cap the climax of his story when someone else manifested his readiness to tell something that was even funnier. The anecdotes were for the most part, if not exactly confined to the world of officialdom, at least related to individuals in the service. It seemed as though, in this gathering, the insignificance of such characters was so thoroughly taken for granted that the only way in which it was worthwhile to speak of them was to cover them with good-natured ridicule. Speransky related how, at the council meeting that morning, one of the statesmen, who happened to be deaf, on being asked his opinion, replied that he was entirely agreeable. Gervais related a long incident in connection with the census, wherein remarkable stupidity had been shown by all persons concerned. Stolupin, who had an impediment in his speech, joined the conversation and began eagerly to speak of the abuses of the former order of things, but, as this threatened to give too serious a character to the talk, Magnitsky chafed him on his earnestness. Gervais perpetrated a pun, and again the talk assumed its former hilarious character. Evidently Speransky, after his labors, liked recreation and amusement in a jolly circle of friends, and all his guests, knowing this characteristic of his, did their best to make him enjoy himself, and at the same time to enjoy themselves. But this gaiety seemed to Prince Andrei forced, and the opposite of gay. The ringing tones of Speransky's voice impressed him unpleasantly, and his incessant laughter had a false ring to it that strangely wounded his sensibilities. Prince Andrei could not laugh, and he was afraid that he should appear like a killjoy in the company, but no one noticed that he did not participate in the general merriment. It seemed to him that all were extremely gay. He tried several times to put in his word, but each time it was tossed back, as it were, like a cork tossed out of the water, and he had no success in jesting like the others. There was nothing wrong or ill-judged in what they said. There was wit and sense displayed, and it ought to have been really worth laughing at, but something— whatever it is, that constitutes the salt of gaiety, was lacking. But, worse than all, they did not seem to realize that it was. After dinner, Speransky's little daughter, with her governatka, withdrew. Speransky caressed the little girl with his white hand and kissed her, and even this action seemed to Prince Andrei full of affectation. The gentlemen, after the English fashion, remained sitting at the table over their port wine, 
The conversation had turned on Napoleon's management of affairs in Spain, and as all agreed in approving of it, Prince Andrei took it upon him to disagree with them. Speransky smiled and, evidently wishing to change the subject, told a story which was totally irrelevant. Then silence ensued for several moments. Before they left the table, Speransky recorked a bottle in which a little wine was left, and saying, Good wine is expensive these days, handed it to the servant and pushed back his chair. All arose and, talking noisily, passed into the drawing room. Speransky was handed two envelopes brought by a courier. He took them and went into his private room. As soon as he had left, the general gaiety subsided, and the guests began to talk together in subdued tones on matters of real interest. "'Well, then, now for recitation,' exclaimed Speransky, coming back from his private room. "'Wonderful talent,' said he, addressing Prince Andrei. Magnitsky immediately assumed an attitude, and began to recite some satirical verses, which he had written in French, upon certain well-known personages in Petersburg, and several times he was interrupted by applause. At the end of this recitation, Prince Andrei went to Speransky to take leave. "'Where must you be going so early?' asked Speransky. "'I promised to spend the evening.' All were silent. Prince Andrei looked into Speransky's mirror-like and impenetrable eyes, and it seemed to him ridiculous that he had ever expected anything great from this Speransky, or of the work which he had undertaken to perform, or how he could ever have attributed any importance to what Speransky was doing. It was long before that dry, measured laugh of his ceased to ring in his ears, even after he had taken his leave of Speransky. On his return home, Prince Andrei began to live over his life in Petersburg during the four months past, as though it were something new. He recalled his labors, his rounds of solicitation, the history of his project of the military code which had been brought to notice and then quietly laid on the table for the sole reason that another one of very wretched character had already been compiled and placed before the sovereign. He recalled the meetings of his committee, of which Berg was a member. He recalled how strenuously and at what length everything that touched upon the outside forms and proceedings of their meetings had been discussed, and how careful they had been to avoid everything that reached the essence of the matter. He recalled his judicial labors, and what pains he had taken to translate articles on the Roman and French course of procedure into Russian, and he grew ashamed of himself. Then his imagination vividly brought up before his mind his estate in Bogucharovo, his projects in the country, his journey to Ryazan. He recalled his musics and their head man, and he applied to them his theory of the individual rights which he had so carefully elaborated into paragraphs, and he was amazed at himself that he could have wasted so much time in such idle work. End of chapter 18。Three, chapter 19 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 19 On the following day, Prince Andrei went to make calls upon several families where he had not been as yet, and in the number upon the Rostovs, whose acquaintance he had renewed at the last ball. Not only was he required by the laws of politeness to call at the Rostovs, but he also had a strong desire to see in her own home this original and lively young girl, of whom he had such pleasant recollections. Natasha happened to be the first who came down to see him. She wore a simple blue morning dress, and it seemed to Prince Andrei that it was even more becoming to her than the one she had worn at the ball. She and the rest of the family received Prince Andrei simply and hospitably as an old friend. The whole family, which he had at first been inclined to criticize severely, now seemed to him charming, simple-hearted, cordial people. The old count showed such genuine and unbounded hospitality, and his good nature was so contagious, especially there in Petersburg, that Prince Andrei could not with good grace refuse his invitation to dinner. "'Yes, they are excellent people,' said Bolkonsky to himself. "'Of course they cannot appreciate what a treasure they possess in Natasha,' but they are good, kindly people, and they make a most admirable background against which to bring out all the charm of this wonderfully poetical young girl, so overflowing with vivacity. Prince Andrei felt that in Natasha existed a peculiar and unknown world, full of unrealized delights, that unknown world of which he had caught the first glimpse as he drove through the Otrandoya Avenue, and then again at the window that moonlit night, when he had been so stirred by it. Now this world no longer excited his curiosity, no longer was it a strange world, 
but as he entered into it, he realized that new delight was awaiting him. After dinner, Natasha, at the Count's request, went to the harpsichord and began to sing. Prince Andrei took up his position by the window and listened, while occasionally exchanging words with the other ladies. When she reached the middle of a long cadenza, Prince Andrei stopped talking and, to his amazement, found that he was choked with tears, a thing which he would not have believed possible for him. He looked at Natasha as she sang, and a new and joyous feeling arose in his heart. He was happy, and at the same time rather melancholy. He was ready to burst into tears, and yet he could not really have told why he felt like weeping. For what? His former love? For the little princess? For his disappointed illusions? For his hopes of the future? Yes and no. The chief reason that he felt like weeping was the sudden awakening to that strange and vivid contradiction between the boundlessly immense and infinite that existed in him and the narrow and limited world to which he felt that he himself and even she belonged. This contrast tormented and at the same time overjoyed him while she was singing. As soon as Natasha finished her song, she went to him and asked him frankly how he liked her voice. She asked the question and was overwhelmed with confusion the moment she had spoken, realizing, when it was too late, that she ought not to have asked it. He smiled as he looked at her, and replied that he liked her singing just as he liked everything else that she did. It was late that evening before Prince Andrei left the Rostovs. He went to bed as usual, but soon found that he had a sleepless night before him. Now he would relight his candle and sit up in bed. Then he would get up. Then he would lie down again. Still, he was not in the least oppressed by this sleeplessness, his soul was so full of new and joyful sensations that it seemed to him as if he had just emerged from a sultry chamber into God's free world. Nor did it once occur to him that he was in love with the young Countess Rostova. He did not think of her, he only imagined her himself, and the consequence of this was that all his whole life presented itself to him in a new light. Why am I struggling? Why am I toiling and moiling in this narrow, petty environment when life— all of life, with all its pleasures, is open before me, he asked himself. And for the first time for long months, he began to devise cheerful plans for the future. He decided that it was his duty to undertake personally the education of his son, to find him an instructor and put him into his hands. Then he would quit the service and travel abroad, and see England, Switzerland, and Italy. I must make the most of my freedom, since I feel myself so overflowing with strength and energy, he said to himself. Pierre was right in saying that one ought to believe in the possibility of happiness, and now I believe it is so. Let the dead bury their dead, but while we are alive, let us live, he thought. End of chapter 19 Part 3, Chapter 20 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 20 One morning, Colonel Adolf Berg, with whom Pierre was acquainted, just as he was acquainted with everyone in Petersburg and Moscow, came to see him. He was dressed in an immaculate and brand new uniform, with little love locks curling round over his temples, and pomaded there, just as the sovereign wore them. I have just come from calling upon the Countess, your wife, and I was so unfortunate in not being able to have my request granted. I hope, Count, that I shall be more successful with you, he said with a smile. What would you like, Colonel? I am at your service. I am now quite completely settled into my new rooms, Count, pursued Berg, evidently convinced in his own mind that this communication could not fail to be an agreeable piece of news. And, consequently, I wanted to have a little reception for my friends, and my wife's. He smiled more effusively than ever. I wanted to ask the Countess and yourself to do me the honor to come and take tea with us and... and have supper. Only the Countess Elena Vizelyevna, who considered the society of such people as the Bergs beneath her, could have had the heart to refuse such an invitation. Berg explained so clearly why he desired to gather round him a small and select company, and why it would be pleasant, and why he grudged money spent on cards and other disreputable occupations but was willing to go to large outlay in entertaining good company that Pierre could not think of refusing, and agreed to be present. Only don't come late, Count, if I may be so bold as to beg of you. At ten minutes to eight, I beg of you. We will have some whist, 
Our general will come. He is very good to me. We will have a good supper, Count. So please do me the favor. Contrary to his usual habit of being late, Pierre that evening reached the Bergs at quarter to eight, five minutes before the appointed time. The Bergs, having made every provision for the reception, were all ready and waiting for their guests to come. Berg and his wife were sitting together in their library, all new and bright, and well provided with statuary and paintings and new furniture. Berg, in a nice new uniform, tightly buttoned up, was sitting near his wife, explaining to her that it was always possible and proper to have acquaintances among people of high station, that being the only real advantage in having friends. You can always find something to imitate, and can ask any sort of advice. You see, that's the way I have done ever since I was first promoted." Berg did not reckon his life according to his years, but according to the various steps of promotion. My comrades have amounted to nothing, but at the first vacancy I shall be made regimental commander, and then I have the happiness of being your husband. He got up and kissed Vera's hand, but before he did so he straightened out the corner of a rug that was turned up. And how have I accomplished all this? Principally by exercising a choice in my acquaintances. Of course, though, one has to be straightforward and punctual. Berg smiled with the consciousness of his superiority over a weak woman, and relapsed into silence, saying to himself that his wife, lovely as she was, was, nevertheless, a feeble woman, unable to appreciate the full significance of the dignity of being a man, ein Mann zu sein. Vera, at the same time, smiled with a similar consciousness of her superiority over her good, worthy spouse, who nevertheless, like the rest of his sex, was quite mistaken, she thought, in his understanding of the meaning of life. Berg, judging by his wife, considered that all women were weak and unintellectual. Vera, judging by her husband alone, and making wider generalizations, supposed that all men considered no one but themselves wise, and, at the same time, had no real understanding, and were haughty and egotistical. Berg got up, and embracing his wife carefully, so as not to rumple her lace pearline, for which he had paid a high price, kissed her on the center of the lips. "'There is one thing. We must not begin to have children too soon,' said he, by an unconscious correlation of ideas. "'Yes,' replied Vera. "'That's exactly what I want. We must live for society. The Princess Yusupovaya has one exactly like this,' said Berg, laying his finger on the lace pearline, with his honest, happy smile." At this time, Count Buzikoy was announced. The young couple exchanged congratulatory glances, each arrogating the credit of this visit. This is what comes of understanding how to form acquaintances, said Berg. This comes of having tact. Now, I beg you, don't interrupt me when I am talking with guests, said Vera, because I know how to receive each one and what to talk to them about. Berg also smiled. Of course, but sometimes among men there must be conversation for men, said he. Pierre was shown into the new drawing-room, where one could not possibly take a seat without destroying the symmetry, neatness, and order that reigned there, and consequently it was perfectly comprehensible, and not to be wondered at, that it required much magnanimity of Berg to allow this symmetry of chair or sofa to be disturbed for his beloved guest, or that, by reason of finding himself in a state of painful irresolution in regard to it, he should have allowed his guest to solve the problem in his own way." Pierre, accordingly, broke into the cemetery by pushing out a chair, and immediately after, Berg and Vera came in and began to talk, each interrupting the other and trying to entertain their guest. Vera, deciding in her own mind that Pierre would naturally be interested in the French embassy, immediately began to talk about it. Berg, deciding that a more virile subject must be chosen, broke into his wife's discourse by raising a question in regard to the war with Austria, and found himself involuntarily digressing from the abstract topic to various concrete proposals which had been laid before him in regard to taking part in the Austrian campaign, and the reasons which had led him to decline them. Although the conversation was desultory, and Vera was indignant that this masculine element should have been introduced, both husband and wife had a feeling of satisfaction that, though as yet there was only one guest, still the evening had begun auspiciously, and that their reception was going to be like every other reception, with talk, tea, and brightly lighted candles, as like, in fact, as two drops of water. Shortly after this, Boris appeared, he having been Berg's former comrade. He treated Berg and Vera with a shade of superiority and condescension. Boris was followed by a colonel and his lady, 
than Berg's own general, than the Rostovs, and the reception by this time, without a shadow of a doubt, began to resemble all other receptions. Berg and Vera could not refrain from a blissful smile at the sight of this stir in the drawing-room, at the clatter of disconnected snatches of conversation, at the rustle of silken dresses and the greetings. Everything was just as it would be everywhere else, especially so was the general, who could not find enough to say in praise of Berg's apartments, and patted him on the shoulder, and with fatherly authority arranged the disposition of the tables for Boston. The general then sat down, next Count Ilya Andreyitch, as being, next to himself, the guest of the greatest importance. The old people gathered in groups by themselves, the young people by themselves. The hostess took her place at the tea-table, which was laid out with exactly the same kind of macaroons, in a silver cake-basket, as the Pannins had had at their reception. In fact, everything was the same as at all receptions. End of chapter 20 Part 3, Chapter 21 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 21 Pierre, as one of the most distinguished guests of the evening, naturally had to play Boston in the set with Count Ilya Andreyitch, the general and the colonel. It happened that his place at the table brought him opposite Natasha, and he could not help being struck by the strange change that had come over her since the evening of the ball. She spoke scarcely a word, and was not so pretty as she had been at the ball. Indeed, she would have looked plain, if it had not been for her sweet expression of resignation. "'What is the matter with her?' Pierre wondered, as he looked at her. She was sitting next to her sister at the tea-table, and with an air of utter indifference, and without even looking at him, answered some remark that Boris had made to her. Having played out a whole suit, and taken five tricks, greatly to his partner's satisfaction, Pierre, as he gathered up his cards, was again led to look at her, by hearing complimentary greetings, and then the steps of someone entering into the room. "'What has happened to her?' he asked himself, with even more wonder than before. Prince André, with an expression of protecting affection, was now standing in front of her, and saying something to her. She had lifted her head, and was gazing at him with flushed cheeks, and apparently striving to restrain her rapid breathing." and the brilliant light of a strange inner fire, till then suppressed, again flashed up in her. She was wholly transfigured. Instead of being plain, she was as radiantly beautiful as she had been at the ball. Prince André came towards Pierre, and Pierre noticed new and youthful expression in his friend's face. Pierre changed his seat several times during the game, sometimes being before Natasha and sometimes behind, but during all the time of the six rubbers he kept watching her and his friend. There is something very serious going on between them, said Pierre to himself, and a feeling of mingled joy and sadness stirred him, and made him forget his own grief. After the sixth rubber, the general got up, declaring that it was an impossibility to play in such a way, and Pierre was released. Natasha, on one side, was talking with Sonya and Boris. Vera, with a slight smile on her face, was talking to Prince André about something or other. Pierre joined his friend, and, asking what secret they were discussing together, took a seat near them. Vera, having noticed Prince André's attention to Natasha, had decided that that evening, that very evening, it was an unavoidable necessity for her to drop some shrewd insinuations in regard to the feelings. And so she took advantage of a moment when Prince André was alone, to begin a talk about the sensibilities in general, and about her sister in particular. With such a clever man as she knew Prince André to be, she was obliged to practice her most refined diplomacy. When Pierre joined them, he noticed that Vera was talking with great eloquence and self-satisfaction, while Prince André seemed rather confused, which was a rare thing with him. "'What is your opinion?' asked Vera, with her slight smile. "'You have such keen insight, Prince, and are so quick to read people's characters. What do you think of Nathalie?' Would she be very likely to be constant in her attachments? Would she be like other women, Vera had herself in mind, and love a man once, and remain forever faithful to him? That is what I call genuine love. What do you think, Prince? I have too slight an acquaintance with your sister, replied Prince André, with a satirical smile, under which he tried to hide his confusion, to decide upon such a delicate question. And then I have noticed that the less attractive a woman is, the more likely she is to be constant he added, and looked at Pierre, who had just at that instant joined them. 
Yes, that is true, prince, in our days, pursued Vera, speaking of our days in the way affected by people of limited intelligence, who suppose that they are the only ones who discover and appreciate peculiarities of their times, and that the natures of people change with changing years. Young girls have so much freedom that the pleasure of being wooed, le plaisir d'être cotrisé, often stifles their true feelings. Et Natalia, il faut la voir, il est très sensible. Yes, she is very susceptible to it. This reference to Natasha again caused Prince Andre to scowl disagreeably. He was about to rise, but Vera proceeded with a still more subtle smile. I think no one has ever been more courtesy than she has, said Vera. But no one has ever really seriously succeeded in pleasing her until very recently. You must know, Count, said she, addressing Pierre, even our dear cousin Boris has been entre nous, and has been very, very far gone. Don le pays du tendre. Prince Andre scowled still more ominously, but said nothing. You and Boris are friends, are you not? asked Vera. Yes, I know him. I suppose he has told you about his boyish love for Natasha? Ah, so it was boyish love, was it? suddenly asked Prince Andre, unexpectedly reddening. Yes, you know, sometimes this intimacy between cousins leads to love. Cousinhood is a risky neighborhood. That's true, isn't it? Oh, yes, without doubt, said Prince Andre, and suddenly becoming unnaturally excited, he began to rally Pierre on his duty to be on his guard against any intimacy with his fifty-year-old cousins in Moscow. And then, right in the midst of this jesting talk, he got up, and taking Pierre by the arm, drew him aside. Well, what is it? asked Pierre, amazed at his friend's strange excitement, and remarking the look which, as he got up, he threw in Natasha's direction. I must really have a talk with you, said Prince Andre. You know our gloves. He referred to the Masonic gloves, which a newly initiated brother was to present to the lady of his love. I... But no. I will talk with you about it by and by. And with a strange light in his eyes and a restlessness in his motions, Prince Andre crossed over to Natasha and sat down. Pierre saw how he asked her some question and how she blushed as she answered him. But just at that moment, Berg came up to Pierre and urged him to take part in a discussion between the general and the colonel on Spanish affairs. Berg was satisfied and happy. That blissful smile of his did not once fade from his face. The evening had been a success, and exactly like other receptions which he had attended. The parallelism was complete. The nice little gossipy chats between the ladies, the cards, and the general raising his voice over the game, the samovar and the macaroons, one thing only was lacking, which he had always seen at receptions and which he wished to imitate. That was a loud conversation between the men, and a discussion over some grave and momentous question. The general had begun this conversation, and now Berg carried Pierre off to take part in it. End of chapter 21「パート3」チャプター22「of War and Peace」by Leo Tolstoy「Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole」「This Lipperbox recording is in the public domain」「Recording by Marianne」Chapter 22 The next day, Prince Andrei went to the Rostovs to dinner, in accordance with Count Ilya Andreyitch's invitation, and spent the whole evening there. All in the house had an inkling of the reason of Prince Andrei's visits, and he made no secret of it, but spent what time he could in Natasha's company. Not only was Natasha, in her heart of hearts, frightened and yet blissful, and full of enthusiasm, but all the household also felt a sort of awe, in the anticipation of a great and solemn event. The countess, with melancholy and gravely wistful eyes, gazed at Prince Andre as he talked with Natasha, and, with a sort of timidity, tried to introduce some indifferent topic as soon as he turned to her. Sonya was afraid to leave Natasha, and equally afraid that she was in their way when she was with her. Natasha grew pale with fear and expectation, if by chance she were left alone with him for a moment. Prince Andrei's timidity amazed her. She felt certain that he had something to say to her, but had not the courage to speak his mind. In the evening, when Prince Andrei had taken his departure, the countess went to Natasha. Well, said she in a whisper, Mamma, for pity's sake, don't ask me any questions now. It is impossible to tell. Nevertheless, that night, Natasha, at one moment full of excitement, 
at the next full of trepidation, lay for a long time in her mother's bed, with eyes fixed on space. Now she would tell her mother how he praised her, and how he said he was going abroad, and how he asked her where they were going to spend the summer, and how he had asked her about Boris. "'Well, it's so strange, so strange. I never knew anything like it before,' said she. "'But I have such a feeling of terror when he is here. I always feel afraid when I am with him. What does it mean? Does it mean that it is really and truly? "'Mama, are you asleep?' "'No, my dear, Dusha Moya, I confess to the same feeling of terror,' replied the mother. "'Go, now. I shan't go to sleep all the same. How silly it would be to go to sleep. Mamasha, Mamasha, nothing like it has ever happened to me before,' said she, in amazement and awe at the feeling which she was now experiencing. "'How could we possibly have imagined such a thing?' It seemed to Natasha that even as long ago as when Prince Andrei had come to Otranoya, she had fallen in love with him at first sight. She was terror-stricken, as it were, at that strange, unexpected happiness in meeting again with the very man whom she had, as she persuaded herself, chosen for her husband then, and feeling that he was not indifferent to her. And it had to be that he should come to Petersburg just at the time when we were here, and it had to be that we should meet at the ball. It is evident that all this brought us together. Even when I saw him first, I felt something peculiar. "'What is it he has said to you? What were those verses? Repeat them to me,' said the countess, trying to recall some verses which Prince Andrei had written in Natasha's album. "'Mama, it's nothing to be ashamed of because he is a widower, is it?' "'Don't talk nonsense, Natasha. Pray to God. Le mariage se font, dans les cieux. "'Sweetheart, Mamasha, how I love you, how good you are!' cried Natasha." shedding tears of bliss and emotion, and hugging her mother. At that same time, Prince Andrei was at Pierre's, telling him about his love for Natasha, and his firm intention of marrying her. That same evening, the Countess Elena Vasilyevna had given a rout. The French ambassador had been there, the foreign prince, who for some time had been a frequent visitor at the Countess's, had been present, as well as a throng of brilliant ladies and gentlemen. Pierre had come down and wandered through the rooms, attracting general notice among the guests by his concentrated, distracted, and gloomy looks. Pierre, ever since the time of the ball, had been conscious that attacks of his old enemy, hypochondria, were imminent, and, with the energy of despair, had struggled to get the better of them. Since this prince had become the countess's acknowledged admirer, Pierre had unexpectedly been appointed one of the emperor's chamberlains, and from that time forth he began to feel a great burden and loathing in grand society, and more often his former gloomy, pessimistic thoughts about the falsity of all things human began to come back to him. At this particular time, this tendency to gloominess was accented by the discovery of the sympathy existing between his little protégé, Natasha, and Prince Andrei, and by the contrast between his own position and his friend's. He vainly struggled to banish the thought about his wife, and about Natasha and Prince Andrei, but everything began once more to seem insignificant in comparison with eternity, and again the question arose, to what end? Night and day he compelled himself to toil over his monastic labors, hoping to exorcise the demon that hovered near him. At midnight Pierre came from the Countess's apartments to his own low-studded room, which smelled of stale tobacco, and had just sat down at the table in his soiled dressing-gown, and started to finish copying certain original documents from Scotland, when someone came into the room. It was Prince André. "'Oh, it's you, is it?' said Pierre, in an abstracted and not over-cordial manner. "'I was hard at work, you see,' said he, pointing to his copy-book, where he had been working for dear life, just as wretched people, in their efforts to save themselves from the wretchedness of their lives, take up any occupation that comes to hand.' Prince André, his face radiant with joy and kindled with new life, came and stood in front of Pierre, and, not perceiving how wretched his friend was, smiled down on him with the egotism of happiness. "'Well, my dear,' said he, "'last evening I wanted to tell you something, and now I have come to unbosom myself. It is something wholly unprecedented in my experience. I am in love, my dear fellow.' Pierre suddenly drew a deep sigh, 
and stretched his clumsy form out on the sofa near Prince Andrei. "'With Natasha Rostova? Yes?' said he. "'Yes, yes, who else could it be? I should never have believed it, but this feeling is stronger than I. Last evening I was tortured, I was miserable, but this torture I would not exchange for anything in the world. I have never lived till now. Only now do I live, and I cannot live without her. But can she love me? I am too old for her.' What should you say? I? I? What could I say? suddenly exclaimed Pierre, springing up and beginning to pace the room. I have always thought. This girl is such a treasure, such a... She is a rare maiden, my dear fellow. I beseech you, don't reason about it. Don't let doubts arise, but marry her. Marry her. Yes, marry her. And I am convinced that you will be the happiest man alive. But how about her? She loves you. Don't talk nonsense, said Prince Andrei with a smile, and looking straight into Pierre's eyes. She loves you. I know she does, cried Pierre bluntly. Now listen, said Prince Andrei, holding him by his arm. Do you know what position I am in? I must tell someone all about it. Well, well, go on. I am very glad, said Pierre, and in reality his face had changed. The frown had smoothed itself out, and he listened to Prince Andrei with joyous sympathy. Prince Andrei seemed, and really was, another and wholly new man. Where had vanished his melancholy, his contempt of life, all his disillusion? Pierre was the only man in whose presence he could speak with absolute frankness, and hence he poured out before him the fullness of his heart. Then he fluently and boldly made plans for the future, declaring that he could not think of sacrificing his happiness to his father's caprices, and expressing his hope that his father would consent to their marriage, and would come to love Natasha. Then he expressed his amazement at the strange and uncontrollable feeling which dominated him. "'If any one had predicted the possibility of my being so deeply in love, I should not have believed it,' said Prince Andrei. "'It is an entirely different sentiment from the one that I had formerly. The whole world is divided for me into two portions. The one is where she is, and there all happiness and hope and light are found. The other is where she is not, and there everything is gloom and darkness.' Darkness and gloom, repeated Pierre. Yes, yes, and how I appreciate that. I cannot help loving light, and I am not to blame for it. And I am very happy. Do you understand me? I know that you sympathize with my joy. Yes, indeed, I do, said Pierre earnestly, gazing at his friend with tender, melancholy eyes. Prince Andrei's fate seemed to him all the brighter from the vivid contrast with the darkness of his own. End of chapter 22The old prince received his son's communication with external unconcern, but with wrath in his heart. As his own life was nearing its close, he could not understand how anyone could wish to make such a change in his life, to introduce into it such a new and unknown element. If only they would let me live out my life in my own way, then, when I am gone, they can do as they please, said the old man to himself. With his son, however, he made use of that diplomacy which he employed in matters of serious import. Assuming a tranquil tone, he summed the whole matter up. In the first place, the match was not brilliant, as to the birth, fortune, or distinction of the bride's family. In the second place, Prince Andre was not as young as he had once been, and his health was feeble. The old prince laid a special stress on this, and she was very young. In the third place, he had a son, whom it would be a shame to give over to the mercy of a young stepmother. In the fourth place, finally, said the father, giving his son an ironical look, I beg of you to postpone the affair for a year. Go abroad, go through a course of treatment, find a good German tutor for Prince Nikolai, and then, if your love, passion, stubbornness, whatever you call it, is as strong as ever, why, marry her." And this is my last word, remember, absolutely my last word, concluded the old prince, 
in a tone that signified that nothing could ever change his mind. Prince Andrei clearly saw that the old prince hoped that either his sentiments or his prospective brides might not withstand the test of a year, or else that he himself, since he was an old man, might die meantime. He, accordingly, determined to obey his father's wishes, to offer himself, and then postpone the wedding for a year. Three weeks after his last call at the Rostovs, Prince Andrei returned to Petersburg. The day following her confidential talk with her mother, Natasha waited anxiously for Bolkonsky, but he did not come. The second day, and the third day, it was precisely the same. Pierre also failed to come, and Natasha, not knowing that the prince had gone to see his father, could not explain his absence. Thus elapsed three weeks. Natasha had no desire to go anywhere, and she wandered like a languid and mournful shadow through the rooms. Evenings she hid herself away from the others and wept, and no longer came to her mother's bedchamber. She frequently flushed, and her temper grew peevish. She had an impression that everybody knew about her disappointment, and was laughing at her and pitying her. This grief, born of pride, added to her misery, all the more from the fact that it was hidden grief. One time she went to the countess and tried to say something, but suddenly burst into tears. Her tears were like those of a child, who had been unjustly punished, and who knows not why. The countess tried to calm her, but the young girl, though she at first began to listen, suddenly interrupted her. "'Do stop, mamma. I do not even think of him. He came, and then he stopped coming. He stopped coming, that's all.' Her voice faltered. She almost wept but she controlled herself and went on. I haven't any desire at all to be married, and I have been afraid of him all the time. I'm perfectly content now, perfectly content. On the day following this conversation, Natasha put on an old dress for which she had an especially tender feeling, owing to the gay times which she had enjoyed when wearing it in days past, and from that morning she once more resumed the occupations that she had dropped since the time of the ball. After she had drunk her tea, she went into the ballroom, which she liked on account of its powerful resonance, and began to practice her solfeggi and other exercises. After she had finished her lesson, she stood in the middle of the room and repeated a single musical phrase which pleased her more than others. She joyfully listened to the charming and apparently unexpected way in which those notes reverberated through the empty spaces of the ballroom, and slowly died away, and suddenly her heart grew lighter. What is the use of thinking so much about it all? It is good as it is, she said to herself, and she began to pace up and down the room, not content with simply walking along the echoing inlaid floor, but at every step, she wore her favorite new slippers, setting her little heels down first and then her toes, and finding no more enjoyment in the sounds of her voice than in the regular clapping of the heel and the creaking of the toe. As she passed the mirror, she glanced into it. What a girl I am! The expression of her face, as she caught sight of the reflection in the glass, seemed to say, "'It's all good. I need no one.' A lackey was on the point of coming in to make some arrangements in the ballroom, but she sent him away, closing the door after him, and then continued her walk. Now again, this morning, she resumed her former favorite habit of loving and admiring her own sweet self. "'How charming this Natasha is,' she was saying, as though the words were spoken by some third person." the man of her imagination. Pretty, a good voice, young, and she does not interfere with any one. only leave her in peace. But even if she had been left in peace, she could not have been calm, and of this she was immediately made aware. The front door into the vestibule was opened, and someone asked, Are they at home? And then a man's steps were heard. Natasha was gazing into the mirror, but she did not see herself. She heard voices in the vestibule, when her face again cleared itself before her eyes, she was pale. It was he. She was sure of it, though she could barely distinguish the voices through the closed doors. Pale and frightened, Natasha ran into the drawing-room. "'Mama, Bolkonsky has come,' she cried. "'Mama, this is dreadful. This is unendurable. I will not be tortured so. What shall I do?' The countess had not time to answer a word when Prince André, with a grave and anxious face, was shown in. As soon as he caught sight of Natasha, a flash of joy lighted it. He kissed the countess's hand, and Natasha's, and took a seat near the sofa. "'It is a long time since we have had the pleasure,' the countess began to say, 
but Prince Andrei interrupted her. He answered her implied question and was evidently anxious to speak what was on his mind as soon as possible. I have not been to see you all this time for the reason that I went to confer with my father. I only returned yesterday evening, he said, glancing at Natasha. I should like to have a little conversation with you, Countess, he added, after a moment's silence. The Countess, drawing a long sigh, dropped her eyes. I am at your service, she murmured. Natasha knew that it was her duty to leave the room, but she found it impossible to stir. Something choked her, and she stared at Prince Andrei, almost rudely, with wide eyes. What? So soon? This very moment? No, it cannot be, she said to herself. He again looked at her, and this glance told her that beyond a peradventure she was not deceived. Yes, her fate was to be decided instantly, that moment, then and there. Go, Natasha, I will send for you, whispered the countess. Natasha, with startled, pleading eyes, looked at her mother and at Prince Andrei, and left the room. I have come, countess, to ask your daughter's hand, said Prince Andrei. The countess's face flushed, but she said nothing. Your proposal, began the countess gravely. Prince Andrei waited and looked into her eyes. Your proposal, she grew confused, is very pleasing to us, and... And I accept, accept your proposal with pleasure, and my husband... I hope, but it will depend upon herself. I will ask her as soon as I receive your permission. Will you grant it? said Prince Andrei. Yes, said the countess, and she offered him her hand, and, with a mixed feeling of alienation and affection, touched his brow with her lips as he bent over her hand. She was ready to love him as a son, but she was conscious that he held her at a distance and filled her with a sort of terror. I am sure that my husband will give his consent, said the countess, but your Batyushka, my father, to whom I have confided my plans, has consented, on the express stipulation that the wedding should not take place within a year, and this was the very thing that I wished to tell you, said Prince Andrei. It is true that Natasha is still young, but a year is a long time. There is no alternative, said Prince Andrei, with a sigh. I will send her to you, said the countess, and she left the room. Lord, have mercy upon us, she repeated over and over as she went in search of her daughter. Sonya said that Natasha was in her chamber. She found her sitting on her bed, pale, with dry eyes, gazing at the holy pictures, and swiftly crossing herself and whispering unintelligible words. When she saw her mother, she jumped up and rushed to her. What? Mama, what is it? Go, go to him. He has proposed for your hand, said the countess coldly. So it seemed to Natasha. Go, go, reiterated the mother, drawing a long sigh and looking with melancholy, reproachful eyes after her daughter as she flew out of the room. Natasha could not have told, for the life of her, how she found herself in the drawing-room, but as she went into the room and caught sight of him, she stopped short. Can it be that this stranger is now all in all to me? she asked herself, and the reply came like a flash. Yes, he alone is dearer to me than all in the world. Prince Andrei went to her with downcast eyes. I have loved you from the first moment that I saw you. May I dare to hope? He looked at her, and the grave passion expressed in his face filled her with wonder. Her eyes replied, Why should you ask? Why should you doubt what you must surely know? Why should you speak when it is impossible, with words, to express what you feel? She drew near to him and paused. He took her hand and kissed it. Do you love me? Yes, yes, exclaimed Natasha, with something that seemed almost like vexation, and catching her breath more and more frequently, she began to sob. What is it? What is the matter? Ah, oh, I am so happy, she replied, smiling through her tears and coming closer to him. She hesitated for a moment, as though asking if it were permissible, and then kissed him. Prince Andrei held her hand and gazed into her eyes, and failed to find in his heart his former love for her. A sudden transformation seemed to have taken place in his soul. There was none of that former poetical and mysterious charm of longing, but there was a feeling akin to pity for her weakness, as a woman, as a child. 
There was a shade of fear in presence of her utter self-renunciation and her fearless honesty, a solemn and, at the same time, blissful consciousness of the obligation which forever bound him to her. The present feeling, though it was not so bright and poetical as the former, was more deep and powerful. "'Has your mamma told you that our marriage cannot be until a year has passed?' asked Prince André, continuing to gaze into her eyes. "'Can it be that this is the little silly chit of a girl, as they all say of me?' mused Natasha. "'Can it be that from this time forth I am the wife, the equal, of this stranger, this gentle, learned man, whom even my father regards with admiration? Can it be true that now, henceforth, life has become serious, that now I am grown up, that now I shall be responsible for every word and deed? Yes, but what was that he asked me? No, she said aloud, but she did not know what he had asked her. Forgive me, said Prince André, but you are so young, and I have already had such long experience of life. I tremble for you. You do not know yourself. Natasha, with concentrated attention, listened to what he said, and did her best to take in the full meaning of his words, but it was impossible. How hard this year will be for me, deferring my happiness, pursued Prince André. But during that time you will have to make sure of your own heart— at the end of the year, I shall ask you to make me happy, but you are free. Our betrothal shall remain a secret, and if you should discover that you do not love me, if you should love, said Prince André, with a forced and unnatural smile. Why do you say that? asked Natasha, interrupting him. You know that from the very first day that you came to Otranoya, I loved you, she said, firmly convinced that she was telling the truth. In a year you will have learned to know yourself. A whole year, suddenly exclaimed Natasha, it now suddenly for the first time dawning upon her that the wedding was to be postponed. And why a year? Why a year? Prince Andrei began to explain the reasons for this postponement. Natasha refused to listen to him. And is there no other way of doing? she asked. Prince Andrei made no answer, but the expression of his face told her how unalterable his decision was. "'This is terrible! No! This is terrible! Terrible!' suddenly exclaimed Natasha, and again she began to sob. "'I shall die if I have to wait a year. It cannot be! It is dreadful!' She looked into her lover's face and saw that it was full of sympathy and perplexity. "'No!' "'No, I, I will do everything you wish,' she said, suddenly ceasing to sob. "'I am so happy.' Her father and mother came into the room and congratulated the affianced pair. From that day forth, Prince Andrei began to visit the Rostovs as Natasha's accepted husband. End of chapter 23《Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 24 There was no former betrothal, and Bolkonsky's engagement to Natasha was not made public. Prince Andrei insisted on this point. He said that as he was the cause of the postponement, he ought to bear the whole burden of it. He declared that he considered himself forever bound by his word, but he felt that he ought not to hold Natasha, and he granted her perfect freedom. If, within half a year, she should discover that she did not love him, she should have perfect right to break the engagement. Of course, neither the parents nor Natasha would hear to this, but Prince Andrei pressed the matter. Prince Andrei was at the Rostovs every day, but he did not treat Natasha with the familiarity of the zunich, or bridegroom. He always addressed her by the formal vu, you, and only kissed her hand. Between Prince Andrei and Natasha, after the day of their engagement, there seemed to be an entirely different relationship from before, one closer and more simple. It seemed as though they hitherto had never known each other. Both of them liked to recall how they had seemed at the time when they were nothing to each other. Now they felt that they were entirely different beings. Then everything was pretense. Now it was simple and true. At first the family felt a certain awkwardness in their relations toward Prince Andrei. He seemed like a man from another world, and it took Natasha a long time to train the others to feel used to him, 
and she felt a pride in assuring them all that it was only in appearance that Prince Andrei was so different, and that he was really like everyone else, and that she was not afraid of him, and that no one had any reason to fear him. After some days the family got wanted to him, and felt no awkwardness in going on with the ordinary routine of life in his presence, and he also had a share in it. He could talk with the Count about farming, about wearing apparel with the Countess and Natasha, and about albums and embroidery with Sonya. Sometimes the family, when by themselves, and even in Prince Andrei's presence, marveled that such an event had taken place, that the prognostics of it had been so apparent. Thus, Prince Andrei's visit to Otranoya, and their coming to Petersburg, and the resemblance between Natasha and Prince Andrei, which an old nurse had remarked when he first came to Otranoya, and many other portents of what had happened were recalled by the family. That poetical infestivity and silence, which always marked the presence of an engaged couple, reigned in the house. Oftentimes, when all were together, not a soul would say a word. Sometimes the rest would get up and leave the room, and even then the two young people, though by themselves, would sit in perfect silence as before. They rarely spoke about their future. Prince Andrei avoided it, from dread, as well as from conscientious motives. Natasha shared his feelings, as, indeed, she shared all his feelings, which she was always quick to read. Once, Natasha began to ask him about his little boy. Prince Andrei flushed, as he was apt to do at that time, and Natasha particularly liked it in him, and replied that his son would not live with them. "'Why not?' asked Natasha. "'I could not take him away from his grandfather, and, besides—' "'How I should love him!' exclaimed Natasha, instantly divining his thought. "'But I understand.' You are anxious to avoid any excuse for misunderstandings between us. The old count sometimes came to Prince Andrei, kissed him, and asked him his advice in regard to Petya's education or Nikolai's advancement in the army. The old countess would sigh as she looked at them. Sonya was always afraid that she was in the way and tried to invent excuses for leaving them alone, even when they did not care to be. When Prince Andrei talked, and he was very admirable in conversation, Natasha would listen to him with pride. When she herself spoke, she noticed with fear and joy that he listened to her with attention and scrutinized her keenly. She would ask herself in perplexity, What is he searching for in me? What are his eyes trying to discover? Supposing he were not to find in me what he seeks to find? Occasionally she was attacked by one of those absurd fits of mirth, peculiar to her, and then it was a delight for her to see and hear him laugh. He rarely laughed aloud, but when he did indulge in merriment, he gave himself up entirely to it, and always, after such an experience, she felt that she had grown nearer to him. Natasha would have been perfectly happy if the thought of their parting, which was now near at hand, had not filled her with vague alarm, so much so that she grew pale and chill at the mere thought of it. On the evening before his departure from Petersburg, Prince Andrei brought Pierre, who had not once called at the Rostovs since the evening of the ball. Pierre seemed confused and out of spirits. He devoted all his attention to the countess. Natasha was sitting with Sonya, playing checkers, and this was in itself an invitation for Prince Andrei to join them. He did so. "'You have known Buzakai for a long time, have you not?' he asked. "'Do you like him?' "'Yes, he is a splendid man, but very absurd.' And, as was usually the case when speaking of Pierre, she began to relate anecdotes of his heedlessness, anecdotes, many of which were wholly imaginary as far as he was concerned. "'You know, I have told him our secret,' said Prince Andrei. "'I have known him since we were boys. His heart is true gold. I beg of you, Nathalie,' said he, growing suddenly grave. "'I am going away. God knows what may happen. You may cease to—' "'Well, I know that I ought not to speak of this. One thing, though, in case anything should happen after I am gone—' What could happen? If there should be any misfortune, pursued Prince Andrei, I beg you, Mademoiselle Sophie, if anything should happen, go to him for help and counsel. He may be a most heedless and absurd man, but his heart is the truest gold. Not Natasha's father, or mother, or Sonya, or Prince Andrei himself could have foreseen what an effect parting from her lover would have upon Natasha. Flushed and excited, with burning eyes, she wandered all day long up and down the house, busying herself with the most insignificant things, as though she had no idea of what was going to happen. She did not shed a tear, 
even at the moment when he kissed her hand for the last time and bade her farewell. "'Don't leave me,' was all that she said, but these words were spoken in a voice that caused him to pause and consider whether it was really necessary for him to go away, and which he remembered long afterward. Even after he had gone, she did not weep, but she stayed in her room for many days, not shedding a tear, and she took no interest in anything, and only said from time to time, "'Ugh, why did he go?' But a fortnight after his departure, most unexpectedly to the household, she woke up out of this moral illness, and began to seem the same as formerly, except that her whole moral nature was changed, just as the faces of children change during protracted illness. End of chapter 24「Part three, Chapter twenty five of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter twenty five. Prince Nikolai Andreyevich Bolkonsky's health and disposition had grown much worse during the year that followed his son's absence. He became still more irritable than formerly, and all the explosions of his unreasonable anger were launched upon the Princess Maria. It seemed as though he tried to search out all the tender spots of her nature, so as to torture her as atrociously as possible. The Princess Maria had two passions, and therefore two joys, her little nephew, Nikolushka, and religion, and both were favorite themes for the old prince's slurs and ridicule. Whatever subject of conversation he arose, he managed to bring in some reference to old maid's superstitions, or to the spoiling and overindulging of children. Do you wish to make him— he referred to Nikolushka, an old maid like yourself. It's all nonsense. Prince Andrei wants a son, not a girl, said he. Or, turning to Mademoiselle Burine, he would ask her, in the princess's presence, how she liked our Russian popes and images, and again indulge in his bitter jests. He seized every opportunity of wounding the Princess Maria in the most cruel way, but the poor girl found no trouble in forgiving him. He was her father— and she knew that he loved her, in spite of everything. How, then, could he be to blame toward her? How could he be unjust to her? Yes, and what was justice? That word, justice, a concept, born of nothing but pride, had never occurred to her thoughts. All the complicated laws of men, for her, were summed up in the one clear and simple rule of love and self-denial, imposed upon us by him, who, though he was God, so loved the world as to suffer for it. What mattered to her, then, the justice or injustice of men? It was necessary for her to suffer and to love, and this she did. During the winter, Prince André had come to Luisia Gurie and was more cheerful, gentle, and affectionate than the Princess Maria had seen him for a long time. She had a presentiment that something unusual had happened to him, but he said nothing to her about his love. Before he went away, he was closeted for a long time with his father, and the Princess Maria noticed that each was displeased with the other. Shortly after Prince André's departure, the Princess Maria wrote to her friend, Julie Karagina, who was at that time in Petersburg, and in mourning for her brother, who had been killed in Turkey. Like all young girls, the Princess Maria had her dreams, and one of hers was that Julie would yet become her brother's wife. Affliction, my dear and affectionate friend Julie, is evident in the common lot of all of us. Your loss is so awful that I can only explain it as being a special providence of God, who, in his love for you, has seen fit to try you and your excellent mother. Ah, my dear friend, religion, and religion alone, can, I will not say console us, but save us from despair. Religion alone can make plain to us what, without her aid, it is impossible for a man to comprehend— why, for what purpose, should beings who are good and noble, and best made to find happiness in life, who have not only never injured a living thing, but rather have sought only the happiness of others, why should they be recalled to God, while the base and the vicious, or those who are only a burden to themselves and others, are left to live? The first death which I ever witnessed, and I shall never forget it, was that of my dear sister-in-law, and it produced upon me a wonderful impression— just as you are now asking fate why your charming brother had to die, so did I ask why this angelic Lisa should be taken away, when she had never done the slightest wrong to anyone, and never had anything but the purest thoughts in her soul. 
And since then, my dear friend, five years have passed away, and, even with my humble intelligence, I begin to see clearly why she had to die, and how her death may be regarded as merely the expression of the Creator's infinite goodness, all of whose works, though for the most part beyond our comprehension, are but the manifestation of his boundless love to his creatures. I often think that perhaps her purity was too angelic to be compatible with the force necessary to carry all the obligations of motherhood. As a young wife, she was beyond reproach. Possibly she might have failed as a mother. Now, although she has left us, and Prince André in particular, the purest regret, the sweetest memories, I am sure that she herself is in the enjoyment of that place which I dare not hope for myself to attain. But, not to speak of her exclusively, this premature and terrible death has had a most salutary effect, notwithstanding all the sorrowfulness of it, upon my brother and myself. These thoughts at that time would have been impossible. At that time I should have repelled them with horror. But now this is plain, and beyond a peradventure. I write this to you, my friend, simply hoping that it may persuade you of the gospel truth, which I have taken as the rule of my whole life, that not one hair from our head shall fall without his will, and his will is conditioned only by infinite love toward us, and, therefore, all that happens to us is for good. You ask if we are going to spend next winter in Moscow. In spite of all my desire to see you, I think it most improbable, and, indeed, I cannot think that it is for the best. And you will be amazed when I tell you that the reason of that is Bonaparte. And this is why. My father's health has been failing of late. He cannot endure any contradiction, and has grown irritable. This irritability, as you may know, is especially excited by political affairs. He cannot endure the thought that Bonaparte has so managed as to put himself on an equality with all the sovereigns of Europe, and especially with ours, the grandson of the great Catherine. As you know, I am perfectly indifferent to politics, but from words spoken by my father, and from his discussions with Mikhail Ivanovitch, I know all that is going on in the world, and particularly about all the honors attained by Bonaparte, who, I should think, is considered a great man, and not the least of the French emperors, over all the world, except at Louis Yagure. And this is what my father will not admit. It seems to me that my father, precisely on account of his views of political affairs, and foreseeing the collisions which would infallibly take place, in consequence of his character, taking no account of any one when he expresses his opinions, feels unwilling to go to Moscow. All the gain that he would get, he would more than undo by the quarrels which would be sure to follow in regard to Bonaparte. At all events, the question is soon to be decided. Our home life goes on in the old routine, except that my brother André is away. As I have already written to you, he has been very much changed of late. This year, for the first time since his affliction, he has begun to lead a perfectly normal life. He has become what he was when he was a child as I remember him, kind, affectionate, and with a truly golden heart, the like of which I never knew. He has learned, so it seems to me, that his life, after all, is not yet ended, but together with this moral change his physical health has deteriorated. He is far worse than before, more nervous. I am troubled about him, and I am glad that he has decided to take the trip abroad which the doctor long ago prescribed for him. I hope that it will effect a complete cure. You write me that he is spoken of in Petersburg as one of the most industrious, cultivated, and intelligent young men of the day. Forgive a sister's pride, but I have never doubted it. It is impossible to estimate the good which he has accomplished here, beginning with his own peasantry, and including the nobility of the district. In going to Petersburg he has received only what was due him. I am amazed that rumors should have come from Petersburg to Moscow, and especially such false rumors as what you wrote me in regard to the supposed marriage of my brother to the little Rostova. I do not believe that my brother will ever marry again, and certainly he will not marry her. And this is my reason for thinking so. In the first place, I know that though he rarely mentions his late wife, yet he was too deeply afflicted by her loss to ever think of letting another fill her place in his heart, or giving a stepmother to our little angel. In the second place, to the best of my knowledge, this young girl is not the sort of woman who would be likely to please Prince André. I feel certain that he would not choose her for his wife, and I will frankly confess that I do not desire it. But I have prattled too long, already. Here I am, finishing my second sheet. Good-bye, my dear friend. 
May God shield you under his holy and almighty wing. My dear companion, Mademoiselle Burine, sends her love. Marie. End of chapter 25part three chapter twenty six of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter twenty six in the middle of the summer the princess maria received a letter from her brother from switzerland in which he confided the strange and surprising news of his engagement to natasha his whole letter breathed enthusiastic devotion for his bride and affectionate and trusting love for his sister he wrote that he had never loved as he loved now, and that now only did he realize and understand the meaning of life. He besought his sister to pardon him for not having said anything to her about this at his visit at Luisia Guri, although he had confided his intention to his father. He had not told her because the Princess Maria would have endeavored to persuade their father to grant his request, and if she had failed it would have irritated him, and the whole weight of his displeasure would have come upon her. Moreover, he wrote, the matter is not so definitely settled as it is now. Then my father had set a term of probation, a year, and now already six months have slipped away, half of the designated term, and I remain firmer than ever fixed in my determination. If the doctors had not detained me here at the springs, I should have been back in Russia ere this, but now I must postpone my return for three months longer. You know me and how I am situated in regard to my father. I really need nothing from him." I have been, and shall be always, independent of him, but to act contrary to his wishes, to incur his anger, when, perhaps, he has so short a time to remain among us, would destroy half of my happiness. I have just been writing him a letter in regard to this, and I beg of you, if you can find a favorable moment, give him this letter, and inform me how he receives it, and whether there is any hope that he will consent to shorten the term by three months." After a long period of indecision, doubting, and prayer, the princess handed the letter to her father. The day following, the old prince said to her, without any show of excitement, "'Write to your brother to wait till I'm dead. It won't be long. He'll soon be free.' The princess tried to make some reply, but her father would not hear it, and his voice began to rise higher and higher. "'Mary! Mary! My little dove! Fine family! Clever people! Ha! Rich!' Ha! Yes, a fine stepmother for the little Nikolushka she'll make. Write him that he may marry her tomorrow if he wishes. She'll make a fine stepmother for Nikolushka, and I'll marry Burenka. Ha! 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 So that he may have a stepmother as well. There's one thing, though. There's no room for any more women here. Let him marry and go and live by himself. Perhaps you'd like to go and live with him, said he, turning to the Princess Maria. Go, then, in God's name, through ice and snow. Ice and snow! Ice and snow! After this explosion the old prince said nothing more on that score, but his restrained vexation at his son's weakness was expressed in his treatment of his daughter. And now he had new themes for his sarcasm, in addition to his old ones, namely, stepmothers, and his admiration for Mademoiselle Burine. "'Why should I not marry her?' he asked his daughter." She would make a splendid princess. And the Princess Maria began to notice, with perplexity and amazement, that her father more and more tried to have the Frenchwoman about him as much as possible. The Princess Maria wrote Prince André how their father had received his letter, but she tried to comfort her brother, giving him to hope that her father might be dissuaded from this notion. Nikolushka and his education, André and religion, were the Princess Maria's consolation and delight, but— as every human being must cherish some individual aspiration, so also the Princess Maria had, in the deepest depths of her soul, secret dreams and hopes, which constituted a higher consolation even than the others. This consoling dream and hope was represented to her mind by the men of God, the pilgrims and fanatics, who came to see her without the old prince's knowledge. The longer the Princess Maria lived, and the more experience she got out of life, by carefully observing it, the more she marvelled at the short-sightedness of men who seek here on earth all their enjoyment and delight, who toil and moil, and battle and struggle, and do evil to one another, in order to follow these impossible, shameful phantoms of happiness. Prince André loved his wife. She died. He was all ready to find his happiness in another woman. 
his father objected to this because he desired for his son a more distinguished and wealthy alliance and thus all men struggled and suffered and tortured themselves and risked the loss of their souls their mortal souls for the sake of attaining joys which were merely transitory not only do we know this ourselves but christ the son of god came down to earth and taught us that this life is fleeting a short probation and yet we cling to it always and expect to find happiness in it how is it that no one comprehends this asked the princess maria none except those despised men of god who come to me with wallets on their shoulders climbing the back stairs for fear lest they should meet the prince not to avoid suffering but for the sake of preventing him from committing a sin to forsake family and fatherland and forswear all endeavour to get earthly good to form no ties and to wander under an assumed name in hempen rags from place to place doing no harm to any one and praying for people praying for those who persecute you as well as for those who give you protection there is no truth and no life higher than that there was one pilgrim woman fedosyushka a little gentle pockmarked woman fifty years old who had been for thirty years wandering about the world barefooted and wearing penitential chains the princess maria was especially fond of her once in the solitude of her chamber feebly illumined only by the lampadka or shrine lamp when fedoyushka had been telling her about her experiences the thought that the pilgrim woman had found the only true path of life suddenly came over her with such appealing force that she herself resolved to go on a pilgrimage after fedoyushka had retired to rest the princess maria long pondered the matter in her own mind and at last resolved no matter how unusual it was that it was her duty to make this pilgrimage she confided her resolve only to the monk who was her confessor and the confessor gave the plan his approval under the pretext that she was going to help some pilgrim the princess maria sent and purchased a pilgrim's complete outfit shirt lapti or bast shoes a kafkin and a black kerchief frequently she would go to the curtained commode where she kept them and stand irresolute wondering whether the time had not yet come for her to carry out her vow oftentimes when she heard the stories told by the pilgrims she would be stirred by their simple narratives which to her were full of profound meaning though so mechanically repeated by them till oftentimes she was ready to renounce everything and flee from her home in her imagination she already saw herself and fedoyushka in filthy rags tramping along with staff and birch-bark wallet over the dusty highway rambling about from one saint's shrine to another without envy without the love of her fellows without desires and at the end of all journeying thither where there is no regret and no tears but eternal joy and felicity i shall go to a place where there is a saint i shall pray there but before i get attached to the place or love any one i shall pass on and i shall keep wandering on until my limbs fail under me and then i shall lie down and die anywhere and then at last i shall reach that eternal haven of peace where there is no regret and no sorrow said the princess maria to herself but later when she saw her father and especially the little koko her resolve lost its force she shed a few quiet tears and had the consciousness that she was a sinner she loved her father and her nephew more than god end of chapter twenty six and this is the end of volume two part three volume two part four chapter one of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 1 The biblical tradition tells us that absence of work, idleness, constituted the first man's happiness before the fall. A love for idleness remains just the same, even in fallen man. But the curse still hangs over mankind, and it is impossible for us to be slothful and easy-going, not alone because we are required to earn our bread in the sweat of our brow, but by the very conditions of our moral nature a secret voice warns us that to be idle is for us a sin if it were possible for a man to find a situation where he could feel that he was of use in the world and fulfilling his duty while still remaining idle he would have found one of the conditions of primeval bliss and such a condition of obligatory and irreproachable idleness is enjoyed by a whole class of society the military 
and this state of obligatory and irreproachable idleness has always been and will be the chief attraction of military service nikolai rostof had been enjoying this felicity to the full having continued since eighteen o seven to serve in the pavlograd regiment he was now commander of the squadron of which denisof had been deprived rostof had grown into a rather rough but kindly young fellow whom his moscow acquaintances would have found sufficiently mauvais genre, but who was loved and respected by his comrades his subordinates as well as his superiors and he was well satisfied with his existence latterly in eighteen o nine in letters from home he had found more and more frequent complaints from his mother that their pecuniary affairs were going from bad to worse and that it would be seasonable for him to come home and give his old parents some joy and consolation in reading over these letters nikolai felt a sensation of alarm at the thought of being torn from the condition of life where he found himself so quiet and tranquil far removed from the busy turmoil of society he had a presentiment that sooner or later he should be dragged again into that whirlpool of life with its wasteful expenditure and rearrangement of affairs with its accounts to verify with its quarrels intrigues obligations with the demands of society and with sonya's love and the necessity of an explanation all this was terribly difficult and confused and he answered his mother's letters with cold formality beginning mon cher maman and concluding with votre obéissant fils and studiously refrained from setting any time for his return home in eighteen ten he received a letter from his parents who informed him of the engagement between natasha and bolkonsky and that the wedding was put off for a year on account of the old prince refusing his sanction this news grieved and disgusted nikolai in the first place he was pained at the thought of losing natasha from the household for he was fonder of her than the other members of the family in the second place he was annoyed from his point of view as a hussar that he had not been on hand to make this bolkonsky understand that this alliance was not a very great honor and that if he loved natasha he might have married her even without his scatter-brained father's consent for a moment he almost made up his mind to ask for a leave of absence so as to see natasha before she was married but just then came the army maneuvers he remembered sonya and the various entanglements and once more he postponed it but in the spring of that same year he received a letter from his mother who wrote without the count's knowledge and this letter prompted him to go she wrote that if he did not come and did not assume the management of their affairs their whole property would have to be sold by auction and they would all be thrown upon the world the count was so weak he had so much confidence in Matenka, he was so good-natured and so easily cheated by every one that everything was going from bad to worse for god's sake i beg of you come immediately unless you wish to make me and all the family unhappy wrote the countess this letter had its effect upon nikolai he was possessed of the sound common sense of mediocrity and it told him that this was his duty now it was requisite that he should go on leave of absence if not upon the retired list he could not have explained why he had to go but after his siesta he commanded his roan stallion mars to be saddled he had not been out for a long time and was at any time a terribly fiery steed and when he brought him home all in a lather he explained to lavrushka denisof's man had stayed on with rostof and to his comrades who dropped in that afternoon that he had obtained leave of absence and was going home how hard it was for him to realize that he was going to absent himself from army life the only thing that especially interested him and fail to find whether he had been promoted or granted the anna for the last maneuvers how strange it was to think that he was going away before he had sold that troika or three span of roans to the polish count holuchowski which they had been negotiating about and which rostov had wagered would bring two thousand roubles how impossible to realize that he should miss the ball which the hussars were going to give to the panic pazjeka in order to pique the uhlans who had given a ball to their pane borozhowska he knew that he must leave go away from all this bright pleasant existence and go where everything was trouble and turmoil at the end of a week he was granted his leave of absence his comrades of the hussars not only those of his regiment but the whole brigade gave him a dinner which cost them fifteen roubles a head they had two bands to play and two choruses to sing for them rostov danced the trebaka with major basov the tipsy officers tossed him embraced him and deposited him on the ground again the soldiers of the third squadron once more tossed him 
and cried hurrah. Then they carried him to his sledge and escorted him as far as the first station. As is usually the case, Rostov's thoughts during the first half of his journey, from Kremengchung to Kiev, were retrospective of matters connected with his squadron. But after he had passed the halfway, he began to forget about the Trioka of Rhones, his quartermaster, Dojeviak, and anxious questions began to arise in his mind as to what he should find at Otranoya. The nearer he came to his home, the more powerfully he was affected by his forebodings, as though this mental state were based upon the same law as that of the swiftness of falling bodies being according to the square of the distance. At Odrenoya station, he gave the driver three roubles for vodka, and, all out of breath, rushed up the steps of the old home like a schoolboy. After the first enthusiastic greetings, and after that strange sense of vague disappointment at the reality falling short of expectation, everything is just the same. Why, then, have I hastened so? Nikolai began to become wanted to the old home life again. His father and mother were the same, except that they had grown a trifle older. He detected a peculiar restlessness about them, and sometimes a slight coldness between them, which was a new thing, and which Nikolai, as soon as he discovered it, attributed to the unfortunate condition of their affairs. Sonya was now about twenty years old. She had reached the zenith of her beauty, and gave no promise that she would ever surpass what she already was. Even thus, she was pretty enough." She simply breathed happiness and love from the moment that Nikolai came home, and this maiden's faithful, unfaltering love for him had a delightful effect upon him. Nikolai was more than all surprised at Petya and Natasha. Petya had grown into a tall, handsome, frolicsome, but still intelligent lad of thirteen, whose voice was already beginning to break. It was long before Nikolai could get over his amazement at Natasha, and he said, laughing, as he gazed at her, you're not at all the same person. What? Have I changed for the worse? Quite the contrary. But what dignity, princess, said he in a whisper. Footnote. The point of this lies in his calling her Kinyaginya, the title of a married princess, as Kinyeshkna is that of an unmarried one. End of footnote. Yes, 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 exclaimed Natasha gleefully. Natasha told him her romance with Prince Andrei, and about his visit to Otranoya, and showed him her last letter from him. "'Tell me, are you not glad for me?' she asked. "'I am so calm, so happy now.' "'Yes, very glad,' replied Nikolai. "'He is a splendid man. And are you very much in love with him?' "'How can I tell you?' replied Natasha. "'I was in love with Boris, and with my teacher, and with Denisov, and—but this is not at all the same.' My mind is serene and decided. I know that there is not a better man to be found, and so I feel perfectly calm and happy. It is entirely different from what it used to be. Before. Nikolai expressed to Natasha his dissatisfaction that the wedding was to be postponed a year, but Natasha, with some show of exasperation, contending that it could not have been otherwise, that it would have been disgraceful to force her way into a family against his father's will, and that she herself had insisted upon it. "'You don't in the least, in the least, understand the necessities of the case,' said she. Nikolai said no more, and acquiesced. He often marveled as he looked at her. She was absolutely unlike a girl deeply in love and separated from her betrothed. Her temper was calm and even, and she was as merry as in days gone by. This was a surprise to Nikolai, and even made him look with some incredulity at her engagement with Bolkonsky. He could not make up his mind that her fate was as yet fully decided, the more from the fact that he had not seen Prince André with her. It seemed to him all the time that there was something that was not as it should be in this proposed marriage. Why this postponement? Why are they not formally betrothed? he asked himself. Once, when speaking with his mother about his sister, he found to his surprise, and to a certain degree his satisfaction, that his mother also did not in the depths of her heart feel any great confidence in the engagement. "'This is what he writes,' said she, showing her son a letter which she had received from Prince André, with that secret feeling of discontent which a mother always has toward her daughter's future married happiness. "'He writes that he will not be back before December. What do you suppose can detain him so? It must be he is ill. His health is very delicate. Do not say anything to Natasha.' 
Don't be surprised that she is happy. These are the last days of her girlhood, and I know how it affects her whenever we get a letter from him. However, it is all in God's hands, and all will be well, she concluded, adding as usual, he is a splendid man. End of chapter 1 Part 4, Chapter 2 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 2 The first days after Nikolai's return, he was grave and even depressed. He was tormented by the present necessity of making an investigation into the stupid details of the household economy for which his mother had begged him to come home. On the third day after his return, in order to get this burden from his shoulders as soon as possible, he went, with contracted brows, sternly, and not giving himself time to decide what he was going to do, to the wing where Matenka lived, and demanded of him the accounts of everything. What he meant by the accounts of everything, he had even less of an idea than Matenka, who, nevertheless, was thrown into alarm and perplexity. Matenka's explanations about his accounts were soon finished the starosta of the estate and the starosta of the commune who were waiting in the anteroom listened with terror and satisfaction at first as the young count's voice began to grow fiercer and louder while they could distinguish terrible words of abuse following one upon the other you brigand you ungrateful wretch i'll whip you like a dog you're not dealing with my papenka this time and words of the like import then these men, with no less satisfaction and terror, saw the young count, all flushed and with bloodshot eyes, dragging Matenka by the collar and reinforcing his efforts with very dexterous applications of his knees and feet whenever the pauses between the words gave him a convenient chance, while he cried at the top of his voice, "'Get out of here, you villain! Don't you ever show your face here again!' Matenka flew down the six steps head first and landed in a bed of shrubbery, the shrubbery was a famous place of refuge for delinquents at Otranoya. Matenka himself, when he returned tipsy from town, was wont to hide in it, and many of the inhabitants of Otranoya, trying to get out of Matenka's way, knew the advantages of this place as a refuge. Matenka's wife and her sister, with terror-stricken faces, peered out of the door of the room, where the polished samovar was bubbling, and where the high-post bedstead affected by overseers could be seen, covered with a patchwork quilt. The young count, all out of breath, and giving them no attention, strode by them with resolute steps and went into the house. The countess, who had heard from the maids all that had taken place in the wing, was, in one sense, delighted at the direction which their affairs were now evidently going to take, and in another she was disquieted at the way in which her son had taken hold of the matter. She went several times on tiptoe to his door, and listened as he smoked one pipe after another. The next day the old count called Nikolai to one side, and with a timid smile said, "'But do you know, my dear, you wasted your fire. Matenka has told me all about it.' "'I knew,' thought Nikolai, "'that I should never accomplish anything here, in this idiotic world.' "'You were angry with him because he did not reckon in those seven hundred roubles, but, do you know, they were carried over, and you did not look on the other page.' "'Papenka, he is a scoundrel and a thief.' I know he is, and what I have done, I have done. But if you don't wish it, I won't say anything more to him about it. No, my dear, the Count was also confused. He was conscious that he himself had been a bad administrator of his wife's estate, and that he was guilty toward their children, but he did not know how to set things right. No, I, I beg of you, take charge of our affairs. I am old, I... No, Papenka... Forgive me if I have done anything disagreeable to you. I am less able to attend to it than you are. The devil take these musics and accounts and carryings over, he said to himself. I used to know well enough what quarter stakes on a six at Faro meant, but this carrying over to the next page, I don't know anything about it at all, said he to himself. And from that time forth, he gave no more attention to their pecuniary affairs. Once, however, the countess called her son to her and told him that she had a note of hand given her by Anna Mikhailovna for two thousand roubles, and she asked Nikolai's advice as to what ought to be done about it. "'This is what I think,' replied Nikolai. "'You have told me that I was to decide the question. Well, 
I don't like Anna Mikhailovna, and I don't like Boris, but they have been friends of ours and are poor. This is what we will do, then. And he took the note and tore it in two, and this action made the old countess actually sob with delight. After this, the young Rostov entirely forswore interference with their business matters, and entered with passionate enthusiasm into the delights of hunting with the hounds, for which the old count set him an example on a large scale. End of chapter 2 Part 4, Chapter 3 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 3 Already the wintry frosts had begun, each morning, to chain up the soil, soaked by the autumnal rains. Already there was green only in patches, and these made a vivid contrast against the strips of brownish stubble fields trodden down by the cattle, and the patches of winter and spring wheat, or the russet lines of the buckwheat fields. The forest tree tops, which even as early as the end of August had been green islands amid the black fields of winter wheat and the corn stubble, were now gold and crimson islands amid the fields of bright green wheat. The gray hare had already more than half changed his coat. The foxes were beginning to quit their holes, and young wolves were larger than dogs. It was the very height of the hunting season. The hounds belonging to that eager young huntsman, Rostov, were now in excellent training for their work, but they had been taken out so assiduously that, by the general advice of the whippers in, it had been decided to give them three days' rest, and to set upon the 28th of September for the hunt, at which time they would begin with a certain dense forest where there was a litter of young wolves. Such was the state of affairs on the 26th of September. All that day the hunting train was at home. It had been bitter cold, but toward evening it grew warmer and began to thaw. On the morning of the 27th, when young Rostov went in his dressing-gown to his window, he looked out upon a morning which could not have been better for hunting. The very sky seemed to be melting and flooding out over the earth. There was no sign of a breeze. The only motion in the air was that faint stir of microscopic drops of mist or fog falling from above. On the bare limbs of the park trees, transparent drops hung and fell on the leaves that carpeted the ground. The garden soil had a peculiar black and glistening appearance, like poppy, and within a short distance lost itself under the dim and moist curtain of fog. Nikolai stepped out upon the wet doorsteps, all covered with mud. There was an odor of dying forest vegetation and of dogs. Milka, the black-spotted bitch, with broad hindquarters and big black Google eyes, got up when she saw her master, stretched herself back, and lay down like a hare then unexpectedly leaped up and licked his face and ears. Another dog, a greyhound, seeing his master, came bounding up the garden path, arching his back and impetuously raising his helm, that is, his tail, began to rub around Nikolai's legs. Oh, hoy! rang out at this moment that inimitable huntsman's call, which comprises in itself the deepest bass and the clearest tenor, and around the corner appeared the whipper in and hunter, Danilo, a grizzled, wrinkled man, with his hair cropped, leaving a knob after the fashion of the Ukraina, and carrying a long whip with curling lash. He had that independent expression and scorn for all the world so characteristic of huntsmen. He took off his Circassian cap in his baron's presence and looked at him scornfully. This expression of scorn was not meant to be insulting to the baron. Nikolai knew that, scornful and superior as this Danello seemed to be, he was, nevertheless, his devoted servant and huntsman. Danilo, said Nikolai, with a timid consciousness that in this perfect hunting weather, with these dogs and this huntsman, he was seized by that indefinable passion for hunting which makes a man forget all his former good resolutions like a fond lover in the presence of his mistress. "'What do you please to require, your illustriousness?' asked a deep, Antiphonal bass, horse was shouting at the hounds, and two bright, black eyes gazed out from under the brows at the silent baron. "'Well, and can't you resist?' these two eyes seemed to be asking. "'A fine day, isn't it? A chase and a race, eh?' asked Nikolai, pulling Milka's ears. Danilo said nothing and winked his eyes. "'I sent Uvarka out at sunrise this morning to listen,' said his deep bass, 
after a minute's pause. He says, she's drawn into the Otroneski Zakas, and they're howling there. He meant that a she-wolf, which they both knew about, had gone with her whelps into the Otroneski forest preserves, which was a small detached property about two versts from the house. Well, we must go after them, mustn't we? said Nikolai. Come with Uvarka, will you? Just as you order. See, they are fed, then. All right. In five minutes, Danella and Uvarko were standing in Nikolai's great library. Though Danello was not very tall, the sight of him in the room irresistibly made one think of a horse, or a bear, surrounded by furniture, and the conditions of civilized life. Danilo was himself conscious of this, and, according to his habit, stood as near the door as possible, striving to talk in an unnaturally low tone, and to keep from moving, lest he should break something, and saying what he had to say as rapidly as possible, so as to get out into the open air, under the sky, instead of the ceiling. Having asked the requisite number of questions, and elicited from Danilo, who was fully as anxious himself to go, the information that it would not hurt the dogs any, Nikolai ordered the horses to be saddled. But just as Danilo was on the point of leaving the room, Natasha came hurrying in with swift steps, and not having stopped to do up her hair, or finished dressing, but wearing her nurse's shawl. Petya came running in with her. "'Are you going?' asked Natasha. "'I thought so. Sonya declared that you were not going. I knew that today was such a perfect day that you would have to go.' "'Yes, we're going,' curtly replied Nikolai, who— as he intended to make a serious business of hunting that day, had no wish to take Natasha and Petya. "'We are going, but after wolves only. It won't amuse you.' "'You know that is just what I like best of anything,' said Natasha. "'It's too bad to be going yourself, and have the horses saddled, and never say a word to us.' "'Vain are obstacles to Russians. Come on,' cried Petya. "'Yes, but you can't go.' Mamenka told you that was out of the question, said Nikolai, turning to Natasha. Yes, I am going. I certainly am going, insisted Natasha firmly. Danila, have the saddles put on for us, and have Michaela bring around my leash, said she, addressing the whipper in. It had been trying and uncomfortable for Danilo to be in the confinement of the room, but to receive an order from the young lady seemed incredible. He cast down his eyes and made haste to go, pretending that it did not concern him, and striving not to strike against her in any way. End of chapter 3 Part 4, Chapter 4 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 4 The old count, who had always kept up an immense hunting establishment, had turned it over to his son's management, but on this day, the 27th of September, feeling particularly cheerful, he determined to be of the party. In two hours the whole hunt was gathered at the front doorsteps. Nikolai, with a grave and solemn face, which made it evident that he could not be distracted by trifles, walked right by Natasha and Petya, without heeding what they said to him. He personally inspected everything, sent forward the pack with the huntsmen, mounted his sorrel donuts, and, whistling to the dogs of his own leash, he started off through the threshing-floor into the field that stretched out toward the Otroneski preserves. The old count's steed, a dun-colored gelding named Vifyanka, was in charge of the count's groom. He himself was to ride in his drosky straight to the mooset which he had designated. The whole number of hounds brought together was fifty-four, together with six whippers in and feeders. Beside the gentlemen there were also eight greyhound grooms, followed by more than two score greyhounds, so that with the master's dogs in leash they were, all told, about one hundred and thirty dogs and twenty mounted huntsmen. Each dog knew who his master was and answered to his call. Each man knew his duty, his place, and his work. As soon as they had ridden beyond the hedge, all, without unnecessary noise or talking, galloped smoothly and evenly along the road, and then struck into the fields that led to the Otronetsky preserves. As soon as the horses were out of the beaten track, they made their way across the field, as though it were a carpet of yielding grass, occasionally splashing through pools of water. The misty sky continued the same, and the moisture fell monotonously to the ground. The air was calm, mild, unresonant. Occasionally were heard a huntsman's whistle, 
the snorting of a horse, the crack of the long lash, and the whine of a dog crouching down in his place. After they had ridden about a verst, suddenly out of the fog loomed five more riders with dogs coming to meet the Rostovs. In front of them rode a hale and hearty old man with the heavy grey mustachios. "'Good morning, little uncle,' cried Nikolai, as the old man rode up to him. "'Here's a howdy-do. I was sure of it,' said the old man. He was a neighbour and distant relative of the Rostovs, a landed proprietor of small means. "'I knew it. You could not resist it, and it's good you've come. Here's a howdy-do.' This was a favourite phrase of the old man's. "'Look out for the cover.' Double quick, for my Girchik reports that the Illigans and all their train are at Korniki, and they might, here's a howdy do, might snatch the litter away from under our very noses. That's where I am going. Say, shall we join packs? asked Nikolai. They united all the hounds into one large pack, and the old man, whom Nikolai called Little Uncle, rode along by his side. Natasha, muffled up in shawls, out of which peered her eager face with bright glistening eyes galloped up to them followed by petya and michalo the huntsmen who were her inseparable companions and by a groom who was delighted to attend her petya was full of glee and kept whipping up and hauling in his horse natasha sat firmly and gracefully on her raven black arabchik and reined him in with a practised hand though without force the little uncle looked disapprovingly at petya and natasha he did not believe in combining frivolities with the serious business of hunting. "'Good morning, little uncle. We are going too,' shouted Petya. "'Good morning to you. Good morning. Don't ride the dogs down,' cried the old man severely. "'Nikolenka, what a splendid dog Trunili is. He knew me,' said Natasha, pointing to her favourite greyhound. "'Trunila, in the first place, is not a dog, but a hound,' mused Nikolai and gave his sister a stern glance, trying to make her realize the immense distance that separated them at that moment. Natasha realized it. "'Don't you imagine, little uncle, that we shall be in any one's way,' said Natasha. "'We will stay in our own places and not stir.' "'An excellent idea, little countess,' said the little uncle. "'But mind you, don't fall off your horse,' he added. "'For you see, here's a howdy-do. You've nothing to hold on by.' The island of the Otradnetsky Preserve was now in sight, two or three hundred yards distance, and the cavalcade rode up toward it. Rostov and the little uncle, having definitely decided where they should set in the hounds and show Natasha her post, a place where there was not the slightest chance of anything ever passing, crossed through the ravine into the woods. "'Well, little nephew, stand on solid ground,' said the little uncle. "'Take care not to let her get by.' "'That depends,' replied Rostov. "'Put! Karai!' he cried, by this call answering the old man's words. Karai was an aged, deformed, ugly-faced hound, famous for having once tackled by himself a she-wolf. All got to their posts. The old count, knowing his son's passionate zeal for hunting, had made good time so as not to be behindhand, and the cavalcade had scarcely reached the preserve when Ilya Andreevich, cheerful and ruddy, with shaking cheeks, came jolting across the fields, behind his three black horses, and was set down at the muset which he had selected. Smoothing out his fur shuba, and getting his hunting equipment, he mounted his glossy, vifyanka, fat, kind, and steady, and grey as himself. The horses and the drosky were sent home. Count Ilya Andreevich, although not a keen huntsman at heart, nevertheless was well acquainted with the rules of venery, and he rode off to the edge of the forest gathered up his reins, settled himself in the saddle, and, feeling conscious that he was all ready, glanced around with a smile. Near him stood his valet, an old-fashioned but heavy rider, Semyon Chekmar. Chekmar held in leash three fierce-looking wolfhounds, not less fat and sleek than master and horse. Two dogs, old and intelligent enough to be out of leash, stretched themselves out on the ground. A hundred paces farther along the edge of the forest was stationed the Count's second whipper in, Mitka, a splendid rider and passionate huntsman. The Count, in accordance with time-honoured custom before the hunt began, drank a silver cup full of root brandy, took a snack of lunch, and then drank a half-bottle of his favourite Bordeaux. 
Ilya Andreyitch was a trifle flushed from the wine and the ride. His eyes grew moist, and had a peculiar gleam, and as he sat in his saddle, muffled in his shuba, he had the aspect of a child who has been got ready for a ride. The lean Chekmar, with sunken cheeks, having got things settled to his satisfaction, looked up at his baron, whose inseparable companion he had been for upwards of thirty years, and perceiving that he was in good humour, waited for some pleasant talk. Just then a third person rode up cautiously, evidently the result of careful training, and, coming out from behind the woods, paused not far from the count. This individual was an old man, with a grey beard, in a woman's capote and high collar. This was the buffoon who wore the woman's name, Natasha Ivanovna. "'Well, Natasha Ivanovna,' said the old count to him, in a whisper, and giving him a wink, "'if you should dare to scare away the brute, Danila will give it to you.' "'I can defend myself,' said Natasha Ivanovna. "'Sh-sh-sh-sh!' Sh, 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 hissed the count, and, turning to Semyon, he asked, "'Have you seen Natalia Ilyanichna? Where is she?' "'She and Peter Ilyich were stationed in the high grass, near Zorovo,' replied Semyon, with a smile." She's a lady, but she's going to have a great hunt all the same. And aren't you surprised, Semyon, to see how she rides, eh? asked the Count. She rides as well as a man. Of course I'm surprised. Such daring, such skill. And where is Nikolashka? On Lyadovo Hill, I suppose, asked the Count, in a whisper. That's where he is. He knows well enough where the best places are. And he rides so cleverly, too. Danila and I were thunderstruck at him the other day, replied Semyon, knowing what would please the Count. He rides well, does he? Eh? Fine fellow on a horse, is he? Eh? Like a picture. How he run that fox t'other day out of the steppe at Zavazino. How he did gallop out of the woods. T'was a caution. Horse worth a thousand, but the rider beyond price. T'would be a hard job to find such another young fellow. It would indeed, interposed the Count, regretting that Semyon did not spin his story out longer. T'would be a hard job, would it? Turning back the flap of his shubka and searching for his snuff-box. Then the other day, coming out of mass, in all his regalia, when Mikhail to Sudoruich, but Semyon did not conclude his sentence, having distinctly heard, owing to the stillness of the atmosphere, the howling of a hound or two, signifying that the hunt was on. He bent down his head and listened, and gave a warning gesture to his baron. "'They are after the whelps,' he whispered. "'They are making straight for Ladovskaya. The Count, with a smile still lingering on his lips, gazed into the distance, along the dyke, and held the snuff-box in his hand, forgetting to take a pinch. Instantly, following the baying of the hounds, came the signal that the wolf was found, sounded on Danello's heavy horn. Then the pack united their voices with those of the first three hounds, and then they could hear the hounds breaking in across the ravine, with that peculiar howl which is the sign to the huntsmen that they have discovered the wolf. The riders had not yet begun to egg on the dogs, but were uttering the ululu, and louder than all rang out Danilo's voice, now in bass, now in piercing shrill notes. It seemed as though his voice filled the whole forest, and burst out beyond the forest bounds, and rang far over the fields. After listening for a number of seconds in silence, the Count and his groom were convinced that the hunt had divided into two packs. The larger half, vehemently giving tongue, were driving farther afield. The other pack were rushing along the forest, past the Count, while behind them was heard Danello's Yuliuyu. The sounds mingled and melted together, but seemed to be growing fainter in the distance. Semyon sighed, and stooped down to disentangle his leash, a young puppy having got the cords mixed up. The Count also sighed, and noticing that he had his snuff-box still in his hand, opened it and took out a pinch of snuff. "'Back!' cried Semyon to the young hound, who was trying to make for the woods. The Count was startled, and dropped his snuff-box. Natasha Ivanovna dismounted, and was just on the point of picking it up. The Count and Semyon were looking at him, Suddenly, as often happens, the sounds of the hunt came nearer, and it seemed as though the baying mouths of the dogs and Danello's Yuluyu were directly upon them. The Count looked round, and at his right saw Mitka, who with starting eyes was staring at him, and, lifting his cap, 
directed his attention in front of him to the other side. "'Look out!' he shouted, in such a voice that it was evident that this word had been for some time painfully struggling to escape. And, letting loose his leash, he dashed in the Count's direction. The Count and Semyon sprang out from the cover, and saw at their left a wolf swinging easily along, with a noiseless lope, making for the very cover where they had been in hiding. The ferocious dogs yelped, and tearing themselves free from the leash, flung themselves after the wolf, almost under the legs of the horses. The wolf paused in his course, awkwardly, like one suffering with the quinsy, turned his head, with its wide forehead, in the direction of the dogs, and then again, with the same easy, waddling gait, gave one spring, and then another, and shaking his stump, tail, disappeared in the cover. At the same instant, with a roar that rather resembled a whine, from the opposite edge of the forest, appeared first one, then a second, then a third hound, and then the whole pack came pouring out into the field in the very track by which the wolf had sneaked away and escaped. On the heels of the hounds appeared Danello's horse, all black with sweat, breaking through the hazel bushes. Over his long back, bending forward and doubled up like a ball, sat Danilo, hatless, with his grey hair dishevelled and falling around his sweaty face. Uliu liu liu, uliu liu, he was shouting. When he saw the count, his eyes flashed fire. You sh he began, menacing the count with his upraised whip handle. You've lost that wolf. What hunters! And as though scorning to have further conversation with the confused and startled count, he gave the wet flank of his chestnut stallion the wrathful blow which had been directed against the count, and dashed after the hounds. The count, like one who had been chastened, remained motionless, and looking around with a scared smile, was going to try to gather sympathy for his situation from Semyon. But Semyon had disappeared. He was riding in and out of the bushes, trying to start up the wolf from the thicket. The masters of the greyhounds were also beating up the brute from all sides. But the wolf had made his way into the bushes, and not a single hunter got sight of him. End of chapter 4part four chapter five of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter five nikolai rostov meantime had not left his post and was anxiously expecting the brute by the near and more distant sounds of the hunt by the baying of the hounds whose voices he could distinguish by the shouts of the whippers in advancing and retreating he had an idea of what was going on in the island he knew that the island sheltered growing and full-grown wolves, that is, old wolves and their whelps. He knew that the hounds had divided into two packs, that in one place they were on the right scent, and that elsewhere they had met with bad luck. He expected each second to see the beast making in his direction. He made a thousand different conjectures as to which side the brute would come out, and how he should attack him. His heart was filled with mingled hope and despair. Several times he offered up a prayer to God that the wolf might come in his way. He prayed with that sense of passionate anxiety with which men are wont to pray under the influence of some powerful excitement, even though it may be due to the most trivial cause. Now what would it be to thee, he said in his prayer, to do this for me? I know that thou art mighty, and that it is a sin to ask thee for such a thing, but for God's sake let an old full-grown wolf come my way and let Karai get a death-clutch on her throat, in sight of the little uncle, who keeps glancing over in this direction. A thousand times during that half-hour Rostov swept his eyes eagerly, restlessly, and with stubborn purpose, around that thicket of forest, where two mighty oaks looked down upon the aspen underbrush, and at the ravine with its gullied banks, and at the little uncle's cap just visible underneath the bushes on the right. No, I shan't have this luck, thought Rostov. But how jolly it would be! No hope. Always the same bad luck with me at cards, and in war, and everywhere. Austerlitz and Dolokhov, in vivid but swift alternation, flashed through his mind. If I could only just once in my life run down a full-grown wolf, that is all that I would ask for, he said to himself, straining his ears and his eyes, as his gaze swept the thicket from right to left, 
and as he tried to distinguish the slightest variation in the noise of the hunt then again he glanced to the right and beheld something swiftly moving across the open field in his direction no it is impossible thought rostof with a heavy sigh as a man sighs when what he has been long looking forward to is practically accomplished and here the greatest piece of good fortune was accomplishing so simple so noiselessly so undemonstratively without a sign rostof could not believe his eyes and this incredulity lasted more than a second the wolf came running forward and leaped clumsily over the ravine that lay across his path it was an aged brute with a gray back and a clearly marked russet belly he ran along at no great speed evidently convinced that no one could see him rostof not daring to breathe glanced at his dogs they were lying down or standing up all around but had not yet discovered the wolf or realized what was going on old karai bending his head back and showing his yellow teeth occasionally snapping them together was making a spiteful search for a flea on his haunch uliu liu liu whispered rostof thrusting out his lips the dogs shaking their chains and pricking up their ears sprang to their feet karai ceased his flea hunting and got up cocking his ears and slightly wagging his tail on which still hung a few shreds of hair shall i let him loose yet or not queried rostof while the wolf was making in his direction and steadily increasing his distance from the woods suddenly the wolf's whole appearance underwent a change a thrill ran over him at the sight of what he had never probably experienced before a pair of human eyes fixed upon him and slightly raising his head towards the huntsman he paused back or forward eh it's all the same forward we'll see he seemed to say to himself and without looking around he dashed ahead with occasional leaps easy and long but decided uliuliu cried nikolai in a voice that sounded not his own his good steed of her own accord bore him forward down the slope leaping the ravine to cut off the wolf and still swifter entirely outstripping her rushed the hounds nikolai did not hear his own shout was not conscious of the pace at which he was riding saw neither the dogs nor the ground over which he was carried saw only the wolf which quickening his speed bounded on without swerving in the direction of the ravine the black spotted wide haunched milka was the first to get close to the wild beast nearer nearer she seemed to press there she leaps upon him but the wolf swerved a trifle toward her and instead of attacking as was usually the case with her milka suddenly raising her tail came to a point uliuliuliuliu cried nikolai the red uibem leaped beyond milka impetuously flung himself on the wolf and gripped him by the haunch but at the same instant overcome by panic he sprang to one side the wolf crouched down clapping his teeth together then sprang up again and bounded forward followed at an arshan's distance by all the hounds though they avoided getting closer he'll escape no that's impossible mused nikolai continuing to shout in a hoarse voice karai uliuliu he screamed trying to make out where the old wolfhound was he now was his only reliance karai with all the strength left him by his advanced age bounding forward looking at the wolf from the corner of his eyes was running heavily side by side with the brute trying to get in front of him but owing to the swiftness of the wolf and the comparative slowness of the hound it was evident that karai's calculation was to be mistaken nikolai now began to see the forest in front of him which if the wolf succeeded in reaching it would probably prove his safety just then in front of them a pack of dogs and a huntsman came in sight dashing almost directly toward him here again was a hope a dark brown young dog with a long body belonging to a kennel unknown to rostof was flying eagerly forward directly toward the wolf and quite upset him the wolf swiftly and most unexpectedly sprang up and threw himself upon the dark brown hound chattered his teeth and the hound covered with blood from a great gash in his side with a pitiful howl beat his head on the ground karyushka oh heavens mourned nikolai the old hound with the tufts of hair flying out from his haunches had taken advantage of the pause that had been made to block the wolf's path and was now within five paces of him the wolf 
apparently conscious of the peril, looked out of the corner of his eye at Karai, put his stump of a tail as far as possible under his legs, and went off at a mighty bound. But at this instant, Nikolai simply saw that something extraordinary happened to the dog. Karai, quick as a flash, was on the wolf's back, and the two were rolling heels over head down into the ravine in front of them. The moment that Nikolai caught sight of the dog and the wolf rolling at the bottom of the ravine, in one indiscriminate mass, out of which could be resolved the wolf's grey hide, his hind legs stretched out, and his face scarred and panting, with laid-back ears, Karai still held him by the gorge, the minute that Nikolai saw this was the happiest moment of his whole life. He was just grasping the saddle-bow to dismount and give the wolf his finishing stroke, when suddenly, from out of that mass of dogs, the brute's head was extended, then his forepaws were laid on the edge of the ravine. The wolf chattered his teeth. Karai had now let go of his gullet, gave a mighty leap with his hind legs, and, flirting his tail, again got his distance from the dogs, and was off at full speed. Karai, with bristling hair, apparently either bruised or wounded, crawled painfully out of the ravine. "'My God, what does it mean?' cried Nikolai, in despair. The little uncle's whipper in started from the other side to cut off the wolf's course, and his dogs again brought the wolf to bay. Again they gathered round him. Nikolai, his whipper in, the little uncle, and his huntsmen circled around the wolf, crying their uliu liu and screaming to the dogs, at each minute, whenever the wolf sat up on his haunches, expecting to dismount, and each time dashing forward, whenever the wolf shook himself free, and tried to dash toward the thicket, which was his only salvation. At the very beginning of this wolf-baiting scene, Danilo, hearing the hunter's uliu came galloping along the edge of the forest. He got there in time to see Karai grapple with the wolf, and he pulled in his horse, expecting to see that the game was finished. But when the huntsman did not dismount, and the wolf shook himself and made off, Danilo spurred on his chestnut, not indeed at the wolf, but in a straight line toward the thicket, in the same way as Karai had done, so as to intercept the beast. Danilo galloped forward silently, holding an unsheathed dagger in his left hand, and like a flail fell the strokes of his whip on his chestnut's laboring sides. Nikolai had not seen or heard Danilo until his heavy panting steed dashed by, and then he heard the sound of a falling body, and saw that Danilo had flung himself into the midst of the dogs, back of the wolf, and was trying to clutch him by the ears. It was manifest now for the dogs, and for the huntsmen, and for the wolf, even, that all was over. The wild beast, timidly laying back his ears, was struggling to gather himself up once more, but the dogs formed a ring round him. Danilo, reaching forward, made a staggering step, and with all his weight threw himself upon the wolf, as though he were lying down to rest, and seized him by the ears. Nikolai was going to stab him, but Danilo muttered, "'Don't do it. We'll gag him.' And, changing his position, he placed his foot on the wolf's neck. Then they put a stake into the wolf's jaws, fastened him as though they were getting him into a leash, tied his legs, and Danilo twice rolled the brute over and over." With weary but happy faces, they lifted the live, full-grown wolf on the shying and whinnying horse, and accompanied by the dogs, all yelping at him, they took him to the place of general rendezvous. All came together and began to examine the wolf, which, with his great broad-browed head hanging down with a stake in his chops, glared from his great glassy eyes at all the throng of dogs and men surrounding him. When he was touched, he would draw together his helpless paws, and glare fiercely, and at the same time steadily, at them all. Count Ilya Andreyitch also came riding up, and had a look at the wolf. "'Oh, rather an old one,' said he. "'Full-grown, eh?' he asked Danilo, who stood near him. "'Indeed he is, your illustriousness,' replied Danilo, respectfully taking off his cap. The Count remembered the wolf which had got past him, and his encounter with Danilo. "'Still, my boy, you were in a bad temper,' said the Count." Danilo made no reply, and merely smiled, with embarrassment, a childishly sweet and pleasant smile. End of chapter 5 Part 4, Chapter 6 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 6 The old count rode off. 
Natasha and Petya promised to follow immediately. The hunt went farther, as it was still early in the day. Toward noon they sent the hounds into a dell, grown up with a dense young forest. Nikolai, taking his position on the hillside, could overlook all his huntsmen. On the other side from Nikolai were fields, and there his whipper in had taken his post alone, in a pit behind a hazel copse. As soon as the dogs were slipped, Nikolai heard the sharp yelp of one of his favorite dogs, Volthorn. The other hounds also gave tongue, now ceasing, and then again taking up the cry. In a minute, from the forest, the cry to Fox was heard, and the whole pack rushed off pell-mell towards the open, in the direction of the field, and away from Nikolai. He saw the dog-feeders, in their red caps, dashing off along the edge of the overgrown dell. He saw also the dogs, and every instant he expected the fox to show himself in that direction on the field. The huntsman stationed in the pit gave a start, and let loose the dogs, and then Nikolai saw a strange-looking red fox crouching down, and hurriedly making across the field with rumpled brush. The dogs began to close in on her. Then, as soon as they came close to her, lo, the fox began to dodge about among them, in circular wise, making the circles ever shorter and shorter, and sweeping her furry brush, which the hunters call turba, a trumpet, around her. And then, lo, one, a white dog, flies at her, and this one is followed by a black dog, and then all is mingled in confusion, and the dogs, as they stand, scarcely swerving, make a sort of star, all their tails pointed outwards. A couple of huntsmen gallop up toward the dogs, one in a red cap, the other a stranger in a green caftan. "'What can that mean?' queried Nikolai. "'Where did the huntsman come from? It's not one of little uncles.' The men dispatched the fox, and stood for a long time, without mounting or tying her to the straps. Nearby, with projecting saddles, stood their horses, which they held by the bridle, and the dogs threw themselves down. The huntsmen were gesticulating and disputing over the fox. Then there rang out the sound of a bugle, the conventional signal of a dispute. "'That's one of Elegan's hunters, and he's quarreling with our Ivan about something,' said Nikolai's whipper in. Nikolai sent the man to fetch his sister and Petya, and they rode slowly at a foot-pace to the place where the dog-feeders had collected the hounds. Several huntsmen were galloping up to the scene of the dispute. Nikolai dismounted and stood near the hounds with Natasha and Petya, who had now come up, and waited till word should be brought as to the issue of the dispute. From out behind the skirt of the forest came the quarrelsome huntsman, with the fox at his saddle-straps, and galloped up to his young baron. While still at a distance he took off his cap and tried to speak respectfully, but he was pale and out of breath, and his face was distorted with rage. One of his eyes was blacked, but he was apparently unconscious of the fact. "'What was the matter with you there?' asked Nikolai. "'What do you suppose? He would be after snatching it away from among our hounds. And it was my mouse-coloured bitch, too, that had grabbed her. Come now, decide. He tried to get away our fox. Now I'll have a whack at his foxes. Here she is, on the saddle-straps. Or would you like a taste of this? pointing to his dagger, and evidently imagining that he was still talking with his enemy. Nikolai, not stopping to discuss the matter with the huntsman, told his sister and Petya to wait for him, and rode off to the place where the rival hunt of the Elegans was collected. The victorious huntsman joined the throng of whippers in, and there, surrounded by his sympathetic admirers, he related his exploit. The truth of the matter was that Elegan, with whom the Rostovs had, in days gone by, had some disputes, as well as lawsuits, was hunting in places usually preempted by the Rostovs, and, on this occasion, he had apparently given special orders to go to the island where the Rostovs were hunting, and allowed his whippers in to snatch the game from his rival's dog. Nikolai had never seen Elegan, but, as was always the case, knowing no halfway in his judgments and feelings, and believing certain reports of the violence and arbitrary conduct of this proprietor, he hated him with all his heart, and considered him his worst enemy. He now rode up to him, full of angry emotions, and firmly grasping his long whip, ready for the most decisive and risky proceedings against his enemy. He had just ridden up, to a jut of the forest, when he saw riding in his direction a portly gentleman, in a beaver cap, on a handsome raven-black steed, and accompanied by two huntsmen. 
instead of an enemy nikolai found elegan a well-bred representative baron who manifested a special desire to make the young count's acquaintance riding up to rostof elegan raised his beaver cap and declared that he was very sorry for what had taken place that he had commanded the huntsman who had permitted himself to trespass on another's preserve to be punished he craved the count's acquiescence and invited him to hunt on his grounds natasha apprehensive lest her brother might do something terrible came up with great anxiety and drew up at a little distance behind him when she saw that the rivals were greeting each other with friendly courtesy she joined them elegan lifted his beaver cap still higher as he saw natasha and with a pleasant smile said that the countess resembled diana both by her passion for hunting and by her beauty of which he had heard many reports elegan in order to smooth over his huntsman's indiscretion pressingly urged rostof to go to a steep hillside of his about a verst away which he kept for his own private use and which on his word was swarming with hares nikolai consented and the hunting party doubled in numbers swept on their way in order to reach elegan's preserve they had to strike across country the huntsmen made common cause the gentlemen rode together the little uncle rostof elegan each stealthily examined the dogs of the other striving not to let the others remark it and anxiously searched for possible rivals among the dogs of the others rostof was especially struck by the beauty of a small thoroughbred young slut spotted with red and rather slender with muscles like steel with a delicate little muzzle and with prominent black eyes she belonged to elegan's pack he had heard of the rarity of elegan's dogs and in this pretty little dog he recognized a rival to his milka in the midst of a sedate conversation about the crops of the current year which elegan had started nikolai called his attention to this little spotted slut that's a lovely little slut you have he said in a careless tone full of metal that one yes that's one good dog she's a hunter replied elegan speaking with affected indifference of his red-spotted yorza for which he had paid a neighbor the year before three families of household serfs you didn't have much of a yield of grain either did you he asked resuming the conversation that he had begun and then considering it no more than fair to mollify the young count in the same way elegan looked at his dogs and picking out milka whose breath of beam first attracted his attention he asked that black-spotted slut of yours is a handsome one too well worth having said he yes pretty good full of go replied nikolai if only an old gray hare would start across that field i would show you what kind of a dog she is he thought and turning to one of his huntsmen he said he would give a rouble if he would find a hare on his form that is hiding in his nest i cannot understand pursued elegan how it is that other sportsmen can be jealous of other men's game and dogs i will tell you how it is with me count i enjoy going out to hunt you see you are apt to fall in with pleasant company like this for what could be better he took off his beaver cap again to natasha but as for merely counting the pelts that's a matter of indifference to me that's a fact or why should it trouble me that some other dog and not mine got on the scent first i get just as much sport from looking on at the course don't you count so i judge just at this time was heard the long halloo a tout yavoua from one of the greyhound keepers who had been set on the watch he was standing halfway down the slope on a hillock with his whip upraised and again he uttered the long drawn a tout yavoua this halloo and the upraised whipstock signaled that he had caught sight of a crouching hare on the scent i imagine said elegan carelessly what say you count shall we give him a run yes we must be after him certainly all together shall we not replied nikolai glancing at yorza and the little uncle's red rugai the two rivals against which he had never as yet had a chance to pit his own dogs now what if they get my milka by the ears he thought to himself as side by side with the little uncle and elegan he galloped off toward the hare a full-grown fellow isn't he asked elegan as they came up to the hunter who had discovered him and not without anxiety whistling to his yorza and you mikhail nikonovitch he asked turning to the little uncle the little uncle came up with a frown why should i meddle it's your game here's a howdy do why your dogs cost a whole village thousand rouble dogs 
You two match yours, and I will look on. Rugai? Na, na, he cried. Rugaiushka, he added, involuntarily expressing by this endearing diminutive the hope that he placed upon his red hound. Natasha could see and feel the excitement which these two old men and her brother tried vainly to conceal, and she herself was even more excited. The hunter on the hillock still stood with upraised whipstock. The gentleman approached him at a footpace. The harriers, coming up to the same horizon, dashed off in the direction of the hare. The hunters, but not the gentleman, also hastened after them. The whole movement was made slowly and in due form. "'Which way is he heading?' asked Nikolai, coming within a hundred paces of the hunter who had discovered him. But the beater had no time to reply, ere the grey hare, scenting the frost of the morning to come, was up and out. The harriers, still in leash, dashed with a howl down the slope after the hare. From all sides, the greyhounds, unleashed, dashed after the harriers and the hare. All these slowly stirring hunting attendants shouted, Stoy! Stay! to keep the dogs on the right scent, and the greyhound keepers crying, Atu! to urge them on, swept across the field. Elegan, with perfect coolness, Nikolai, Natasha, and the little uncle, flew along, not heeding how or whither they were going, with only the dogs and the hare in their eyes, and fearing only lest they should for a single instant lose the course of the hunt from sight. The hare proved to be full-grown and full of game. After springing out, he did not on the instant dash away, but cocked up his ears, listening to the shouts of the men and the trampling of the horses, suddenly closing in upon him from all sides. He made a dozen springs, in no great haste, letting the hounds come quite close to him, and then, finally, having chosen his course, and realized his danger, he laid back his ears and was off like the wind. His form had been in the stubble, but the course he took was toward the meadowlands, where it was marshy. Two dogs, answering to the hunter who had discovered him, were the first to see the hare, and lay for him, but they were still a considerable distance behind when Elegan's red-spotted Yorza outstripped them, came within a dog's length of him, sprang upon him with frightful violence, snapped at the hare's tail, and, supposing that she had him, rolled over and over. The hare, arching his back, darted off at a sharper pace than ever. Then the black-spotted Milka, broad of beam, dashed in front of Yorza, and began swiftly to gain on the hare. Malushka, Matushka, little mother, rang out Nikolai's encouraging shout. It seemed as though Milka were just going to overtake and nip the hare, but she went too far and went beyond. The hare had stopped short. Again the pretty Yorza came to the fore, and seemed to hang over the hare's very tail, as though she were measuring the distance, so as not to be deceived again, before she should seize him by the hind leg. Yorzenka, sweet little sister, rang out Elegan's voice unnaturally, as though choked with tears. Yorza heeded not his prayer. At the very instant that she might have expected to seize her game, he swerved off, and bowled away along the ridge, between the meadow and the stubble. Again Yorza and Milka, like two little pole horses, dashed off neck and neck after the game, but this middle ground was better running for the hare, and the dogs did not gain on him so rapidly. Rugai, Rugaishka, here's a howdy-do, cried still a third voice at this instant, and Rugai, the little uncle's red, crook-backed hound, stretching out and doubling up his back, was seen catching up with the two other hounds, dashing beyond them, and falling, with terrible effort of self-denial, on the hare itself. He flung him from the middle ground into the meadow, leaped upon him even more fiercely a second time in the muddy marsh, into which he sank up to his knees, and then all that could be seen was that he rolled over and over with the hare, the mud staining his back. The star of dogs clustered round them. In a minute the party gathered in a circle around the clustering dogs. The little uncle, radiantly happy, alone dismounted and cut off the hare's hind foot. Shaking the hare so that the blood would drip off, he looked around excitedly. With wandering eyes, unable to keep his feet and hands quiet, and spoke not knowing what he said or whom he addressed, "'That's the kind of a howdy-do. That's a dog for you.' "'Worth all your thousand-ruble hounds. "'Here's a howdy-do,' he said, all out of breath, "'and fiercely glancing around, as though he were berating someone, "'as though all of them were his foes, and all had insulted him, "'and now, at last, he had come to his chance for getting even with them. 
Look at your thousand-ruble dogs. Here, Rugai, here's the foot, he cried, flinging him the hare's paw, with the mud still clinging to it. You've earned it. Here's a howdy-do. She'd run herself all out. She'd cornered him thrice all by herself, said Nikolai, likewise not heeding anyone, and not minding whether anyone listened to him or not. That was a great way. He seized him by the back, exclaimed Elegan's groom. Yes, when she's run him out, of course any house-dog could grip him, said Elegan at the same instant. He was flushed, and what with the mad gallop and the excitement could scarcely draw his breath. Natasha, so great was her excitement and enthusiasm, also was screaming at the top of her lungs, and so shrilly that it made one's ears tingle. With these shrieks of delight she expressed what all the other sportsmen were expressing by their simultaneous exclamations, and these shrieks were so odd that she would have been constrained to feel ashamed of herself, and all the others would have been amazed at it, if it had been at another time. The little uncle himself doubled up the hair cleverly, and boldly laid him over the cropper of his horse, as though by this action he were defying them all, and mounted his fallow bay, and rode away, acting as though he had no wish to speak to any one. All the rest, melancholy and disconsolate, separated, and it was only after some time had elapsed that they had recovered their former state of affected indifference. For some time still they gazed after the red, humped-backed Rugai, who, all splattered with mud, rattling his chain, trotted after the little uncle's horse, with the supercilious aspect of a victor. "'You see, I am like all the rest of you, as long as there is no game to be after. Yes, and you had better keep aloof,' was what the aspect of this dog seemed to Nikolai to say. When, after some time, the little uncle rode back to Nikolai and began to talk with him, Nikolai felt flattered that— after what had taken place, the little uncle was condescending enough to talk with him. End of chapter 6 Part 4, Chapter 7 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 7 When, late in the afternoon, Elegan courteously took his departure, Nikolai found that they were so far from home that he was glad to accept the little uncle's proposition that their hunting party should spend the night at his little estate of Mikhailovko. Now, if you should come to my place, here's a howdy do, said the little uncle. It would be the best thing you could desire. You see, the weather is wet, added the little uncle. You could get rested, and the little countess could be driven home in a drotsky. The proposition was accepted. A huntsman was sent to Otranoya after the drotsky while Nikolai, Natasha, and Petya went to the little uncle's. Five men, big and little, the little uncle's house serfs, rushed out upon the front doorstep to welcome their barren home. A dozen women, of every age and size, thrust their heads out of the back porch to stare at the approaching cavalcade. The appearance of Natasha, a woman, a barunya, on the horseback aroused their curiosity to such a pitch that several of them, undeterred by her presence, approached her, made a close examination of everything about her, and made their observations freely in her presence, as though she were some curiosity on exhibition, and not a human being, who could hear and understand what they said. Arinka, Just ye look! She sits sidewise! Yes, sidewise! And her skirt dangles! And see her horn! Holy saints preserve us! And a knife, too! She's a real tartar! How is it you don't get thrown off? asked the most audacious of them, turning directly to Natasha. The little uncle dismounted from his horse at the doorsteps of his small country residence, which was built in the midst of an overgrown garden, and, glancing round on his domestics, he gave an imperative order for the supernumeraries to clear out, and for everything to be done necessary for the reception of his guests and the hunting train. There was a general scattering. The little uncle helped Natasha to dismount, and, giving her his hand, led her up the precarious deal steps. The house, which was not plastered, and showed the rough timbers of the walls, was not remarkable for its cleanliness. It was plain to see that the inmates did not consider it the first duty of life to remove every trace of a spot, but there was no noticeable neglect. The entry was filled with the odor of fresh apples, and hung with the skins of wolves and foxes. The little uncle conducted his guests through the antechamber into a small music-room, with a folding table and red-painted chairs. 
thence into the drawing-room where there was a round pine table and a sofa and finally into the library where there were a ragged divan a well-worn carpet and portraits of suvorov of the proprietor's father and mother and of himself in military uniform the library smelt strong of tobacco and dogs here the little uncle begged his guests to be seated and make themselves quite at home and he left them rugai his back still covered with mud came into the room lay down on the divan and began to clean himself with tongue and teeth from the library led a corridor in which could be seen a screen with its hangings full of rents beyond the screen were heard the laughing and chatter of women natasha nikolai and petya threw off their wraps and sat down on the divan petya rested his head on his arm and was instantly asleep natasha and nikolai sat in silence their faces were flushed they were very hungry and in very good spirits they exchanged glances after the hunting was over and they were in the house nikolai no longer considered it necessary to display his masculine superiority over his sister natasha winked at her brother and both after trying to restrain themselves for a moment burst forth in a short and hearty peal of laughter without even taking time to think what they were laughing at after a short absence the little uncle came in dressed in a cossack coat blue trousers and short boots and natasha felt that this costume which to her amusement and amazement she had seen the little uncle wear at otranoya was a perfectly proper costume in no respect worse than frock coat or swallow tail the little uncle was also in the best of spirits he was not only not offended by the brother and sister's merriment it never entered into his head that they were laughing at his mode of life but even he joined in with their apparent causeless laughter well the little countess is so young here's a howdy-do never saw another like her he exclaimed giving rostof a long-stemmed pipe and waving another which he had chosen for himself with a carved short stem between his three fingers all day riding just like a man and as though it were quite the ordinary thing shortly after the little uncle rejoined them the door was opened by a young girl apparently barefooted to judge by the noiselessness of her tread and in came a portly ruddy-faced handsome woman of forty with double chin and full red lips bearing in her hands a huge tray set out with dishes with overpowering hospitality dignity and politeness beaming from her eyes and expressed in her every motion she contemplated the guests and with a flattering smile made them a most respectful curtsey in spite of a rather unusual portliness which made bosom and abdomen unduly prominent and caused her to hold her head very high this woman who was the little uncle's ekonomka or housekeeper moved about with amazing agility she walked up to the table set down the tray and skilfully with her white plump hands removed and arranged on the table the bottles and various dishes comprising the zukaska or lunch having done this she started away and stood by the door with a smile on her face that is the kind of woman i am now do you understand the little uncle her attitude seemed to rostof to imply how could he fail to understand not only rostof but even natasha understood the little uncle and the meaning of his furrowed brows and the happy self-satisfied smile which slightly curved his lips as anisya fedorovna entered the room on the tray were travnik or herb brandy liqueurs mushrooms wheat flour cakes with buttermilk fresh honeycomb mulled wine and sparkling mead apples raw nuts roasted nuts and nuts cooked in honey then anisya fedorovna brought fruits preserved in honey and sugar and a ham and a roast fowl just from the fire all this was of anisya fedorovna's own preparation and selecting and setting forth all this was redolent of anisya fedorovna and had the mark of her genius and taste all was in character with her scrupulous neatness and cleanness and whiteness and her pleasant smile have a bite of something to eat little countess she insisted handing natasha first one thing and then another natasha partook of everything and it seemed to her that she had never seen and never tasted such buttermilk cakes or mulled wine with such a flavour or nuts cooked so deliciously in honey or such a fowl anisya fedorovna went out rostof and the little uncle while sipping their glasses of cherry liqueur talked about hunting past and to come about rugai and Alagin's dogs natasha with shining eyes sat up erect on the divan and listened to them several times she tried to rouse petya to have something to eat 
but he muttered incoherent words and was evidently too sound to sleep. Natasha felt so happy, she so keenly enjoyed the novel surroundings, that her only fear was that the Drotsky would come for her too soon. After one of those fortuitous silences, that are almost inevitable with people who for the first time entertain their friends at home, the little uncle, responding to a thought that must have occurred to his guests, remarked, "'And this is the way I shall live out my days. You die, here's a howdy-do, and nothing's left. So what's the sin?' The little uncle's face had grown very grave, and even handsome, as he made this remark. Rostov could not help thinking of the pleasant things his father and the neighbors had said of the old man. The little uncle, throughout the whole government, had the reputation of being as noble-hearted and disinterested as he was eccentric. He was often called upon to act as arbiter in family disputes. He was chosen executor of wills. He was made the repository of secrets. He was elected judge and called upon to fill other offices, but he stubbornly refused to enter active service. Autumn and spring he rode about the country on his fallow bay salion. In the winter he stayed at home. In the summer he lounged in his overgrown garden. "'Why don't you enter the service, little uncle?' "'I have served, and I've given it up. It's no use. Here's a howdy-do. I can't make anything out of it. It's well enough for you youngsters, but my wits could never grasp it. But hunting—' That's quite another thing. That's the howdy-do. Open that door there, he cried. What did you shut it for? The door at the end of the corridor, which the little uncle called Collidor, led into a single room occupied by the hunting train. The bare feet swiftly slithered along, and an invisible hand pushed the door open into the hunter's room, as this was called. The sounds of the balalika, or Ukrainian guitar, were clearly heard through the corridor, Someone who was a master hand at playing it evidently had a hold of the instrument. It had been a long time since Natasha had listened to these sounds, and now she ran out into the corridor to hear more distinctly. That is my Mitka, the coachman. I bought a beautiful balalaika for him. I am fond of it, said the little uncle. After coming back from his courses, the little uncle was in the habit of summoning Mitka into the hunter's room to play for him. The little uncle liked that kind of music. "'How good it is! It's excellent,' said Nikolai, with a slight trace of involuntary scorn, as though he were ashamed of himself for confessing that he extremely enjoyed such sounds. "'Excellent!' repeated Natasha reproachfully. She was conscious of the tone in which her brother spoke. "'Excellent does not express it. It's charming. That's what it is.' Just as the little uncles picked mushrooms, the hydromel and the liqueur seemed to her the best in the world, so also did that tune on the balaleka seem to her, at that moment, the very acme of all musical charm. "'Again, please, again,' cried Natasha at the door, as soon as the sounds of the balalaika had ceased. Mitka tuned the instrument, and once more began bravely to thrum out the barinya, or the high-born maid, with a clanging of strings and grappling of chords. The little uncle sat and listened, inclining his head to one side with an almost imperceptible smile. The theme of the Barinya was repeated a hundred times. Several times the balalaika had to be tuned, and then once more the same sounds trembled forth, and yet the listeners were not wearied, and wanted to hear this tune over and over again. Anisya Fedorovna came in, and leaned her portly frame against the door lintel. "'Be kind enough to listen to him,' said she to Natasha, with a smile strikingly like the little uncle's. "'He plays for us gloriously,' she said. "'That part is not done right,' suddenly exclaimed the little uncle, with an energetic gesture. "'It needs to be faster, there. Here's a howdy-do. Let it out.' "'And do you know how to play?' asked Natasha. The little uncle smiled, but made no reply. "'Just you look, Anishusha. If the strings are all on my guitar—' I have not had it in my hands for some time. Here's a howdy-do. Anisya Fedorovna gladly went to fulfill her lord and master's command, and soon brought the guitar. The little uncle, not looking at any one, blew off the dust, rapped with his bony fingers on the sounding-board of the guitar, tuned the strings, and straightened himself on his chair. He grasped the guitar above the finger-board, with a somewhat theatrical air, pushing back his left elbow, and with a wink toward Anisya Fedorovna, he struck up, not the barunya, but a prelude of one clear ringing chord, 
after which he began in a steady and precise but still regularly accented tempo to improvise variations on the well-known song on the pavement of the street at once the theme of the song began to sing itself rhythmically in the hearts of both nikolai and natasha with that peculiar sedate cheerfulness which anisya fedorovna's whole being exhaled anisya fedorovna blushed and hiding her face in her handkerchief she left the room with a laugh the little uncle went on improvising on the song clearly carefully and with energetic steadiness his glance full of varying inspiration fixed on the spot where anisya fedorovna had been standing there was a barely perceptible something betokening amusement at one corner of his mouth under his gray moustache and this look intensified as the song went on or as the accent grew more pronounced and in such places as the strings almost snapped under his twanging fingers charming charming little uncle some more some more cried natasha as soon as he came to a pause then springing up from her seat she threw her arms around the little uncle and kissed him nikolenka nikolenka he cried glancing at her brother and as it were asking him if he appreciated it all nikolai was also greatly delighted with the performance the little uncle once more struck a tune anisya fedorovna's smiling face again appeared in the doorway and behind her were grouped still other faces at the crystal flowing fountain cries a voice o oh maiden wait was the tune which the little uncle played then he made one more skilful change of key broke off and shrugged his shoulders there there little uncle you old darling murmured natasha in such a tone of entreaty that one might have thought her life were dependent on its gratification the little uncle stood up and as though there were two men the one smiling a grave smile at the merry one while the merry one performed a naive and dignified antic in anticipation of the pliska or native dance now then my dear niece cried the little uncle waving his hand toward natasha after striking a chord natasha threw off the shawl which she had wrapped around her glided out in front of the little uncle and putting her arms akimbo made a motion with her shoulders and waited where how when had this little countess educated as she had been by a french emigre imbibed the russian spirit from the very atmosphere which she had breathed where had she learned all those characteristic motions which the pas de chale might long ago have supposed entirely to efface but the spirit and the motions were the very ones inimitable untaught intuitive thoroughly russian which the little uncle expected of her the moment she got to her feet with an enthusiastic proud and shrewdly gay smile the first tremor of fear which seized nikolai and all the other spectators the fear that she might not be able to perform it correctly passed away and gave place to sheer admiration her performance was so absolutely perfect and so entirely what was expected of her that anisya fedorovna who had immediately handed to her the handkerchief that played such an indispensable part in the dance wept and laughed at once as she gazed at that slender graceful countess from another world as it were educated in silks and velvets who could understand all that was in herself anisya in anisya's father fyodor and in her aunt and in her mother and in the whole russian people well little countess here's a howdy do exclaimed the little uncle with a radiant smile when the plaska was finished well done niece now all we have to do is pick you out a fine young husband here's a howdy do already picked out said nikolai smiling oh ho exclaimed the little uncle in surprise with a questioning look at natasha natasha with a smile of pleasure nodded her head in assent and he's such a fine one said she but the moment these words had escaped her lips a new train of thoughts and feelings arose in her mind what signified nikolai's smile when he said already picked out is he glad or sorry possibly he thinks that my bolkonsky would not approve would not understand this gaiety of ours no he certainly would not understand it all where is he now i wonder said natasha to herself and her face grew suddenly grave but it lasted only a single second you must not think about it you must not dare to think about it she said to herself and with her face wreathed in smiles she again sat down beside the little uncle and urged him to play something more the little uncle played still another song and valse 
Then, after a short silence, he cleared his throat and struck up his favorite hunting song. As the evening sun sank low, fell the white and beauteous snow. The little uncle sang as the peasant, as the people, sings, with that full and naive conviction that the whole meaning is to be found exclusively in the words, that the tune will go of itself, and that there is no special air, or that the air is merely for harmony's sake. The result was that this singing of the little uncles, so completely free from self-consciousness, like the songs of the birds, was particularly charming. Natasha was in raptures over his singing. She determined that she would not take any more lessons on the harp, but would henceforth play only on the guitar. She asked the little uncle to let her take the instrument, and immediately began to pick out chords for singing. About ten o'clock, a lanyanka, or long, low carriage, and a drotsky came for Natasha and Petya, and three mounted men who had been sent to find them. The count and countess did not know what had become of them, and, as the messenger reported, were in a great state of agitation. Petya was picked up and deposited in the Lanyenka, like a dead body. Natasha and Nikolai took their places in the Drotsky. The little uncle muffled Natasha all up, and bade her farewell with a new and peculiar touch of affection. He accompanied them on foot as far as the bridge, which they had to abandon for the ford, and he commanded his hunters to proceed them with lanterns. "'Good-bye, Pushkai, my dear niece,' rang his voice from out of the darkness. Not the one which Natasha had known hitherto, but the one that had sung, as the evening sun sank low. The windows in the village through which they passed gleamed with ruddy lights, and there was a cheerful odor of smoke. "'How charming the little uncle is!' exclaimed Natasha, as they bowled along the highway. "'Yes,' said Nikolai. "'You are not cold, are you?' "'No, I'm comfortable, perfectly comfortable. "'Oh, I'm so happy,' replied Natasha, with a sense of perplexity. "'They rode for a long time in silence. "'The night was dark and damp. "'They could not even see the horses. "'They could only hear them splashing through the unseen mud-puddles. "'What was going on in that child's impressionable mind, "'which was so quick to catch and retain the most varied experiences of life? "'How was it possible to stow them all away in it? "'But she was very happy.' As they drew near the house, she suddenly struck up the song, as the evening sun sank low, the tune of which she had been trying all the way to catch, and at last succeeded in remembering. "'You've caught it, have you?' said Nikolai. "'What were you thinking about just now, Nikolenka?' asked Natasha. They were fond of asking each other this question. "'I?' exclaimed Nikolai, trying to recollect. "'Let me see.' At first, I was thinking that Brugai, the red hound, was like the little uncle, and that, if he had been a man, he would have kept the little uncle about him all the time, if not for hunting, at least for his music. At all events, I would have kept him. What a musician the little uncle is, isn't he? Well, and what were your thoughts? Mine? Wait. Wait. At first I was thinking how we were riding here— and that we supposed we were on our way home, whereas in reality it is so dark that God only knows where we are going, and we might suddenly discover that we were not at Otronaya at all, but in some fairy realm. And then I was thinking... No, there was nothing else. I know, you certainly were thinking about him, said Nikolai, smiling, as Natasha knew by the tone of his voice. No, replied Natasha, though in reality she had been thinking about Prince Andrei, and wondering how he would have liked the little uncle. "'And there's one thing I have been repeating and repeating all the way,' said Natasha, "'and that is, how superbly Anishushka marched about.' And Nikolai heard her clear, merry laugh, so easily excited by trifles. "'But do you know,' she suddenly added, "'I am certain that I shall never, never again be so happy, so free from care as I am now.' "'What rubbish! Nonsense! Trumpery talk!' exclaimed Nikolai, and he thought in his own mind, how charming this Natasha of mine is. I shall never find another friend like her. Why should she think of getting married? We might travel all over the world together. How charming this dear Nikolai is, thought Natasha. Ah, there's a light in the drawing-room still, said she, pointing to the windows of the mansion, cheerfully shining out into the moist, velvety darkness of the night. End of chapter 7
Part four, chapter eight of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter eight. Count Ilya Andreevich had resigned his position as predvoditel or marshal of the district nobility because this office entailed too great expenses but still his finances showed no improvement often natasha and nikolai found their parents engaged in secret anxious consultation and they heard rumors about the sale of the magnificent ancestral home of the rostovs and their pod moskovnaya estate now that he was relieved from this office it was not necessary for them to entertain so extensively and life at Otradnoya went on more quietly than in former years but the huge mansion and the wings were just as full of servants as ever and more than twenty persons habitually sat down at table and all these were the regular household who lived there practically members of the family or those who were obliged for some reason or other to live at the count's expense such for instance were dimmler the music master and his wife fogel the dancing master and his whole family and then an elderly lady of quality named bilova who had her home there and many others of the same sort petya's tutors and governors the young lady's former guvernatka and men and women who simply found it better or more to their advantage to live at the count's than at home they had not quite so much company as formerly but the scale of living was practically the same for the count and the countess found it impossible to accommodate themselves to any other the hunting establishment was the same nay it had even been increased by nikolai there were still fifty horses and fifteen coachmen in the stables rich gifts on name days were still given and formal dinners at which all the neighbourhood were invited the count still had his whist and boston parties at which as he held his cards spread out so that every one could see them his neighbours were enabled to go away enriched to the extent of several hundred roubles every day having come to regard it as an especial prerogative of theirs to make up a table at which count ilya andreyitch should serve as their chief source of income the count marched along through the monstrous tangle of his affairs striving not to believe that he was so involved and at every step involving himself more and more and feeling conscious that he had not the strength to rend the bonds that beset his feet or the zeal and patience required to unravel them the countess with her loving heart was conscious that their fortunes were going to rack and ruin but she felt that the count was blameless that he could not help being what he was that he himself was suffering though he tried to conceal it from the consciousness of the ruin that faced himself and his family and was striving to devise means of rescue from her woman's point of view the only means that presented itself was to get nikolai married to a wealthy heiress she felt that this was their last hope and that if Nikolai refused a certain match which she proposed to arrange for him, it would be necessary to bid a final farewell to every hope of restoring their fortunes. This match was with Julie Karagina, the daughter of a most worthy and virtuous father and mother, a girl whom the Rostovs had known since she was a child, and who had lately come into a large fortune by the fortuitous death of the last of her brothers. The countess had written directly to Madame Karagina in Moscow, proposing a marriage between daughter and son and she had received a most favourable response karagina replied that she for her part was agreed but that everything depended on her daughter's inclinations karagina invited nikolai to come to moscow several times the countess with tears in her eyes told her son that now since both of her daughters were provided for her sole desire was to see him married she declared that she would go to her grave contented if this might be then she said that she happened to know of a very lovely girl, and she wanted to know his ideas upon the subject. On other occasions she openly praised Julie, and advised Nikolai to go to Moscow and have a good time during the Christmas holidays. Nikolai was sharp enough to understand his mother's covert hints, and during one of their talks he managed to draw her out completely. She told him that their whole hope of bringing their affairs into order was in seeing him married to the Karagina but what if i loved a girl who was poor maman would you insist upon my sacrificing my feelings and honour for money he asked not realising the harshness of his question and simply desiring to show his noble feelings no you don't understand me said his mother not knowing how to set herself straight you misunderstand me entirely nikolinka all i desire is your happiness she added and she had the consciousness that she had not spoken the truth that she was getting beyond her depth she burst into tears 
Mamenka, don't cry. Simply tell me that this is your real wish, and you know that I would give my whole life, everything that I have, to make you happy, said Nikolai. I would sacrifice everything for you, even my dearest wishes. But the countess had no desire to offer the dilemma. She had no wish to demand a sacrifice from her son. She would have preferred herself to be the one who should make the sacrifice. No, no, you have not understood me. We won't say anything more about it, said she, wiping away her tears. Yes, perhaps it is true that I am in love with a penniless girl, said Nikolai to himself. Why should I sacrifice my sentiments and my honor for the sake of wealth? I am amazed that Mamenka should say such a thing to me. Is there any reason, because Sonya is poor, that I should not love her? he asked himself. Can I return her true, generous love? And, most certainly, I should be much happier with her than with such a doll as Julie. I can always sacrifice my feelings for my parents' good, he said to himself, but to command my feeling is beyond my power. If I love Sonya, then my feeling is more powerful and rules everything for me. Nikolai did not go to Moscow. The countess did not again revert to her conversation with him about his marriage, but it was with pain, and even with indignation, that she saw the signs of a constantly growing intimacy between her son and the dowerless Sonya. She reproached herself, but she found it impossible to resist heaping worriments upon Sonya and finding fault with her, oftentimes stopping her short and addressing her with the formal vu, you, and moya mailia, instead of both the usual tender epithets. What annoyed the worthy countess most of all was that this poor, dark-eyed niece of hers was so sweet, so gentle, so humbly grateful for all her kindnesses, and so genuinely, unchangeably, and self-sacrificingly in love with Nikolai, that it was impossible to find anything really to blame her for. Nikolai stayed at home, waiting till his leave of absence should expire. A letter was received about that time from Natasha's lover, Prince Andrei, dating at Rome. It was his fourth. In it, he wrote that he should long ere that have been on his way home to Russia, had it not been that the warmth of the climate had unexpectedly caused his wound to reopen, which obliged him to postpone his journey till the beginning of the next year. Natasha was deeply in love with her bridegroom. Her character had been greatly modified by this love. At the same time, her nature was thoroughly open to all the joys of life, but toward the end of the fourth month of their separation, she began to suffer from attacks of melancholy, which she found it impossible to resist. She was sick to death of herself. She grieved because all this time was slipping away so uselessly, while she felt that she was only too ready to love and to be loved. It was far from cheerful at the Rostovs. End of chapter 8part four chapter nine of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter nine the christmas holidays had come and except for the high mass except for the formal and perfunctory congratulations of the neighbors and the household servants except for the new dresses that everybody had on there was nothing that especially signalized the season though the perfectly still atmosphere, with the thermometer at twenty degrees below zero, the sun shining dazzlingly all day long, and at night the wintry sky glittering with myriads of stars, seemed to imply that nature, at least, gave special distinction to the Christmas tide. After dinner, on the third day of the Christmas holidays, all the household had scattered to their respective rooms. It was the most tedious time of day. Nikolai, who had been out in the morning, making calls on the neighbors, was asleep in the divan room. The old count was resting in his library. Sonya was sitting at the center table in the drawing room copying some designs. The countess was laying out her game of patience. Nastasya Ivanovna, the buffoon with the woebegone countenance, was sitting at the window with two old ladies. Natasha came into the room and went directly up to Sonya, looked at what she was doing, then stepped across to her mother and stood by her without saying a word. "'Why are you wandering about like a homeless spirit?' asked her mother. "'What do you want?' "'I want him, instantly, this very minute. I want him,' said Natasha, with gleaming eyes, but without a trace of a smile. The countess raised her head and gave her daughter a steady look. "'Don't look at me so. Don't look at me, Mamma. I shall cry if you do.' 
sit down. Sit down here with me, said the countess. Mamma, I must have him. Why am I perishing so, mamma? Her voice broke. The tears started to her eyes, and in order to hide them she quickly turned away and left the room. She went into the divan room, stood there a moment lost in thought, and went to the maid's sitting room. There, an elderly chambermaid was scolding a young girl, who had just come in from out of doors all out of breath. "'You might play some other time,' the old servant was saying. "'There is a time for all things.' "'Let her be, Kondratyevna,' said Natasha. "'Run, Mavrushka, run.' And having rescued Mavrusha, Natasha went through the ballroom into the anteroom. An old man and two young lackeys were playing cards. They stopped their game and respectfully stood up as their young mistress came in. "'What shall I have them do?' wondered Natasha. "'Yes, Nikita, please go. Where shall I send him? Oh, yes, go into the barnyard and fetch me a cock. Yes, and you, Misha, bring me some oats.' "'Do you wish a few oats?' asked Misha, with joyous readiness. "'Go!' "'Go, make haste,' said the old man imperiously. "'And you, Fyodor, get me a piece of chalk.' As she went past the butler's pantry, she ordered the samovar to be got ready, although it was not anywhere near the time for it. Foka, the bufetchik, or butler, was the most morose man of all the household. Natasha took it into her head to try her power over him. He suspected that she was not in earnest, and began to ask her if she meant it. "'Oh!' "'What a barushnya she is,' said Foka, pretending to be very cross at Natasha. "'No one in the house set so many feet flying, and no one could give the servants so much to do as Natasha. She could not have any peace of mind if she saw servants, unless she sent them on some errand. It seemed as if she were making experiments whether she would not meet with angry answers or with grumbling, in the part of some of them, but the servants obeyed, no one else so willingly as Natasha.' "'Now, what shall I do? Where shall I go?' pondered the young countess, as she slowly passed along the corridor. "'Natasya Ivanovna, what sort of children shall I have?' she demanded of the buffoon, who, dressed in his woman's short jacket, was coming towards her. "'Oh, you will have fleas, dragonflies, and grasshoppers,' replied the buffoon. "'My God, my God, it's this everlasting sameness! What shall I do with myself?' where can I find something to do? And, swiftly kicking her heels together, she ran upstairs to the quarters occupied by Fogel and his wife. Two governesses were sitting in the Fogel's room. On the table stood plates with raisins, walnuts, and almonds. The governesses were discussing the question whether it were cheaper to live in Moscow or Odessa. Natasha sat down, listened to their conversation with a grave, thoughtful face, and then stood up. "'The island of Madagascar!' she exclaimed. Madagascar, she repeated, laying a special emphasis on each syllable, and then, without replying to Madame Chausse's question what she said, she hastened from the room. Petya, her brother, was also upstairs. He and his tutor were arranging for some fireworks which they were going to set off that night. Petya, Petya, she cried to him, carry me downstairs. Petya ran to her and bent his back. She jumped upon it and threw her arms around his neck, and he, with a hop, skip, and jump, started to run down with her. "'No, thank you. That will do. The island of Madagascar,' she repeated, and jumping off, she flew downstairs. Having made the tour of her dominions, as it were, having made trial of her power of command, and discovered that all were sufficiently obedient, but that everything was nevertheless utterly stupid, Natasha went into the ballroom sat down in a dark corner behind a chiffonier, and began to thrum the bass strings of her guitar, practicing a theme which she remembered from an opera she had heard at Petersburg in company with Prince Andre. If any one from the outside had been listening to her, it would have struck him that there was something lacking in the harmonies that she managed to produce on her guitar. But in her imagination these sounds aroused from the dead past a whole series of recollections. As she sat in the shadow of the chiffonier, with her eyes fixed on the pencil light that streamed from the door of the butler's pantry, she listened to herself and indulged in daydreams. She was in the mood for daydreaming. Sonya, with a wine glass in her hand, passed through the ballroom on her way to the butler's pantry. Natasha looked at her, at the bright chink in the door, and it seemed to her that on some occasion, long before, she had seen the light streaming through the chink in the pantry door, 
and Sonya crossing the room with a glass. Yes, and it was exactly the same, said Natasha to herself. What is this tune, Sonya? cried Natasha, moving her fingers over the bass strings. Ah, are you here? cried Sonya, startled at first, and then stopping to listen. I don't know. Isn't it the storm? she suggested timidly, for fear that she was mistaken. Now there, she gave a start in exactly the same way. She came up to me in exactly the same way, and her face wore the same timid smile when that took place, thought Natasha. And in just the same way I felt that there was something lacking in her. No, that is the chorus from Water Carrier, don't you remember? And Natasha hummed the air over to recall it to Sonya's memory. Where were you going? asked Natasha. To change the water in this glass. I am just copying a sketch. You are always busy, and here am I, not good for anything, said Natasha. Where is Nikolai? Asleep, I think. Sonya, do go and wake him up, urged Natasha. Tell him that I want him to sing. She remained sitting there, and wondering why it was that this had happened so, but as it did not disturb her very much that she was not able to solve this question, she once more relapsed into her recollections of the time when she was with him, and he looked at her with loving eyes. Ugh! Oh, I wish he would come. I am so afraid that he won't come. But worst of all, I am growing old. That's a fact. Soon I shall not be what I am even now. But, maybe, he will come today. Maybe he is here now. Maybe he has come, and even now is sitting in the drawing-room. Maybe he came yesterday, and I have forgotten all about it. She got up, laid down the guitar, and went into the drawing-room. All the household, tutors, governesses, and guests, were already gathered near the tea-table. The men were standing around the table, but Prince Andrei was not among them, and everything was as usual. "'Ah, there she is,' said Count Ilya Andreitch, as he saw Natasha. "'Come here and sit by me.' But Natasha remained standing near her mother, looking around as though she were in search of someone. Mamma she murmured. Give him back to me, mamma. Quick, quick. And again she found it hard to keep from sobbing. She sat down by the table and listened to the conversation of her elders and of Nikolai, who had also come in late to the tea-table. My God, my God, the same faces, the same small talk. Even Papa holds his cup and cools it with his breath, just as he always does, said Natasha to her horror feeling a dislike rising in her against all the household because they were always the same. After tea, Nikolai, Sonya, and Natasha went into the divan room, to their favorite corner where they always held their most confidential conversations. End of chapter 9this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 10 Has it ever happened to you, asked Natasha of her brother, when they were comfortably settled in the divan room, has it ever happened to you that it seemed as though there were nothing, just nothing at all, left in the future for you, that all that was best was past, and that you were not so much bored as disgusted? Haven't I, indeed? Many a time when everything was going well, and all were gay, it would come into my head that it was all vanity and vexation of spirit, and that all of us would have to die. Once, at the regiment, I did not go out to promenade, though the band was playing, for everything had suddenly become so gloomy. Ugh! I know what you mean. I know, I know, interposed Natasha. When I was a tiny bit of a girl, it used to be that way with me. Do you remember I was punished once, on account of those plums, and you were all dancing, while I had to sit alone in the classroom and sobbed. I shall never forget how melancholy I felt, and how vexed with you all and with myself. Oh, yes, vexed with you all, all of you. And the worst of it was, I was not to blame, said Natasha. Do you remember? I remember, replied Nikolai, and I remember that I went to you and wanted to comfort you, and, do you know, I was ashamed to do it, we were terribly absurd. I had at that time a kind of a toy, like a mannequin, and I wanted to give it to you. Do you remember? And do you remember, asked Natasha, 
with a thoughtful smile how once long long time ago when we were little tots uncle took us into the library that was in the old house and it was dark and when we went in suddenly there stood before us a negro said nikolai taking the word from her mouth and laughing merrily of course i remember it and now i can't tell for the life of me that it was a negro or whether we saw it in a dream or whether it was something that we were told he was gray you remember and had white teeth and he stood and stared at us do you remember it sonya asked nikolai yes i have a dim recollection of something about it timidly replied the young girl i have asked both papa and mamma about that negro said natasha they declare that no negro was ever here but you see you remember about it certainly i do and now i recall his teeth very distinctly how strange just as though it were in a dream i like it and do you remember how we were rolling eggs in the music-room and suddenly two little old women appeared and began to whirl round on the carpet that was so wasn't it do you remember how fine it was yes and do you remember how papenka in a blue shuba used to fire off his musket from the doorsteps thus smiling with delight they took turns in calling up not the reminiscences of a gloomy old age but the recollections of the poetic days of youth impressions from the most distant past dreams fused and confused with reality and these happy recollections sometimes made them quietly laugh sonya as usual sat at a little distance from the other two though their recollections were not confined to themselves alone sonya did not remember much of what the others did and what came back to her failed to arouse in her that poetic feeling which they experienced she simply rejoiced in their enjoyment and tried to take part in it she began to feel a special interest in these reminiscences only when they came to speak of her first coming to their house sonya was telling how afraid she was of nikolai because he wore braid on his jacket and her nurse told her that they were going to sew her up in braid and i remember they told me that you were born under a cabbage said natasha and i remember also that i did not dare to disbelieve it though i knew that it was a fib and i felt so uncomfortable at this stage of the conversation a chambermaid thrust her head into the divan room at the rear door and said in a whisper baronishna they have brought the cock i don't want it polya now tell them to carry it away again while they were still engaged in talking dimmler came into the divan room and went to the harp that stood in one corner as he took off the covering the harp gave forth a discordant sound edward karluitch please play my favorite nocturne that one by monsieur field cried the old countess from the drawing-room dimmler struck a chord and turning to natasha nikolai and sonya said young people how quiet you are sitting yes we are talking philosophy said natasha looking up for an instant and then pursuing the conversation it now turned upon dreams dimmler began to play natasha noiselessly went on her tiptoes to the table took the candle and carried it out then she came back and sat down quietly in her place in the room especially that part where the divan was on which they were sitting it was dark but through the lofty windows the silver light of the full moon fell across the floor do you know i think said natasha drawing close to nikolai and sonya when dimmler had now finished his nocturne and sat lightly thrumming the strings apparently uncertain whether to cease or to play something else i think that when you go back remembering and remembering and remembering everything you remember so far back that at last you remember what happened even before you were born at least i do that is metempsychosis exclaimed sonya who always had been distinguished for her scholarship and her good memory the egyptians used to believe that our souls once inhabited the bodies of animals and will go into animals again ah but do you know i don't believe that we were ever in animals remarked natasha in the same low voice though the music had ceased but i know for certain that we used to be angels in that other world and when we come here we remember about it may i join you asked dimmler coming up noiselessly and taking a seat near them if we were angels then why have we fallen lower suggested nikolai no that can't be who told you that you are lower than the angels because i know what i used to be objected natasha with conviction you see the soul is immortal it must be if i am going to live always that i lived before 
lived a whole eternity yes but it is hard for us to realize what eternity is remarked dimmler who when he had joined the group of young people had worn a slightly scornful smile but now spoke in as low and serious a tone as the rest why is it hard to realize eternity demanded natasha after today comes tomorrow and then the next day and so on for ever and in the same way yesterday was and the day before and so on natasha now it's your turn sing me something said the countess's voice why are you all sitting there like conspirators mamma i don't feel like it said natasha but nevertheless she got up not one of them not even dimmler who was no longer young wanted to break off the conversation and leave the corner but natasha had arisen and nikolai took his place at the harpsichord natasha as usual going to the centre of the music-room and choosing the place where her voice sounded best began to sing her mother's favourite piece she had said that she did not feel like singing but it was long since she had sung as she sang that evening and long before she sang so well again count ilya andreyitch listened to it from his library where he was closeted with matenka and like a schoolboy in haste to go out to play as soon as his lessons are done he stumbled over his words as he gave his instructions to his overseer and finally stopped speaking while matenka also with ears attent stood silently in front of the count nikolai did not take his eyes from his sister and even breathed when she did sonya as she listened thought what a wide gulf there was between her and her friend and how impossible it would be to find any one in the world so bewitchingly charming as her cousin the old countess with a smile of melancholy pleasure and with tears in her eyes sat occasionally shaking her head she was thinking of natasha and of her own youthful days and of that unnatural and terrible element that seemed to enter into this engagement of her daughter with prince andrei dimmler taking his seat next to the countess and covering his eyes listened no countess said he finally this talent of hers is european she has nothing to learn such smoothness sympathetic quality power ugh how i tremble for her how worried i am said the countess not realizing to whom she was speaking her maternal instinct told her that natasha had more in her than ordinary girls and that this would result in unhappiness for her natasha had not quite finished her singing when fourteen-year-old petya all excitement came running into the room with the news that some maskers had come natasha abruptly stopped durak idiot she cried to her brother and running to a chair flung herself into it and sobbed so that it was long before she could recover herself it's nothing mamenka truly it's nothing it was only petya startled me said she striving to smile but her tears still flowed and her throat was choked by her repressed sobs the house servants who had dressed themselves up as bears turks tavern keepers fine ladies monsters and ogres bringing in with them the outside cold and hilarity at first shyly clustered together in the anteroom but gradually hiding one behind the other they ventured into the ballroom and at first timidly but afterwards with ever-increasing fervour and zeal began to perform songs dances and corvades and other christmas games the countess after she had recognized them and indulged in a hearty laugh at their antics retired to the drawing-room count ilya andreyitch with a radiant smile took his seat in the ballroom with approving glances at the masqueraders meantime all the young folks had mysteriously disappeared within half an hour the other masqueraders in the ballroom were joined by an elderly barunya in farthingale and this was nikolai by a turkish woman and this was petya by a clown this was dimmler by hussar natasha and by a circassian youth sonya both the girls had dark eyebrows and moustaches contrived with the help of burnt cork after well-feigned surprise and pretended lack of recognition as well as praise from those who were not murmuring the young people decided that their costumes were too grand to be wasted and that it was incumbent upon them to go and exhibit them elsewhere nikolai who had a strong desire for a trioka ride the roads being in splendid condition proposed that they should take with them the ten house serfs who were disguised and that all should go and visit the little uncle no he is an old man you will merely disturb him expostulated the countess why you couldn't all get into his house if you must go somewhere then go to melyukov's 
Melyukova was a widow who, with a host of children of various ages, and with tutors and governesses, lived about four versts from the Rostovs. "'There, ma chère, a good idea!' cried the old count, becoming greatly excited. "'Wait till I can get into a costume, and I will go with you. I tell you, we will wake Pesheta up.' But the countess was not at all inclined to let the old count go, since, for several days, his leg had been troubling him. It was therefore decided that it was not best for Ilya Andreitch to go, but that if Luisa Ivanovna, that is to say, Madame Schoss, would act as chaperone, then the young ladies might also go to Melyukova's. Sonya, though generally very timid and shy, now was more urgent than all the others in her entreaties to Luisa Ivanovna not to leave them in the lurch. Sonya's costume was the best of all. Her moustache and dark brows were extremely becoming to her. All assured her that she was very handsome, and she was keyed up to a state of energy and excitement quite out of her usual manner. Some inner voice told her now or never her fate was to be decided, and now, in her masculine garb, she seemed like another person. Luisa Ivanovna consented, and in less than half an hour four triokas, with jingling bells, on shaft arch and harness swept, creaking and crunching over the frosty snow, up to the front steps. Natasha was the first to catch the tone of Christmas festivity, and this jollity was perfectly infectious, growing more and more noisy, and reaching the highest pitch as they all came out into the frosty air, and with shouting and calling, and laughing and screaming, took their places in the sledges. Two or three spans were unmatched. The third trioka belonged to the old count, with a racer of the Orlov breed between the thills. The fourth was Nikolai's own private troika, with a low, shaggy, black shaft-horse. Nikolai, in his old maid's costume, over which he threw his hussar's riding-cloak, fastened with a belt, took his place in the middle of his sledge, and gathered up the reins. It was so light that he could see the metal of the harness-plates shining in the moonbeams, and the horse's eyes, as they turned them anxiously toward the merry group, gathered under the dark roof of the porte chaucheur In Nikolai's sledge were packed Natasha, Sonya, Madame Schoss, and two of the maid-servants. In the old counts went Dimmler, with his wife, and Petya. In the others the rest of the household serfs were disposed. "'You lead the way, Zakhar,' cried Nikolai, to his father's coachman. He wished to have the chance to beat him on the road. The old count's trioka, with Dimmler and the other masqueraders, creaked as though its runners were frozen to the snow, and, with the jingling of its deep-toned bell, started forward. The side-horses twitched at their shafts, and kicked up the sugar-like, gleaming crystals of the snow. Nikolai followed Zakhar. Behind them, with a creaking and crunching, came the others. At first they went rather gingerly along the narrow driveway. As they passed the park the shadows cast by the bare trees lay across the road and checkered the moonlight. But as soon as they got beyond the park enclosure, the snowy expanse, gleaming like diamonds, with a deep blue phosphorescence, all drenched in moonlight and motionless, opened out before them in every direction. All at once the foremost sledge dipped into a cradle-hole, in exactly the same way the one behind it went down and came up again, and then the next behind, and then, boldly breaking the iron-bound silence, the sledges began to speed along the road one after the other. "'There is a hair-track, ever so many of them,' rang Natasha's voice, through the frost-bound air. "'How light it is, Nicholas,' said Sonya's voice." Nikolai glanced round, and bent over so as to get a closer look into her face. The pretty face, with an odd and entirely new expression, caused by the black brows and the moustache, glanced up at him from under the sables. "'That used to be Sonya,' said Nikolai to himself. He gave her a closer look and smiled. "'What is the matter, Nicholas?' "'Nothing,' said he, and he again gave his attention to his horses." Having now reached the hard-trodden high road, stretching away in the moonlight, and polished smooth by numberless runners, and all hacked up by the tracks of the horseshoe nails, the horses of their own accord began to pull on the reins, and increase their speed. The off-horse, tossing his head, galloped along, twitching on his traces. The shaft-horse shook out into a trot, laying back his ears as though asking, "'Shall we begin, or is it too early as yet?' Zakhar's trioka, already a considerable distance ahead, the jingle of its deep-toned bell, growing more and more distant, could be seen like a black patch against the whiteness of the snow. 
shouts and laughter and the voices of the party in the distance could be plainly heard now then my darlings cried nikolai giving a firm rein with one hand and raising his hand with the knout and only by the increase of the wind that blew in their faces and by the straining of the side horses which kept springing and galloping faster and more furiously could it be told at what a pace the troika was flying nikolai glanced back with shouts and whistling with creaking of whips and encouraging words to the horses followed the other troika at a flying pace the back of the shaft horse rose and fell steadily under the curved duga but with no thought of breaking and ready to give more and ever more speed if it were required of him nikolai now overtook the first troika they glided down a little slope and came out upon a road wide enough for several teams to drive abreast stretching along the interval by the riverside where will this take us i wonder queried nikolai this must be the sloping intervale but no it is a place i don't recognize at all i never saw it before it is neither the sloping intervale nor the dyomkin hill god only knows where we are it is certainly some new and enchanted place well what difference does it make to us and shouting at his horses he began to gain on the first trioka zakhar held his team to their work and turned round his face white with frost even to the eyebrows nikolai gave his horses rein zakhar reached out his arms clicked his tongue and also gave his free rein now steady there baron cried he still swifter flew the two troikas side by side and swiftly the legs of the horses interwove as onward they sped nikolai began gradually to forge ahead zakhar not changing the position of his outstretched arms kept the hand that held the reins a little higher you can't come it baron he cried to nikolai nikolai urged all three of his horses to gallop and sped past zakhar the horses kicked the fine dry snow into the faces of the party the bells jingled together as they flew on side by side and the swiftly moving legs of the horses mingled together while the shadows crossed and interlaced upon the snow the runners whizzed along the road and the shouts and cries of the women were heard in each of the sledges once more reining in his horses nikolai glanced around him everywhere was the same magical expanse flooded deep with the moonbeams and with millions of stars scattered over it zakhar is shouting turn to the left but why to the left queried nikolai aren't we going to the melyukovs is this the way to melyukovna god knows where we are going and god knows what is going to become of us and it is very strange and very pleasant whatever becomes of us he looked down into the sledge oh see there his moustache and eyelashes are all white said one of the handsome young strangers with delicate moustaches and eyebrows who sat in the sledge that i think must have been natasha said nikolai to himself and the other is madame Schoss. and perhaps i am wrong but that circassian with the moustache i never saw before but i love her all the same you aren't cold are you he asked they gave no other answer than a merry laugh dimmler was shouting something from the hindmost sledge it was probably funny but he could not make out what it was yes yes replied other voices with a burst of laughter and now here is a sort of enchanted forest with black shadows interlacing and the gleams of diamonds and something like an enfilade of marble steps and there are the silver roofs of an enchanted castle and the piercing yells of wild beasts but supposing after all it were milyukovka then it would be still more wonderful that we should have gone god knows how and still have come out at milyukovka said nikolai to himself in point of fact it was milyukovka and maids and lackeys began to appear on the doorsteps of the entrance with torches and happy faces who is it asked someone from the front door masqueraders from the counts i can tell by the horses replied various voices end of chapter ten part four chapter eleven of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter eleven pelagaya danilovna Milyukova, a very stout and energetic woman in spectacles and wearing a loose-fitting capote was sitting in the drawing-room surrounded by her daughters whom she was doing her best to entertain they were quietly moulding wax and looking at the shadows cast by retreating figures when the steps and voices of the visitors began to echo through the anteroom hussars high-born ladies witches 
clowns, bears, coughing and wiping their frost-bound faces, came into the ballroom, where the candelabras were hastily lighted. The clown, that is, Dimmler, with the barinha, that is, Nikolai, opened the dance. Surrounded by gleefully shouting children, the masqueraders, hiding their faces and disguising their voices, made low bows before the mistress of the mansion, and then scattered through the room. Ugh! Oh, it is impossible to tell. Ah, that's Natasha. Just see whom she looks like. Truly she reminds me of someone. And there's Edward Karluitch. How elegant! I shouldn't have known you. Ah, how elegantly he dances. Ah, oh, saints preserve us! And who is that Circassian? Indeed, it reminds me of Sonyushka. And who is that? Well, well, this is a kindness. Move out the tables, Nikita, Vanya, and we have been sitting here so solemnly. Ha, ha, ha! What a hussar! What a hussar! Just like a boy, and what legs! I can't look at you. Such were the remarks on every side. Natasha, who was a great favorite with the young Melyukovs, disappeared with them into some distant room, where a burnt cork and dressing-gowns and various articles of masculine attire were immediately in requisition, and these were snatched from the lackey who brought them, through the half-open door, by girlish arms all bare. Within ten minutes all the young people of the Melyukov family came down and rejoined the masqueraders. Pelagea Danilovna, who had seen that a sufficient place was cleared for her guests, and regalement prepared for the gentlefolk as well as the serfs, went round among the maskers with her spectacles on her nose, and a set smile, looking close into the faces of all, and not recognizing a single one. She neither recognized the Rostovs nor Dimmler, nor could she even distinguish her own daughters, or the masculine dressing-gowns and uniforms which they had put on. "'And who is that one?' she asked of the Gouvernatka, and looking straight into the face of her daughter, who represented a Kassan Tatar. I think it must be one of the Rostovs. Well, and you, Mr. Hussar, what regiment do you serve in? she asked of Natasha. Give that Turk, yes, that Turk, some fruit cake, said she to the butler, who was serving the refreshments. It is not forbidden by their laws. Sometimes, looking at the strange but absurd pass performed by the dancers, who gave themselves up completely to the ideas that they were mumming, that no one would recognize them, and therefore felt no mock of modesty. Pelagea Danilovna would hide her face in her handkerchief, and her whole fat body would shake with the good-natured and uncontrollable laughter of old age. After they had performed the Plyaska, various korvads, and other Russian national dances, Pelagea Danilovna had all the serfs and the others together form into a great circle. A ring, a rope, and a rouble were brought, and they began to play various games. By the end of an hour the costumes began to show signs of wear and tear. The charcoal moustaches and eyebrows began to disappear from the sweaty, heated, jolly faces. Pelagaya Danilovna began to recognize the masqueraders, and congratulate them on the skill with which they had made up their costumes, and tell them how very becoming they were to the young ladies, and she thanked them all for having entertained her so well. The guests were invited into the drawing-room, and refreshments were provided in the ballroom for the serfs. "'No, but what a terrible thing to read your fortune in a bath!' exclaimed an old maid, who lived with the Malyukovs. "'Why so?' asked the oldest daughter of the family. They were now sitting down at supper. "'No, don't think of doing such a thing. It requires so much courage.' "'I would as just leaf," said Sonya. "'Tell us what happened to that young lady,' asked the second Malyukova girl. "'Well, this was the way of it. A certain Varishna, said the old maid, took a cock, two plates, knives, and forks, as the way is, and went and sat down.' She sat there, and sat there, and suddenly she hears someone coming. A sledge drives up, with harness bells jingling. She listens. Someone is coming. Someone comes in, absolutely in human form, just like an officer, and sits down with her where the second plate is set. "'Oh! Oh!' screamed Natasha, rolling her eyes in horror. "'And how was it? How did he speak to her?' "'Yes, just like a man.' Everything was just as it should have been, and he began to talk with her, and all she needed to do was to keep him talking till the cock crowed, but she got frightened. As soon as she got frightened and hid her face in her hands, then he clasped her in his arms. Luckily just then some maids came running in. "'Now, what is the good of frightening them so?' protested Pelagaya Danilovna. "'Mamasha, 
you yourself have had your fortune told exclaimed one of the daughters how is it fortunes are told in a granary asked sonya well this is the way of it you go into the granary and listen it depends on what you hear if there is any knocking or tapping it is a bad sign but if the wheat drops then it's for good and it will come out all right mamma tell us what happened to you when you went to the granary pelagia danilovna smiled oh what's the use and i have forgotten said she besides you wouldn't go would you yes i would go too pelagia danilovna do let me i certainly will go said sonya very well then if you are not afraid louisa ivanovna can i asked sonya of madame Schoss. while they were playing the games with the ring the rouble and the rope and now while they were talking nikolai had not left sonya's side and looked at her from wholly new eyes it seemed to him that this evening thanks to that charcoal moustache he for the first time knew her as she really was in reality sonya that evening was merrier livelier and prettier than nikolai had ever seen her before why what a girl she is and what an idiot i have been he said to himself as he gazed into her gleaming eyes and saw her radiantly happy and enthusiastic smile dimpling her cheeks under her moustache and that look which he had never seen before i am not afraid of anything said sonya can i start now she got up she was told where the granary was and how she must stand and listen and make no noise the servant brought her shuba she flung it over her head and gave a glance at nikolai how charming that girl is he said to himself and what have i been thinking about all this time sonya stepped out into the corridor on her way to the granary nikolai making the excuse that he was too warm hurried to the front steps it was a fact the crowd made the air in the rooms close out of doors it was as cold and still as ever the moon was shining except that it was brighter than before the brightness was so intense and there were so many gleaming stars in the snow that those on high were quite effaced and one had no desire to look for them there the sky was almost black and spoke of gloom the terrestrial sky was white and gay what an idiot i have been what an idiot why have i waited so long mused nikolai and he sprang down the steps and turned the corner of the house by the footpath that led back to the rear entrance he knew that sonya would come that way halfway along the path stood a great woodpile covered with snow and casting deep shadows across it and beyond it fell the shadows of the lindens bare and old weaving patterns on the snow and the path the footpath led to the granary the timber walls of the granary and its roofs covered with snow shone in the moonlight like a palace made of precious stone one of the park trees crackled in the frost and then everything became absolutely still again it seemed to nikolai as if his lungs breathed in not common air but the elixir of eternal youth and joy feet were heard stamping on the steps of the servants entrance someone was scraping the snow away from the lower step on which it had drifted and then the voice of an old maid said straight ahead straight ahead right along this path baronishna only you must not look round i am not afraid replied sonya's voice and then toward nikolai came sonya's dainty feet sliding and squeaking in her thin slippers sonya came along all muffled up in her shuba and it was not till she was within two paces of him that she saw him it seemed to her also that he was different from what she had ever known him before and that he had nothing of what always made her a bit afraid of him he was in his feminine costume with clustering locks and wearing a blissful smile such as sonya had never seen before sonya swiftly hurried to him she's entirely different not at all the same thought nikolai as he looked into her face all kindled by the moonlight he put his arms under her shuba which encircled her head strained her to his heart and kissed her lips which still showed traces of the moustache and had a faint odour of burnt cork sonya returned his kiss full on the lips and putting up her slender hands laid them on both sides of his face sonya nicholas that was all they said they ran to the granary and then they went back into the house by the doors through which they had come End of chapter eleven Part four chapter twelve of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy translated by Nathan Haskell Dole 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 12. When they drove home from Pelagea de Lovna's, Natasha, who had seen and observed everything, made a redistribution of forces, so that Luisa Ivanovna and Dimmler went in the sledge with her, while Sonya and Nikolai and some of the maids drove together. Nikolai, feeling now no anxiety to take the lead, drove deliberately along the homeward road, and as he kept turning to look at Sonya, with the weird moonlight falling on her, he tried to discover in that all-transforming light the Sonya of the past from the Sonya of the moment, with her charcoal-penciled brows and moustache, the Sonya from whom he was determined never to be parted. As he looked at her, and remembered what she was, and what she had been, as he recalled that odour of the burnt cork, mingling so strangely in his consciousness of her kiss, and as he gazed at the ground swiftly gliding by, and at the glittering sky, he felt that he was once more in the realm of enchantment. "'Sonya, art thou comfortable?' he would occasionally ask. "'Yes,' would be Sonya's answer. "'And art thou?' When they were halfway home, Nikolai told the coachman to hold the horses, and he ran back for a moment to Natasha's sledge and leaned over the side. "'Natasha!' he whispered, in French. "'Do you know, I have made up my mind in regard to Sonya?' "'Have you told her yet?' asked Natasha, becoming all radiant with delight. "'Oh, how strange that moustache and those eyebrows make you look, Natasha! Are you glad?' "'Oh, I am so glad, so glad. I was beginning to grow angry with you. I have not told you so, but you haven't been treating her fairly. She is such a true-hearted girl, Nicholas. How glad I am!' I am often naughty, but I have reproached myself for being selfish in my happiness and not sharing it with Sonya, pursued Natasha. But now I am so glad. But you must go back to her. No, wait a moment. Fee, how absurd you do look, exclaimed Nikolai, still gazing at her, and in his sister also discovering something new and unusual and bewitchingly lovely, which he had never before noticed in her. Natasha, it's like enchantment, isn't it? Yes, replied she, you have done nobly. If ever I had seen her like this before, thought Nikolai, I should long ago have asked her advice, and what is more, should have followed it, and all would have been well. So you are glad, and I have done right, have I? Oh, yes, perfectly right. It was only a little while ago that I got vexed with Mamasha about this. Mamma said that she was trying to catch you. How could she say such a thing? I almost quarreled with Mamma and I will never allow any one to say anything mean about her, because she is goodness itself. All right, then, is it? exclaimed Nikolai, giving another searching look at the expression of his sister's face, so as to be sure that she was in earnest, and then, with creaking boots, he jumped down from the runner, and ran to overtake his own sledge. And there still sat the same radiantly happy little Circassian, with moustache and gleaming eyes under her sable hood, and this Circassian was Sonya, and this Sonya was assuredly to be his happy and loving wife in the days to come. After they had reached home, and had told the countess how they had spent the time with the Melyukovs, the young girls went to their room. Without wiping off their burnt cork moustaches, they undressed, and sat together for a long time, talking about their happiness. They had much to say about their future married lives, and what friends their husbands would be, and how happy they should be. On Natasha's table stood dressing-glasses, placed there early that evening by her maid, Nunyasha. "'But when will all this be? Never, I fear me. It would be too great happiness to come true,' said Natasha, as she got up and went over to the mirrors. "'Sit down, Natasha. Maybe you will see him,' said Sonya. Natasha lighted the candles and sat down. "'I see someone with a moustache,' exclaimed Natasha, catching sight of her own face." "'You must not turn it into ridicule, Baryshnya," said Dunyasha. Natasha, with the help of Sonya and her maid, got into the proper position before the glass. Her face assumed a serious expression, and she remained silent. Long she sat there, looking at the row of waning candles in the mirror, wondering, as she remembered the heroines of stories she had heard, whether this mysterious twelfth night she should see her coffin, or whether she should see him— Prince Andre, in the background of the dark and confused square of glass. But, as she was not ready to mistake the smallest spot or stain on the glass for the form of a coffin or of a man, she saw nothing. Her eyes began to grow heavy, and she got up and left the mirror. 
how is it other people see things and i never see anything she asked now you sit down sonya to-day of course you must look for yourself but look for me too said she i have such terrible presentiments to-night sonya sat down in front of the mirrors arranged herself in the right position and began to look now sofya alexandrovna will surely see something whispered dunyasha but you are always making fun sonya overheard this and heard natasha reply yes i know she will see something she did last year you remember for three minutes all sat in silence of course she will whispered natasha but she did not finish her sentence suddenly sonya pushed the mirror back and covered her eyes with her hand ach natasha she cried did you see something did you what did you see demanded natasha taking the mirror from her sonya had seen nothing her eyes were simply beginning to grow heavy and she was just on the point of getting up when she heard natasha beginning to say of course she will she had no intention of deceiving either dunyasha or natasha but it was stupid sitting there she herself did not know how or why it was that the cry had escaped from her when she covered her eyes with her hand did you see him demanded natasha seizing her by the arm yes wait i saw him said sonya led by some unaccountable impulse but not knowing which natasha meant by him nikolai or andre but why should i not tell what i saw others have seen such things and who can prove that i did or didn't see something was the thought that flashed through sonya's mind yes i saw him said she how was it was he sitting or standing how was it now i saw at first i could not see anything then suddenly i got a glimpse of him and he was lying down andre lying down is he ill demanded natasha gazing at her friend with horror-stricken eyes no on the contrary his face was cheerful and he turned toward me at that instant it began to seem to her that she had seen what she was telling well and then what sonya then i did not see anything more something blue and red sonya when will he come back when shall i see him my god how i tremble for him and for myself and everything fills me with alarm cried natasha and paying no heed to the words of comfort spoken by sonya she got into bed and long after the candles were put out she lay there motionless with wide open eyes gazing at the frosty moonbeams flooding the icy window panes end of chapter twelve Part four, chapter thirteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter thirteen. Shortly after Twelfth Night, Nikolai confessed to his mother his love for Sonya and announced his firm determination to make her his wife. The countess, who had long before that remarked what was going on between the two young people and who had been expecting this announcement, listened in silence to his words and then coldly informed him that he might marry any one he pleased, but that neither she nor his father would countenance such a marriage. For the first time Nikolai felt conscious that his mother was offended with him, that, notwithstanding all her love for him, she would not yield to him in this matter. With icy coldness, and without looking at her son, she sent for her husband, and when he came, she tried, in Nikolai's presence, to tell him, in a few chilling words, of what her son proposed to do, but she had not the necessary self-control tears of vexation sprang to her eyes and she was compelled to leave the room the old count tried feebly to reason with nikolai and begged him to give up his intention nikolai replied that he could not go back on his word and the father sighing and evidently all upset in his mind hastily put an end to the conference and went to the countess in all his encounters with his son the count always had the consciousness of his own blameworthiness towards him in regard to the squandering of his fortune, and, accordingly, he could not show his anger against his son for refusing to wed a rich wife and for choosing penniless Sonya. In all this affair he remembered with the keener sorrow that, if only his estates had not been so ruined, it would be impossible for Nikolai to find a better wife, and that the only persons responsible for the wasting of this estate were himself and his Matenka and their incorrigible habits." the father and mother had nothing more to say to nikolai in regard to this but a few days later the countess summoned sonya 
and with a bitterness which no one in the world would have expected of her she reproached her niece with having decoyed her son and accused her of the blackest ingratitude sonya in silence and with downcast eyes listened to the countess's bitter words and was at a loss to know what was required of her she was ready for any sacrifice for all of them in return for their benefits the thought of self-sacrifice was ever a delight to her but in this affair she could not comprehend what she was required to sacrifice or for what purpose she could not help loving the countess and all the rostof family nor could she help loving nikolai or knowing that his happiness depended on her love for him she therefore stood silent and sad and had nothing to reply it seemed to nikolai that he could not longer endure this state of things and he went to his mother to have a final explanation nikolai first besought his mother to be reconciled to him and sonya and consent to their marriage then he threatened her that if they persecuted sonya he would instantly marry her clandestinely the countess with a coldness her son had never experienced before replied that he was of age that prince andrei was going to marry without his father's sanction and that he might do the same but that she would never receive this intrigantka as her daughter angry at her use of the term intrigantka nikolai raised his voice and told his mother that he had never thought that she would oblige him to sacrifice his noblest feelings and that if this were so then he would never but he did not finish uttering this rash vow which judging by the expression of his face his mother awaited with horror and which might have for ever raised a cruel barrier between them he did not utter it because natasha with a pale and solemn face came into the room she had been listening at the door nikolinka you do not know what you are saying hush hush i tell you hush she almost screamed so as to drown his words mamma darling there's no reason in this at all dushenka moya dear heart said she turning still paler and going to her mother who felt that she was on the very edge of an abyss and looked with horror at her son and yet by reason of her stubbornness and the impulse of the quarrel she would not and could not give in nikolinka i beg of you go away go and you sweetheart mamma listen she entreated turning again to her mother her words were incoherent but they brought about the wished-for result the countess deeply flushed buried her face in her daughter's bosom and nikolai got up and clasping his head between his hands rushed out of the room natasha acted the part of peacemaker so well that nikolai received a promise from his mother that sonya should not be annoyed and he himself swore that he would never do anything without the knowledge of his parents with the firm intention of retiring from the service as soon as he could wind up his connection with his regiment and return and marry sonya nikolai melancholy and grave still under strained relations with his parents but as it seemed to him passionately in love rejoined his regiment early in january after nikolai's departure it became sadder than ever in the house of the rostovs the countess owing to her mental tribulations was taken seriously ill sonya was depressed both on account of her separation from nikolai and still more on account of the unfriendly manner in which the countess in spite of herself treated her the count was more than ever occupied by the wretched state of his pecuniary affairs which demanded of him the most heroic measures it was absolutely necessary to dispose of their mansion in moscow and their podmoskovniana estate and in order to effectuate this sale it was essential to go to moscow but the state of the countess's health caused him to postpone his departure from day to day natasha who had easily and even cheerfully borne the first weeks of separation from her lover now every day grew more nervous and impatient the thought that she was wasting the best time of her life when she might so much better have been employing it in loving sacrifice for him constantly tormented her his letters generally merely served to annoy her it revolted her to think that when her life was nothing but a constant thought about him he was living in the great world of action seeing new places and new people who were full of interest to him the more fascinating his letters were the more they annoyed her her letters to him gave her no consolation they were nothing but tedious and hypocritical exercises she was not able to write freely because she could not realize the possibility of correctly expressing in a letter even the thousandth part of what she was accustomed to express with her voice her smile and her glance she wrote him perfunctory and monotonous letters the stupidity of which she herself acknowledged 
while her mother corrected in the rough draft the mistakes in spelling which she made the countess's health was still feeble but it was now no longer possible to put off the return to moscow it was necessary to arrange for the marriage settlement it was necessary to sell the mansion and moreover prince andrei was now expected in moscow where his father prince nikolai andreitch was spending the winter indeed natasha was certain that he had arrived already the countess remained in the country but the count taking sonya and natasha with him went to moscow toward the end of january end of chapter thirteen and this is the end of part four of volume two volume two part five chapter one of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne part five chapter one pierre after the engagement of prince andrei and natasha suddenly without any apparent reason began to find it impossible to pursue his former mode of life firmly as he was convinced of the truths revealed by the benefactor delightful as had been the first period of enthusiasm for the inward labor of self-improvement to which he had given himself up with such zeal all the charm of this former existence suddenly vanished after the betrothal of his friends and after the death of iosif alexievitch intelligence of which he received about the same time nothing but the empty skeleton of life remained to him his mansion with that brilliant wife of his who was still enjoying the favors of an influential personage his acquaintance with all petersburg and his duties at court with all their tedious formalities all this life of his suddenly began to fill pierre with unexpected loathing he ceased to write in his diary he shunned the society of the brethren he began once more to frequent the club and to drink heavily he became intimate with the gay young bachelor set and his behavior became such that the countess elena vasilievna found it necessary to give him a stern admonition pierre felt that she was right and in order not to compromise her he decided to go to moscow in moscow as soon as he set foot in his enormous house with the dried up and withered princesses and the swarm of menials as soon as he went out into town and saw the iverskaya chapel with its innumerable tapers burning before the golden shrines and the square of the kremlin with its sheet of untrodden snow the izvoschek's and the hovels of the Svitsev Vrazek, saw old Muscovites who, with never a desire or a quickening of the blood, lived out their days, the Muscovite dances, the Muscovite ballrooms, the Muscovite English club. He felt himself at home in a refuge of quiet. Life in Moscow gave him the sensation of comfort and warmth and coziness that one has in an old and dirty dressing-gown. Pierre was welcomed by all Moscow society, young and old, as a long-expected guest, whose place was always ready for him and never given to another. In the eyes of Moscow society, Pierre was most kindly, good-natured, intelligent, and benevolent, though eccentric, absent-minded, but cordial, a thoroughgoing Russian baron, of the old stamp. His purse was always empty, because it was opened to all. Benefits, wretched pictures, statuary, benevolent societies, gypsies, schools, subscription dinners, drinking bouts, the masons, churches, books. No one and nothing ever met with a refusal from him. And if it had not been for two friends of his, who had borrowed large sums of him and now took him under their guardianship, he would have had absolutely nothing left. At the club, no dinner or reception was complete without him as soon as he took his place on the ottoman after a couple bottles of margu the members would gather round him and vie with each other in all sorts of gossip discussions and clever stories if discussions degenerated into quarrels he would restore peace by his kindly smile alone or by a clever jest the masonic meetings were tedious and dull if he were absent often after dining with his bachelor friends he would yield with a genial and weakly smile to their entreaties and go with them where they went and help the hilarious young fellows wake the echoes with their wild enthusiastic shouts at the balls he would never refuse to dance if partners were scarce young matrons and young girls liked him because he was attentive especially after dinner to all alike without making invidious distinctions it was a common saying of him il est charmant il n'est pas de sexe 
Pierre had become simply a retired court chamberlain, good-naturedly vegetating in Moscow, like so many hundreds of others. How horror-struck he would have been if, seven years before, when he was just back from abroad, someone had told him that it was idle for him to seek out or invent a career. That the ruts in which he would move were long ago made for him, determined before the foundation of the world, and that, in spite of all his struggles, he should be what everyone in his position was doomed to be. He would not have been able to believe this. Had he not, with all his heart, wished at one time that a republic should be established in Russia, then that he might be a Napoleon, then a philosopher, then a general, the conqueror of Napoleon, had he not seen the possibility, and wished to take part in the mighty task, of regenerating depraved humanity, and of bringing himself to the highest degree of improvement, had he not established schools and infirmaries, and emancipated his peasantry. But instead of what he had dreamed, lo, here he was the rich husband of an unfaithful wife, a court chamberlain retired, a gourmand and wine-bibber, and easily inclined to criticize the government, a member of the English club, and a flattered habitué of Moscow society. It was long before he could reconcile himself to the thought that he himself was a court chamberlain living in Moscow, the very type of which he should have so deeply despised seven years before. Sometimes he comforted himself with the thought that this mode of life was only temporary, but then he would be terrified by another thought of how many people, just like himself, with all their hair and their teeth still good, had entered temporarily into this mode of life, and into this club, and were now passing from it, bald and toothless. In moments of pride, when he thought over his position, it seemed to him that he was of an entirely different nature, distinct from these retired chamberlains, whom he used to despise, that they were insipid and stupid, contented and satisfied with their position. While I, on the contrary, am utterly dissatisfied, my sole desire is to do something for humanity, he would say to himself, in such moments of pride. But perhaps all these colleagues of mine are just like myself, and have been struggling and seeking to find some new and original path through life, and, like myself, have, by sheer force of circumstances, by the conditions of society and birth, that elemental force against which man is powerless, been brought into the same condition as myself. This he would say to himself in moments of humility, and, after he had lived in Moscow for some time, he ceased to despise his colleagues, the retired courtiers, and began to like them, and to esteem them, and to pity them, as he did himself. Pierre no longer suffered, as formerly, from moments of despair, hypochondria, and disgust of life. But the same disease, which formerly had been made manifest by occasional attacks, had struck inward, and not for a moment ceased its insidious working. For what end? Why? For what purpose were we created in the world, he would ask himself, in perplexity many times every day, in spite of himself, beginning to reason out some explanation of life, but as he knew by experience that such questions as these must remain unanswered, he would strive in all haste to put them out of his mind, taking up a book, or going over to the club, or calling on Apollo Nikolaevich to talk over the gossip of the town. Elena Vysilyevna, whom no one ever cared for except for her body's sake, and who was one of the stupidest women in the world, said Pierre to himself, makes people believe that she is a woman of superior wit and refinement, and they bow down before her. Napoleon Bonaparte was despised by everyone until he became great, but since he has become a miserable comedian. The Emperor Franz is trying to make him take his daughter illegally for his wife. The Spaniards, through the Roman Catholic clergy, offered up prayers of thanksgiving to God for granting them a victory over the French on the 26th of June, while the French, through the medium of the same Catholic priesthood, offer up thanksgivings to the same God for having beaten the Spaniards on the 26th of June. My brethren, the Masons, solemnly swear that they will be ready to sacrifice all they possess for their neighbor, but, when the box is passed around, they do not contribute a single rouble for the poor. And the Astria Lodge intrigues against the manna-seekers, and they toil and moil for the sake of getting a genuine Scotch carpet and charter, though the meaning of it is not known even by the one who copies it off, and it is necessary to no one. All of us profess the Christian law of forgiveness of injuries, and of love for our neighbor, 
a law in obedience to which we have erected here in moscow eighty score churches while yesterday a deserter was flogged with a knout and the priest the servant of this same law of love and forgiveness presented the crucifix for the soldier to kiss before he received his punishment thus mused pierre and this whole universal falsehood which everybody acknowledges amazed him every time he thought of it just as though he were not used to it just as though it were some new thing i understand this falsehood and confusion he thought but how can i convince them of what i understand i have made the experiment and have always found that they in the depths of their hearts understand it just as i do but they strive not to see it of course it must be so but for me what ought i to do pierre asked himself he was undergoing the unhappy experience of many people especially russians who have not only the faculty of seeing and realizing the possibility of goodness and right but of seeing too clearly the falsity and deception of life to feel able to take any serious part in it every department of activity was in his eyes complicated with falsehood and deception whatever he had tried to be whatever he had tried to accomplish he always found himself jostled by this knavery and falsehood with his path of activity completely blocked but meantime it was necessary for him to live necessary for him to find occupation it was too terrible for him to be under the weight of these unsolvable problems of life and so he gave himself up to the first temptation in order to forget them he frequented the society of all sorts and conditions of men he drank deeply he purchased paintings he built houses and chief of all he read he read and read everything that came into his hands and he was such an omnivorous reader that even when on his return home his valet came in to undress him he continued his reading and after reading till he was tired he would fall asleep and the next morning he would go to the club or call on acquaintances and talk gossip and from there go to some wanton rout where wine and women served to occupy his mind and thus around the circle again from spree to reading and then his idle gossip and wine strong drink was becoming for him constantly a greater and greater physical and even moral necessity although the doctors warned him that wine was dangerous to him on account of his corpulency he still continued to drink heavily he felt perfectly happy only when without knowing or caring how he had poured down his capacious throat several glasses of wine and begun to experience the pleasant warmth spreading through his frame and good will toward all the human race and a mental readiness superficially to touch upon any question without pretending to penetrate deeply into its inner nature only after he had drunk a bottle or two of wine would he vaguely feel that this complicated terrible coil of life which had formerly appalled him was now not so appalling as it had seemed with a roaring in his ears as he idly chatted or listened to stories or read his books after dinner or supper he saw this tangle of doubts constantly facing him on every side but it was only under the influence of wine that he could say to himself this is nothing i will put it away for the present for i have an explanation already but now is no time i will think it all out by and by this by and by never came when his stomach was empty the next morning all the former questions arose just as unsolvable and terrible and pierre hastened to seize his book and was delighted when any one came to call upon him sometimes pierre remembered what he had heard of soldiers at war that when they are lying idle under fire they eagerly strive to invent some diversion so as the more easily to forget the threatening danger and it seemed to pierre that all men were similar soldiers distracting themselves from life some by ambition others by cards others by codifying laws others by women play horses some by politics others by sport by wine by statecraft there is nothing insignificant there is nothing of great importance all is the same in the end only how can i save myself from it thought pierre only by not seeing it this terrible it end of chapter one Part Five, Chapter Two of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Two. Early in the winter, Prince Nikolai Andreyitch Bolkonsky and his daughter took up their residence in Moscow. 
the fame of his past life the keenness of his intellect and his bold originality immediately caused him to be regarded by the muscovites with special admiration and respect and as the popular enthusiasm for the emperor alexander's management of affairs had notoriously cooled off and given place to an anti-french and nationalistic tendency now all the vogue in moscow he had become the centre of the opposition to the government the prince had aged very considerably during the year past he now began to manifest some of the acute symptoms of old age unexpected naps forgetfulness of recent events and vivid remembrance of those long past and the childish vanity with which he accepted the role of chief of the muscovite opposition nevertheless when the old prince came down to evening tea in his fur shubka and powdered wig and at any one's instigation began to tell his pithy anecdotes about the days gone by or deliver his still pithier and harsher judgments upon the present he inspired in all his guests a single feeling of sincere respect in the eyes of visitors the old-fashioned house with its huge pier-glasses its anti-revolutionary furniture its powdered lackeys presided over by this severe and intelligent old man of a past generation with his gentle daughter and the pretty frenchwoman who treated him with such deference presented an impressive but agreeable spectacle but these visitors did not realize that over and above the two or three hours when they saw the household there were twenty-two more each day during which the inner life of the house went on unseen this inner life had recently especially during their stay in moscow become exceedingly trying for the princess maria in moscow she was deprived of her dearest pleasures the visits from her pilgrims and the solitude which gave her such consolation at louisia Gurie. she could find no comfort or joy in the crowded city she did not go into society everybody knew that her father would not allow her to go without him and his health was too precarious to permit him to go out and consequently she received no invitations to dinner parties or balls she had renounced all hope of ever getting married she had too often witnessed the coldness and irritability with which he received and dismissed such young men as occasionally came to their house and who might have been her suitors the princess maria had no friends since her arrival in moscow her eyes had been opened in regard to the two who had been more intimate with her than all the rest mademoiselle burine in whom even in times past she could not feel perfect confidence had now become positively disagreeable to her and for several reasons she felt obliged to hold her at a distance julie with whom she had kept up an uninterrupted correspondence for five years was in moscow but she seemed like an utter stranger to her when they met again face to face julie by the death of her brothers had become one of the wealthiest girls in moscow and was completely absorbed in the pleasures of fashionable society she was surrounded by young men who she said to herself had suddenly awakened to the appreciation of her merits she found herself now rapidly growing old and felt that her last chance of finding a husband was passing and that now or never her fate must be decided the princess maria with a melancholy smile remembered as each thursday came round that now she had no one to write to since julie whose presence gave her no delight was in town and she could see her every week she like the old french emigre who refused to marry the lady at whose house he had spent all his evenings for a number of years was sorry that julie was so near because now she should have no one to write to she had no one in moscow to whom she could confide her sorrows and since coming there these sorrows had increased and multiplied the time for prince andrei's return and for his marriage was drawing nigh but his father seemed no more inclined than before to listen to his entreaties and sanction it on the contrary he would hear nothing to it and the mere mention of the countess rostova drove the old prince beside himself as it was he was in a bad temper the greater part of the time the princess maria had a new and additional trial at this time in the lessons which she gave her six-year-old nephew in her treatment of nikolushka she recognized with dismay that she was liable to fits of irritability similar to her father's no matter how many times she reproached herself for losing her temper during his lesson hours it happened almost every time when she sat down with the pointer to teach him his french alphabet that from her very desire to help him along as rapidly as possible to make his tasks easy and give the little fellow all the superfluity of her own knowledge the slightest inattention on the part of the little boy who was afraid to begin with of an outbreak of his aunt's irascibility would make her tremble with indignation lose her patience grow angry and raise her voice 
and sometimes even seize him by the arm and stand him in the corner. After doing this, she would begin to shed tears over her hasty temper, her ugly nature, and Nikolushka, sobbing out of sympathy, would leave his corner without permission, run up to her, and pull her tear-wet hands from her face and try to comfort her. But by far the greatest trial of all was caused the princess by her father's irritability, which was always vented upon his daughter, and which of late became even cruelty. If he had compelled her to do penance all night long with prayers and genuflections, if he had struck her, if he had compelled her to draw wood and water, it would have never occurred to her that her position was hard. But this loving tyrant, all the more terrible from the very fact that he loved her, and therefore tormented both himself and her, took especial pains not only to insult and humiliate her, but to make her feel that she was always and forever in the wrong. And latterly he discovered a new whim, which tormented the Princess Maria more than all else put together. This was his constantly increasing friendship for Mademoiselle Burine. First suggested to his maid by the news of Prince Andrei's engagement, the farcical notion that, if his son were going to marry, then he would marry Burine, evidently flattered his fancy, and of late he had stubbornly lavished especial attentions on the Frenchwoman, for the special purpose, as it seemed to the Princess Maria, of affronting herself, and of expressing his disapprobation of his daughter by making love to Burine. In Moscow, on one occasion, when the Princess Maria was present, it seemed to her that her father chose that time on purpose— the old prince kissed Mademoiselle Burine's hand, and, drawing her to him, embraced and fondled her. The Princess Maria flushed with anger and left the room. After a few moments Mademoiselle Burine rejoined her, smiling, and began to tell some entertaining story in her agreeable voice. The Princess Maria hastily wiped away her tears, went with decided steps straight to Burine, and, evidently not knowing what she was doing, began to shout at the Frenchman in furious haste and with explosive accents. It is shameful, contemptible, beastly, to take advantage of a man's weakness. She did not conclude her sentence. Leave my room, she fairly screamed, and then burst into tears again. The following day, the prince said not a word to his daughter, but she observed that at dinner he ordered Mademoiselle Burine to be served in precedence of all others. At the end of the dinner, when the butler, according to his usual custom, handed the coffee round, serving the princess first, the old prince suddenly flew into a passion, flung his cane at Philip, and instantly gave orders that he should be sent to serve as a soldier. "'You didn't obey me. Twice I told you. You didn't obey me. She's the first person in this house. She is my best friend,' screamed the prince. "'And if you,' he added in a perfect fury, for the first time addressing his daughter, "'if you permit yourself, if you dare,' another time, as you did this evening, to forget your duty before her, then I will show you who is master of this house. Away with you, out of my sight. Here, beg her pardon. The Princess Maria begged Emily Burine's pardon, and then interceded with her father for the butler Philip. At such moments there arose in the Princess Maria's soul a feeling like the pride of an immolated victim— and then, again, at such moments, this father whom she blamed would either search for his spectacles, not seeing them, when they were close at hand, or would forget what had only just happened, or would stagger along on weakening limbs, glancing lest anyone should have seen his feebleness, or, what was worse than all, after dinner, when there were no guests to keep him awake, would suddenly fall into a doze, dropping his napkin and nodding his head over his plate. He is old and feeble and do I dare to judge him, she would think at such moments, with revulsion of feeling and disgust at herself. End of chapter 2 Part 5, Chapter 3 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 3 in 1811 there was living in Moscow a French doctor, Metivier, a handsome man of gigantic frame, amiable after the manner of his nation, and, as was said by everyone, a physician of extraordinary skill. He had rapidly become fashionable, and was received in the houses of the highest aristocracy not merely as a doctor, but as an equal. Prince Nikolai Andreitch, who had always scoffed at medical science, had lately, by Mademoiselle Burine's advice, 
consulted this doctor, and soon became accustomed to him. Metivier used to visit him twice a week. On the 6th of December, O.S., St. Nicholas's Day, all Moscow called at the prince's door, but he gave orders to admit no one. He commanded, however, that a select few, whose names he handed to the Princess Maria, should be bidden to dinner. Metivier came that morning with his congratulations, and in his capacity of physician took it upon him to violate the orders, de force la consigne, as he expressed it to the Princess Maria, and he went in to see the prince. It chanced that this morning the old prince was in one of his most detestable moods. The whole morning he wandered up and down the house, finding fault with every one, and pretending not to understand anything that was said to him, and that they would not understand him. The Princess Maria knew only too well that this mood betokened a latent and persistent querulousness that was certain to flash out in a tempest of fury, and all that morning, the Prince's name-day, she expected the outbreak, which was sure to go off as a loaded musket at full cock until the doctor's arrival the morning passed in comparative serenity having admitted the doctor the princess maria took her book and sat down in the drawing-room near a door where she could hear all that was going on in the prince's cabinet at first she only heard metivier's voice then her father's then both voices speaking at once then the door opened and the dark-haired metivier appeared on the threshold his handsome face expressing alarm followed by the prince in his nightcap and dressing-gown his face distorted with passion, and the pupils of his eyes dilated. "'Haven't you any wits?' screamed the prince. "'Well, I have. You slave of Bonaparte! You spy! Out of my house! Get out, I tell you!' And he slammed the door. Metivier, shrugging his shoulders, went to Mademoiselle Burine, who, on hearing the loud voices, had rushed in from the adjoining room. "'The prince is not very well.' bilious and cerebral congestion i will come in again to-morrow don't be worried said metivier and laying his fingers on his lips he hastened out the prince was heard walking up and down in his room in his slippers and shouting spies traitors traitors everywhere not a moment's peace even in my own house after metivier's departure the old prince summoned his daughter to him and the whole brunt of his fury fell upon her she was to blame for admitting spies into his presence. Why, he had told her, said he, that she was to write down a list, and not to admit any one who was not on that list. Why, then, had she admitted this scoundrel? It was all her fault. He could not have a moment's rest with her, not even die in peace, said he. No, Matushka, you might as well make up your mind to it. We must part. We must part. I can't stand this sort of thing any more, he exclaimed, and left the room. And then, as though fearing that she might not understand how thoroughly his mind was made up, he came back to her, and, endeavoring to assume an expression of calmness, he added, And don't you for a moment imagine that I say this to you in passion. No, I am perfectly calm, and I have made up my mind after full deliberation, and it shall be. We must part, find a home somewhere else but he could not restrain himself, and, with a flash of indignation possible only to one who loves, he, though evidently suffering himself, shook his fist in her face and screamed, "'And why on earth hasn't some idiot taken her for his wife?' He slammed the door after him, and Mademoiselle Burine called to him, and quiet reigned in his cabinet. At two o'clock the six persons invited to dinner arrived. These guests, the distinguished Count Rostovchin, Prince Lupukhkin and his nephew, General Chatrov, an old companion in arms of the princes, and for young men, Pierre, and Boris Dubretskoy, were waiting for him in the drawing-room. Having recently come to Moscow on leave of absence, Boris had been anxious to make the acquaintance of Prince Nikolai Andreitch, and he had so far succeeded in winning his good graces that the prince made an exception in his case and received him in spite of his being an eligible young bachelor. The prince's house was not what one calls fashionable, but it was the centre of a small circle which, though it made little noise in the city, gave a more flattering distinction than any other to those who were admitted to it. This was made evident to Boris a week before, when he overheard Rostopchin tell the governor-general of the city, who invited him to dinner on St. Nicholas's Day, that it was impossible. On that day I always go and worship the relics of Prince Nikolai Andreitch. Oh, yes, yes, replied the governor-general. How is he? 
the little company gathered before dinner in the old-fashioned high-studded drawing-room with its ancient furniture was like the gathering of a solemn court of justice no one had much to say and if they spoke it was in low tones prince nikolai andreitch came in silent and preoccupied the princess maria seemed even more quiet and timid than usual the guests took no pains to talk with her for they saw that she was not attending to what they said count rostopchin was the only one who kept up the thread of conversation speaking now of the latest news in the city and now of politics in general lupopkin and the old general rarely took any share in it prince nikolai andreitch listened as a superior judge listens to a report presented to him only by his significant silence or by some curt monosyllable now and then showing that he followed the drift of what was said the tone of the conversation made it evident that no one took any satisfaction in what was going on in the political world they spoke of recent events as though they were convinced that everything was going from bad to worse but in all their anecdotes and criticisms it was noticeable how each speaker came to a stop or was brought to a stop every time at that borderland where there was any possibility of personal reflections on his majesty the emperor the conversation at dinner turned on the most recent political news the seizure by napoleon of the possessions of the duke of oldenburg and the russian note hostile to napoleon which had been dispatched to all the courts throughout europe bonaparte treats europe as a pirate treats the ships he has captured said count rostopchin repeating an epigram that he had already got off a number of times before you can only marvel at the forbearance or blindness of the sovereigns now it is the pope's turn and bonaparte is calmly proceeding to humiliate the head of the catholic religion and not a voice is raised in protest our sovereign is the only one who protests against the occupation of the duchy of oldenburg but then count rostopchin came to a pause conscious of having reached that point where criticism was impossible he was offered other positions instead of oldenburg said prince nikolai andreitch just as i transfer peasants from luisia guriae to bogucharovo or to my raisin estates he does with dukes the duke of oldenburg shows great force of character and bears his misfortune with admirable resignation said boris modestly joining the conversation he made this remark because on his way from petersburg he had been honoured with an introduction to the duke prince nikolai andreitch gave the young man a look as though he had it in his mind to make some reply to this but checked himself feeling that boris was too young for him to waste his sarcasm upon I have read our protest in regard to the Oldenburg affair, and was amazed at the bad style in which it was written, said Count Rostopchin, in the easy-going tone of a man who knows perfectly well what he is talking about. Pierre looked at Rostopchin in naive amazement, unable to comprehend why he should be disturbed at the wretched style of the note. What difference does it make how the note was written, Count, provided the subject matter is vigorous, said he. My dear fellow, I think, with our army of five hundred thousand men, it might just as well have been couched in a good style said count rostopchin pierre understood now why count rostopchin was disturbed by the wretched writing of the note it seems to me there's a plentiful crop of penny aligners nowadays said the old prince yonder in petersburg everybody is writing not only notes but new laws all the time my andrusia has been scribbling a whole volume of laws for russia there today everybody is scribbling and he laughed unnaturally the conversation languished for a moment then the old general called attention to himself by a preliminary cough have you heard of what took place recently at a review at petersburg how the new french ambassador acted what was that yes i heard something about it he made a very awkward remark in his majesty's presence i believe his majesty called attention to the division of grenadiers and their splendid marching pursued general chartoff but it seems the ambassador showed absolute indifference and permitted himself to say that at home in france they did not waste their time on such trivialities the sovereign did not deign to give him any answer but they say that at the subsequent review he did not say a word to him all were silent it was out of the question to make any comment on this occurrence since it concerned the monarch personally insolent wretches exclaimed the prince do you know metivier i showed him out of the house to-day he came and was admitted, although I had given special orders to admit no one, said the prince, with an angry look at his daughter. And then he repeated his whole conversation with the French doctor, and gave the reasons that made him think Metivier a spy. Though these reasons were inconclusive and obscure, no one made any criticism. 
After the roast, the champagne was handed around. The guests rose to their feet, offering the old prince their congratulations. The Princess Maria also went round to him. He gave her a cold, angry look, and put up his wrinkled, clean-shaven cheek for her to kiss. The whole expression of his face told her that their conversation of the morning had not been forgotten, that his mind was just as fully made up, and that only the presence of his guests prevented him from saying the same thing over again. When they went into the drawing-room for coffee, the older members of the company sat down together. Prince Nikolai Andreyitch grew more animated and expressed his mind freely in regard to the war then just beginning. He declared that our wars with Bonaparte had hitherto been unsuccessful and would be so long as we tried to make common cause with the Germans and meddle with European affairs as we were compelled to do by the presence of Tilsit. There was no sense in our battling either for or against Austria. Our policy lay in the east, and, as far as Bonaparte was concerned, we required only one thing, to protect our frontier, to have some firmness in our policy, and never let him dare to cross our Russian frontier, as he did in 1807. "'And how is it possible for us to fight against the French, Prince?' asked Count Rostopchin. "'Can we take up arms against our teachers, our gods? Look at our young men, look at our young ladies. Our gods are the French. Our kingdom of heaven is Paris.' He had raised his voice, evidently, so that all might hear him. Our costumes are French. Our ideas are French. Our sentiments are French. You put out Metivier because he is a Frenchman, a good-for-nothing fellow. But our ladies grovel before him on their very knees. And last evening, at a party, out of the five ladies, three were Roman Catholics. And these were working on canvas embroidery, on Sunday, by virtue of a dispensation from the Pope. And there they sat, almost naked, for all the world like signboards for a public bathhouse, if I may be allowed the expression. Ugh! When I look at our young dandies, Prince, I feel inclined to take the cudgel of Peter the Great from the museum and break the ribs for them in good old Russian style. That would put an end to all their whimsies. All were silent. The old prince, with a smile on his face, looked at Rostopchin and nodded his head in assent. Well, Prescetti, good-bye. Your illustriousness, take care of your health, said Rostopchin, rising with the abrupt motions characteristic of him and offering his hand. Good-bye, my dear. You're like a lute. I always like to hear you, said the old prince, lying his hand on his arm and offering his cheek for a kiss. The others also got up with Rostopchin. End of chapter 3《Part V, Chapter IV of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter IV. Princess Maria, as she sat in the drawing room and listened to the conversation and criticisms of the old men, understood nothing of what she heard. Her sole preoccupation was whether these guests had remarked the ill will that her father showed toward her. She had not even noticed the peculiar attentions and civilities showed her all throughout the dinner hour by Drubetskoy, who was now making his third visit to the house. The princess, with a strangely abstracted and questioning glance, turned to Pierre, who, hat in hand and with a smiling face, was the last of the guests to come and pay her his parting respects after the old prince had retired. Thus it happened that the two were left together in the drawing-room. "'May I stay a little longer?' he asked, suiting his action to the word— by depositing his corpulent frame on an easy chair near the Princess Maria. "'Oh, yes, certainly,' replied she. Her glance seemed to ask, "'Have you remarked anything unusual?' Pierre was now in a happy after-dinner frame of mind. He gazed musingly straight forward and smiled gently. "'Have you known that young man long, Princess?' he asked. "'What young man?' Drubetskoy. "'No, not very long.' "'Well, do you like him?' "'Yes, he is a pleasant young fellow. "'Why do you ask?' said the princess, "'her mind still on her morning's conversation with her father. "'Because I have made a discovery. "'The young man has come on leave of absence from Petersburg "'with the sole and special purpose of marrying a rich wife.' "'You have made that discovery?' exclaimed the princess Maria. "'Yes,' pursued Pierre, with a smile. "'And this young man so manages it "'that where the rich girls are gathered together, "'there he also is to be found.' He is now undecided which to attack, you or Mademoiselle Julie Carrigina. Il est très assidu, au d'elle. 
Yes, he's very attentive to her. He goes there, then? Yes, very often. And do you know the new way of making love, inquired Pierre, with a cheery smile, evidently lapsing into that jolly spirit of good-humoured ridicule for which he so often had reproached himself in his diary. No, replied the princess. In these days, in order to please the young ladies of Moscow, il fell être melancolique, et elle est très melancolique auprès de Mademoiselle Caragarine, said Pierre. Really, exclaimed the princess, gazing into Pierre's good face, and persistently thinking about her trials. It would be so much easier, she thought, if I could only make up my mind to confide in some one all my thoughts and feelings, and I should like especially to tell Pierre everything. He is so good and noble. It would certainly be easier for me. He would give me his advice. Would you marry him? asked Pierre. Oh, good gracious, Count! There are times when I would marry any one, suddenly exclaimed the Princess Maria, unexpectedly to herself, and with tears in her voice. Ugh, oh, how hard it is to love a near kinsman, and feel that— No matter, though, she went on to say, with trembling voice, you cannot do anything for him but only annoy him, and when you know that you cannot help things otherwise, then there is only one thing, only one thing to do, to go away. But where could I go? What is it? What is the matter with you, princess? But the princess, without being able longer to control herself, burst into tears. I don't know what is the matter with me today. Do not criticize me. Forget what I have said to you. All Pierre's gaiety was gone. He anxiously questioned the princess, begging her to tell him everything, to confide her trials to him. But her only reply was to beseech him to forget what she had said, that she herself did not remember what she had said, and that she had no trials except the one which he knew about already, that Prince Andrei's marriage threatened to bring about a quarrel between her father and brother. "'Have you heard anything about the Rostovs?' she asked, for the purpose of diverting the conversation. "'I am told that they will be here soon. Andrei, also, I am expecting any day. I should have liked for them to meet here.' "'And how does he look upon the matter now?' asked Pierre, meaning by the pronoun the old prince, her father." The Princess Maria shook her head. "'But what is to be done? The year will be up now in a few months, and this can never be. I only wish I could spare my brother the first minutes. I wish the Rostovs would come very soon. I hope to make their acquaintance. You have known them for a long time, have you not?' asked the Princess Maria. "'Tell me, with your hand on your heart, exactly the honest truth. What kind of a girl is she, and how do you like her? I want the whole truth because Andre, you know, takes such a tremendous risk in doing this against his father's will, that I should like to know just how it is. A dull instinct told Pierre that in this repeated demand to hear the whole truth was betrayed the Princess Maria's ill will toward her prospective sister-in-law, and that she had an idea that Pierre would not approve of Prince Andre's choice, but Pierre told her not so much what he thought as felt. "'I don't know how to answer your question,' he said, reddening without any reason." I really don't know what kind of a girl she is. I can never analyze her. She is fascinating. But what makes her so, I can't tell you. And that is all I can say in regard to her. The Princess Maria sighed, and the expression of her face said, Yes, that is what I expected and feared. Is she intellectual? asked the Princess. Pierre deliberated. I think not, said he. But perhaps she is. She does not think it necessary to be intellectual. But, on the other hand, she is fascinating, no one more so. The Princess Maria again shook her head disapprovingly. Ugh, how I hope that I shall love her. You tell her so if you see her before I do. I hear that they will be here in a few days, said Pierre. The Princess Maria confided to Pierre her plan for making the acquaintance of her prospective sister-in-law as soon as she came to Moscow, and then trying to reconcile the old prince to her. End of chapter 4
there he found himself undecided between two of the wealthiest girls in town julie and the princess maria although the princess maria in spite of her plain features seemed to him more attractive than julie karagina there were difficulties in the way of paying his addresses to bolkonsky's daughter at his last meeting with her on the old prince's name-day she had replied to all his tentative remarks on the subject of the feelings so at haphazard that it was evident that she had not heard what he said julie on the other hand received his attentions only too gladly though in a way peculiar to herself alone julie was twenty-seven after the death of her brother she had become very rich she was now very far from being a beauty but she had conceived the idea that not only was she as pretty but far more captivating than she had ever been before in this illusion she was sustained by the facts that in the first place she had become a very rich maiden and in the second place as she grew older and older men found her less dangerous and were able to gather round her with more freedom since they felt that they were not incurring any obligations in taking advantages of the suppers receptions and jolly society in general that frequented her house men who ten years before would have thought a second time about going every day to a house where there was a young girl of seventeen lest they should compromise her and get entangled themselves now unhesitatingly appeared there daily and treated her not as a marriageable damsel but as an acquaintance irrespective of sex the karagins that winter entertained more pleasantly and hospitably than any one else in moscow besides the formal receptions and state dinners they every day entertained a numerous society especially of men who ate supper at midnight and broke up at three o'clock in the morning nor was julie willing to miss a ball an entertainment or a new play at the theatre her toilettes were always in the height of the fashion but nevertheless julie pretended to be disenchanted with all life she told everybody that she had no belief in friendship or in love or in any of the pleasures of this world and hoped for peace only yonder she affected the tone of a maiden who has endured great disappointment of one for instance who had been disappointed in the man she loved or cruelly deceived in him although nothing of the sort had ever happened to her it began to be thought that such was the case and she herself came to believe that her sufferings in life had been grievous this melancholia did not stand in the way of her enjoying herself or prevent the young men who came to her house from having a delightful time there every guest who went there paid his tribute to his hostess's melancholic mood and then fell to talking about the things of this world and dancing and intellectual games and the capping of verses or borim which were greatly in vogue at the Kerrigans. some few of the young men boris among them took a deeper interest in julie's melancholy moods and with these young men she had longer and more confidential conversations about the vanity of all things terrestrial and she showed them her albums filled with gloomy drawings apothems and couplets julie treated boris with a special favor she mourned with him over his lost illusions she offered him those consolations of friendship which she was so well able to offer having herself suffered so much in life she also showed him her album boris made a sketch of two trees with the legend o solitary trees your dark boughs scatter down upon me gloom and melancholy on another page he drew a picture of a tomb and wrote tis death that gives us succor death that gives us peace alas tis then alone that earthly sorrows cease julie declared that couplet to be charming there is something so ravishing in the smile of melancholy said she to boris quoting word for word a passage from a book she was reading tis a ray of light falling in darkness a shadow's difference between sorrow and despair affording the hope of coming consolation whereupon boris wrote for her these lines oh poisoned ailment of souls too sensitive thou that alone doth make it sweet for me to live mild melancholy come thy consolation bring the torments of my gloomy solitude o oh, calm mingle thy secret soothing balm with tears that never cease to spring julie played on her harp for boris her most melancholy nocturnes boris read aloud to her poor liza and more than once had to pause in his reading because of the emotion which overmastered him when they met in society julie and boris exchanged glances to signify that they were the only people in the world capable of understanding and appreciating each other 
Anna Mikhailovna, who was a frequent visitor at the Karagins, and always managed to be a partner with Julie's mother, took especial pains to procure all possible information in regard to Julie's fortune, which consisted of two estates in the vicinity of Penza, and forest lands near Nizhny Novgorod. Anna Mikhailovna, with humble dependence on the will of Providence, and with deep emotion, looked upon the etherealized melancholy which served as a bond between her son and the wealthy Julie. Toujours charmante et melancolique, cette chère Julie, she would say to the daughter. Boris says that here in your house he finds rest for his soul. He has suffered the loss of so many illusions, and he is so sensitive, she would say to the mother. Ach, my dear, I cannot tell you how devoted I am to Julie of late, she would say to her son. And who could help loving her? She is such a celestial creature. Ach, Boris, Boris, she was silent for a minute. And how sorry I am for her maman, she went on to say. Today she was showing me her accounts and letters from Penza, where they have colossal estates, and it is so trying for her to have no one to help her. They cheat her so. Boris's face wore an almost imperceptible smile as he listened to his mother's words. He was quietly amused at her transparent shrewdness, but he listened to her and sometimes asked her questions in regard to these Prenzensk and Nitegorodsky properties. Julie had for some time been looking for a proposal from her melancholy-souled adorer, and she was ready to accept him, but some secret antipathy toward her, a distaste of her evident desire to get married, and of her affections, and a feeling of horror at thus practically repudiating the bliss of true love, still kept Boris at a distance. His leave of absence was now drawing to a close. He spent long hours, and every Sunday, at the Kerrigan's, and every day, when he came to think the matter over, he would decide that his proposal should take place on the morrow. But when he was in Julie's company, and saw her red face and chin, almost always dusted with powder, her moist eyes and the expression of her face, which seemed ready, at a moment's notice, to fly from melancholy to the equally natural enthusiasm and rapture of wedded bliss, Boris could not bring himself to utter the decisive words although in his imagination he had for some time looked upon himself as the prospective master of the Kerrigan estates, and had many times overspent the income arising therefrom. Julie noticed Boris's infirmity of purpose, and it sometimes occurred to her that he had an antipathy for her, but her feminine vanity quickly restored her confidence, and she would assure herself that it was merely his love that made him so bashful. Her melancholia, however, was beginning to change into vexation, and a short time before the time of Boris's departure, she was thinking of adopting some decisive plan. Just before Boris's leave of absence drew to a close, Anatole Kurigan made his appearance in Moscow, and, as a matter of course, in the Kerrigan's drawing-room. And Julie, abruptly arousing from her melancholy, became very cheerful and manifested great friendliness toward Kurigan. Mon cher, said Anna Mikhailovna to her son, I know on good authority that Prince Vasily has sent his son to Moscow to make a match with Julie. I am so fond of Julie that I should be very sorry for her. What do you think about it, my dear? asked Anna Mikhailovna. Boris was thoroughly humiliated at the thought of being left out in the cold, and of having wasted his whole month in arduous, melancholic service of Julie, and of seeing another man, especially such an idiot as Anatole, having control of that income from the Prinzensk estates, which he was already, in his imagination, enjoying and profiting by. He went to the Kerrigans with a full determination to offer himself. Julie met him with a gay and careless mien, giving him a merry account of what a good time she had enjoyed at the ball the evening before, and asked him when he was going back. In spite of the fact that Boris had come with the intention of confessing his love, and had, therefore, decided to be tenderly sentimental, he immediately began, in a tone of irritation, to complain of women's inconstancy, pointing out how easy it was for women to shift from gloom to glee, and that their moods depended wholly upon the one who happened to be dancing attendance upon them. Julie took offence at this, and declared that he was right, that women needed variety, and nothing was more annoying to any one than to have a perpetual sameness. "'Then I should advise you,' began Boris, with the intention of winging a sharp retort, but at that instant came the humiliating thought that he was on the point of leaving Moscow without attaining his wished-for end, and at the cost of wasted labor, a thing to which he was unaccustomed. He paused in the middle of his sentence, dropped his eyes to avoid seeing the look of disagreeable annoyance and indecision on her face, and said, However, 
it was not at all for the purpose of quarrelling with you that i came here on the contrary he looked at her to see whether she would encourage him to proceed all expression of annoyance had suddenly vanished and her restless imploring eyes were fixed upon him with greedy expectation i can always manage so as to keep out of her way thought boris here i am for it might as well finish he flushed crimson raised his eyes to hers and said you know my sentiments toward you there was no need of saying more julie's face had become radiant with triumph and satisfaction but she compelled boris to tell her all that was customary to say in such circumstances to tell her that he loved her and that he had never loved any one else so passionately she knew that in exchange for her penzensk estates and nizagorodsky forests she had a right to exact this and she obtained what she wished the young couple with no further thoughts of solitary trees shedding gloom and melancholy laid their plans for the future establishment of a magnificent home in petersburg made calls and got everything ready for a brilliant wedding end of chapter five part five chapter six of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 6 Count Ilya Andreevich, together with Natasha and Sonya, arrived in Moscow toward the end of January. The countess was still ailing and was unable to travel, but it was out of the question to wait for her recovery. Prince Andrei was expected in Moscow every day, and, besides, it was important to purchase Natasha's wedding outfit. It was necessary to sell the Podmoskovnaya estate, and it was necessary to take advantage of the old prince's presence in moscow in order that he might become acquainted with his future daughter-in-law the rostovs moscow house had not been warmed besides they were to be in town for only a short time and the countess was not with them accordingly ilya andreitch decided to accept the hospitality of marya dmitrievna akrovzimova who had long ago urged them to come to her late one evening the four coaches on runners conveying the rostovs drove into marya dmitrievna's courtyard on the old kanyushinaya street marya dmitrievna lived alone her daughter was married all of her sons were in the government service she was just as erect as ever her words were as much to the point she always expressed her opinion to every one in a loud and decided voice and her whole personality seemed to be a living reproach against all weaknesses passions and impulses the necessity of which she utterly denied from early morning dressed in her jacket she gave personal attention to the domestic arrangements and then went out for a drive if it were a holy day to mass and thence to the prisons and jails where she had business that she never mentioned to any one on ordinary days on finishing her toilet she received applicants of every rank and condition who chanced to come to her door her charities having been dispensed she dined and this abundant and well-ordered meal was always shared by three or four guests after dinner she made up a table for boston late in the evening she had newspapers or some new book read aloud to her while she sat with her knitting she rarely accepted invitations and if she ever made any exceptions it was only in favor of the most important personages of the city she had not yet retired when the rostovs arrived as the door into the hall creaked on its hinges and admitted the travellers and their retinue of servants together with a rush of cold air marya dmitrievna with her spectacles toward the end of her nose came and stood in the doorway her head erect and gazed at the visitors with a stern and solemn face one might have thought that she was really angry and was about to turn the intruders out if she had not been heard at that very instant to give the most urgent orders in regard to the disposition of her guests and their luggage the counts bring them this way said she indicating certain trunks and not stopping to greet any of the party the young ladies this way to the left well and what are you gaping there for she cried to the maids have the samovar got ready plumper and prettier than ever she cried taking possession of natasha whose face under her hood was all rosy with the cold Phew! how cold you are there get off your wraps as quick as ever you can she cried to the count who was bending over to kiss her hand you're frozen most likely have some rum put in with the tea sonyushka bonjour said she to sonya showing by this french phrase and the pet diminutive 
her rather condescending and yet affectionate relationship to the girl when they had taken off their wraps and put themselves to rights after their journey they gathered round the tea-table and marya dmitrievna kissed them all in turn i am right glad that you have come and that you have put up at my house said she it is high time she went on giving natasha a significant look the old man is here and his son is expected from day to day you must you certainly must make his acquaintance well we'll talk about all this by and by she added giving sonya a look as much as to say that she did not care to talk about this in her presence now listen said she addressing the count what are your plans for tomorrow whom will you send for shinshin she doubled over one finger then that snivelling anna mikhailovna too she and her son are here sons to be married then uzakoy i suppose he and his wife are here he ran away from her but she came traipsing after him he dined with me on wednesday well then and these she indicated the young ladies i will take them tomorrow to the iverskaya chapel and then to albert chalmay's of course everything will have to be got new for them don't judge by me such sleeves they wear these days recently the young princess irina vasilyevna came to call upon me she was a marvel to see she had sleeves like two barrels on her arms you see there's some new fashion every day and what business have you on hand she asked turning sternly upon the count everything in the quickest possible time replied the count to buy the girls duds and to find a purchaser for my podmotskovanyoa land and house and so if you will allow me i will tear myself away for a little while and slip off to marinskoya for a day and leave my girls with you very good very good they'll be safe with me they couldn't be safer with the orphans aid society i'll take them wherever they need to go and scold them and spoil them with flattery said marya dmitrievna stroking with her big hand the cheek of her favorite goddaughter natasha the following morning they went to pray before the iverskaya virgin and to see mademoiselle aubert who stood in such awe of Maria Dmitrievna that, in order to get rid of her as soon as possible, she would always sell her goods at a positive loss. Maria Dmitrievna ordered there the larger part of the trousseau. On their return she drove everybody else out of the room and called Natasha to her armchair. Now, then, we can have a talk. I congratulate you on your choice. You have secured a fine young man. I am glad for you. I have known him ever since he was so high. She put her hand an arshin from the floor natasha colored with pleasure i am fond of him and of all his family now listen you know very well that the old prince nikolai is very averse to having his son marry a whimsical old man however prince andrei is not a child and his permission is not necessary still it is not pleasant to enter a family against their will we must act quietly and with tact you are clever we will manage to bring him round where he ought to be. You must accomplish it by your sweetness and cleverness. That's all it requires, and it will come out all right. Natasha made no reply. From shyness, Maria Dmitrievna supposed, but in reality because it was so annoying to Natasha that anyone should meddle with her love affair with Prince Andrei, for it seemed to her so entirely above and beyond all ordinary human concerns that no one else, in her opinion, could understand it she loved and admired prince andrei alone he loved her and was coming in a few days and would make her his that was all sufficient you see i have known him for a long time and mashenka also your future sister-in-law i am fond of her in spite of the proverb about husbands sisters she would not hurt a fly she asked me to introduce her to you you and your father must go there to-morrow be sure to be very sweet to her for you are younger than she is before your friend comes you will have already become acquainted with his sister and his father and they will have grown fond of you am i not right isn't that best yes replied natasha with little heartiness end of chapter six part five chapter seven of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 7 On the following day, by Marya Dmitrievna's advice, Count Ilya Andreyitch and Natasha went to call on Prince Volkonsky's. 
the count in anything but a happy frame of mind made ready for this call in fact he felt terribly about it he remembered too well his last encounter with the old prince at the time of the mobilizing of the militia when in answer to his invitation to a dinner party he had received an angry reprimand for not having furnished his full quota of men natasha however having put on her best gown was in the most radiant spirits they cannot help being fond of me she said to herself everyone likes me and i am so willing to do for them all they could wish i am so willing to love him because he is his father and to love her because she is his sister that they cannot fail to love me they drove up to the gloomy old house on vosvenhenka street and went into the entry well god have mercy on us exclaimed the count half in jest half in earnest but natasha observed that her father was very much agitated as he hastened into the anteroom and asked in a timid faltering voice if the prince and the princess were at home after their names had been sent in the prince's servants seemed to be thrown into great perplexity the footman who had hurried off to announce them was stopped by another footman at the drawing-room door and the two began to whisper together a chambermaid came hurrying into the hall and she also had something to say to them in reference to the princess finally a stern-faced elderly footman approached the rostovs and announced that the old prince was unable to receive them but the princess would be glad to see them mademoiselle burine first came to receive the visitors she met them with more than ordinary politeness and conducted them to the princess the princess agitated and nervous her face covered with crimson patches hastened forward stepping heavily and vainly endeavouring to appear calm and dignified at first sight natasha did not please her it seemed to her that she was too fashionably dressed too frivolous flighty and conceited the princess maria did not realise that even before seeing her future sister-in-law she was prejudiced against her through an involuntary envy of her beauty youth and happiness and jealousy of her brother's love for her over and above these obscure feelings of antipathy the princess maria was still more agitated from the fact that when the rostovs were announced the prince had shouted at the top of his voice that he would not have anything to do with them that the princess maria might receive them as she so desired but that they should not come into his presence the princess determined to receive them but she was afraid lest at any minute the prince might perform some act of rudeness since he seemed greatly stirred up by the rostovs arrival i have brought my little songstress my dear princess said the count with a bow and a scrape and looking round anxiously as though he were afraid of the old prince appearing on the scene i am very anxious for you to become acquainted i am sorry very sorry that the prince is ill and after making a few commonplace remarks he got up saying if you will excuse me princess i will leave my natasha with you for a brief quarter of an hour while i slip out and call on anna semyonovna who lives only a couple of steps from here i will come back for her ilya andreyitch as he afterwards told his daughter conceived this master stroke of subtle diplomacy for the purpose of giving the future sisters-in-law a chance to get better acquainted but he had another reason besides which was that he might escape the possibility of meeting the prince this reason he did not confess to his daughter but natasha perceived this timidity and anxiety of her father's and felt abused she blushed for him and was still more annoyed with herself for having blushed and she looked straight at the princess with a defiant challenging expression that seemed to imply that there was nothing she was afraid of the princess told the count that he was perfectly excusable and only hoped that he would make his stay at anna semyonovna's as long as possible accordingly ilya andreyitch took his departure mademoiselle burine in spite of the anxious beseeching glances given her by the princess maria who was anxious to have a confidential talk with natasha did not see fit to leave the room and kept up a steady stream of chatter about the delights of moscow and the theatres natasha was piqued by the confusion that had occurred in the reception room by her father's cowardice and by the unnatural tone affected by the princess who it seemed to her felt it was an act of condescension to receive her and consequently everything gave her a disagreeable impression the princess maria displeased her she thought she was very plain stubborn and unsympathetic natasha suddenly underwent a moral shrinking as it were and in spite of herself assumed such a reckless tone that the princess maria was still further alienated from her 
after five minutes of a laboured and artificial conversation slippered feet were heard rapidly approaching into the princess maria's face came a sudden look of dismay the door opened and the old prince came in dressed in a white nightcap and dressing-gown ach sudaruyenya he exclaimed sudaruyenya countess countess rostova if i am not mistaken i beg your pardon i beg your pardon i did not know sudaruyenya for god i did not know that you were honouring us with your presence i was coming to see my daughter which explains this costume i beg you to pardon it for god i did not know he said for the second time in such an unnatural tone laying such a special stress on the word god and speaking so disagreeably that the princess maria got up and dropped her eyes not daring to look either at her father or at natasha natasha got up and then sat down again and likewise knew not what to do only mademoiselle Burine wore a pleasant smile i beg your pardon i beg your pardon for god i did not know grumbled the old prince and after staring at natasha from head to foot he left the room mademoiselle Burine was the first to recover self-possession after this apparition and she began to talk about the prince's failing health natasha and the princess looked at each other without speaking and the longer they looked at each other without expressing what they ought to have said the more they were confirmed in their mutual dislike when the count returned natasha made an ill-mannered display of relief and immediately prepared to take her departure at this moment she almost hated this dried-up old princess who by her silence had put her in such an awkward position and who in half an hour's talk with her had not once mentioned prince andrei of course i can't be the first to speak of him in the presence of that french woman said natasha to herself the princess maria at the same time was tormented by a similar compunction she knew that it was her duty to say something to natasha but she found it impossible both because mademoiselle burine's presence embarrassed her and because she herself did not know what made it so difficult to speak on the coming marriage after the count had already left the room princess maria went to natasha with hurried steps seized her hand and with a deep sigh said wait a moment i must natasha gave the princess maria a satirical glance though she could not have told what made her do so and listened my dear nathalie said the princess maria you must know i am delighted my brother has found happiness she paused with a consciousness that she was not telling the truth natasha noticed this pause and suspected the cause of it i think princess that it is not a propitious time to speak of this said natasha with an appearance of outward dignity and hauteur while the tears almost choked her what have i said what have i said she wondered as soon as she left the room that day they waited for natasha a long time at dinner she was sitting in her room sobbing like a child blowing her nose and then beginning to sob again sonya stood beside her and kissed her on the hair natasha what is there to cry about she asked why should you care about them it will all pass over natasha no if you only knew how humiliating it was i was just like don't speak of it natasha of course you were not to blame then why should you let it trouble you kiss me said sonya natasha lifted her head and kissed her friend on the lips laying her tear-wet face next to hers i cannot tell you i do not know no one is to blame said natasha if any one is i am but all this is terribly painful Ugh! Oh, why does he not come she went down to dinner with reddened eyes Marya Dmitrievna, who had learned how the Rostovs had been received at the prince's, pretended to pay no attention to Natasha's disconsolate face, and jested in loud and eager tones with the Count and her other guests. End of chapter 7chapter eight that evening the rostovs went to the opera marya dmitrievna having secured them tickets natasha felt no desire to go but it was impossible for her to refuse her hostess's kindness which had been designed expressly for her pleasure when after she was already dressed and had gone into the parlour to wait for her father she surveyed herself in the great pier-glass and saw how pretty how very pretty she was 
She felt even more melancholy than before, but her melancholy was mingled with a feeling of sweet and passionate love. Vos moi, if he were only here, I should not be so stupidly shy before him as I was before. I would throw my arms around him and cling close to him, and make him look at me with those deep, penetrating eyes of his, with which he has so often looked at me, and then I would make him laugh, as he laughed then, and his eyes— how plainly I can see his eyes even now, said Natasha to herself. And what do I care for his father and his sister? I love him. I love him, him alone, with his dear face and eyes, with his smile, like that of a man and like that of a child, too. No, it is better not to think about it, to forget him and to forget that time, too, absolutely. I cannot endure this suspense. I shall be crying again. And she turned away from the mirror exercising all her self-control not to burst into tears and how can sonya be so calm and unconcerned in her love for nikolenka and wait so long and patiently she wondered as she saw her cousin coming toward her also in full dress and with her fan in her hand no she is entirely different from me i cannot natasha at that moment felt herself so full of passion and tenderness that it was not enough to love and to know that she was loved what she wanted now, at this instant, was to throw her arms around her lover's neck and speak to him, and hear him speak those words of love of which her heart was full. As she rode along in the carriage, sitting next to her father, and dreamily looking at the lamplights that flashed through the frost-covered windows, she felt still deeper in love, and still more melancholy than ever, and she quite forgot with whom and where she was going. Their carriage fell into the long line, and the wheels slowly creaked over the snow as they drew up to the steps of the theatre. The two girls gathered up their skirts and quickly jumped out. The Count clambered down, supported by the footmen, and, making their way through the throng of ladies and gentlemen and programme vendors, the three went into the corridor that led to their box. Already the sounds of music were heard through the closed doors. "'Nathalie, your hair,' whispered Sonia in French. The Capaldiner, hastening past the ladies, politely opened their box door. The music sounded louder, the brightly lighted rows of boxes occupied by ladies with bared shoulders and arms, and the parterre filled with brilliant uniforms, dazzled their eyes. A lady who entered the adjoining box shot a glance of feminine envy at Natasha. The curtain was still down, and the orchestra was playing the overture. Natasha, shaking out her train, went forward with Sonya and took her seat, glancing at the brightly lighted boxes on the opposite side of the house. The sensation, which she had not experienced for a long time, of having hundreds of eyes staring at her bare arms and neck, affected her all at once with mixed pleasure and discomfort, and called up a whole swarm of recollections, desires, and emotions associated with that sensation. Natasha and Sonya, both remarkably pretty girls, and Count Ilya Andreyitch, who had not been seen for a long time in Moscow, naturally attracted attention. Moreover, everyone had a general notion that Natasha was engaged to marry Prince Andrei, and everybody knew that ever since the engagement the Rostovs had been residing at their country estate, therefore they looked with much curiosity at the bride of one of the most desirable men in Russia. Natasha's beauty, as everybody told her, had improved during their stay in the country, and that evening, owing to her excited state of mind, she was extraordinarily beautiful. No one could have failed to be struck by her exuberance of life and beauty, and her complete indifference to everything going on around her. Her dark eyes wandered over the throng, not seeking for anyone in particular, and her slender arm, bare above the elbow, leaned on the velvet rim of the box, while with evident unconsciousness of what she was doing, she crumpled her program, folding and unfolding it in time with the orchestra. "'Look, there's Elenina,' said Sonya, "'with her mother, I think.' "'Saints! Mikhail Kirilovich has grown fat, though,' exclaimed the old count. "'See, there's our Anna Mikhailovna. What kind of a headdress has she on? There are the Karagans and Boris with them, evidently enough an engaged couple. Drubetskoy must have proposed.' "'What? Didn't you know it? T'was announced to-day,' said Shin Shin, coming into their box. Natasha looked in the same direction that her father was looking, and saw Julie, who, with a string of pearls around her fat red neck, covered with powder, as Natasha knew well, was sitting next to her mother with a radiantly happy face. 
Behind them could be seen Boris's handsome head, with sleekly brushed hair. He was leaning over so that his ear was close to Julie's mouth, and as he looked askance at the Rostovs, he was saying something to his bride. "'They're talking about us, about me,' thought Natasha, "'and she's probably jealous of me, and he is trying to calm her. They need not worry about it. If they only knew how little I cared about them!' Behind them sat Anna Mikhailovna, festive and blissful, and wearing her habitual expression of utter resignation to God's will. Their box was redolent of the atmosphere characteristic of a newly engaged couple, which Natasha knew and loved so well. She turned away, and suddenly all the humiliating circumstances of her morning visit recurred to her memory. "'What right has he not to be willing to receive me as a relation? Ugh! I think it best not to think about this, at least not till he comes back,' she said to herself, and she began to scan the faces of strangers or acquaintances in the parterre. In the front row, in the very middle of the house, leaning his back against the railing, stood Dolokhov, in Persian costume, with his curly hair combed back into a strange and enormous ridge. He was standing in full view of the whole theatre, knowing that he was attracting the attention of everybody in the house, yet looking as unconcerned as though he were in the privacy of his own room. Around him were gathered a throng of the gilded youth of Moscow, and it was evident that he was their leader. Count Ilya Andreyitch, with a smile, nudged the blushing Sonya, and called her attention to her former suitor. "'Do you recognize him? And where did he turn up from?' asked the Count of Shinshin. "'He had disappeared entirely, had he not?' "'Yes, completely,' replied Shinshin. "'While he was in the Caucasus he deserted, and they say he became a minister to some reigning prince in Persia. After that he killed the Shah's brother.' and now all the young ladies of Moscow have lost their wits over him. Dolokhov Maperzin, and that's the end of it. Here with us there's nothing to be done without Dolokhov. They swear by him. He's made a subject of invitation, as though he were a sterlet, said Shinshin. Dolokhov and Anatole Kuragin have turned the heads of all our young ladies. Just then into the next box came a tall, handsome lady with a tremendous plait of hair and a great display of plump white shoulders and neck, around which she wore a double string of large pearls. She was a long time in settling herself with a great rustling of her stiff silk dress. Natasha found herself involuntarily gazing at that neck, those shoulders and pearls, and that headdress, and she was amazed at their beauty. Just as Natasha was taking a second look at her, the lady glanced round, and, fixing her eyes on Count Ilya Andreyitch, nodded her head and smiled. It was Countess Buzakaya, Pierre's wife. Ilya Andreyitch, who knew everyone in society, leaned over and spoke with her. "'Have you been here long, Countess?' he inquired. "'I'm coming in. I'm coming in soon to kiss your hand. I'm in town on business, and have got my girls with me. They say Semyonova plays her part superbly,' said Ilya Andreyitch. I hope Count Pyotr Kirillovich has not entirely forgotten us. Is he here? Yes, he was intending to come, said Ellen, and she gave Natasha a scrutinizing look. Count Ilya Andreyitch again sat back in his place. Isn't she pretty, though? asked he of Natasha. A perfect marvel, replied the latter. I could understand falling in love with her. By this time the last notes of the overture were heard, and the baton of the Kapellmeister rapped upon the stand. Those gentlemen who were in late slipped down to their places, and the curtain rose. As soon as the curtain went up, silence reigned in the parterre, and in the boxes, and all the gentlemen, young and old, whether in uniform or in civilian's dress, and all the ladies, with precious stones glittering on their bare bosoms, with eager expectation, turned their attention to the stage. Natasha also tried to look. End of chapter 8 Part Five, Chapter Nine of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Nine. Smooth boards formed the center of the stage. On the sides stood painted canvases representing trees. In the background, a cloth was stretched out on boards. In the foreground, girls in red bodices and white petticoats were sitting around. One who was exceedingly stout wore a white silk dress. 
she sat by herself on a low footstool to the back of which was glued green cardboard they were all singing something after they had finished their chorus the girl in white advanced toward the prompter's box and a man in silk tights on his stout legs and with a feather and a dagger joined her and began to sing and wave his arms the man in the tights sang alone then she sang then they were both silent the orchestra played and the man began to turn down the fingers on the girl's hand evidently waiting for the beat when they should begin to sing their parts together they sang a duet and then all in the audience began to clap and to shout and the man and the woman on the stage who had been representing lovers got up smiling and letting go of hands and bowed in all directions after her country life and the serious frame of mind into which natasha had lately fallen all this seemed to her wild and strange she was unable to follow the thread of the opera and it was only as much as she could do to listen to the music she saw only painted canvas and oddly dressed men and women going through strange motions talking and singing in a blaze of light she knew what all this was meant to represent but it all struck her as so affected unnatural and absurd that some of the time she felt ashamed for the actors and again she felt like laughing at them she looked around at the faces of the spectators to see if she could detect in them any of this feeling of ridicule and perplexity which she felt but all these faces were absorbed in what was taking place on the stage or as it seemed to natasha expressed a hypocritical enthusiasm this must be i suppose very lifelike said natasha she kept gazing now at those rows of pomaded heads in the parterre then at the half-naked women in the boxes and most of all at her neighbor ellen who as undressed as she could well be gazed with a faint smile of satisfaction at the stage not dropping her eyes conscious of the brilliant light that overflowed the auditorium and the warm atmosphere heated by the throng natasha gradually began to enter into a state of intoxication which she had not experienced for a long time she had no idea who she was or where she was or of what was going on before her she gazed and let her thoughts wander at will and the strangest most disconnected ideas flashed unexpectedly through her mind now she felt inclined to leap upon the edge of the box and sing the aria which the actress had just been singing then she felt an impulse to tap with her fan a little old man who was sitting not far off then again to lean over to ellen and tickle her at one time when there was perfect silence on the stage just before the beginning of an aria the door that led into the parterre near where the rostovs were seated creaked on its hinges and a man who came in late was heard passing down to his seat there goes kuragin whispered shinshin the countess buzakaya turned her head and smiled at the newcomer natasha followed the direction of the countess buzakaya's eyes and saw an extraordinarily handsome adjutant who with an air of extreme self-confidence but at the same time of good breeding, was just passing by their box. This was Anatole Kuragin, whom she had seen and noticed some time before at a ball in Petersburg. He now wore his adjutant's uniform, with epaulette and shoulder-knot. He advanced with a supreme air of youthful gallantry, which would have been ludicrous had he not been so handsome, and had his handsome face not worn such an expression of cordial good humor and merriment. Although it was during the act, he sauntered along the carpeted corridor, slightly jingling his spurs and holding his perfumed, graceful head on high with easy grace. Glancing at Natasha, he joined his sister, laid his exquisitely gloved hand on the edge of her box, nodded to her, and bent over to ask some questions in reference to Natasha. Mais charmante, said he, evidently referring to her. She understood less from hearing his words than from the motion of his lips. Then he went forward to the front row and took his seat near Dolokhov, giving him a friendly, careless nudge with his elbow, though the others treated him with such worshipful consideration. The other, with a merry lifting of the eyebrows, gave him a smile and put up his foot against the railing. "'How like brother and sister are,' said the Count, "'and how handsome they both are.' Shinshin, in an undertone, began to tell the Count some story about Kurigan's intrigues in Moscow, to which Natasha listened simply because he had spoken of her as charmante. The first act was over. All in the parterre got up, mingled together, and began to go and come. Boris came to the Rostovs' box, received their congratulations very simply, and, 
smiling abstractedly and raising his brows, invited Natasha and Sonya, on behalf of his betrothed, to be present at their wedding, and then left them. Natasha, with a bright, coquettish smile, had talked with him and congratulated him on his engagement, although it was the same Boris with whom she had been in love only a short time before. This, in her intoxicated, excited state, seemed to her perfectly simple and natural. The bare-bosomed Ellen sat near her, and showered her smiles indiscriminately on all, and in exactly the same way Natasha smiled on Boris. Ellen's box was crowded by the most influential and witty men of the city, who also gathered around the front of it, on the parterre side, vying with each other, apparently, in their desire to let it be known that they were acquainted with her. Kuragin, throughout the entire entre-acte, stood with Lopukhov, with his back to the stage, in the very front row, and kept his eyes fixed on the Rostovs' box. Natasha felt certain that he was talking about her, and it afforded her gratification. She even turned her head slightly, in a way which, in her opinion, best showed off the beauty of her profile. Before the beginning of the second act, Pierre, whom the Rostovs had not seen since their arrival, made his appearance. His face wore an expression of sadness, and he was stouter than when Natasha had last seen him. Without recognizing anyone, he passed down to the front row. Anatole joined him and began to make some remark, looking and pointing to the Rostov's box. A flash of animation passed over Pierre's face as he caught sight of Natasha, and he hastily made his way across through the seats to where she was. Then, leaning his elbows on the edge of her box, he had a long conversation with her. While she was talking with Pierre, she heard a man's voice in the Countess Buzakoya's box, and something told her that it was Anatole Kurigan. She glanced round, and their eyes met. She almost smiled, and he looked straight into her eyes with such an admiring, tender gaze that it seemed to her strange to be so near him, to see him, to be so sure that she pleased him, and yet not to be acquainted with him. In the second act the stage represented a cemetery, and there was a hole in the canvas which represented the moon, and the footlights were turned down, and the horns and contrabasses began to play in very deep tones, and the stage was invaded from both sides by a throng of men in black mantles. These men began to wave their arms, brandishing what seemed to be daggers. Then some other men rushed forward, and proceeded to drag away by main force that damsel who, in the previous act, had been dressed in white, but was now in a blue dress. Before they dragged her away, they sang with her for a long time, and at the sound of three thumps on something metallic behind the scenes, all fell on their knees and began to sing a prayer. A number of times all these actions were interrupted by the enthusiastic plaudits of the spectators. Every time during this act that Natasha looked down into the parterre, she saw Anatole Kurigan with his arm carelessly thrown across the back of his seat, gazing at her. It was pleasant for her to feel that she had so captivated him, and it never entered into her head that in all this there was anything improper. When the second act was over, the Countess Buzakaya stood up, leaned over to the Rostov's box, thereby exposing her whole bosom, beckoned the old Count to come to her, and then, paying no heed to those who came to her box to pay her their homage, she began a smiling, confidential conversation with him. "'You must certainly make me acquainted with your charming girls,' said she. "'The whole city are talking about them, and I don't know them.' Natasha got up and made a curtsy to this magnificent countess. The flattery of this brilliant beauty was so intoxicating to her that she blushed with pleasure and gratification. "'I mean to be a Muscovite also,' said Ellen. "'And aren't you ashamed of yourself, to hide such pearls in the country?' The Countess Buzakoya, by good rights, had the reputation of being a fascinating woman. She could say the opposite of what she thought, and could flatter in the most simple and natural manner. "'Now, my dear Count, you must allow me to see something of your daughter.' though I don't expect to be here very long. You don't either, I believe. I shall try to make them have a good time. I hear a good deal about you in Petersburg, and I wanted to make your acquaintance, said she, turning to Natasha with her stereotyped, bewitching smile. I heard about you from my page, Drubetskoy. Have you heard, by the way, that he was engaged? And from my husband's friend, Bolkonsky, Prince Andrei Bolkonsky, said she, with an especial emphasis, signifying thereby that she knew of his relations toward Natasha. Then she proposed that, in order to become better acquainted, one of the young ladies should come over into her box for the rest of the performance, and Natasha went. 
during the third act the scenes represented a palace wherein many candles were blazing while on the walls hung paintings representing full bearded knights in the centre stood apparently a czar and tsaritsa the czar was gesticulating with his right hand and after singing something with evident timidity and certainly very wretchedly he took his seat on a crimson throne the damsel who had at first been dressed in white and then in blue was now in nothing but a shift with dishevelled hair and stood near the throne she was warbling some doleful ditty addressed to the tsaritsa but the tsar peremptorily waved his hand and from the side scenes came a number of bare-legged men and bare-legged women and began to dance all together then the fiddles played a very dainty and merry tune one girl with big bare legs and thin arms coming out from among the others went behind the scenes and having adjusted her corsage came into the centre of the stage and began to caper around and knock her feet together the whole parterre clapped their hands and shouted bravo then a man took his stand in one corner the orchestra played louder than ever with a clanging of cymbals and blare of horns and this bare-legged man alone by himself began to make very high jumps and kick his feet together this man was duport who earned sixty thousand roubles a year by his art all in the parterre in the boxes and in the upper paradise began to thump and shout with all their might and the man paused and smiled and bowed to all sides then some others danced bare-legged men and women then one of the royal personages shouted something with musical accompaniment and all began to sing but suddenly a storm arose chromatic scales and diminished sevenths were heard in the orchestra and all scattered behind the scenes carrying off with them again one of those who was present and the curtain fell once more among the audience arose a terrible roar and tumult and all with enthusiastic faces shouted at once duport 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 natasha no longer looked upon this as strange or unusual with a sense of satisfaction she looked around her smiling joyously ne sais pas qu'il est admirable duport asked ellen turning to her oh oui replied natasha End of chapter nine Part five, chapter ten of War in Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter ten. During the entr'acte, a draught of cold air made its way into Ellen's box as the door was opened and Anatole came in, bowing and trying not to disturb any one. Allow me to present my brother, said Ellen, uneasily glancing from Natasha to Anatole natasha turned her pretty graceful head toward the handsome young man and smiled at him over her shoulder anatole who was as fine-looking near at hand as he was at a distance sat down by her and said that he had been long wishing for the pleasure of her acquaintance ever since that nerushkin's ball where he had seen her and never forgotten her kuragin was far cleverer and less affected with women than he was in the society of men he spoke fluently and simply and natasha had a strange and agreeable feeling of ease in the company of this man about whom so many rumours were current he was not only not terrible but his face even wore a naive jolly and good-natured smile kuragin asked her how she enjoyed the play and told her how semyovnova at the last performance had gotten a fall while on the stage do you know countess said he suddenly addressing her as though she were an old acquaintance we have been arranging a fancy dress party you ought to take part in it it will be very jolly we shall all rendezvous at the kerrigan's please come won't you he insisted in saying this he did not once take his smiling eyes from her face her neck her naked arms natasha was not left in doubt of the fact that he admired her this was agreeable but somehow she felt constrained and troubled by his presence when she was not looking at him she was conscious that he was staring at her shoulders and she involuntarily tried to catch his eyes so that he might rather fix them on her face but while she thus looked him in the eyes she had a terrified consciousness that that barrier of modesty which she had always felt before kept other men at a distance was down between him and her without being in the least able to explain it she was conscious within five minutes that she was on a dangerously intimate footing with this man she nervously turned a little for fear he might put his hand on her bare arm or kiss her on the neck 
they talked about the simplest matters and yet she felt that they were more intimate than she had ever been with any other man she looked at ellen and at her father as though asking them what all this meant but ellen was busily engaged in conversation with some general and paid no heed to her imploring look and her father's said nothing more to her than what it always said happy well i am glad of it during one of those moments of constraint while anatole's prominent eyes were calmly and boldly surveying her natasha in order to break the silence asked him how he liked moscow natasha asked the question and blushed it seemed to her all the time that she was doing something unbecoming in talking with him anatole smiled as though to encourage her at first i was not particularly charmed with moscow because what a city ought to have to be agreeable is pretty women isn't that so well now i like it very much said he giving her a significant look will you come to our party countess please do said he and stretching out his hand toward her bouquet and lowering his voice he added in french you will be the prettiest come my dear countess and as a pledge give me that flower natasha did not realize what he was saying any more than he did but she had a consciousness that in his incomprehensible words there was an improper meaning she knew not what reply to make and turned away pretending not to have heard him but the instant that she turned away the thought came to her that he was there behind her and so near what is he doing now is he ashamed of himself is he angry is it my business to make amends she asked herself she could not refrain from glancing round she looked straight into his eyes and his nearness and self-possession and the good-natured warmth of his smile overcame her she gave him an answering smile and gazed straight into his eyes and once more she realized with the feeling of horror that there was no barrier between them the curtain again went up anatole left the box calm and serene natasha rejoined her father in her own box but already she was under the dominion of this world into which she had entered everything that passed before her eyes now seemed to her perfectly natural while all her former thoughts concerning her lover and the princess maria and her life in the country vanished from her mind as though all that had taken place long long ago in the fourth act there was a strange kind of devil who sang and gesticulated until a trap beneath him was opened and he disappeared this was all that natasha noticed during the fourth act something agitated and disturbed her and the cause of this annoyance was kuragin at whom she could not help looking when they left the theatre anatole joined them summoned their carriage and helped them to get seated as he was assisting natasha he squeezed her arm above the elbow startled and blushing she looked at him his brilliant eyes returned her gaze and he gave her a tender smile not until she reached home was natasha able clearly to realize all that had taken place and when she suddenly remembered prince andrei she was horror-struck and as they all sat drinking tea she groaned aloud and flushing scarlet ran from the room my god i am lost she said to herself how could i have let it go so far she wondered long she sat hiding her flushed face in her hands striving to give herself a clear account of what had happened to her and she could not do so nor could she explain her feelings everything seemed to her dark obscure and terrible then in that huge brilliant auditorium where duport with his bare legs and spangled jacket capered about on the dampened stage to the sounds of music and the girls and the old men and ellen much decolleté with her charm and haughty smile were all applauding and enthusiastically shouting bravo there under the protection of this same ellen everything was perfectly clear and simple but now alone by herself it became incomprehensible what does it mean what means this fear that i experience in his presence what means these stings of conscience which i experience now she asked herself if only her mother had been there natasha would have made confession of all her thoughts before going to bed that night she knew that sonya with her strict and wholesome views would either entirely fail to understand or would be horrified by her confession natasha accordingly tried by her own unaided efforts to settle the question that tormented her have i really forfeited prince andrei's love or not she asked herself and then with a reassuring smile she replied to her own question what a fool i am to ask this what is the sense of it none 
I have done nothing. I was not to blame for this. No one will know about it, and I shall not see him any more, she said to herself. Of course it is evident no harm has been done. There is nothing to repent of, and no reason why Prince Andre should not love me just as I am. But what do I mean by just as I am? Oh, my God! My God! Why is he not here? Natasha grew calm for an instant, but then some instinct told her that, even though nothing had happened and no harm had been done, still the first purity of her love for Prince Andre was destroyed. And once more she let her imagination bring up her whole conversation with Kurrigan, and she recalled his face and his motions, and the tender smile that this handsome, impudent man had given her after he had squeezed her arm. End of chapter 10 Part 5, Chapter 11 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 11 Anatole Kuragin was living in Moscow because his father had sent him from Petersburg, where he had been spending more than 20,000 rubles a year, and had accumulated heavy debts as well, which his creditors were trying to obtain from his father. His father explained to him that he would, for the last time, pay one half of his debts, but only on condition of his going to Moscow as adjutant to the governor-general of the city, an appointment which he obtained for him. He advised him to make up his mind at last to try to win the hand of some rich heiress. He suggested the Princess Maria, or Julie Karagina. Anatole consented and went to Moscow, where he took up his residence at Pierre's. At first Pierre received him with scant welcome, but at length he became accustomed to him, and occasionally accompanied him on his sprees, and, under the pretense of a loan, gave him money. Anatole, as Shinshin correctly stated the case, had instantly turned the heads of all the girls in Moscow, and particularly by the fact of his affected neglect of them, and his avowed preference for gypsy girls and French actresses, with the leading light of whom, Mademoiselle Georges, it was said, he was on terms of close intimacy." He never failed of a single drinking bout given by Danilov or the other fast men of Moscow. He could drink steadily from night till morning, out drinking everyone else. Moreover, he was a constant habitué of all the balls and receptions in the upper circles of society. Rumors were rife of various intrigues of his with married ladies in Moscow, and at the balls he always paid particular court to several. But from young ladies, particularly those who were rich and in the marriage market, most of whom were excessively plain, Anatole kept at a respectful distance, and this arose from the fact, known only to a very few of his most intimate friends, that he had been married two years before. Two years before, while his regiment had been cantoned in Poland, a Polish proprietor of a small estate had forced Anatole to marry his daughter. Anatole had soon after abandoned his wife, and, by engaging to send money periodically, he persuaded his father-in-law to let him pass still as a bachelor. Anatole was always satisfied with his situation, with himself, and with other people. He was instinctively, by his whole nature, convinced that it was entirely impossible for him to lead another manner of existence, and that he had never in his life done anything wrong. He was in no condition to ponder on the effect that his behavior might have on others, or what might be the result of his behaving in this, that, or the other way. He was persuaded that, just as the duck was so created as always to be in the water, in the same way he was created by God for the purpose of living with an income of 30,000 rubles a year, and of occupying the highest pinnacle of society. He was so firmly grounded in this opinion, that other people also, when he saw them, shared in his conviction, and never thought of refusing him either the foremost place in society, or the money which he took of any one he met, without ever thinking of repaying it. He was no gambler, at least, he never showed sordid love for gain. He was not ostentatious. It was absolutely a matter of indifference to him what men thought of him. Still less was he open to the charge of ambition. Many times he had annoyed his father by injuring his own prospects, and he always made sport of dignities. He was not stingy, and he never refused any one who asked a favor of him. All that he cared for was a good time, and women, and, as, according to his opinion, there was nothing ignoble in these tastes, and he could not calculate the consequence for other people of the gratification of these tastes of his, he therefore considered himself irreproachable, sincerely scorned ordinary scoundrels and base men, and held his head high with a tranquil conscience. 
debauchees those male magdalens have a secret feeling of blamelessness such as is peculiar to the frail sisterhood and it is based in the same hope of forgiveness she shall be forgiven much for she hath loved much and he shall be forgiven much because he hath enjoyed much dolokhof back again in moscow after his exile and his adventures in persia and once more leading a dissipated and luxurious life and playing high naturally became intimate with his old petersburg companion kuragin and made use of him for his own ends anatole really liked dolokhof for his wit intelligence and audacity dolokhof who found the name the notability and the connections of anatole kuragin an admirable decoy for attracting rich young fellows into his clutches made use of him and got enjoyment out of him without letting him suspect it besides the financial purpose for which anatole served him the act itself of controlling the will of another was an enjoyment a habit a necessity for dolokhof natasha had made a deep impression on kuragin at supper after the opera with all the enthusiasm of a connoisseur he praised to dolokhof her arms her shoulders her feet and her hair and he expressed his intention of making love to her the possible consequences of such love-making anatole did not stop to consider nor was it in him to foresee them any more than in any other of his escapades yes she's pretty my dear fellow but she's not for us said dolokhof i'm going to tell my sister to invite her to dinner how's that suggested anatole you had better wait till she's married you know said anatole je dois les petites filles you can turn their heads so quick you have already fallen into the hands of one petite fille said dolokhof who knew about anatole's marriage see well can't get caught a second time eh replied anatole good-naturedly laughing end of chapter eleven part five chapter twelve of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 12 The next day the Rostovs stayed at home, and no one came to see them. Marya Dmitrievna had a confidential conversation with her father, taking pains to keep it secret from Natasha, who nevertheless suspected that they were discussing the old prince and concocting some scheme. It disquieted and humiliated her. She was every moment expecting Prince Andrei to come, and twice that day she sent the Dvornik to the Balkonskys to learn if he had arrived, but he was still absent. It was now more trying to her than during the first days of his absence. Her impatience and melancholy thoughts about him were intensified by an unpleasant recollection of her interview with the Princess Maria and the scene with the old prince, as well as by a vague and undefinable fear and uneasiness. She had a notion that either he would not come at all, or that before he came something would happen. She found it impossible, as before, to have calm and collected thoughts about him when alone by herself. As soon as her thoughts turned to him, her recollections of him were confused by recollections of the old prince, of the Princess Maria, of the operatic performance, and of Kurigan. Again the question arose whether she was not to blame, whether her troth plighted to Prince Andre was not already broken, and again she would picture to herself, even to the most trifling details, every word, every gesture, every slightest shadow in the play of expression on the face of that man who had succeeded in arousing in her such a terrible and inexplicable feeling. In the eyes of the home circle, Natasha seemed livelier than usual, but she was far from being as calm and happy as she had been before. On Sunday morning, Maria Dmitrievna proposed to her guests to attend Mass at the parish chapel of Uspeni Namohiltsak. "'I don't like these fashionable churches,' said she, evidently priding herself on her independence god is everywhere one we have an excellent pope and deacon as well and the service is well performed what kind of worship is it to have concerts given in the choir i don't like it it's mischievous nonsense marya dmitrievna liked sundays and had them kept as high festivals her house was thoroughly washed and cleaned on saturday neither she nor the people within her gates did any work they wore their best clothes and all went to mass on sunday she had prepared an extra fine dinner and her servants were provided with vodka and a roasted goose or a suckling pig but nothing in the whole house gave more decided evidence of its being a holiday than marya dmitrievna's broad stern face 
which on this occasion wore an unchangeable expression of solemn festivity after mass while they were drinking their coffee in the drawing-room where the furniture covers had been removed a servant announced to Maria Dmitrievna that the carriage was at the door. She drew a long face and, putting on her best shawl, in which she always paid visits, got up and announced that she was going to see Prince Nikolai Andreevich Bolkonsky to have an understanding with him in regard to Natasha. After Maria Dmitrievna had taken her departure, a modiste from Madame Chalmes came to try on the young lady's new dresses and Natasha, retiring to the next room and shutting the door, was very glad of the diversion. Just as she had put on a hastily basted and still sleeveless waist, and was standing in front of the mirror, bending her head around to see how the back fitted, she heard in the drawing-room the lively tones of her father's voice, mingled with those of a woman, and it made her blush. It was Ellen's voice. Natasha had not time to take off the experimental waist before the door opened, and into the room came the Countess Buzakaya, beaming with a good-natured and flattering smile and wearing a dark purple velvet dress with a high collar ah madelicieuse she exclaimed to the blushing natasha charmante no she is quite unlike any one else my dear count said she turning to the count who followed her in the idea of living in moscow and not going anywhere no i shall not let you off this evening mademoiselle georges is going to recite for me and we shall have a crowd and if you don't bring your beauties who are far better than mademoiselle georges i shall never forgive you my husband is away he has gone to tver otherwise i should send him for you do not fail to come don't fail at ten o'clock she nodded to the dressmaker whom she knew and received a most respectful curtsey and then sat down in an armchair near the mirror picturesquely disposing the folds of her velvet dress she did not cease to chatter with good-natured and merry volubility, constantly saying pleasant, flattering things about Natasha's beauty. She examined her dresses and praised them, also managed to say a good word for a new dress of her own, en gauze métallique, metallic gauze, which she had just received from Paris, and advised Natasha to get one like it. "'Besides, it would be extremely becoming to you, my charmer,' said she. Natasha's face fairly beamed with pleasure she felt happy and exhilarated by the praise of this gracious countess buzokoya who had heretofore seemed to her such an inaccessible grand lady and was now so cordial toward her natasha's spirits rose and she felt almost in love with this woman who was so beautiful and so good-natured ellen on her part was sincerely enchanted by natasha and wanted her to have a good time anatole had urged her to help on his acquaintance with her and it was for this purpose that she had called on the rostovs the idea of helping her brother in such a flirtation was amusing to her. Although that winter in Petersburg she had felt a grudge against Natasha for alienating Boris from her, it had now entirely passed from her mind, and, with all her heart, she felt kindly disposed toward Natasha. As she was taking her departure, she called her protégé aside. Last evening my brother dined with me. We almost died of laughing. He eats just nothing at all and can only sigh for you, my charmer. Il est fou, mais fou amoureux de vous, ma chère. Natasha flushed crimson on hearing these words. How she blushes, how she blushes. Ma délicieuse, pursued Ellen, don't fail to come. Even if you are in love, that is no reason for making a nun of yourself. Even if you are engaged, I am sure that your future husband would prefer to have you go into society rather than die of tedium in his absence. Of course she knows that I am engaged. Of course she and her husband, she and Pierre, that good, honest Pierre, have talked and laughed about this. Of course there is no harm in it. And again under Ellen's influence, all that hitherto seemed terrible to her seemed simple and natural. And she is such a grande dame, and so kind, and she seems to like me so heartily, said Natasha to herself. And why shouldn't I have a good time? queried Natasha looking at Ellen with wide eyes, full of amazement. Maria Dmitrievna returned in time for dinner, silent and solemn, having evidently suffered a rebuff at the old prince's. She was still laboring under too much excitement from her encounter to be able to give a calm account of it. To the Count's question she replied that everything would be all right, and she would tell him about it the next day. When she was informed of the Count Buzukaya's visit, and the invitation for the evening, she said, I don't like the idea of your going to the Buzukayas, 
and I should advise you not to. However, if you have already promised, go. Perhaps you will have some amusement, she added, addressing Natasha. End of chapter 12「Part Five, Chapter Thirteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Thirteen. Count Ilya Andreyitch took his young ladies to the Countess Buzakaya's. The reception was fairly well attended, but the most of the company were strangers to Natasha. Count Ilya Andreyitch saw with dissatisfaction that the larger majority of those present consisted of men and women noted for their free and easy behavior. Mademoiselle Georges stood in one corner of the drawing-room surrounded by young men. There were a number of Frenchmen, and among them Mitivier, who since Ellen's arrival had become an intimate at her house. Count Ilya Andreyitch decided not to take a hand at the card-table, or to leave the girls, but to take his departure as soon as Mademoiselle Georges had finished her recitation. Anatole was at the door, evidently on the lookout for the Rostovs. As soon as he had exchanged greetings with the Count, he joined Natasha, and followed her into the room. The moment she saw him she was assailed, just as she had been at the theatre, by a mixed sense of gratified vanity that she pleased him, and of fear, because of the absence of moral barriers between him and her. Ellen received Natasha effusively, and was loud in praise of her beauty and her toilette. Soon after their arrival, Mademoiselle Georges retired from the room to change her costume. In the meantime, chairs were disposed in the drawing-room, and the guests began to take their seats. Anatole procured a chair for Natasha, and he was just going to sit next to her, but the Count, keeping sharp eye on his daughter, took the seat next to her. Anatole sat behind. Mademoiselle Georges, with plump and dimpled arms all bare, and with a red shawl flung across one shoulder, came out into the space around which the chairs were ranged, and assumed an unnatural pose. A murmur of admiration was heard. Mademoiselle Georges threw a stern and gloomy glance around, and began to recite certain lines in French, in which the guilty love of a mother for her son is delineated. In places she raised her voice, then again she spoke in a whisper, triumphantly tossing her head, and in other places she broke short off, or spoke in deep, hoarse tones, rolling her eyes. Adorable, divine, de la Sue, were the acomiums heard on all sides. Natasha's eyes were fastened on the stout actress, but she heard nothing, saw nothing, understood nothing of what was going on before her. She felt that she was irrevocably drawn again into that strange, mad world, so far removed from the past world, where it was impossible to know what was right and what was wrong, what was reasonable and what was foolish. Behind her sat Anatole, and she was conscious of his nearness, and with terror awaited some development. After the first monologue, the whole company arose and crowded around Mademoiselle Georges, expressing their delight and enthusiasm. "'How beautiful she is,' said Natasha to her father, who had got up with the rest and was starting to push his way through the throng toward the actress. "'I cannot think so when I look at you,' said Anatole, sitting down next to Natasha. He spoke so that no one else could hear what he said. "'You are charming. Since the first moment that I saw you I have not ceased.' "'Come, let us go, Natasha,' interrupted the Count, returning to his daughter. "'How pretty she is!' Natasha, making no reply, followed her father, but gave Anatole a look of wondering amazement. After several more recitations, Mademoiselle Georges took her departure, and the Countess Buzakaya invited her guests into the ballroom. The Count wanted to go home, but Ellen begged him not to spoil her improvised ball. The Rostovs remained. Anatole took Natasha out for a valse, and while they were on the floor, and he clasped her waist and hand, he told her that she was revisante, and that he loved her. During the écoles, which she danced with Kurigan also, Anatole said nothing to her while they were by themselves, but merely gazed at her. Natasha was in doubt whether she had not dreamed what he said to her during the valse. At the end of the first figure he again pressed her hand. Natasha lifted startled eyes to his, but his look and his smile had such an expression of self-confidence and flattering tenderness that she found it impossible to look at him and say to him what was on her tongue to say. She dropped her eyes. "'Do not say such things to me. I am betrothed. I love another,' she hurriedly whispered. She glanced at him. Anatole was not in the least confused or chagrined at what she had said. "'Don't speak to me about that. What difference does it make to me?' he asked. 
I tell you I am madly, madly in love with you. Am I to blame because you are bewitching? It's our turn to lead. Natasha, excited and anxious, looked around with wide, frightened eyes, and gave the impression of being gayer than usual. She remembered almost nothing of what took place that evening. While they were dancing the Ecoles and the Grossvater, her father came and urged her to go home with him, but she begged to stay a little longer. Wherever she was, whomever engaged her in conversation, she was conscious all the time of his eyes upon her. Afterwards she remembered asking her father's permission to go to the dressing-room to adjust her dress, and how Ellen followed her, and told her with a laugh that her brother was in love with her. She remembered how, in the little divan room, she had again met Anatole, how Ellen had suddenly disappeared, leaving her alone with him, and how Anatole, seizing her hand, had said in a tender voice, "'I cannot call upon you, but must I never see you? I love you madly, desperately. Can I not see you?' and then, blocking her way, he had bent down his face close to her face. His great, gleaming, masculine eyes were so near to her face that she could see nothing else except those eyes of his. Nathalie, she heard his voice whisper, with a questioning inflection, and her hand was squeezed almost painfully. Nathalie? I do not understand at all. I have nothing to say, said her glance. His glowing lips approached her lips, but at that instant she felt that her deliverance had come, for the sound of Ellen's footstep and the rustle of her dress were heard in the room. Natasha glanced at Ellen, then blushing and trembling she gave him a terrified, questioning look, and started for the door. Un mot, un seul, un nom de Dieu, said Anatole. She paused. She felt that it was necessary for her to hear that single word, which would afford her an explanation of what had happened, and allow her something tangible to answer. Nathalie, un mot, un seul, he kept repeating, evidently not knowing what to say, and he repeated it until Ellen came close to him. Ellen and Natasha returned together to the drawing-room. Declining the invitation to stay to supper, the Rostovs went home. That night Natasha could not sleep at all. She was tormented by the question which she could not answer, which she loved, Anatole or Prince Andrei. She loved Prince Andrei, she had a very distinct remembrance of how warmly she loved him. But she loved Anatole also, there could be no doubt about that. Otherwise how could all of this have taken place, she asked herself. If it was possible for me, on saying good-bye to him, to answer his smiles with smiles, if I could permit myself to go so far, then of course I was in love with him at first sight. He certainly is good, and noble, and handsome, and it is impossible not to be in love with him. What can I do when I love him, and love the other, too? she asked herself, and found no solution to the vexing problem. End of chapter 13 Part 5, Chapter 14 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne Chapter 14 Morning came, with its usual occupations and bustle. All arose, stirred about, engaged in talk. Once more the modiste came. Again Maria Dmitrievna appeared and summoned them down to tea. Natasha, with wide-opened eyes, as though trying to anticipate and intercept every glance fixed upon her, looked anxiously about and struggled to seem the same as usual. After breakfast, which was her favorite time, Maria Dmitrievna sat down in her easy chair and called Natasha and the old count to her. Well, with strong emphasis on the word, well, my friends, now I have thought the whole matter over, and this is my advice, she began. Yesterday, as you know, I went to see Prince Nikolai. Well, again with strong emphasis, I had an interview with him. He thought to shout me down, but I am not to be shouted down so easily. I had it all out with him. "'Well, what did he do?' asked the Count. "'What did he do? He's a raving maniac, won't listen to anything. "'Well, what's the use of talking? "'And, meanwhile, we are tormenting this poor girl so,' said Maria Dmitrievna. "'And my advice to you is to transact your business and go home, to Otradnoye, and there wait till—' "'Oh, no!' cried Natasha. "'Yes, you must go,' maintained Maria Dmitrievna and wait there. If your betrothed should come here now, 
there would infallibly be a quarrel but if he is here alone with the old man they will talk the whole thing over calmly and then he will come for you ilya andreyitch approved of this plan which instantly appealed to his good judgment if the old prince was appeased then they could rejoin him at moscow or louisa Gurie. if not as it would be contrary to his wishes then the wedding could take place at otronoya that is true as gospel said he only i am sorry that i went there and took her said the old count there is nothing to be sorry for as long as you were here you couldn't help paying him that mark of respect well if he does not approve it is his affair said marya dmitrievna making search for something in her reticule besides the trousseau is all ready so what have you to wait for and what isn't ready i will send to you indeed i am sorry about it but you would be much better off to return and god be with you having succeeded in finding what she was searching for she handed it to natasha it was a letter from the princess marya she's written to you how she torments herself poor soul she is afraid you will imagine that she does not like you well and she doesn't like me said natasha nonsense don't say such a thing cried marya dmitrievna i take no one's opinion i know she does not like me said natasha boldly snatching the letter and her face assumed such an expression of hard and angry determination that it caused marya dmitrievna to look at her more closely and frown don't you contradict me that way matushka said she what i tell you is the truth go and reply to her letter natasha made no rejoinder and retired to her own room to read the princess marya's letter the princess wrote that she was in despair owing to the misunderstanding that had arisen between them whatever were her father's feelings she wrote she besought natasha to be assured that it was impossible for her not to love her as the choice of her brother for whose happiness she was ready to sacrifice everything moreover she wrote do not imagine that my father was unkindly disposed toward you he is old and feeble and you must excuse him but he is good and generous and will not fail to love the one who can make his son happy the princess further asked natasha to appoint a time when they could have another meeting after reading the letter through natasha sat down at the writing-desk to pen a reply cher princess she wrote hastily and mechanically and paused what more could she write after all that had taken place the evening before yes yes all that is past and now already everything is different she said to herself as she pondered over the letter that refused to be written ought i to reject him is it really my duty it is frightful and to escape from these terrible thoughts she went to sonya and began to help her pick out her embroidery patterns after dinner natasha again retired to her room and took up the princess marya's letter can it be that all is really over between us she mused can it be that this has happened so quickly and that all that is past is completely annihilated she recalled in all its intensity her love for prince andrei and yet at the same time she felt that she was in love with kuragin she vividly pictured herself as prince andrei's wife and recalled those dreams of happiness with him which she had so many times enjoyed in imagination and at the same time fired with passionate emotions she recalled every detail of her last meeting with anatole why could it be possible to love them both at once she more than once asked herself in the depths of perplexity then only could i be perfectly happy but now i must choose and i cannot be happy to be deprived of either of them one thing is certain she thought to tell prince andrei what has happened or to hide it from him is impossible but as far as he is concerned no harm has been done can i break off for ever though with that delicious love for prince andrei to whom my life has been devoted so long barushnya said the maid in a whisper and coming into the room with a mysterious face a nice little man told me to give you this the maid handed her a note only for christ's sake she exclaimed as natasha without thinking mechanically broke the seal and began to read it was a love letter from anatole and while she did not comprehend a word of it she comprehended enough to know that it was from him from the man she loved yes she loved him how else could happen what had happened how could she have in her hand a love letter from him with trembling hands natasha held this passionate love letter composed for anatole by dolokhof and in reading it she found it contained what corresponded to everything 
which it seemed to her she herself felt. Last evening decided my fate. You must love me, or I die. I have no other alternative. So the letter began. Then he proceeded to say that he knew her parents would not consent to her marriage to him for various secret reasons, which he could reveal to her alone, but that if she loved him, it was enough for her to say the little word, yes, and no mortal power could suffice to destroy their bliss. Love conquers all. He would spirit her away, and fly with her to the ends of the earth. Yes, yes, I love him, mused Natasha, as she read the letter over for the twentieth time, and tried to discover some peculiarly deep meaning in every word. That evening Marya Dmitrievna was going to the Arkharovs, and she invited the young ladies to accompany her. Natasha, under the pretext of a headache, remained at home. End of chapter 14Part Five, Chapter Fifteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Fifteen. Sonya, on her return late that evening, went to Natasha's room and, to her amazement, found her still dressed and asleep on the sofa. On the table near her lay Anatole's letter, wide open. Sonya picked the letter up and proceeded to read it. She read it through, and gazed at the sleeping Natasha, trying to discover in her face some key to the mystery of what she had read, and finding none. The expression of Natasha's face was calm and sweet and happy. Sonya, pale and trembling, with fright and emotion, clutching her breast lest she should choke, sat down in an easy chair and melted into tears. "'How is it I have seen nothing of this? How can this have gone so far?' Is it possible she has ceased to love Prince Andre? And how can she tolerate this Kuragin? He is a deceiver and a scoundrel, that is evident. What will Nicholas do, dear, noble Nicholas, when he learns of this? So this is what caused her agitation and unnatural behavior for the last three days, said Sonya to herself. But it is impossible that she is in love with him. Most likely she opened the letter without knowing from whom it came. In all probability she was offended— she couldn't have done such a thing knowingly. Sonya wiped away her tears, and went close to Natasha and scrutinized her face. Natasha, she murmured, almost inaudibly. Natasha awoke and looked at Sonya. Ah, are you back already? And in the impulse of the sudden awakening she gave her friend a warm and affectionate hug. But instantly noticing that Sonya's face was troubled, her face also became troubled and suspicious. Sonya... "'Have you been reading that letter?' she asked. "'Yes,' murmured Sonya. Natasha smiled triumphantly. "'No, Sonya, it is impossible to hold out any longer,' said she. "'I cannot hide it from you any more. "'You know, we love each other. "'Sonya, my darling, he has written me. "'Sonya!' Sonya, not believing her own ears, stared at Natasha with open eyes. "'But Bolkonsky!' she exclaimed. "'Ugh, oh, Sonya! Ugh! Oh, if you could know how happy I am!' cried Natasha. "'You can't imagine what such love is!' "'But, Natasha, do you mean to say that the other is all at an end?' Natasha gazed at Sonya with wide-open eyes, as though she did not understand her question. "'What? Have you broken with Prince Andrei? demanded Sonya. "'Ugh! Oh, you can't comprehend it! Don't talk nonsense!' "'Listen to me,' said Natasha, with a flash of ill-temper. "'No, I cannot believe this,' insisted Sonya. "'I cannot understand it. "'How can you have loved one man a whole year, and then suddenly— "'Why, you have only seen him three times. "'Natasha, I don't believe you. "'You are joking. "'In three days to forget everything, and so—' Three days,' interrupted Natasha. "'It seems to me as if I had loved him for a hundred years.' It seems to me as if I had never loved anyone else before him. You cannot comprehend it. Sonya, wait. Sit down. Natasha threw her arms around her and kissed her. I have been told, and you have probably heard, that such love as this existed. But now for the first time I experience it. It is not like the one before. The moment I set eyes on him, I felt that he was my master, that I was his slave, and that I could not help loving him. "'Yes, his slave. 
Whatever he commands me, I obey him. You can't understand that. What can I do? What can I do, Sonya? pleaded Natasha, with a happy, frightened face. But just think what you are doing, insisted Sonya. I cannot let this go on, this clandestine correspondence. How could you permit him to go so far? asked she, with a horror and aversion which she had tried in vain to hide. I have told you, replied Natasha, that I have no will about it. Why can't you understand? I love him. Then I will not let it go any farther. I shall tell the whole story, cried Sonya, with a burst of tears. For God's sake, I beg of you. If you tell, you are not my friend, exclaimed Natasha. Do you wish me to be unhappy? Do you wish to separate us? Seeing how passionately excited Natasha was, Sonya shed tears of shame and regret for her friend. But what has passed between you? she asked. What has he said to you? Why doesn't he come to the house? Natasha made no reply to this question. For God's sake, Sonya, don't tell anyone. Don't torment me, entreated Natasha. Remember, it's never right to interfere in such matters. I have trusted you. But why all this secrecy? Why doesn't he come to the house? insisted Sonya. Why doesn't he openly ask for your hand? You know Prince Andrei gave you absolute freedom, if such were the case. But I don't believe in this man. Natasha, have you considered what his secret reasons may be? Natasha gazed at Sonya with wondering eyes. Evidently this question had not occurred to her before, and she knew not what answer to make. What reasons? I don't know. But of course there must be reasons. Sonya sighed and shook her head incredulously. If there were reasons, she began, but Natasha, foreseeing her objections, with frightened eagerness interrupted her. Sonya, it is impossible to doubt him. Impossible, wholly impossible, don't you understand? she cried. Does he love you? Love me, repeated Natasha, with a smile of contemptuous pity for her friend's incredulity. You have read his letter. You have seen him, haven't you? But if he were a dishonorable man— He? A dishonorable man? If you knew him, exclaimed Natasha. If he were an honorable man, then he ought either to explain his intentions or else cease to see you. And if you are not willing to do this, then I shall. I shall write him. I shall tell your papa, said Sonya decidedly. But I can't live without him, cried Natasha. Natasha, I don't understand you. What are you saying? Think of your father. Think of Nicholas. I want no one. I love no one but him. How do you dare to assert that he is dishonorable? Don't you know that I love him? cried Natasha. Sonya, go. I don't wish to quarrel with you. Go away, for God's sake, go away. You see how tormented I am, screamed Natasha in a voice of repressed anger and despair. Sonya began to sob and rushed from the room. Natasha went to her writing-table and, without pausing a moment, wrote the letter to the Princess Maria which she had not been able to write the morning before. In the letter she laconically informed the princess that all misunderstandings were at an end, that taking advantage of Prince Andrei's generosity and giving her perfect freedom, she begged her to forget all that had happened, and to forgive her if she had been to blame in respect to her, but that she could never be his wife. At that moment all seemed to her so easy, simple, and clear. The Rostovs were to start for the country on Friday, and on Wednesday the Count went with an intending purchaser to his Podmoskovnaya estate. On the day of the Count's trip, Sonya and Natasha were invited to a great dinner at the Kuragins, and Maria Dmitrievna went as their chaperone. At this dinner Natasha again met Anatole, and Sonya observed that Natasha had some mysterious conversation with him which she evidently wished not to be overheard, and during all the dinner time she seemed to be more agitated than ever. On their return home, Natasha was the first to begin the explanation which her friend was anxious for. "'There, Sonya, you have said all sorts of foolish things about him,' Natasha began, in a cajoling tone, such as children use when they want to be flattered. "'He and I came to a clear understanding to-day.' "'Now, what do you mean? What did he say, Natasha?' How glad I am that you are not vexed with me. Tell me all, tell me the whole story. What did he say to you? Natasha pondered. Ach, Sonya, if you only knew him as I do. He said, 
He asked me what sort of an engagement I had with Bolkonsky. He was delighted that it depended on me to break it off. Sonya sighed mournfully. But you haven't broken your engagement with Bolkonsky, have you? Well, perhaps I have broken my engagement with Bolkonsky. Perhaps it is all at an end. What makes you have such hard thoughts of me? I have no hard thoughts of you, only I can't understand this. Wait, Sonya, and you will understand the whole thing. You will learn what a man he is. But don't harbor hard thoughts of me, or of him, either. I harbor no hard thoughts of any one. I love you, and I am sorry for you all. But what am I to do? Sonya, however, was not blinded by the affectionate manner in which Natasha treated her. The more gentle and insinuating Natasha's face grew, the more stern and serious became Sonya's face. Natasha, said she, you yourself begged me not to say any more about this to you, and I have not, and now you reopen it yourself. Natasha, I don't have any faith in him. Why all this mystery? There, you begin again, interposed Natasha. Natasha, I am afraid for you. Why should you be afraid for me? I am afraid that you are going to your ruin, said Sonya, in a resolute voice, frightened herself at what she said. An angry look again came into Natasha's face. I will go to my ruin, I certainly will, and the faster the better. It's no affair of yours. It won't hurt you, even if it does hurt me. Leave me. Leave. I hate you. Natasha, expostulated Sonya, in dismay. I hate you. I hate you. We can never be friends any more. Natasha rushed out of the room. Natasha had nothing more to say to Sonya, and she avoided her. With that peculiar expression of nervous preoccupation and guilt, she wandered up and down the rooms, trying one occupation after another, and instantly abandoning them. Hard as this was for Sonya, she did not let her out of her sight for a single moment, but followed her everywhere she went. On the day before the Count's return, Sonya observed that Natasha spent the whole morning at the parlor window, as though in expectation of someone, and that she made some sort of signal to an officer who drove by, and who Sonya thought must have been Anatole. Sonya began to observe her friend still more closely, and remarked that during all dinner-time and throughout the evening Natasha was in a strange and unnatural state of excitement, answering at random the questions that were asked her, beginning and not finishing sentences, and laughing at everything. After tea Sonya saw a timid chambermaid watching for her at Natasha's door. She let her pass in, and listening at the keyhole discovered that she was the bearer of another letter. And suddenly it became clear to Sonya that Natasha had some terrible plan on foot for that evening. Sonya knocked loudly at the door. Natasha refused to admit her. "'She is going to elope with him,' said Sonya to herself. "'She is quite ready for anything. Her face today had a peculiarly pitiful and determined expression. She wept when she said good-bye to her father yesterday,' Sonya remembered. "'Yes.' It is evident that she is going to elope with him. What can I do about it? mused Sonya, now recalling all the circumstances that made her think Natasha had adopted some terrible resolution. The Count is away. What can I do? Write to Kurrigan and demand of him an explanation. But who would make him reply to it? Write to Pierre, as Prince Andre told me to do in case of misfortune. But perhaps she has already broken with Volkonsky. Certainly Natasha sent her letter to the Princess last evening— if her father were only here! It seemed terrible to tell Marya Dmitrievna, who had such confidence in Natasha. But what else can I do? mused Sonya, as she stood in the dark corridor. Now or never is the time to show that I am grateful to this dear family, and that I love Nicholas. No, even if I have to stay awake for three nights I will not leave this corridor, and I will detain her by main force, and I will not allow any scandal to happen to this family, she said to herself. End of chapter 15
natasha had agreed to meet kuragin at ten o'clock that evening at the rear entrance kuragin was to place her in a trioka which should be in waiting and carry her sixty verse to the village of kamienko where an unfrocked pope would be in readiness to perform the mock marriage ceremony at kamienko a relay would be ready to take them toward warsaw and thence by regular stages they would make their escape abroad anatol had his passport and his podoroznoya or order for post horses and ten thousand roubles obtained from his sister and ten thousand obtained through dolokhof's mediation two witnesses vostokhof formerly a law clerk who is now a creature of dolokhof's and makarin a hussar on the retired list a weak and good-natured fellow who had an inordinate affection for kuragin were sitting in the front room over their tea in dolokhof's large cabinet the walls of which were hung from floor to ceiling with persian rugs bearskins and weapons sat dolokhof himself in a travelling beshmet and top-boots before an open desk on which lay bills and packages of money anatol in his uniform unbuttoned came in from the room where the two witnesses were sitting and was passing through the cabinet into the adjoining room where his french valet and another servant were packing up the last remaining effects dolokhof was making out the accounts and writing the amounts on a sheet of paper well said he you will have to give two thousand to vostokhof all right give it to him said anatol makarka this was an affectionate name for makarin is so disinterested that he would go through fire and water for you there now the accounts are all made out said dolokhof calling his attention to the paper is that right yes of course it is said anatol evidently not heeding what was said and looking into vacancy with a dreamy expression and a smile that did not leave his face dolokhof shut the desk with a slam and turned to kuragin with an amused smile but see here now you'd better give this up there's still time said he fool durak said anatol stop talking nonsense if you only knew but only the devil knows what this is to me honestly throw it up said dolokhof i tell you the honest truth do you imagine that this is a joke that you are going into there you are stirring me up again go to the devil exclaimed anatol scowling i have no time to listen to your idiotic twaddle and he started to leave the room Dolokhov smiled scornfully and condescendingly as Anatol turned away. "'Wait!' he cried after him. "'I am not joking. I am telling you the truth. Come here. Come here, I say.' Anatol came back into the room again, and, trying to concentrate his attention, gazed at Dolokhov, apparently quite under the influence of his will. "'Listen to me. I suspect for the last time. Why should I jest with you?' have i done anything to thwart you who is it that has made all the arrangements for you who found your pope for you who procured your passport who got the money for you haven't i done the whole thing yes and i thank you do you imagine i am not grateful anatol sighed and embraced his friend i have been helping you but it is my place to tell you the truth it is a dangerous game and if it misses fire a stupid one suppose you elope with her well and good what will be the next step it will be discovered that you are married you will be prosecuted as a criminal ugh what nonsense what stupid nonsense cried anatol frowning again haven't i told you again and again eh and anatol with that peculiar passion for argument characteristic of men of small intellects when they want to show their wit reiterated the considerations which he had laid before dolokhof a hundred times i have told you again and again my mind is made up if this marriage is invalid said he doubling over his finger of course i am not responsible for it well then suppose it is valid it's just the same and when we are abroad no one will know the difference that's a fact is it not say no more say no more say no more but really give it up you will only get yourself into a scrape go to the devil screamed anatol and tearing his hair he rushed into the next room and then he came right back and sat down a straddle of a chair in front of dolokhof the devil only knows what this is to me eh just see how it beats he took dolokhof's hand and put it on his heart 
Ah, quel pied, mon cher, quel regard, un dies, eh? Dolokhov, smiling unsympathetically, looked at him out of his handsome, impudent eyes, evidently feeling inclined to have a little more sport out of him. Well, but when your money is gone, what then? What then? Eh? repeated Anatole, with a touch of genuine distress at the thought of the future. What then? I am sure I don't know. But what is the use of talking nonsense? He looked at his watch. It's time. Anatole went into the next room. Hurry up there. Aren't you almost ready? What are you dawdling so for? He cried, addressing the servants. Dolokhov put up the money, and, shouting to his man to have a lunch of eatables and drinkables prepared for the travellers for their journey, he went into the room where Bostokov and Makarin were waiting. Anatole had flung himself down on the ottoman in the cabinet, and, with his head resting on his hand, was dreamily smiling and whispering low and tender words. "'Come and have something to eat. Have a drink, then,' cried Dolokhov from the next room. "'I don't wish anything,' replied Anatole still with the smile on his handsome lips. Come, Balaga is here. Anatole got up and went into the dining-room. Balaga was a famous Trioka driver, who, for half a dozen years, had known Dolokhov and Anatole, and had furnished them with teams. More than once, when Anatole's regiment had been at Tver, he had started at nightfall from Tver, set him down in Moscow before daybreak, and brought him back by the following morning. More than once he had taken Dolokhov out of the reach of pursuers. More than once he had taken them out to drive with gypsies and demochki, nice little dames, as Balaga called fast women. More than once, at their instigation, he had run down pedestrians and izvoschcheks in the Moscow streets, and always his gentlemen, as he called them, had rescued him from the penalty. More than one horse he had broken down in their service. More than once he had been thrashed by them, Many times they had given him champagne and Madeira, which he specially affected, and he knew of escapades of theirs which would have condemned any ordinary man to Siberia. During their orgies they had often invited Balaga to take part, and made him drink and dance with the gypsies, and more than one thousand roubles of theirs had passed through his hands. In service for them he had twenty times a year risked life and limb, and in accompanying their deviltry he had almost killed more horses than their money would ever pay for. But he was fond of them. He was fond of that mad pace of eighteen verse an hour. He was fond of upsetting some harmless Ivoschek from his box, or running down some pedestrian on the street crossings, and of dashing at full tilt down the Moscow highways. He was fond of hearing behind him that wild cry of drunken voices, Pachol, Pachol! when it was already a physical impossibility for his horses to carry them a step further. And he was fond of winding his whiplash around a peasant's neck, who shrank back more dead than alive as he passed by. Real gentlemen, he called them. Anatole and Dolokhov also were fond of Balaga, because of his masterly skill in handling the lines, and because his tastes were similar to theirs. With others he drove hard bargains, charging twenty-five roubles for two hours' outing, and he rarely condescended to drive others himself, but more frequently sent one of his subordinates. But with his gentlemen, as he called them, he always went himself, and never charged for his extra labor. Only when he learned through the valets that money was plentiful, he would come, after an interval of many months, and, very soberly and obsequiously, bowing low, asked to be helped out of his difficulties. His gentlemen always made him take a seat. "'You will excuse me,' Bayushka Fyodor Ivanuitch, or your illustriousness, he would say, I am entirely out of horses. I pray you to advance me enough to go and get more at the Yermanka. And Anatole and Dolokhov, if they happened to be flush of funds, would give him a thousand or so roubles. Balaga was twenty-seven years old, a stubbed, red-haired, snub-nosed muzik, with fiery red complexion and still more fiery red neck, with glittering little eyes and a scrubby beard. He wore a fine blue silk-lined kaftan, and over that a sheepskin polushupka. He crossed himself, turning to the shrine corner, as he came in, and advanced toward Dolokhov, holding out a small black hand. "'Fyodor Ivanovitch, your good health!' he exclaimed with a low bow. "'How are you, brother? There he is.' "'Good health, your illustriousness,' said he, addressing Anatole, who came in at that moment, and offered him also his dirty hand." 
i ask you balaga said anatol clapping his hand on his shoulder do you love me or not eh now there's a chance for you to prove it what horses have you come with eh those your man ordered your own wild ones said balaga now see here balaga no matter if you slaughter all three of your horses provided you get us there within three hours eh if we slaughter them how shall we get there replied balaga with a wink i'll smash your snout for you a truce to joking cried anatol suddenly with glaring eyes who's joking exclaimed the driver with a laugh do i ever grudge anything for my gentleman whatever my horses can show in the way of speed that we will do ah grunted anatol sit down then yes why not sit down said dolokhof i will stand fyodor ivanovitch sit down no nonsense have a drink said anatol and poured him out a great glass of madeira the driver's eyes flashed at the sight of the wine refusing at first for manners sake he drank it down and wiped his mouth with a red silk handkerchief which he kept in the top of his cap well when shall we start your illustriousness let me see anatol glanced at his watch start pretty soon now see here balaga hey you will get there on time well it depends on the start if we get off luckily then we'll be there in good time i got you to tver once went there in seven hours don't you remember your lustrousness do you know when christmas we started from tver said anatol smiling at the remembrance and turning to makarin who was gazing affectionately at kuragin with all his eyes you wouldn't believe it makarka we flew so that it quite took away my breath we came upon one file of carts and jumped right over two of them eh what horses those were interposed balaga taking up the thread of the story at that time i put in two young side horses with the bay shaft horse said he turning to dolokhof you would hardly believe it fyodor ivanuitch those wild creatures actually flew for sixty verse it was impossible to hold them my hands were numb it was so cold i threw down the lines look out for yourself your illustriousness said i and rolled over backward into the sledge it was hopeless to control em or even to stick to my seat the devils got us there in three hours only the left one was winded End of chapter sixteen part five chapter seventeen of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter seventeen anatol left the room and at the end of a few minutes came back in a sable shubka girded with a silver buckled leather belt and wearing a sable cap jauntily set on one side and very becoming to his handsome face glancing into the mirror and then taking the same posture before dolokhof which the mirror had told him was the most effective he seized a glass of wine well fedya good-bye prashkai thank you for everything prashkai said anatol well comrades friends he pondered a moment friends of my youth prashkaite he said turning to makarin and the others although they were all going with him anatol evidently wanted to do something affecting and solemn on the occasion of this farewell he spoke in a low slow deep voice and throwing out his chest he swayed a little as he rested his weight on one leg all of you take your glasses you too balaga well comrades friends of my youth we have had jolly good times together we have enjoyed life we have been on many sprees eh now when shall we meet again i am going abroad farewell prashkai my boys to your health hurrah he cried draining his glass and smashing it on the ground to your good health exclaimed balaga also draining his glass and wiping it with his handkerchief makarin with tears in his eyes embraced anatol ugh prince how sad that we should have to part he exclaimed come let us be off cried anatol balaga was on the point of leaving the room hold on there wait said anatol shut the door we must sit down first there that's the way they closed the door and sat down for the sake of the superstition well now be off with you boys said anatol getting up anatol's valet joseph gave him his purse and sabre 
and all flocked into the anteroom. "'But where is the shuba?' demanded Dolokhov. "'Hey, Ignatka, go to Matryona Matryevna and ask her for the shuba, the sable cloak. I know how girls go off on such occasions,' exclaimed Dolokhov with a wink. "'She will come running out more dead than alive, dressed for staying in the house, and if you delay a moment too long there will be tears, and O oh, Papasha and O oh, Mamasha, and she'll be cold and back she'll go. So be sure you take this shuba with you, and have it all ready in the sledge. The valet brought a woman's cloak, lined with fox. You fool! I told you to get the sable. Hey, Matryoshka, bring the sable, he shouted, his voice ringing down through the rooms. A handsome gypsy girl, though thin and pale, with brilliant black eyes and curly, purplish black hair, with a red shawl over her shoulders, came hurrying out with the sable cloak over her arm. "'Why, I don't care. Take it,' said she, evidently afraid of her master, and yet regretting the cloak. Dolokhov, without heeding her, took the foxskin shuba, threw it over Matryosha, and wrapped it round her. "'So,' said Dolokhov, "'and so,' he repeated, as he pulled the collar up above her head, leaving only a small opening for her face. "'That's the way, do you see?' and he moved Anatole's head towards the opening left by the collar, where Matryosha's brilliant smile could alone be seen. "'Well, good-bye, Matryosha. Pershkai,' said Anatole, kissing her. "'Ech, my follies here are ended. Give my regards to Stioshka. Well, Pershkai, Matryoshka, wish me good luck.' "'Well, then, Prince, God grant you the best of luck,' said Matryosha, in her gypsy accent." At the doorstep two triokas were waiting, with two jaunty yamshchiks in attendance. Balaga was on the box of the first sledge and, with his elbows held high, was deliberately sorting the reins. Anatole and Dolokhov got in behind him. Makarin, Vostokov, and the valet took their places in the other trioka. "'All ready?' inquired Balaga. "'Let her go,' he cried, twisting the reins round his wrists and the three horses flew like the wind down the Nikitsky Boulevard. The groom leaped down to hold the horses' heads by the curb, while Anatole and Dolokhov strode along the pavement. Coming to the gate, Dolokhov gave a low whistle. The whistle was returned, and immediately after a chambermaid came running out. "'Come into the court, else you will be seen. She'll be down presently,' said she. Dolokhov remained by the gate. Anatole followed the chambermaid into the dvor turned to the corner, and ran up the steps. Suddenly, Gravrilo, Maria Dmitrievna's colossal footman, met Anatole. "'Be good enough to go to my mistress,' said the footman, in a deep, bass voice, as he blocked all retreat from the door. "'Who's your mistress? Who are you?' demanded Anatole, in a breathless whisper. "'If you please, I was ordered to show you.' "'Kurgan, back!' cried Dolokhov. "'You are betrayed! Back!' Dolokhov, who had been left at the outside gate, was engaged in a tussle with the Dvornik, who was trying to shut it and prevent Anatole from returning through it. Dolokhov, with a final output of force, overturned the Dvornik, seized Anatole by the arm, pulled him through the gate, and ran together with him back to their trioka. End of chapter 17「Part Five, Chapter Eighteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Maria Dmitrievna, finding the weeping Sonya in the corridor, had obliged her to confess the whole. Having got possession of Natasha's letter and read it, Maria Dmitrievna took it and confronted Natasha with it. Wretched girl, shameless hussy, she said to her. I will not listen to a single word. Pushing away Natasha, who looked at her with wondering but tearless eyes, she shut her in under lock and key. Then she had ordered the Dvornik to admit into the courtyard any one who might come that evening, but not to let them out again, and she had ordered the footmen to show such persons into her presence. Having made these arrangements, she took up her position in the drawing-room and waited for developments. When Gavrilo came in to inform Marya Dmitrievna that the abductors had escaped, she was very indignant. She got up, and for a long time paced up and down the room, with her hands clasped behind her back, deliberating on what she ought to do. At midnight she got the key out from her pocket and went into Natasha's room. Sonya was still sitting in the corridor, sobbing. 
Maria Dmitrievna, let me go to her for God's sake, said she. Maria Dmitrievna, giving her no reply, opened the door and went in. Disgusting, abominable, in my house. Indecent, shameless hussy. Only I'm sorry for her father, said Maria Dmitrievna, trying to master her indignation. Hard as it will be, I will bid them all hold their tongues, and I'll keep it from the count. Maria Dmitrievna entered the chamber with her firm step. Natasha was lying on the sofa, with her face hid in her hands. She did not stir, but lay in the same position in which Maria Dmitrievna had left her. "'Pretty conduct! Pretty conduct, indeed!' exclaimed Maria Dmitrievna. "'To make assignations with your lovers in my house! None of your hypocrisy! Listen when I speak to you!' Maria Dmitrievna shook her by the arm. "'Listen when I speak to you! You have disgraced yourself, like any common wench. I'd settle this with you, but I have some pity for your father. I shall keep it from him. Natasha did not change her position, but her whole body began to shake with the noiseless convulsive sobs that choked her. Maria Dmitrievna glanced at Sonya and sat down on the sofa near Natasha. Lucky for him he escaped me, but I'll find him, said she, in her harsh voice. Do you hear what I am saying? She put her big hand under Natasha's face and turned it toward her. Both Maria Dmitrievna and Sonya were amazed when they saw her face. Her eyes were dry and glittering, her lips compressed, her cheeks hollow. Let me be. What do I care? I shall die, she murmured, turning away from Maria Dmitrievna with angry petulance and hiding her face in her hands again. Natalia, exclaimed Maria Dmitrievna, I wish you well. Lie there, lie there if you wish, I won't touch you. But listen to me. I am not going to show you how blameworthy you have been. You know. But don't you see? Your father will be back tomorrow. What shall I say to him? Again Natasha's form was shaken by sobs. He will hear of it, and so will your brother, and so will your betrothed. I have no betrothed. I have refused him, cried Natasha. That is immaterial, pursued Maria Dmitrievna. Well, they will learn of it. Do you think they will forgive it? There's your father. I know him. If he should challenge him, would it be a good thing? Huh? Ah, leave me. Why should you have interfered at all? Why? Why? Who asked you to? screamed Natasha. Sitting up straight on the sofa and glaring angrily at Maria Dmitrievna. But what idea had you? demanded Maria Dmitrievna, again losing her patience. Were you kept locked up? Who on earth prevented him from coming to the house? Why must he needs carry you off like a gypsy wench? Well, now, suppose he had carried you off. Do you suppose we shouldn't have found him? Either your father, or your brother, or your betrothed? Well, he's a scoundrel, a knave, that's what he is. He's better than all of you put together, cried Natasha, sitting up very straight. If you had not meddled, ugh, oh, my God, has it come to this? Has it come to this? Sonya, what made you? Go away! And she burst into a passion of tears, sobbing with the desperation such as only those feel who know that they are responsible for their own woes. Marya Dmitrievna began to speak once more, but Natasha cried, Go away! Go away! You all hate me! You all despise me! And she threw herself on the sofa again. Maria Dmitrievna continued for some time to give her advice and assure her that this whole affair ought to be kept a secret from the Count, that no one would know anything about it if only Natasha would try to let it all go and not betray in any one's presence that anything had happened. Natasha made no reply. She ceased to sob, but a fit of shivering and trembling came upon her. Maria Dmitrievna put a pillow under her head, covered her up with a couple of comforters, and herself brought her some linden flower, but Natasha had nothing to say to her. Now, let her go to sleep, said Maria Dmitrievna, and left the room, thinking that she would soon sleep. But Natasha did not go to sleep, and with wide, staring eyes, gazed into vacancy. She slept none that night, and she did not weep, and she did not speak to Sonya, who several times got up and went to her. On the following day, Count Ilya Andreyitch returned from his 
but Moskovnaya in time for breakfast, as he had promised. He was in a most genial frame of mind. He had come to a satisfactory arrangement with his purchaser, and now there was nothing to detain him in Moscow, and away from his countess, whom he was very anxious to see. Marya Dmitrievna met him, and informed him that Natasha had been ill the day before, that they had sent for the doctor, and now she was better. Natasha that morning did not leave her room. With set, cracked lips, with wide, dry eyes, she kept her place by the window, and anxiously gazed at the passers-by in the street, and turned anxiously towards those who entered her room. She was evidently expecting news from him, expecting that either he would himself come or send her a letter. When the Count went to her, she heard the sound of his heavy steps, and turned round nervously, and then her face assumed its former expression of hauteur, and even anger. She did not even get up to meet him. "'What is the matter with thee, my angel? Are you ill?' asked the Count. Natasha hesitated. "'Yes, I am ill,' said she. In reply to the Count's anxious questions, why she was so cast down, and whether anything had happened to her lover, she assured him that nothing had happened, and begged him not to be disturbed. Marya Dmitrievna confirmed Natasha's statement that nothing had happened, but the Count, judging from the imaginary illness, and by his daughter's absent-mindedness, by the troubled faces of Sonya and Marya Dmitrievna, saw clearly that during his absence something must have happened. It was so terrible, however, for him to think that anything disgraceful had happened to his beloved daughter. He was so happy in his buoyant good spirits that he avoided asking any pointed questions, and tried hard to assure himself that nothing out of the way could have happened. And his only regret was that, on account of Natasha's indisposition, he was obliged to postpone their return to his country seat. End of chapter 18《パート5チャプター19 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy translated by Nathan Haskell Dole This LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by Marianne Chapter 19 Pierre on the day of his wife's arrival at Moscow had made up his mind to take a journey somewhere so as to avoid being with her Then when the Rostovs came to Moscow the impression produced upon him by Natasha made him hasten to carry out his intention he went to Tver to see Iosip Alexievich's widow, who had some time since promised to put into his hands her husband's papers. On Pierre's return to Moscow, a letter was handed him from Maria Dmitrievna, who urged him to come and consult with her on some highly important business concerning Andrei Bolkonsky and his betrothed. Pierre had avoided Natasha. It seemed to him that he felt for her a sentiment stronger than was justifiable for a married man to harbor for his friend's mistress and some perverse fate was constantly throwing them together. "'What can have happened, and what can it have to do with me?' he wondered, while dressing to go to Marya Dmitrievna's. "'It is high time for Prince Andrei to be back and marry her,' thought Pierre, as he set out for Mrs. Akrasimova's. On the Tversky Boulevard someone hailed him. "'Pierre, been back long,' cried a well-known voice. Pierre raised his head. It was Anatole and his inseparable companion— Makarin, dashing by in a double sledge, drawn by two grey trotters, that sent the snow flinging over the dasher. Anatole sat bolt upright, in the classic pose of dashing warriors, with his neck muffled in a beaver collar, and bending his head a little. His face was fresh and ruddy. His hat, with a white plume, was set jauntily on one side, exposing his curled and pomaded hair, dusted with fine snow. Indeed, he's a real philosopher, thought Pierre. He sees nothing beyond the enjoyment of the actual moment. Nothing annoys him, and consequently he is always jolly, self-satisfied, and calm. What would I give to be like him, thought Pierre, with a feeling of envy. In the anteroom of the Akrasimovas, a footman, who relieved Pierre of his shuba, told him that Maria Dmitrievna would receive him in her own room. As he passed through the music-room, Pierre caught sight of Natasha sitting by the window, with a strange expression of disdain on her pale, thin face. She gave him a glance, and frowned, and, with an expression of chilling dignity, left the room. "'What has happened?' asked Pierre, on entering Marya Dmitrievna's room. "'Pretty state of affairs,' replied Marya Dmitrievna. Fifty-eight years I have lived in this world, and I never saw anything so shameful.' And then, 
receiving pierre's word of honour that he would keep secret what he should hear Maria Dmitrievna confided to him that Natasha had broken her engagement with Prince Andrei without the knowledge of her parents, that the cause of this break was Anatole Kuragin, whom Pierre's wife had introduced to her, and with whom she had promised to elope during her father's absence in order to enter into a clandestine marriage. Pierre, with shoulders raised and mouth opened, listened to Maria Dmitrievna's story, not believing his own ears, that Prince Andrei's betrothed, that hitherto lovely natasha rostova so passionately beloved should give up bolkonsky for that fool of an anatole who was a married man for pierre was in the secret of his marriage and so be enamoured of him as to consent to elope with him pierre could not comprehend and could not imagine natasha's sweetness of character he had known her since childhood could not in his mind be associated with this new suggestion of baseness folly and cruelty in her he remembered his own wife they are all alike he said to himself thinking that he was not the only one who had had the misfortune to be in the toils of an unworthy woman and at the same time he could have wept for his friend prince andrei to whose pride it would be such a grievous blow and the more he grieved for his friend the greater scorn and even aversion he felt for natasha who had just passed by him with such an expression of haughty dignity in the music-room he could not know that Natasha's soul was full to overflowing of despair, shame, and humiliation, and that she was not to blame for her face expressing, from very despair, that cold dignity and disdain. "'But how could he marry her?' exclaimed Pierre, catching at Marya Dmitrievna's last word. "'He could not marry her. He already has a wife.' "'Worse and worse!' exclaimed Marya Dmitrievna. "'Fine young man! What a dastard he is!' and she has been waiting here these two days for him to come. At any rate, she must cease expecting him. We must tell her. When she learned from Pierre all the details of Anatole's marriage, and had poured out the vials of her wrath against him in abusive words, Maria Dmitrievna explained to Pierre why she had asked him to call upon her. She was afraid that the Count, or Bolkonsky, who was liable to return at any moment, might learn of the affair, in spite of all her efforts to keep it a profound secret, and might challenge Kuragin to a duel, and, therefore, she besought him to add his influence to hers in getting him to leave town and never show himself in her presence again. Pierre willingly agreed to fulfil her wishes, since now he for the first time realized the danger threatening the old Count and Nikolai and Prince Andrei. Having preferred her request in short and precise terms, she took him back into the drawing-room. "'Mind you, the Count knows nothing of this. You must pretend that you also know nothing about it,' said she. "'And I am going this instant to tell her that she is to cease expecting him. And stay to dinner, if you will,' shouted back Maria Dmitrievna to Pierre. Pierre met the old Count. He was disturbed and annoyed. That morning Natasha had told him that she had broken her engagement with Balkonsky. "'Too bad, too bad, mon cher,' said he to Pierre. "'Too bad for these girls to be away from their mother. "'How sorry I am that I ever came at all. "'I am going to be frank with you. "'She has already broken her engagement "'without telling any one of us about it. "'Now I will admit that I never have been "'overpleased at this engagement. "'I will agree that he is a fine man and all that. "'But what would you have? "'There would not be much happiness "'if the father was opposed.' and Natasha would not lack chances of getting married. Still, the affair has gone on so long, and to have such a step taken without consulting father or mother. And now she's sick, and God knows what's the matter. It's a bad thing, Count, a bad thing, for daughters to be without their mother. Pierre perceived that the Count was very much disconcerted, and he tried to bring the conversation round to other topics, but the Count kept returning to his grievance. Sonya, with anxious face, came into the drawing-room. "'Natasha is not very well today. She is in her room. But she would like to see you. Marya Dmitrievna is with her, and would also like you to come.' "'Yes, certainly. You and Bolkonsky were good friends. She probably wants to send some message,' said the Count. "'Ugh, oh, my God, my God! How good it all was!' And tearing at his thin locks, the Count left the room." Maria Dmitrievna had been explaining to Natasha how Anatole was married. Natasha refused to believe her and demanded to have confirmation of it from Pierre himself. Sonya confided this to Pierre as they passed along the corridor toward Natasha's room. 
Natasha, pale and stern, was sitting next to Marya Dmitrievna. The moment Pierre entered the doorway, she met him with feverishly glittering, wildly imploring eyes. She did not smile, she did not even greet him with a nod, she only looked at him eagerly, and her eyes merely demanded if he came as her friend, or, like all the rest, as her enemy, in reference to Anatole. Pierre, in his own personality as Pierre, did not exist for her. "'He knows all about it,' said Marya Dmitrievna, indicating Pierre and addressing Natasha. "'Let him tell you, if I am not speaking the truth. Natasha, as a wounded animal at bay, glares at the dogs and huntsmen approaching, looked first at the one and then at the other. "'Natalia Ilyanichna,' Pierre began, dropping his eyes and experiencing a feeling of compunction for her— and of aversion to the operation which he was obliged to perform. It is true. Whether this is true or not true, as far as you are concerned, it cannot matter, because— Then it is not true that he is married. Nay, it is true. Has he been married for some time? she asked. On your word of honor! Pierre gave her his solemn word of honor. Is he still in town? she asked hurriedly. "'Yes, I have just seen him.' The effort to say more was evidently too much for her, and she made them a sign with her hand to leave her alone. End of chapter 19 Part 5, Chapter 20 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 20 Pierre did not remain for dinner, but immediately took his leave. He went out for the purpose of finding Anatole Kuragin, the mere thought of whom now made all the blood rush to his heart and almost choke him. He sought him everywhere, at the ice hills, among the gypsies, at Komenos, but he was nowhere to be found. Pierre went to the club. There everything was going in its usual train. The members, who were assembling for dinner, formed little groups, and, greeting Pierre, spoke of various items of city gossip. A servant, who knew his habits and his particular friends, accosted him politely, and informed him that the place was ready for him at the little table, that Prince N. N. was in the library, but that T. T. had not yet come. One of Pierre's acquaintances, during some talk of the weather, asked him if he had heard of Kurigan's elopement with Rostova, about which the whole city were talking, and if it were true. Pierre, with a laugh, said that it was all nonsense, because he had just come from the Rostovs. He inquired of every one if they had seen Anatole. One said that he had not yet come, another that he would be there to dinner. It was strange for Pierre to look at this tranquil, indifferent throng of men, who had not the slightest inkling of what was passing in his mind. He then sauntered through the hall till all had gone in to dinner, and then, giving up expecting Anatole, he did not wait for dinner, but went home. Anatole, whom he was so anxious to find, dined that day with Dolokhov, and was discussing with him some plan of still carrying out their ill-fated enterprise. It seemed to him absolutely necessary to have an interview with Natasha. In the evening he went to his sister's, in order to arrange with her some means of procuring this interview. When Pierre, who had vainly ransacked all Moscow, returned home, the footman informed him that Prince Anatole Vasilyevich was with the Countess. The countess's drawing-room was crowded with company. Pierre, not even greeting his wife, whom he had not seen since his return, never had she seemed to him more utterly detestable than at that moment, went into the drawing-room, and, catching sight of Anatole, went straight up to him. "'Ah, Pierre!' cried the countess, approaching her husband. "'You don't know in what a position our Anatole,' she paused, when she saw the forward thrust of her husband's head, in his flashing eyes, and his resolute gait, the same strange, terrible expression of frenzy and might which she had known and experienced after his duel with Dolokhov. "'Sin and lewdness are with you everywhere,' said Pierre to his wife. "'Anatole, come with me. I want a few words with you,' he said in French. Anatole glanced at his sister, and boldly rose, ready to follow Pierre. Pierre took him by the arm and hurried him out of the room. "'Si vous vous permettez dans mon salon,' exclaimed Ellen in a whisper, but Pierre made no reply, and left the room. Anatole followed him with his usual jaunty gait, but there was a trace of anxiety on his face. When they reached Pierre's cabinet he shut the door, and addressed Anatole without looking at him. "'You promised to marry the Countess Rostova, and planned to elope with her. 
my dear replied anatole in french in which language indeed the whole conversation was carried on i consider myself under no obligation to answer questions asked in such a tone pierre's face white to begin with became perfectly distorted with rage with his huge hand he seized anatole by the collar of his uniform coat and proceeded to shake him from side to side until the young man's face expressed a sufficient degree of terror when i tell you that i must have an answer from you now look here this is stupid ha huh? exclaimed anatole looking for the button that had been torn off from his collar you are a scoundrel and a blackguard and i don't know what restrains me from the satisfaction of smashing your head with this said pierre expressing himself with easy fluency because he spoke in french he had taken into his hand a heavy paperweight and he held it up menacingly and then slowly laid it back in its place again did you promise to marry her i i i don't think so besides i couldn't have promised any such thing be because pierre interrupted him have you any of her letters he demanded coming close to him anatole gave him one look and instantly put his hand into his pocket and took out a pocket-book pierre seized the letter which he handed to him and violently pushing aside a chair that was in his way he went to the sofa and flung himself upon it i will not hurt you have no fear said he in reply to anatole's terrified gesture the letters one thing said pierre as though repeating a lesson for his own edification secondly he continued after a moment's silence getting to his feet again and beginning to pace up and down the room you must leave moscow to-morrow but how can i thirdly pursued pierre not heeding him you must never breathe a word about what has taken place between you and the countess this i know i cannot oblige you to do but if you have a single spark of conscience pierre walked in silence several times from one end of the room to the other anatole had sat down by the table and was scowling and chewing his lips you must learn some time that above and beyond your own pleasure the happiness and peace of others are to be considered that you are ruining a whole life for the sake of having a little amusement trifle with women like my wife as much as you please with such you have fair game they know what you want of them they are armed against you by their very experience in lust but promise a young girl to marry her to deceive her to rob her why don't you know that it is as cowardly as to strike an old man or a child pierre stopped speaking and looked at anatole inquiringly his anger had vanished i don't know i'm sure huh said anatole gaining confidence in proportion as pierre's anger subsided i know nothing about it and i don't want to know said he not looking at pierre while at the same time his lower jaw trembled slightly but you have spoken to me words so insulting that i as a man of honor cannot think of permitting them pierre looked at him in amazement perfectly unable to understand what he wanted of him though we have had no witnesses continued anatole still i cannot what you wish satisfaction asked pierre scornfully at least you can retract what you said eh that is if you expect me to carry out your wishes eh i will i'll take it back exclaimed pierre and i beg you to forgive me pierre could not help looking at the torn button and money if you need it for your journey anatole smiled this contemptible villainous smile which he knew so well in his wife stirred pierre's indignation oh contemptible heartless race he exclaimed and left the room the next day anatole started for petersburg end of chapter twenty part five chapter twenty one of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter twenty one pierre went to marya dmitrievna's to inform her how he had accomplished her wishes in regard to anatole's expulsion from moscow he found the whole house in terror and commotion natasha was very ill and as marya dmitrievna informed him under a seal of secrecy the night after she had learned that anatole kuragin was married she had poisoned herself with arsenic that she managed surreptitiously to procure having swallowed a considerable quantity she awakened sonya and confessed what she had done 
the proper antidotes to the poison had been given in time and she was now out of danger but she was still so weak that it was out of the question to think of taking her to the country and the countess had been sent for pierre saw the troubled count and the weeping sonya but he was not allowed to see natasha pierre had that day dined at the club and had heard on all sides gossip about the frustrated elopement but he strenuously denied these rumours assuring every one that there was nothing in it except that his brother-in-law had offered himself to rostova and had been refused it seemed plain to pierre that it was his bounden duty to conceal the whole affair and save natasha's reputation in a real panic he waited for prince andrei's return and each day he went to the old prince's to inquire for news of him prince nikolai andreitch had learned through mademoiselle bourienne of all this gossip flying through the city and he had read the letter to the princess maria in which natasha broke off her engagement with prince andrei this letter also he had obtained through mademoiselle bourienne who had fetched it from the princess he seemed in better spirits than usual and awaited his son's return with the greatest impatience when the latter finally reached moscow the old prince first thing handed him natasha's letter to his sister announcing her discontinuance of the engagement and told him with additions of his own invention the various rumours current concerning the elopement a few days after anatole's departure pierre received a note from prince andrei announcing his arrival and begging pierre to come to see him since prince andrei's arrival had been in the evening pierre went to see him the following morning he expected to find him in almost the same state of mind as natasha was and therefore great was his amazement when on being shown into the drawing-room he heard prince andrei in the adjoining cabinet telling in a loud animated manner of some petersburg intrigue he was occasionally interrupted by the old prince and by a third person present the princess maria came in to greet pierre she sighed as she turned her eyes towards the door of the room where her brother was evidently anxious to give expression to her sympathy for his affliction but pierre detected on her face evidences of her inward gratification at the turn affairs had taken and at the manner in which her brother had received the news of natasha's fickleness he told me that he expected this said she i know that his pride would not let him make any show of his feelings but nevertheless he bears up under it better far better than i had any reason to expect of course since it had to be so but do you mean to say it is all over between them the princess maria looked at him in amazement she could not understand how any one should even ask such a question pierre went into the cabinet prince andrei much altered and evidently restored to perfect health but with a new and perpendicular wrinkle between his brows was standing in civil dress in front of his father and prince mershersky who was arguing eagerly making forceful gestures the topic was speransky news of whose unexpected banishment and reported treason had only just reached moscow now prince andrei was saying the very men who a month ago were extolling him and who are fully incapable of comprehending his aims are criticizing him and condemning him to criticize a man in disfavor is very easy and so it is to make him responsible for the blunders of others but i tell you if any one has done any good during this present reign it has been done by him by him alone he caught sight of pierre and paused a spasm passed over his face and immediately his expression became stern but posterity will do him justice said he and with that he turned to greet pierre well how are you stout as ever he said in a lively tone but the newly furrowed frown grew still deeper yes i am well he replied in answer to pierre's question and laughed pierre saw clearly that this laugh was affected and was simply equivalent to saying well but who cares whether i am well or ill after exchanging a few words with pierre in regard to the frightful travelling from the polish frontier and how he met in switzerland a number of men who had known pierre and about mr de salle whom he had brought abroad as his son's tutor prince andrei again with feverish eagerness returned to the topic of speransky which the two old men still kept on the tapis if there had been any treason and if there had been any proofs of his correspondence with napoleon then they would surely have been published broadcast said he speaking excitedly and fluently personally i do not like speransky and i have not liked him in the past but i do like justice pierre was aware that his friend was now laboring under that necessity which he himself had only too often experienced of getting thoroughly stirred up and excited over some alien topic simply for the purpose of dispelling thoughts too heavy to be endured 
when prince mashersky had taken his departure prince andrei took pierre's arm and drew him into the room which had been prepared for his occupancy in this room a bed had been hastily set up trunks and boxes opened were scattered about prince andrei went to one of these and took out a casket and from the casket a packet wrapped in a paper all this he did silently and very swiftly he straightened himself up and cleared his throat his face was gloomy and his lips compressed forgive me if i trouble you pierre perceived that prince andrei was going to speak about natasha and his broad countenance expressed pity and sympathy this expression on pierre's face nettled prince andrei he went on in a loud decided and disagreeable voice i have received my dismissal from the countess rostova and rumours have reached my ears of your brother-in-law having offered himself to her or something to that effect is that true whether true or false pierre began but prince andrei interrupted him here are her letters and her miniature he took the packet from the table and handed them to pierre give this to the countess if you happen to see her she is very ill said pierre so she is still here inquired prince andrei and prince kurgan he asked hastily he went some time ago she almost died i am very sorry for her illness said prince andrei he smiled coldly evilly disagreeably like his father but mr kurgan did not then honor the countess rostova with the offer of his hand asked prince andrei he snorted several times it is impossible for him to marry for the reason that he is already married said pierre prince andrei gave a disagreeable laugh again suggestive of his father and where pray is he to be found this precious brother-in-law of yours may i ask said he he has gone to peter however i don't really know said pierre well it's all the same to me said prince andrei assure the countess rostova that she has been and is perfectly free and that i wish her all happiness pierre took the package of letters prince andrei as though trying to make up his mind whether it were not necessary for him to say something or expecting pierre to say something looked at him keenly see here do you remember a discussion we had once in petersburg do you remember yes i remember said prince andrei hurriedly i said that a fallen woman ought to be forgiven but i did not say that in my own case i should forgive her i cannot but wherein is the comparison asked pierre prince andrei interrupted him his voice was loud and shrill yes ask her hand again be magnanimous and all that yes that would be very noble but i am not capable of following in this gentleman's footsteps if you wish to continue my friend never mention this to me again not a word about it now good-bye you will give this to her will you Pierre left the room and went to the old prince and the princess Maria. The old prince seemed more animated than usual. The princess was her ordinary self, but back of her sympathy for her brother, Pierre could see that she was delighted at having the engagement broken. As Pierre looked at them, he realized how deep were the scorn and dislike which they all felt toward the Rostovs. He realized that it was wholly helpless even to mention her name, though she might have had anyone else in the world in Prince Andrei's place. At dinner the conversation turned on the war which was unquestionably imminent. Prince Andrei kept up an unceasing stream of talk and discussion with his father, or with Mr. de Salle, his son's Swiss tutor, and he displayed more excitement than usual, and Pierre knew only too well the moral cause of this excitement. End of chapter 21《That same evening Pierre went to call upon the Rostovs to fulfill his commission. Natasha was in bed, the Count had gone to the club, and Pierre, having entrusted the letters into Sonya's hands, went to Maria Dmitrievna, who was greatly interested to know how Prince Andrei had received the news ten minutes later sonya appeared natasha is determined to see count pyotr kirillovitch said she but how can he go to her room everything is in disorder there said marya dmitrievna but she is dressed and has come down into the drawing-room said sonya marya dmitrievna merely shrugged her shoulders 
if only the countess would come this is a perfect torture to me now be careful and don't tell her everything she added warningly it would break my heart if anything were said to hurt her she is so to be pitied so to be pitied natasha grown decidedly thin with pale smileless face though not at all confused as pierre supposed she would be stood in the middle of the drawing-room when pierre made his appearance in the door she hesitated evidently undecided whether to go to him or wait for him pierre hastened forward he supposed that she would as usual give him her hand but she stood motionless sighing deeply and with her arms hanging lifelessly in exactly the same pose that she always took when she went in the middle of the music-room to sing only with an entirely different expression pyotr kurilovitch she began speaking very swiftly prince bolkonsky was your friend and is still your friend she added by afterthought for it seemed to her that everything was past and all things had become new he told me once to turn to you if pierre quietly blew his nose as he looked at her till that moment he had in his heart blamed her and tried to despise her but now she seemed to him so eminently deserving of pity that there was no room in his heart for reproach he is here now please ask him to for forgive she paused and breathed still faster but she did not weep yes i will tell him said pierre he knew not what to say natasha was evidently terrified by what pierre might have thought she meant yes i know that all is over between us she said hurriedly no it can never be all that tortures me is the wrong that i have done him only ask him to forgive 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 me for all her whole frame trembled and she sat down in a chair never before had pierre experienced such a feeling of compassion as now came over him i will tell him i will certainly tell him all said pierre but i should like to know one thing what asked natasha i should like to ask if you loved pierre did not know what term to use in speaking of anatole did you love that vile man don't call him vile exclaimed natasha but i i don't know i don't know at all then the tears came again and a still more intense feeling of pity affectionate compassion and love came over pierre he was conscious of the tears welling out from under his spectacles and dropping and he hoped that they would not be seen let us say no more about it my dear said pierre strange indeed suddenly seemed to natasha the sound of his voice so sweet so tender so sincere let us say no more about it my dear i will tell him all but one thing i want to ask you consider me your friend and if you need any help or advice or simply if you need someone in whom you can confide not now but by and by when everything is clear to your own mind remember me he took her hand and kissed it i should be happy if i were in the position to pierre grew confused do not speak to me so i do not deserve it cried natasha and she started to leave the room but pierre detained her by the hand he knew that there was something more he must tell her but when he had spoken it he was amazed at his own words wait wait all life is before you said he before me before me is only ruin she exclaimed in the depths of shame and self-reproach ruin he repeated if i were not myself but the handsomest wisest and best man in the world and were free i would this very instant on my knees sue for your hand and your love natasha for the first time in many days wept tears of gratitude and emotion and giving pierre one look she fled from the room pierre followed her almost running and restraining the tears of tenderness and happiness that choked him throwing his shuba over his shoulders but without putting his arms through the sleeves he went out and got into his sledge. "'Where now?' asked the driver. "'Where?' repeated Pierre to himself. "'Where can I go now? "'To the club, or to make some calls? "'All men at this moment seemed to him so contemptible, 
so mean in comparison with that feeling of emotion and love which had overmastered him in comparison with that softened glance of gratitude which she had given him just now through her tears home said pierre throwing back his bearskin shuba and exposing his broad joyfully throbbing chest though the mercury marked ten degrees of frost it was cold and clear above the dirty half-lighted streets above the black roofs of the houses stretched the dark starry heavens only as pierre gazed at the heavens above he ceased to feel the humiliating pettiness of everything earthly in comparison with the height to which his soul aspired as he drove out on the arbatskaya square the mighty expanse of the dark starry night spread out before pierre's eyes almost in the zenith of this sky above the prechentensky boulevard convoyed and surrounded on every side by stars but distinguished from all the rest by its nearness to the earth and by its white light and by its long curling tail stood the tremendous brilliant comet of 1812 the same which men thought presaged all manner of woes and the end of the world but in pierre this brilliant luminary with its long train of light awoke no terror on the contrary rapturously his eyes wet with tears he contemplated this glorious star which seemed to him to have come flying with inconceivable swiftness through measureless space straight toward the earth there to strike like an enormous arrow and remain in that one fate designated spot upon the dark sky and pausing raise aloft with monstrous face its curling tail flashing and playing with white light amid the countless other stars doomed to perish it seemed to pierre that this star was the complete reply to all that was in his soul flowing into new life and filled with tenderness and love end of chapter twenty two and end of part five also this is the end of volume two of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole volume three part one Chapter One of War and Peace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. Volume Three, Part One, A Chapter One. Toward the end of the year eighteen eleven. A tremendous armament and concentration of forces took place in Western Europe, and in 1812, these forces, millions of men, counting those who were concerned in the transport and victualling of the armies, were moved from west to east toward the borders of Russia, where the Russian forces were drawn up just as they had been the year before. On the 24th of June, the forces of Western Europe crossed the Russian frontier, and war began. In other words, an event took place opposed to human reason and human nature. Millions of men committed against one another an infinite number of crimes, deception, treachery, robbery, forgery, issues of false assignments, depredations, incendiary fires, murders, such as the annals of all the courts in all the world could not equal in the aggregate of centuries, and yet which, at that period, the perpetrators did not even regard as crimes. What brought about this extraordinary event? What were its causes? The historians, with naive credulity, assure us that the causes of this event are to be found in the affront offered to the Duke of Oldenburg in the disregard of the continental system in Napoleon's ambition, Alexander's firmness, the mistakes of diplomatists, and what not. Of course, in that case, to put a stop to the war, it would have merely required Metternich Rumyantsev, or Talleyrand, between a levy and a rout, to have made a little effort and skillfully composed a state paper, or Napoleon to have written to Alexander, Monsieur, mon frère, je consens à rendre la douche au duc de Oldenburg. It is easily understood that the matter presented itself in that light to the men of that day. It is easily understood that Napoleon attributed the cause of the war to England's intrigues. Indeed, he said so on the island of St. Helena. It is easily understood that the members of the British Parliament attributed the causes of the war to Napoleon's ambition. 
that Prince Oldenburg considered the war to have been caused by the insult which he had received, that the merchants regarded the continental system, which was ruining European trade, as responsible for it, that old veterans and generals saw the chief cause for it in the necessity to find them something to do, but legitimists of that day, in the necessity of upholding le bon principal, and the diplomatists in the fact that they had not been skillful enough to hoodwink Napoleon in regard to the Russian alliance with Austria in 1809, or that it had been awkward to draw up memorandum number 178. It is easily understood that these, and an endless number of other reasons, the diversity of which is simply proportioned to the infinite diversity of standpoints, satisfied the men who were living at that time. But for us, posterity, who are far enough removed to contemplate the magnitude of the event from a wider perspective, and who seek to fathom its simple and terrible meaning, such reasons appear insufficient. To us it is incomprehensible that millions of Christian men killed and tortured each other because Napoleon was ambitious, Alexander firm, English policy astute, and Duke Oldenburg affronted. It is impossible to comprehend what connection these circumstances have with the fact itself of murder and violence. Why, in consequence of the affront put upon the Duke, thousands of men from the other end of Europe should have killed and plundered the people of the governments of Smolensk and Moscow, and have been killed by them. For us, posterity, who are not historians, and not carried away by any far-fetched processes of reasoning, and who can, therefore, contemplate the phenomena with unclouded and healthy vision, the causes thereof arise before us in all their innumerable quantity. The deeper we delve into the investigation of causes, the more numerous do they open up before us, and every separately considered cause, or whole series of causes, appears equally efficient in its own nature, and equally fallacious, by reason of its utter insignificance in comparison with the prodigiousness of the events, and equally fallacious, also by reason of its inability, without the cooperation of all the other causes combined, to produce the events in question. Such a cause as the refusal of the Napoleon to draw his army back within the Vistula, and to restore the Duchy of Oldenburg, has as much weight in this consideration as the willingness or unwillingness of a single French corporal to take part in the campaign. Whereas, if he had refused, and a second, and a third, and a thousand corporals and soldiers had likewise refused, Napoleon's army would have been so greatly reduced that the war could not have occurred. If Napoleon had not been offended by the demand to retire his troops beyond the Vistula, and had not issued orders for them to give battle, there would have been no war. But if all the sergeants had refused to go into action, there also would have been no war. And there also would have been no war if there had been no English intrigues, and no Prince Oldenburg, and if Alexander had not felt himself aggrieved, and if there had been no autocratic power in Russia, and if there had been no French Revolution, and no dictatorship, and empire following it. And nothing of all that led up to the revolution, and so on. Had any one of these causes been missing, war could have taken place. Consequently, all of them, milliards of causes, must have cooperated to bring about what resulted. And, as a corollary, there could have been no exclusive final cause for these events, and the great event was accomplished simply because it had to be accomplished. And so millions of men, renouncing all their human feelings and their reason, had to march, from west to east, and kill their fellows. Exactly the same as, several centuries before, swarms of men had swept from east to west, likewise killing their fellows. The deeds of Napoleon and Alexander, on whose fiat apparently depended this or that occurrence, were just as far from being spontaneous and free as the actions of the merest soldier taking part in the expedition, either as a conscript or as recruit. This was evidently the case, because, in order that Napoleon's or Alexander's will should be executed, they being apparently the men on whom the event depended, the cooperation of countless factors was requisite one of which failing, the event could not have occurred. It was indispensable that millions of men, in whose hands was really all the power, soldiers who fought, and men who transported munitions of war and cannon, should consent to carry out the will of these two feeble human units, 
and they were brought to this by an endless number of complicated and varied causes. Fatalism in history is inevitable, if we would explain its illogical phenomena, that is to say, those events the reason for which is beyond our comprehension. The more we strive by our reason to explain these phenomena in history, the more illogical and incomprehensible to us they become. Every man lives for himself and enjoys sufficient freedom for the attainment of his own personal ends, and is conscious in his whole being that he can instantly perform or refuse to perform any action. But as soon as he has done it, this action, accomplished in a definite period of time, becomes irrevocable and forms an element in history in which it takes its place with a fully preordained and no longer capricious significance. Every man has a twofold life. On one side is his personal life, which is free in proportion as his interests are abstract. The other is life as an element, as one bee in the swarm, and here a man has no chance of disregarding the laws imposed upon him. Man consciously lives for himself, but, at the same time, he serves as an unconscious instrument for the accomplishment of historical and social ends. An action once accomplished is fixed, and when a man's activity coincides with others, with the millions of actions of other men, it acquires historical significance. The higher a man stands in the social ladder, the more men he is connected with, the greater the influence he exerts over others the more evident is the predestined and unavoidable necessity of his every action. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. The king is the slave of history. History, that is to say, the unconscious, universal life of humanity, in the aggregate, every moment profits by the life of kings for itself as an instrument for the accomplishment of its own ends. Napoleon, though never before had it seemed so evident to him as now in this year, 1809, that it depended upon him whether he should shed or not shed the blood of his people, verser le sang de ses peuples, as Alexander expressed it in his last letter to him, was in reality never before so subordinated to the inevitable laws which compelled him, even while, as it seemed to him, working in accordance with his own free will, to accomplish for the world in general, for history, what was destined to be accomplished. The men of the West moved toward the East so as to kill each other, and, by the law of coordination, thousands of trifling causes made themselves into the guise of final causes, and, coinciding with this event, apparently explained this movement and this war. The dissatisfaction with the Continental System, and the Duke of Oldenburg, and the invasion of Prussia, undertaken, as it seemed to Napoleon, simply for the purpose of bringing about an armed neutrality, and the French emperor's love and habit of war coinciding with the disposition of his people, the attraction of grander preparations, and the outlays for such preparations, and the necessity for indemnities for meeting these outlays, and the intoxicating honors paid at Dresden, and the diplomatic negotiations which, in the opinion of contemporaries, were conducted with a sincere desire to preserve peace, but which merely offended the pride of either side, and millions and millions of other causes, serving as specious reasons for this event which had taken place and coinciding with it. When an apple is ripe and falls, what makes it fall? Is it the attraction of gravitation, or is it because its stem withers, or because the sun dries it up, or because it is heavy, or because the wind shakes it, or because the small boy standing underneath is hungry for it? There is no such proximate cause. The whole thing is the result of all these conditions, in accordance with which every vital, organic, complex event occurs. And the botanist who argues that the apple fell from the effect of decomposing vegetable tissue, or the like, is just as much in the right as the boy who, standing below, declares that the apple fell because he wanted to eat it and prayed for it. Equally right and equally wrong would be the one who should say that Napoleon went to Moscow because he wanted to go, and was ruined because Alexander wished him to be ruined. Equally right and equally wrong would be the man who should declare that a mountain, weighing millions of tons and undermined, fell in consequence of the last blow of the mattock dealt by the last laborer. In the events of history, so-called great men are merely tags that supply a name to the event, and have quite as little connection with the event itself as the tag. Every one of their actions, though apparently performed by their own free will, is, in its historical significance, out of the scope of volition, and is correlated with the whole trend of history, 
and is, consequently, preordained from all eternity. End of chapter 1「Part 1, Chapter 2 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 2 On the 10th of June, Napoleon started from Dresden, where he had been for three weeks the centre of a court composed of princes, dukes, kings, and at least one emperor. Before his departure, Napoleon showed his favour to the princes, kings, and the emperor who deserved it, he turned a cold shoulder on the kings and princes who had incurred his displeasure. He gave the Empress of Austria pearls and diamonds, which he called his own, though they had been stolen from other kings, and then tenderly embracing the Empress Maria Luisa, as the historian terms her, left her heartbroken by his absence, which it seemed to her, now that she considered herself his consort, although he had another consort left behind in Paris, was too hard to be endured." Although the diplomats stoutly maintained their belief in the possibility of peace, and were working heartily for this end, although Napoleon himself wrote a letter to the Emperor Alexander, calling him Monsieur Monfrera, and sincerely assuring him that he had no desire for war, and that he should always love and respect him, still, he was off for the army, and at every station was issuing new receipts, having in view to expedite the movement of the troops from west to east." He travelled in a calash, driven by six horses, and accompanied by his pages, aides, and an escort, and took the route through Posen, Thorn, Danzig, and Königsberg. The army was moving from the west to east, and relays of fresh horses bore him in the same direction. On the 22nd of June he overtook the army, and spent the night in the Wilkowski forest, on the estate of a Polish count, where quarters had been made ready for him. On the following day, Napoleon, outstripping the army, drove to the Niemen in his calash, and, for the purpose of reconnoitring the spot where the army was to cross, he put on a Polish uniform and went down to the banks of the river. When he saw on the other side the Cossacks and the wide-stretching steppes, in the centre of which was Moscow, La Ville Saint, the capital of that empire, which reminded him of the Scythian one, against which Alexander of Macedon had marched. Napoleon, unexpectedly and contrary to all strategical as well as diplomatic considerations, gave orders for the advance, and on the next day the troops began to cross the Niemen. Early on the morning of the 24th he emerged from his tent, which had been pitched on the steep left bank of the river, and looked through his field-glass at the torrents of his troops pouring forth from the Wilkowski forest, and streaming across the three bridges thrown over the Niemen. The troops were aware of the presence of the emperor. They searched for him with their eyes, and when they discovered him on the cliff, standing in front of his tent, and distinguished from his suite by his figure, in an overcoat and cocked hat, they flung their caps in the air and shouted, Viva la emperor! And then, rank after rank, a never-ceasing stream, they poured forth, and still poured forth, from the mighty forest that till now had concealed them, and, dividing into three currents, crossed over the bridges to the other side. Something will be done this time. Oh, when he takes a hand, he makes things hot. God, save us! There he is! Hurrah for the emperor! So these are the steps of Asia. Beastly country all the same. Goodbye, Boucher. I'll save the best place in Moscow for you. Goodbye. Luck to you. Have you seen him? The emperor? Hurrah for the emperor! Roar, roar! If I am made governor of India, Gerard, I'll appoint you minister at Kashmir. That's a settled thing. Hurrah for the emperor! Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah! Those rascally Cossacks, how they run! Hurrah for the emperor! There he is. Do you see him? Twice I've seen him as plain as I see you, the little corporal. I saw him give the cross to one of our vets. Hurrah for the emperor! Such were the remarks and shouts made by men, both young and old, of the most widely differing characters and positions in the world. The faces of all these men bore one universal expression of delight at the beginning of the long-expected campaign, and of enthusiasm and devotion for the man in the grey overcoat standing on the hill. 
On the 25th of June, a small thoroughbred Arab steed was brought to Napoleon, and he mounted and set off at a gallop down to one of the three bridges over the Neman, greeted all the way by enthusiastic acclamations, which he evidently endured for the reason that it was impossible to prevent the men from expressing by these shouts their love for him. But these acclamations, which accompanied him wherever he went, fatigued him, and distracted his attention from the military task that met him at the moment that he reached the army. He rode across the bridge that shook under his horse's hoofs, and, on reaching the farther side, turned abruptly to the left and galloped off in the direction of Kovno, preceded by his mounted guards, who, crazy with delight and enthusiasm, cleared the way for him through the troops pressing on ahead. On reaching the broad river Vistula, he reined in his horse near a regiment of Polish Uhlans that was halted on the bank. Hurrah! shouted the Polyaks, no less enthusiastically, as they fell out of line, elbowing each other in their efforts to get a sight of him. Napoleon contemplated the river, then dismounted and sat down on a log that happened to be lying on the bank. At a mute signal, his telescope was handed to him. He rested it on the shoulder of one of his pages, who came forward beaming with delight, and began to reconnoiter the other shore. Then he remained lost in study of a map spread out over the driftwood. Without lifting his head, he said something, and two of his aides galloped off toward the Polish Uhlans. What was it? What did he say? was heard in the ranks of the Uhlans, as one of the aides came hurrying toward them. The order was that they should find a ford and cross to the other side. The Polish colonel, who commanded the Uhlans, a handsome old man, flushing and stumbling in his speech from excitement, asked the aide-de-camp whether he might be permitted to swim the river with his men instead of trying to find the ford. He was evidently as apprehensive of receiving a refusal as a schoolboy who asks permission to ride on horseback, and what he craved was the chance to swim the river under his emperor's eyes. The aide-de-camp replied that in all probability the emperor would not be displeased with this superfluity of zeal. As soon as the aide-de-camp had said this, the old mustachioed officer, with beaming face and gleaming eye, waved his sword and cried, Vavant! and, ordering his uhlans to follow him, he plunged spurs into his horse and dashed down to the river. He angrily struck the horse that shied at the task and forced him into the water, striking out boldly into the swift current where it was deepest. The water was cold, and the swiftness of the current made the passage difficult. The uhlans clung to one another in case they were dismounted from their horses. Several of the horses were drowned and some of the men. The others endeavored to swim, one clinging to his saddle, another to his horse's mane. Their endeavoring was to swim to the farther side, and, although there was a ford only half a verst below, they were proud of swimming and drowning in that river, under the eye of the man sitting on the log, and not even noticing what they were doing. When the aide-de-camp on his return found a favorable moment, he allowed himself to call the emperor's attention to the devotion of these polyaks to his person. The little man in the gray greatcoat got up, and calling Berthier, began to walk with him back and forth on the river bank, giving him orders, and occasionally casting a dissatisfied glance at the drowning Uhlans, who distracted his attention. It was nothing new in his experience that his presence anywhere, in the deserts of Africa, as well as in the Moscovite steppes, was sufficient to stimulate and drive men to the most senseless self-sacrifice. He commanded a horse to be brought, and rode back to his bouviac. Forty Uhlans were drowned in the river, although boats were sent to their aid. The majority gave up the task and returned to the hither side. The colonel and a few of the men swam across the river, and with great difficulty crept up the farther shore. But as soon as they were on the land, though their garments were streaming with water, they shouted, Vivant, gazing with rapture at the spot where Napoleon had been, but from which he had vanished, and counting themselves fortunate." In the afternoon, after making arrangements for procuring with all possible dispatch the counterfeit Russian assonants that had been prepared for use in Russia, and after issuing an order to shoot a certain Saxon who, in a letter that had been intercepted, gave information in regard to the disposition of the French forces, Napoleon, in still a third order, caused the Polish colonel who had quite needlessly flung himself into the river to be enrolled in the Légion d'Honneur of which he himself was the head. Coulvot perda, de montant. Those whom God wishes to destroy, he first makes mad. End of chapter 2
Part three, chapter three of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter three. The Russian emperor, meantime, had been now for more than a month at Vilno, superintending reviews and maneuvers. Nothing was ready for the war, although all had foreseen that it was coming, and though the emperor had left Petersburg to prepare for it. The vacillation as to what plan, from among the many that had been prepared, was to be selected, was still more pronounced after the emperor had been for a month at headquarters. Each of the three divisions of the army had a separate commander, but there was no nachalnik, or responsible chief, over all the forces, and the emperor did not see fit to assume this position. The longer the emperor stayed at Vilna, the less ready for the war, were they who had grown weary of expecting it. The whole purpose of those who surrounded the sovereign seemed directed toward making him pass the time agreeably and forget about the impending conflict. After a series of balls and festivals given by Polish magnates and by the courtiers and by the emperor himself, a Polish adjutant proposed one fine June day that the imperial staff should give a banquet and ball in his majesty's honor. The suggestion was gladly adopted by all. The sovereign granted his sanction the imperial adjutants collected the necessary funds by a subscription. A lady, who it was thought would be most acceptable to the emperor, was invited to do the honors. Count Benningsen, a landed proprietor of the Vilno government, tendered the use of his country house for the festivity, which was set for the 25th of June, and it was decided that the ball and banquet, together with a regatta and fireworks, should take place at Zacreto, Count Benningsen's country place. On that very day on which Napoleon gave orders to cross the Niemen, and the vanguard of his army drove back the Cossacks and set foot on Russian soil, Alexander was spending the evening at Count Benningsen's villa at a ball given by his staff. It was a gay, brilliant occasion. Connoisseurs in such matters declared that never before had so many pretty women been gathered in one place. The Countess Buzakaya, who, with other Russian ladies, had followed the sovereign from Petersburg to Vilno, was at this ball by her overwhelming so-called Russian beauty quite putting into the shade the more refined and delicate Polish ladies. She attracted much attention, and the sovereign did her the honor of dancing with her. Boris Drubetskoy, having left his wife at Moscow, was also present at this ball, and garçon, as he expressed it, and, although not on His Majesty's staff, was a participant in the festivities in virtue of having subscribed a large sum toward the expenses. Boris was now a rich man, who had already arrived at high honors, and who no longer required patronage, but stood on an equal footing with any of his own age, no matter how lofty their rank might be. He had met Ellen at Vilno, not having seen her for some time, but he made no reference to the past. But as Ellen was enjoying the favor of a very influential individual, and Boris had not long been married, it suited their purposes to meet as good old friends. At midnight they were still dancing, Ellen, finding no partner to her taste, had herself proposed to Boris to dance the mazurka. They were in the third set. Boris, with cool indifference, glancing at Ellen's dazzling bare shoulders, set off by a dark gauze dress shot with gold, was talking about old acquaintances, and, at the same time, neither he nor anyone else observed that, not for a single second, did he cease to watch the emperor, who was in the same hall. The emperor was not dancing. He was standing in the doorway, and addressing, now to one and now to another, those gracious words which he, of all men alone, had the art of speaking. Just before the beginning of the mazurka, Boris noticed that the general adjutant, Balashov, who stood on terms of special intimacy with the sovereign, approached him as he was talking with a Polish lady, and, contrary to court etiquette, stood waiting at a short distance from him. While still talking, the sovereign looked up inquiringly, and, evidently perceiving that only weighty considerations would have caused Balashov to act thusly, he gave the lady a slight bow and turned to the adjutant. At Balashov's very first words, an expression like amazement came over the sovereign's face. He took Balashov's arm and, together with him, crossed the ballroom so absorbed that he did not notice how the company parted, making a sort of lane three sazons wide through which he passed. Boris observed Arakcheyev's agitated face as the sovereign walked out with Balashov. Arakcheyev, looking askance at the emperor, and snuffing through his red nose, moved out from the throng as though expecting that the sovereign would address him. 
It was clear to Boris that Arkcheyev hated Balashov and was much dissatisfied that any news of importance should be brought to the sovereign otherwise than through him. But the sovereign, not heeding Arkcheyev, passed out together with Balashov through the open door into the brilliantly illuminated garden. Arkcheyev, grasping the hilt of his sword and viciously glancing around, followed them twenty steps in the rear. While Boris continued to perform the proper figures of the mazurka, he was continually tortured by the thought of what news Balashov had brought, and how he might get hold of it before the others. In the figure, when he had to choose a lady, he whispered to Ellen that he wanted to get the Countess Potacha, who, he believed, had gone out on the balcony. Hastily crossing the marquetry floor, he slipped out of the open door into the garden, and there, perceiving the sovereign walking along the terrace in company with Balashov, he stepped to one side. The sovereign and Balashov were directing their steps toward the door. Boris, pretending that in spite of all his efforts he had not time to get out of the way, respectfully crowded up against the lintel and bowed. The sovereign, with the agitated face of a man personally offended, uttered these words. To make war against Russia without any declaration. I will never consent to peace so long as a single armed foe remains in my land, said he. It seemed to Boris that the sovereign took a delight in uttering these words. He was satisfied with the form in which his thought was couched, but he was annoyed that Boris had overheard him. Let not a word of this be known, he added with a frown. Boris understood that this was a hint to him, and, closing his eyes, he again bowed slightly. The sovereign returned to the ballroom, and remained for about half an hour longer. Boris was the first to learn the news of the French army having crossed the Niemen, and, turning his luck to good use, made several important personages think that many things concealed from the others were known to him, and thereby he succeeded in rising still higher in their estimation. The news of the French crossing the Niemen, unexpected as it was, was peculiarly unexpected after a long month of strained expectancy, and by reason of being announced at a ball. The sovereign, at the first instant of receiving the news, under the influence of inner revolt and indignation, made use of that bold sentiment which gave him such satisfaction, and so exactly expressed his feeling, at the time, and afterwards became famous. On his return to his residence after the ball, the sovereign sent, at two o'clock in the morning, for his secretary, Shishkin, and dictated a general order to his troops, and a rescript to Field Marshal Prince Sotoykov, strictly charging him to use the words about his refusal to make peace so long as a single armed Frenchman remained on Russian soil. On the next day the following note was written to Napoleon. My brother, I learned yesterday that, notwithstanding the fidelity with which I have adhered to my engagements towards your majesty, your troops have crossed the Russian frontier, and I have this moment received from Petersburg a note wherein Count Loriston, in order to explain this aggression, announces that your majesty considered himself at war with me from the time that Prince Kurakin demanded his passports. The grounds on which the Duke of Bassano refused to grant it would never have allowed me to suppose that this step could serve as a pretext for the aggression. In fact, my ambassador was never authorized to take this step, as he himself explicitly declared, and, as soon as I was informed of it, I manifested the extent of my disapproval by ordering him to remain at his post. If your majesty is not obstinately bent upon shedding the blood of our peoples through a misunderstanding of this sort, and will consent to withdraw your troops from the Russian territory, I will regard what has passed as non-existent, and we may arrive at some accommodation. In the opposite case, your majesty, I shall be compelled to repulse an attack which I have done nothing to provoke. There is still a chance for your majesty to avoid the calamities of a new war. I am, etc. Signed, Alexander. End of chapter 3「Part 1, Chapter 4 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 4. On the 25th of June, at two o'clock in the morning, the sovereign, having summoned Balashov, and read over to him his letter to Napoleon, ordered him to take it and deliver it to the French emperor in person. In dispatching Balashov, the sovereign once more repeated what he had said about not making peace so long as a single armed foe remained on Russian soil, and he ordered him to quote these exact words to Napoleon. 
The sovereign did not incorporate this threat in his letter to Napoleon, because his tact made him feel that they were inappropriate at that moment, when the last efforts were making for reconciliation, but he strenuously commanded Balashoff to repeat them to Napoleon verbally. Setting off that very same night, Balashoff, accompanied by a burgher and two Cossacks, by daylight reached the village of Rikonti, on the Russian side of the Niemen, where the French vanguard were stationed. He was brought to a halt by the French vedettes. A non-commissioned officer of hussars, in a crimson uniform and shaggy cap, challenged the approaching envoy and ordered him to halt. Balashoff did not come instantly to a pause, but continued to advance at a footpace along the road. The subaltern, scowling and muttering some abusive epithet, blocked Balashoff's way with his horse and rudely shouted to the Russian general, demanding if he were deaf, that he paid no attention to what was said to him. Balashoff gave his name. The subaltern sent a soldier to the officer in command. Paying no further heed to Balashoff, the non-commissioned officer began to talk with his comrades concerning their private affairs, and did not even look at the Russian general. It was an absolutely new experience for Balashoff, after being so accustomed to proximity to the very fountainhead of power and might, after just coming from a three hours conversation with his sovereign, and having been universally treated with respect, to find this, here on Russian soil, hostile and peculiarly disrespectful display of brutal insolence. The sun was just beginning to break through the clouds, the air was cool and fresh with dew, Along the road from the village they were driving the cattle to pasture. Over the fields, one after another, like bubbles on the water, soared the larks with their matin songs. Balashoff looked about him while waiting for the officer to arrive from the village. The Russian Cossacks and the burglar and the French hussars occasionally exchanged glances, but no one spoke. A French colonel of hussars, evidently just out of bed, came riding up from the village on a handsome, well-fed, gray horse, accompanied by two hussars. The officer, the soldiers, and their horses had an appearance of content and jauntiness. It was the first period of the campaign, while the army was still in the very best order, almost fit for a review in time of peace, with just a shade of martial smartness in their attire, and with their minds a trifle stirred up to the gaiety and cheerfulness and spirit of enterprise that always characterize the beginning of an expedition. The French colonel with difficulty overcame a fit of yawning, but he was courteous and evidently appreciated Balashoff's high dignity. He conducted him past his soldiers inside the lines and informed him that his desire to have a personal interview with the emperor would in all probability be immediately granted, since the imperial headquarters, he believed, were not far distant. They approached the village of Rikonti, riding by pickets, sentinels and soldiery who saluted their colonel and gazed with curiosity at the Russian uniforms, and finally came to the other side of the village. According to the colonel, the chief of division, who would receive Balashoff and arrange the interview, would be found two kilometers distant. The sun was now mounting high, and shone bright and beautiful over the vivid green of the hills. They had just passed a pothouse on a hillside, when they saw, coming to meet them up the hill, a little band of horsemen, led by a tall man in a red cloak and in a plumed hat, under which long, dark locks rolled down upon his shoulders. He rode a coal-black horse, whose housings glittered in the sun, and his long legs were thrust forward in the fashion affected by French riders. This man came at a gallop toward Balashoff, flashing and waving in the bright June sun, with his plumes and precious stones and gold galloons. Balashoff was within the length of two horses from this enthusiastically theatrical-looking individual, who was galloping to meet him in all his bravery of bracelets, plumes, necklaces, and gold, when Yulnir, the French colonel, respectfully said, in a deferential whisper, Le Roy de Napal. This was indeed Marat, who was still called the King of Naples. Although it was wholly incomprehensible in what respect he was the King of Naples, Still he bore that title, and he himself was convinced of its validity, and consequently he assumed a more majestic and important aspect than ever before. He was so convinced that he was actually King of Naples that when, on the day before his departure from that city, he was walking with his wife through the streets of Naples, and a few Italians acclaimed him with Viva il Re, Hurrah for the King, 
he turned to his consort and said, with a melancholy smile, Oh, poor creatures, they do not know that I am going to leave them tomorrow. But though he firmly believed that he was king of Naples, and was grieved for the sorrow that was coming upon his faithful subjects in losing him, still, when he was commanded to enter the military service again, and especially since his meeting with Napoleon at Danzig, where his august brother-in-law had said to him, I make you king to reign in my way, not yours, he had cheerfully taken up the business which he understood so well, and, like a carriage horse, driven but not overworked, feeling himself in harness, he was frisky even between the thrills, and, decked out in the most gorgeous and costly manner possible, galloped gaily and contentedly along the Polish highway, not knowing whither or wherefore. As soon as he approached the Russian general, he threw his head back in royal fashion, and solemnly, with his black curls flowing down over his shoulders, looked inquiringly at the French colonel. The colonel respectfully explained to His Majesty Balashoff's errand, though he could not pronounce his name. De Balmacheve, said the king, his self-confidence helping him to overcome the difficulty that had floored the colonel. Chame de faire votre connaissance, général, he added, with a royally gracious gesture. The moment the king began to speak loud and rapidly, all the kingly dignity instantly deserted him, and, without his suspecting such a thing himself, changed into a tone of good-natured familiarity. He laid his hand on the withers of Balashoff's horse. "'Well, General, everything looks like war, it seems,' said he, as though he regretted a state of things concerning which he was in no position to judge. "'Your Majesty,' replied Balashoff, the Russian emperor, my sovereign, has no desire for war, and, as your majesty sees, said Balashoff, and thus he went on with unavoidable affectation, repeating the title Votre Majesty at every opportunity during his conversation with this individual, for whom it was still a novelty. Marat's face glowed with dull satisfaction while he listened to Monsieur de Balashoff, but Royal Tablige, and he felt that it was indispensable for him, as king and ally, to converse with Alexander's envoy on matters of state. He dismounted, and, taking Balashoff's arm, and drawing him a few paces aside from his suite, waiting respectfully, he began to walk up and down with him, trying to speak with all authority. He informed him that the Emperor Napoleon was offended by the demand made upon him to withdraw his forces from Prussia, especially as this demand was made publicly, and, therefore, was an insult to the dignity of France. Balashoff said that there was nothing insulting in this demand, because— Marat interrupted him. So then, you do not consider the Emperor Alexander as the instigator of the war? he asked suddenly, with a stupidly good-natured smile. Balashoff explained why he really supposed that Napoleon was the aggressor. "'Ah, my dear general,' again exclaimed Marat, interrupting him, "'I desire with all my heart that the emperors should come to a mutual understanding, and that the war, begun in spite of me, should be brought to a termination as soon as possible,' he said in the tone of servants who wish to remain good friends, though their masters may quarrel. And he proceeded to make inquiries about the Grand Duke, and the state of his health, and recalled the jolly good times which they had enjoyed together at Naples, then, suddenly, as though remembering his kingly dignity, Marat drew himself up haughtily, struck the same attitude in which he had stood during his coronation, and, waving his right hand, said, I will not detain you longer, General. I wish you all success in your mission. And then, with his embroidered red mantle, and his plumes gaily waving, and his precious trinkets glittering in the sun, he rejoined his suite, which had been respectfully waiting for him. Balashoff went on his way, expecting, from what Marat said, to be very speedily presented to Napoleon himself, but, instead of any such speedy meeting with Napoleon, the sentinels of de Vaux's infantry corps detained him again at the next village, just as he had been halted at the outposts, until an aide of the corps commander, who was sent for, conducted him to Marshal de Vaust in the village. End of chapter 4《Part One, Chapter Five of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Five. Devoust was the Emperor Napoleon's Arakcheyev, Arakcheyev except in cowardice, just the same, 
punctilious and cruel, and knowing no other way of manifesting his devotion except by cruelty. In the mechanism of imperial organism, such men are necessary, just as wolves are necessary in the organism of nature, and they always exist and manifest themselves and maintain themselves, however incompatible their presence and proximity to the chief power may seem. Only by this indispensableness can it be explained how Arakcheyev, a cruel man, who personally pulled the moustache of a grenadier, and who, by reason of weakness of nerves, could not endure any danger, and was ill-bred and ungentlemanly, could maintain power and influence with a character so chivalrous, noble, and affectionate as Alexander's. In the barn attached to a peasant's cottage, Balashoff found Marshal de Voust, sitting on a keg and busily engaged in clerk's business, he was verifying accounts. An aide stood near him. He might have found better accommodations, but Marshal de Voust was one of those men who purposely make the conditions of life as disagreeable as possible for themselves, in order to have an excuse for being themselves disagreeable. Consequently, they are always hurried and obstinate. How can I think of the happy side of life when, as you see, I am sitting on a keg in a dirty barn and working, the expression of his face seemed to say. The chief satisfaction and requirement of such men are that they should be brought into contact with men of another stamp, and to make before them an enormous display of disagreeable and obstinate activity. This gratification was granted to Voust when Balashoff was ushered into his presence. He buried himself more deeply than ever in his work when the Russian general appeared. He glanced over his spectacles at Balashoff's face, animated by the spirit of the beautiful morning and the meeting with Morat, but he did not get up or even stir. He put on a still more portentous frown and smiled sardonically. Noticing the impression produced on Balashoff by this reception, de Voust raised his head and chillingly demanded what he wanted. Supposing that this insulting reception was given him because de Voust did not know that he was Emperor Alexander's general adjutant, and, what was more, his envoy to Napoleon, Balashoff hastened to inform him of his name and mission. Contrary to his expectation, de Voust, after listening to Balashoff's communication, became still more gruff and rude. "'Where is your packet?' he demanded. "'Give it to me. I will send it to the emperor.' Balashoff replied that he was ordered to give the package personally to the emperor. "'Your emperor's orders are carried out in your army, but here,' said de Voust, "'you must do as you are told,' and, as though to make the Russian general feel still more keenly how completely he was at the mercy of brute force, de Voust sent an aide for the officer of the day. Balashoff took out the packet containing the sovereign's note and laid it on the table, a table improvised of a door, with the torn hinges still protruding, and laid on a couple of barrels. De Vaus took the packet and read the superscription. "'You have a perfect right to treat me with respect, or not to treat me with respect,' said Balashoff. "'But permit me to remark that I have the honor of being one of His Majesty's aides.' De Vaus gazed at him without saying a word, but a trace of annoyance and confusion, betrayed in Balashoff's face, evidently afforded him gratification." "'All due respect will be showed to you,' said he, and placing the envelope in his pocket, he left the barn. A moment later the marshal's aide, Monsieur de Castier, made his appearance and conducted Balashoff to the lodgings made ready for him. Balashoff dined that same day with the marshal, in the barn, the boards on the barrels serving as the table. Early in the morning of the following day, de Voust came and, taking Balashoff to one side, told him confidentially that he was requested to stay where he was, though, if the baggage train received orders to advance, he was to advance with it, and not to communicate with anyone except with Monsieur de Castrier. At the end of four days of solitude, of tedium, of bitter consciousness of his helplessness and insignificance, all the more palpable through contrast with the atmosphere of autocracy to which he had so recently been accustomed, after a number of transfers with the marshal's baggage, and the French forces which occupied the whole region, Balashoff was brought back to Vilno, now in possession of the French. He re-entered the town by the same gate by which he had left it four days before. On the following day, the imperial chamberlain, Monsieur de Turenne, came to Balashoff and announced that the Emperor Napoleon would be pleased to grant him an audience. Four days previously, sentinels from the 
Proyobrazensky regiment had been standing in front of the mansion into which Balashov was conducted. Now two French grenadiers in blue uniforms opened over the chest, and in shaggy caps, an escort of hussars and uhlans, and a brilliant suite of aides, pages, and generals, were standing at the steps near his saddle-horse, and his Mameluk Rustan, waiting for him to make his appearance. Napoleon received Balashov in the same house in Vilno, from which Alexander had dispatched him. End of chapter 5《Part One, Chapter Six of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Six. Though Balashov was accustomed to court magnificence, the sumptuousness and display of Napoleon's court surprised him. Count Turin conducted him into the great drawing room, where a throng of generals, chamberlains, and Polish magnates, many of whom Balashov had seen at court during the sojourn of the Russian Emperor, were in waiting. Duroc told the Russian general that the Emperor Napoleon would receive him before going out to ride. At the end of some moments of expectation, the chamberlain on duty came into the great drawing-room and, bowing courteously, invited Balashov to follow him. Balashov passed into a small drawing-room which opened into the cabinet, into the very same cabinet where the Russian Emperor had given him his directions. Balashov stood a couple of minutes waiting, then hasty steps were heard in the other room, the folding doors were hastily flung open. All was silent, and then firm, resolute steps were heard coming from the cabinet. It was Napoleon. He had only just completed his toilet for riding on horseback. He was in a blue uniform coat thrown open over a white waistcoat that covered the rotundity of his abdomen. He wore white, chamois skin, small clothes that fitted tightly over the stout thighs of his short legs, and hessian boots. His short hair had evidently only just been brushed but one lock of hair hung down over the center of his broad brow. His white, puffy neck was in sharp contrast with the dark collar of his uniform coat. He exhaled a strong odor of eau de cologne. His plump and youthful-looking face with its prominent chin wore an expression of benevolence entirely compatible with his imperial majesty. He came in, giving quick little jerks as he walked along, and holding his head rather high. His whole figure— thick-set and short, with his broad, stout shoulders, and with the abdomen and breast involuntarily thrust forward, had that portly, stately carriage which men of forty who have lived in comfort are apt to have. Moreover, it was evident that on this particular day he was in the most enviable frame of mind. He inclined his head in response to Balashov's low and respectful bow, and, approaching him, began immediately to speak like a man who values every moment of his time, and does not condescend to make set speeches, but is convinced in his own mind that he always speaks well and to the point. "'How are you, General?' said he. "'I have received the Emperor Alexander's letter which you brought, and I am very glad to see you.' He scrutinized Balashov's face with his large eyes, and then immediately looked past him. It was evident that Balashov's personality did not interest him in the least. It was evident— that only what came into his own mind had any interest for him. Everything outside of him had no consequence, because, as it seemed to him, everything in the world depended on his will alone. "'I have not desired war, and I do not desire it now,' said he, "'but I have been driven to it. Even now,' he laid a strong stress on the word, "'I am ready to accept any explanation which you can offer.' and he began clearly and explicitly to state the grounds for his dissatisfaction with the Russian government. Judging by the calm, moderate, and even friendly tone in which the French emperor spoke, Balashov was firmly convinced that he was anxious for peace and intended to enter into negotiations. Sir, le emperor, mon montre, Balashov began his long-prepared speech when Napoleon, having finished what he had to say, looked inquiringly at the Russian envoy, but the look in the emperor's eyes, fastened upon him, confused him. "'You are confused. Regain your self-possession,' Napoleon seemed to say, as he glanced with a hardly perceptible smile at Balashov's uniform and sword. Balashov recovered his self-possession and began to speak. He declared that the emperor Alexander did not consider Kurakin's demand for his passport a sufficient ground for war, that Kurakin had proceeded on his own responsibility and without the sovereign's sanction— 
that the Emperor Alexander did not wish for war, and that he had no understanding with England. None as yet, suggested Napoleon, and, as though fearing to commit himself, he scowled, and slightly inclined his head, giving Balashov to understand that he might go on. Having said all that he had been empowered to say, Balashov declared that the Emperor Alexander desired peace, but that he would not enter into negotiations except on conditions that— Here Balashov stopped short. He recollected the words which the Emperor Alexander had not incorporated in the letter, but which he had strenuously insisted should be inserted in the rescript to Saltwikov, and which he had commanded Balashov to repeat to Napoleon. Balashov remembered these words— so long as an armed foe remains on Russian soil, but some strange and complicated feeling restrained him. He found it impossible to repeat these words, although his desire to do so was great. He hesitated, and said, on condition that the French troops retire beyond the Niemen. Napoleon remarked Balashov's confusion as he said those last words. His face twitched. The calf of his left leg began to tremble nervously. Not stirring from the place where he was standing, he began to speak in a higher key, and more rapidly than before. All the time that he was speaking, Balashov, not once shifting his eyes, involuntarily watched the twitching of Napoleon's left calf, which increased in violence in proportion as he raised his voice. "'I desire peace no less than the Emperor Alexander,' said he. "'Have I not for eighteen months done everything to preserve it? I have been waiting eighteen months for an explanation.' "'But what is demanded of me before negotiations can begin?' he asked with a frown, and emphasizing his question with an energetic gesture of his little, white, plump hand. "'The withdrawal of the troops beyond the Neiman, sire,' replied Balashov. "'Beyond the Neiman,' repeated Napoleon. "'So that is all that is wanted now, is it? "'Beyond the Neiman, merely beyond the Neiman,' insisted Napoleon, looking straight at Balashov. Balashov respectfully inclined his head." Four months ago the demand was to evacuate Pomerania, but now all that is required is to retire beyond the Neiman. Napoleon abruptly turned away and began to pace up and down the room. You say that it is demanded of me to retire beyond the Neiman before there can be any attempt at negotiations. But in exactly the same way two months ago all that was required of me was to retire beyond the Oder and the Vistula, and yet you can still think of negotiating? He walked in silence from one corner of the room to the other, and then stopped in front of Balashov. Balashov noticed that his left leg trembled even faster than before, and his face seemed petrified in its sternness of expression. This trembling Napoleon himself was aware of. He afterwards said, Les vibrations de mon mollet gauche est un grand signe chez moi. Any such propositions as to abandon the odor or the vistula may be made to the Prince of Baden, but not to me. Napoleon almost screamed, the words seeming to take him by surprise. If you were to give me Petersburg and Moscow, I would not accept such conditions. You declare that I began this war, but who went to his army first? The Emperor Alexander, and not I. And you propose negotiations when I have spent millions, when you have made an alliance with England, and when your position is critical, you propose negotiations with me. But what was the object of your alliance with England? What has she given you? he asked, hurriedly, evidently now making no effort to show the advantages of concluding peace, and deciding upon the possibilities of it, but simply to prove his own probity and power, and Alexander's lack of probity and blundering statecraft. At first he was evidently anxious to show what an advantageous position he held, and to prove that, nevertheless, he would be willing to have negotiations opened again, but he was now fairly launched in his declaration, and the longer he spoke the less able he was to control the current of his discourse. The whole aim of his words now seemed to exalt himself, and to humiliate Alexander, which was precisely what he least of all wished to do at the beginning of the interview. "'It is said you have concluded peace with the Turks?' Balashov bent his head affirmatively. "'Peace has been dec he began, but Napoleon gave him no chance to speak." It was plain that he wished to have the floor to himself, and he went on talking with that eloquence and excess of irritability to which men who have been spoiled are so prone. Yes, I know that you have concluded peace with the Turks, and, without securing Moldavia and Wallachia, 
but I would have given your sovereign these provinces just as I gave him Finland. Yes, he went on to say, I promised the Emperor Alexander the provinces of Moldavia and Wallachia, and I would have given them to him, but now he shall not have those beautiful provinces. He might, however, have united them to his empire, and, in his reign alone, he would have made Russia spread from the Gulf of Bothnia to the mouth of the Danube. Catherine the Great could not have done more, exclaimed Napoleon, growing more and more excited as he strode up and down the room, and saying to Balashov almost the same words which he had said to Alexander himself at Tilsit. All that my friendship would have brought to him, oh, what a glorious reign, what a glorious reign, he repeated several times. He paused and took out a gold snuff-box and greedily sniffed at it. What a glorious reign the Emperor Alexander's might have been! He gave Balashov a compassionate look, but as soon as the general started to make some reply, Napoleon hastened to interrupt him again. "'What could he have wished or sought for that he would not have secured by being my friend?' Napoleon asked, shrugging his shoulders in perplexity. "'No, he preferred to surround himself with my enemies. And what enemies?' pursued Napoleon. "'He has attached himself to Steins, Armfelts, Benigsons, Wurzengerodes, Stein, a traitor banished from his own country, Armfelt, a scoundrel and intriguer, Wurzengeroda, a fugitive French subject, Benigsen, a rather better soldier than the others, but still incapable, who had no idea how to act in 1807, and who ought to arouse horrible recollections in the Emperor's mind. We will grant that he might make some use of them, if they had any capacity, pursued Napoleon, scarcely able in his speech to keep up with the arguments that kept rising in his mind in support of his right or might, the two things being one in his view. But there is nothing of the sort. They are of no use either for war or peace. Barclay, they say, is better than all the rest of them, but I should not say so, judging by his first movements. But what are they doing? What are all these courtiers doing? Fool proposes, Armfeld argues, Benigsen considers, and Barclay, when called upon to act, knows not what plan of action to decide upon, and time slips away, and nothing is accomplished. Bagration alone is a soldier. He is stupid, but he has experience, a quick eye, and decision. And what sort of a part is your young sovereign playing in this hopeless throng? They are compromising him, and making him responsible for everything that takes place. A sovereign has no right to be with his army unless he is a general, said he, evidently intending these words to be taken as a direct challenge to the Russian emperor. Napoleon was well aware how desirous the Emperor Alexander was to be a military commander. The campaign has not been begun a week, and you could not defend Vilno. You are cut in two and driven out of the Polish provinces. Your army is already grumbling. On the contrary, Your Majesty, said Balashov, scarcely remembering what had been said to him and finding it hard to follow this pyrotechnic of words, the troops are full of zeal. I know all about it, said Napoleon, interrupting him. I know the whole story, and I know the contingent of your battalions as well as that of my own. You have not two hundred thousand men, and I have three times as many. I give you my word of honor, said Napoleon, who forgot that his word of honor might have very little weight. I give you my word of honor that I have five hundred and thirty thousand men on this side of Vistula. The Turks will be of no help to you. They are never of any use and they have proved this by making peace with you. The Swedes, it is their fate to be ruled by madmen. Their king was crazy. They got rid of him and chose another. Bernadotta, who instantly lost his wits, because it is sure proof of madness that a Swede should enter into alliance with Russia. Napoleon uttered this with a vicious sneer, and again carried the snuff-box to his nose. To each of Napoleon's propositions, Balashov was ready and willing to give an answer, he kept making the gestures of a man who has something to say, but Napoleon gave him no chance to speak. In refutation of the Swedes being mad, Balashov was anxious to state that Sweden was isolated if Russia were against her, but Napoleon interrupted him, shouting at the top of his voice so as to drown his words. Napoleon had worked himself up into that state of irritation in which a man must talk, and talk, and talk, if for nothing else but to convince himself that he is in the right of a question. 
Balashoff began to grow uncomfortable. As an envoy he began to fear that he was compromising his dignity, and he felt it incumbent upon him to reply, but as a man he had a moral shrinking before the assault of such unreasonable fury as had evidently come upon Napoleon. He was aware that anything Napoleon might say in such circumstances had no special significance, that he himself, when he came to think it over, would be ashamed. Balashoff stood with eyes cast down, looking at Napoleon's restless, stout legs, and tried to avoid meeting his eyes. "'But what do I care for your allies?' demanded Napoleon. "'I, too, have allies. These Poles, eighty thousand of them. They fight like lions, and there will be two hundred thousand of them.' and, probably still more excited by the fact that in making this statement he was uttering a palpable falsehood, and by Balashoff standing there, in silent submission to his fate, he abruptly turned back and came close to Balashoff, and, making rapid and energetic gestures with his white hands, he almost screamed, "'Understand? If you incite Prussia against me, I assure you, I will wipe her off from the map of Europe,' said he." his face pale and distorted with rage, and energetically striking one white hand against the other. Yes, and I will drive you beyond the Duina and the Dnieper, and I will erect against you that barrier which Europe was stupid and blind enough to permit to be overthrown. This is what will become of you. That is what you will have lost in alienating me, said he, and once more began to pace the room in silence a number of times jerking his stout shoulders. He replaced his snuff-box in his waistcoat pocket, took it out again, carried it to his nose several times, and halted directly in front of Balashoff. He stood thus without speaking, and gazed directly into Balashoff's eyes with a satirical expression. Then he said in a low tone, E supertant quel beau regna, pour avoir votre met. What a glorious reign your master might have had. Balashoff, feeling it absolutely indispensable to make some answer, declared that affairs did not present themselves to the eyes of the Russians in such a gloomy aspect. Napoleon said nothing, but continued to look at him with the same satirical expression, and apparently had not heard what he said. Balashoff declared that in Russia the highest hopes were entertained of the issue of the war. Napoleon tossed his head condescendingly, as much as to say, I know it is your duty to say so, but you do not believe it. My arguments have convinced you. When Balashoff had finished what he had to say, Napoleon once more raised his snuff-box, took a sniff from it, and then stamped twice on the floor as a signal. The door was flung open. A chamberlain, respectfully approaching, handed the emperor his hat and gloves. Another brought him his handkerchief. Napoleon, not even looking at them, addressed Balakoff. Assure the Emperor Alexander, in my name, said he as he took his hat, that I esteem him as warmly as before. I know him thoroughly, and I highly appreciate his lofty qualities. Je ne vous ressemble plus, général. Vous recevrez ma lettre à l'empereur. And Napoleon swiftly disappeared through the door. All in the reception room hurried forward and down the stairs. End of chapter 6 Part three, chapter seven of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter seven. After all that Napoleon had said to him, after those explosions of wrath, and after those last words spoken so coldly, Je ne vous retiens plus, général, vous recevrez ma lettre. Balashoff was convinced that Napoleon would not only have no further desire to see him, but would rather avoid seeing him, a humiliated envoy, and, what was more, a witness of his undignified heat. But, to his amazement, he received, through Duroc, an invitation to dine that day with the emperor. The guests were Bessieres, Colencourt, and Bethier. Napoleon met Balashoff with a cheerful face and affably, there was not the slightest sign of awkwardness or self-reproach for his outburst of the morning, but, on the contrary, he tried to put Balashoff at his ease. It was plain to see that Napoleon was perfectly persuaded that there was no possibility of his making any mistakes, and that in his understanding of things all that he did was well, not because it was brought into comparison with the standards of right and wrong, but simply because he did it. 
The emperor was in excellent spirits after his ride through Vilno, where he was received and followed by the acclamations of a throng of people. In all the windows along the streets where he passed were displayed tapestries, flags, and decorations ornamented with his monogram, while Polish ladies saluted him and waved their handkerchiefs. At dinner he had Balashov seated next himself and treated him not only cordially, but as though he considered him one of his own courtiers, one of those who sympathized in his plan and rejoiced in his success. Among other topics of conversation he brought up Moscow and began to ask Balashov about the Russian capital, not merely as an inquisitive traveller asks about a new place which he has in mind to visit, but as though he were convinced that Balashov, as a Russian, must be flattered by his curiosity. How many inhabitants are there in Moscow? How many houses? Is it a fact that Moscow is called Moscow la Sainte? And how many churches are there in Moscow? he asked. And when told that there were upwards of two hundred, he asked, What is the good of such a host of churches? The Russians are very religious, replied Balashov. Nevertheless, a great number of monasteries and churches is always a sign that a people are backward, said Napoleon, glancing at Kulenkor for confirmation in this opinion. Balashov respectfully begged leave to differ from the French emperor's opinion. Every country has its own customs, said he. But nowhere else in Europe is there anything like it, remarked Napoleon. I beg your majesty's pardon, replied Balashov. There is Spain, as well as Russia, where monasteries and churches abound. This reply of Balashov's, which had a subtle hint at the recent defeat of the French in Spain, was considered very clever when Balashov repeated it at the Emperor Alexander's court, but it was not appreciated at Napoleon's table and passed unnoticed. The indifferent and perplexed faces of the marshals plainly betrayed the fact that they did not understand where the point of the remark came in, or realized Balashov's insinuation. If that had been witty, then we should have understood it. Consequently, it could not have been witty, the marshal's faces seemed to say. So little was this remark appreciated that even Napoleon did not notice it, and naively asked Balashov the names of the cities through which the direct road to Moscow led. Balashov, who throughout the dinner was on the alert, replied, Just as all roads lead to Rome, so all roads lead to Moscow, that there were many roads, and that among these different routes was the one that passed through Poltava, which Charles the Twelfth had chosen. Thus replied Balashov, involuntarily flushing with delight at the cleverness of this answer. Balashov had hardly pronounced the word Poltava when Kolenkort began to complain of the difficulties of the route from Petersburg to Moscow and to recall his Petersburg experiences. After dinner they went into Napoleon's cabinet to drink their coffee. Four days before it had been the Emperor Alexander's cabinet. Napoleon sat down, stirring his coffee in a severe's cup, and pointed Balashov to a chair near him. There is a familiar state of mind that comes over a man after a dinner, and, acting with greater force than all the dictates of mere reason, compels him to be satisfied with himself and consider all men his friends. Napoleon was now in this comfortable mental condition. It seemed to him that he was surrounded by men who adored him. He was persuaded that even Balashov, after having eaten dinner with him, was his friend and worshipper. Napoleon addressed him with a pleasant and slightly satirical smile. This is the very room, I am informed, which the Emperor Alexander used. Strange, isn't it, General? he asked, evidently not having any idea that such a remark would fail to be agreeable to his guest, as it insinuated that he, Napoleon, was superior to Alexander. Balashov could have nothing to reply to this and merely inclined his head. Yes. In this room, four days ago, Vinzengaroda and Stein were holding counsel, pursued Napoleon, with the same self-confident satirical smile. What I cannot understand is that the Emperor Alexander has taken to himself all my personal enemies. I do not understand it. Has it never occurred to him that I might do the same thing? And this question directed to Balashov evidently aroused his recollection of the cause of his morning's fury, which was still fresh in his mind. And have him know that I will do so, said Napoleon, getting up and pushing away his cup. I will drive all his kindred out of Germany, those of Württemberg, Weimar, Baden. Yes, I will drive them all out. Let him be getting ready for them an asylum in Russia. Balashov bowed and signified that he was anxious to withdraw, and that he listened simply because he could not help listening to what Napoleon said. 
but Napoleon paid no heed to this motion. He addressed Balashov not as his enemy's envoy, but as a man who was for the time being entirely devoted to him, and must needs rejoice in the humiliation of his former master. And why has the Emperor Alexander assumed the command of his forces? What is the reason of it? War is my trade, and it is his to rule and not to command armies. Why has he taken upon him such responsibilities? Napoleon again took his snuff-box, silently strode several times from one end of the room to the other, and then suddenly and unexpectedly went straight up to Balashov, and with a slight smile he unhesitatingly, swiftly, simply, as though he were doing something not only important, but rather even agreeable to Balashov, put his hand into his face and, taking hold of his ear, gave it a little pull, the smile being on his lips alone. To have one's ear pulled by the emperor was considered the greatest honor and favor at the French court. Eh bien, vous nous dites rien. Admirateur et courtesan de l'empereur Alexandre, asked Napoleon, as though it were an absurdity in his presence to be an admirer and courtier of anyone beside himself. Are the horses ready for the general? he added, slightly bending his head in answer to Balashov's bow. Give him mine. He has far to go. The letter which was entrusted to Balashov was the last that Napoleon ever wrote to Alexander. All the particulars of the interview were communicated to the Russian emperor, and the war began. End of chapter 7Part 1, Chapter 8 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 8 After his interview with Pierre, Prince Andre went to Petersburg on business, as he told his relatives, but in reality to find Prince Anatole Kuragin there, since he considered it his bounden duty to fight him. But Kuragin, whom he inquired after as soon as he reached Petersburg, was no longer there. Pierre had sent word to his brother-in-law that Prince Andre was in search of him. Anatole Kuragin had immediately secured an appointment from the Minister of War and gone to the Moldavian army. During this visit to Petersburg, Prince Andre met Kutuzov, his former general, who was always well disposed to him, and Kutuzov proposed that he should go with him to the Moldavian army, of which the old general had been appointed commander-in-chief. Prince Andre having thereupon received his appointment as one of the commander's staff, started for Turkey. Prince Andrei felt that it would not be becoming to write Kurigan and challenge him. Having no new pretext for a duel, he felt that a challenge from him would compromise the Countess Rostova, and therefore he sought for a personal interview with Kurigan when he hoped he should be able to invent some new pretext for a duel. But in Turkey also he failed of finding Kurigan, who had returned to Russia as soon as he learned of Prince Andrei's arrival. In a new country, and under new conditions, life began to seem easier to Prince Andrei. After the faithlessness of his betrothed, which had affected him all the more seriously from his very endeavor to conceal from all the grief that it had really caused him, the conditions of life in which he had found so much happiness had grown painful to him, and still more painful, the very freedom and independence which he had in times gone by prized so highly. He not only ceased to harbor those thoughts which had for the first time occurred to him as he looked at the heavens, on the fields of Austerlitz, which he so loved to develop with Pierre, and which were the consolations of his solitude at Bogocharovo, and afterwards in Switzerland and Rome, but he even feared to bring up the recollection of these thoughts, which opened up such infinite and bright horizons. He now concerned himself solely with the narrowest and most practical interests, entirely disconnected with the past, and busied himself with these, with all the greater avidity, because the things that were past were kept from his remembrance. That infinite, ever-retreating vault of the heavens, which at that former time had arched above him, had, as it were, suddenly changed into one low and finite oppression, where all was clear, but there was nothing eternal and mysterious. Of all the activities that offered themselves to his choice, the military service was the simplest and best known to him. Accepting the duties of General Inspector on Kutuzov's staff, he entered into his work so doggedly and perseveringly that Kutuzov was amazed at his zeal and punctuality. Not finding Kurigan in Turkey, he did not think it worth his while to follow him back to Russia, but still he was well aware that, 
no matter how long a time should elapse, it would be impossible for him, in spite of all the scorn which he felt for him, in spite of all the arguments which he used in his own mind to prove that he ought not to stoop to any encounter with him. He was aware, I say, that if ever he met him, he would be obliged to challenge him, just as a starving man throws himself on food. And this consciousness that the insult had not yet been avenged, that his anger had not been vented, but still lay on his heart, poisoned that artificial serenity which Prince Andre, by his apparently indefatigable and somewhat ambitious and ostentatious activity, procured for himself in Turkey. When, in 1812, the news of the war with Napoleon reached Bucharest, where for two months Kutuzov had been living, spending his days and nights with his Wallachian mistress, Prince Andrei asked his permission to be transferred to the Western Army. Kutuzov, who had already grown weary of the excesses of Bolonsky's activity, which was a constant reproach to his own indolence, willingly granted his request, and gave him a commission to Barclay de Tolly. Before joining the army, which, during the month of May, was encamped at Drissa, Prince Andrei drove to Luisia Guru, which was directly in his route, being only three verse from the Smolensk highway. During the last three years of Prince Andrei's life, there had been so many changes, he had thought so much, felt so much, seen so much, for he had traveled through both the east and the west, that he felt a sense of strangeness, of unexpected amazement, to find at Luisia Garoy exactly the same manner of life, even to the smallest details. As he entered the driveway and passed the stone gates that guarded his paternal home, it seemed as though it were an enchanted castle, where everything was fast asleep. The same sobriety, the same neatness, the same quietude reigned in the house, the same furniture, the same walls, the same sounds, the same odor, and the same timid faces, only grown a little older. The Prince Maria was the same timid, plain body, only grown into an old maid, and living out the best years of her life in fear and eternal moral sufferings, without profit and without happiness. Boreen was the same coquettish, self-satisfied person, cheerfully getting profit out of every moment of her life, and consoling herself with the most exuberant hopes. Only it seemed to Prince Andre that she showed an increase of assurance. The tutor, the Salas, whom Prince Andre had brought from Switzerland, wore an overcoat of Russian cut. His unmanageable tongue involved itself in Russian speech with the servants, but otherwise he was the same pious and pedantical tutor of somewhat limited intelligence. The only physical change in the old prince was a gap left by the loss of a tooth from one corner of his mouth. Morally, he was just the same as before, only with an accentuation of his ugly temper and his distrust in the genuineness of everything that was done in the world. Nikolushka, with his rosy cheeks and dark curly hair, had been the one person to grow and change, and, unconsciously, gay and merry, he lifted the upper lip of his pretty little mouth, just as the lamented princess, his mother, had done. He, alone, refused to obey the laws of immutability in this enchanted sleeping castle. But, though externally everything remained as it had always been, the internal relations of all these people had altered since Prince Andre had seen them. The members of the household were divided into two alien and hostile camps, which made common cause now simply because he was there, for his sake changing the ordinary course of their lives. To the one party belonged the old prince, Burin, and the architect, to the other the princess Maria, de Salles, Nikolushka, and all the women of the establishment. During his brief stay at Luisia Guroy, all the family dined together, but it was awkward for them all, and Prince Andre felt that he was a guest for whose sake an exception was made, and that his presence was a constraint upon them. At dinner the first day, Prince Andre, having this consciousness, was involuntarily taciturn, and the old prince, remarking the unnaturalness of his behavior, also relapsed into a moody silence, and immediately after dinner retired to his room. When, later, Prince Andre joined him there, and, with the desire of entertaining him, began to tell him about the young Count Kamiensky's campaign, the old prince unexpectedly broke out into a tirade against the Princess Maria, blaming her for her superstition and her dislike of Mademoiselle Burin, who, according to him, was the only person truly devoted to him. 
The old prince laid the cause of his feeble health entirely to the Princess Maria, insisting that she all the time annoyed and exasperated him, and that, by her injudicious coddling and foolish talk, she was spoiling the little Prince Nikolai. The old prince was perfectly well aware that it was he who was tormenting his daughter, and that her life was rendered exceedingly trying, but he was also aware that he could not help tormenting her, and that she deserved it. Why does not Prince Andre, who sees how things are, say anything to me about his sister? wondered the old prince. He thinks, I suppose, that I am a wicked monster, or an old idiot, who has unreasonably estranged himself from his daughter, and taken a Frenchwoman in her place. He does not understand, and so I must explain to him, and he must listen to me, thought the old prince, and he began to expound the reasons that made it impossible to endure his daughter's absurd character. Since you ask my opinion, said Prince Andre, not looking at his father, for he was condemning him for the first time in his life. But I did not wish to talk about it. Since you ask me, however, I will tell you frankly my opinion. In regard to this matter, if there is any misunderstanding and discord between you and Masha, I could never blame her for it, for I know how she loves you and reveres you. And if you ask me further, pursued Prince Andre, giving way to his irritation, because he had become of late exceedingly prone to fits of irritation, then I must have one thing to say. If there is any such misunderstanding, the cause of it is that vulgar woman who is unworthy to be my sister's companion. The old man at first gazed at his son with staring eyes, and by his forced smile uncovered the new gap caused by the loss of the tooth, to which Prince Andre could not accustom himself. What companion, my dear? Ha! Have you already been talking that over? Ha! But Yushka, I do not wish to judge you, said Prince Andre, in a sharp and choleric voice, but you have driven me to it, and I have to say, and always shall say, that the Princess Maria is not to blame, but they are to blame, the little Frenchwoman is to blame. Ha! You condemn me! You condemn me! cried the old man, in a subdued voice, and with what seemed confusion to Prince Andre. But then suddenly he sprang up and screamed, Away! Away with you! Don't dare to come here again! Prince Andre intended to take his departure immediately, but the Princess Maria begged him to stay another day. He did not meet his father that day. The old prince kept in his room and admitted no one except Mademoiselle Burine and Tikhon. But he inquired several times whether his son had yet gone. On the following day, just before dinner, Prince Andre went to his little son's apartment. The blooming lad, with his curly hair, just like his mother's, sat on his knee. Prince Andre began to tell him the story of Bluebeard, but, right in the midst of it, he lost the thread and fell into a brown study. He did not give a thought to this pretty little lad, his son, while he held him on his knee, but he was thinking about himself. With a sense of horror, he sought and failed to find any remorse in the fact that he had exasperated his father, and no regret that he was about to leave him, after the first quarrel that they had ever had in their lives. More serious than all else was his discovery that he did not feel the affection for his son, which he hoped to arouse, as of old, by caressing the lad and taking him on his knee. "'Well, go on, Papa,' said the boy. Prince Andre, without responding, set him down from his knees and left the room. The moment Prince Andre suspended his daily occupations, and especially the moment he encountered the former conditions of his life, in which he had been engaged in the old, happy days, the anguish of life took possession of him with fresh force, and he made all haste to leave the scene of these recollections and find occupation as soon as possible. "'Are you really going, Andre?' asked his sister. "'Thank God I can go,' replied Andre. "'I am very sorry that you cannot also.' "'What makes you say so?' exclaimed his sister. "'Why do you say so, now that you are going to this terrible war? "'And he is so old. "'Mademoiselle Burine told me that he had asked after you.' "'As soon as she recalled this subject, her lips trembled, "'and the tears rained down her cheeks. "'Prince Andre turned away and began to pace up and down the room. "'Oh, my God! My God!' he cried. "'And how do you conceive that any one—' that such a contemptible creature can bring unhappiness to others, he exclaimed, 
with such an outburst of anger that it frightened the Princess Maria. She understood that, in speaking of such contemptible creatures, he had reference not alone to Mademoiselle Burine, who had caused him misery, but also to that man who had destroyed his happiness. Andre, one thing I want to ask you. I beg of you, she said, lightly touching his elbow and gazing at him with her eyes shining through her tears. I understand you. Princess Maria dropped her eyes. Do not think that sorrow is caused by men. Men are his instruments. She gazed somewhat above her brother's head, with that confident look that people have who are accustomed to look at the place where they know a portrait hangs. Sorrow is sent by him, and comes not from men. Men are his instruments. They are not accountable. If it seems to you that any one is culpable toward you, forget it and forgive. We have no right to punish, and you will find happiness in forgiving. If I were a woman, I would, Marie. Forgiveness is a woman's virtue, but a man has no right and no power to forgive and forget, said he, and, although he was not at that instant thinking of Kurrigan, all his unsatisfied vengeance suddenly surged up in his heart. If the Princess Maria at this late date urges me to forgive, it is proof positive that I ought long ago to have punished, he said to himself, and not stopping to argue with his sister, he began to dream of that joyful moment of revenge when he should meet Kurrigan, who, as he knew, had gone to the army. The Princess Maria urged her brother to delay his journey yet another day, assuring him how unhappy her father would be if Andre went off without a reconciliation with him. But Prince Andre replied that in all probability he should soon return from the army, that he would certainly write to his father, and that now the longer he stayed the more bitter this quarrel would become. Adieu, Andre. Remember that sorrows come from God, and that men are never accountable for them. Those were the last words that his sister said as they bade each other farewell. Such is our fate, said Prince Andre to himself, as he turned out of the avenue of the Luisogorsky mansion. She, poor innocent creature, is left to be devoured by this crazy old man. The old man is conscious that he is doing wrong, but he cannot change his nature. My little lad is growing up and enjoying life, though he will become like all the rest of us, deceivers and deceived. I am going to the army, for what purpose I myself do not know, and I am anxious to meet a man whom I despise, so as to give him a chance to kill me and exult over me. In days gone by, the same conditions of life had existed, but then there was a single purpose ramifying through them and connecting them, but now everything was in confusion. Isolated, illogical thoughts, devoid of connection, arose one after another in Prince Andre's mind. End of chapter 8Part 1, Chapter 9 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 9 Prince Andre reached the army headquarters toward the 1st of July. The troops of the 1st Division, commanded by the Sovereign in person, were entrenched in a fortified camp on the Drissa. The troops of the 2nd Division were in retreat, though they were endeavoring to join the 1st, from which, as the report went, they had been cut off by a strong force of the French. All were dissatisfied with the general conduct of military affairs in the Russian army, but no one ever dreamed of any of the Russian provinces being invaded, and no one had supposed that the war would be carried beyond the western government of Poland. Prince Andrei found Barclay de Tolly on the bank of the Drissa. As there was no large town or village within easy reach of the camp, all this enormous throng of generals and courtiers who were present with the army were scattered in the best houses of the little villages for a distance of ten versts from the camp on both sides of the river. Barclay de Tolly was stationed about four versts from the sovereign. He gave Bolkonsky a dry and chilling welcome, and, speaking in his strong German accent, told him that he should have to send in his name to the sovereign for any definite employment, but proposed that for the time being he should remain on his staff. Anatole Kurrigan, whom Prince Andre hoped to find at the army, was no longer there. He had gone to Petersburg, and this news was agreeable to Bolkonsky. He was absorbed in the interest of being at the very center of a mighty war just beginning, and he was glad to be, for a short time, freed from the provocation which the thought of Kurrigan produced in him. 
During the first four days, as no special duties were required of him, Prince Andre made the circuit of the whole fortified camp, and by the aid of his natural intelligence and by making inquiries of men who were well informed, he managed to acquire a very definite comprehension of the position. But the question whether the camp were advantageous or not remained undecided in his mind. He had already come to the conclusion, founded on his own military experience, that even those plans laid with the profoundest deliberation are of little consequence in battle. How plainly he had seen this on the field of Austerlitz, that everything depends on what was done to meet the unexpected and impossible to be foreseen tactics of the enemy, that all depended on how and by whom the affair was conducted. Therefore, in order to settle this last question in his own mind, Prince Andre, taking advantage of his position and his acquaintances, tried to penetrate the character of the administration of the armies, and of the persons and parties that took part in it, and he drew up for his own benefit the following digest of the position of affairs. While the sovereign was still at Vilno, the troops had been divided into three armies. The first was placed under command of Barclay de Tolly, the second under the command of Bagration, the third under the command of Tormasov. The emperor was present with the first division, but not in his quality of commander-in-chief. In the orders of the day, it was simply announced that the sovereign would not take command, but would simply be present with the army. Moreover, the sovereign had no personal staff, as would have been the case had he been commander-in-chief, but only a staff appropriate to the imperial headquarters. Attached to him were the chief of the imperial staff, the general quartermaster, Prince Volkonsky, generals, fugal adjutants, diplomatic shinovniks, and a great throng of foreigners, but these did not form a military staff. Besides these, there were attached to his person, but without special functions, Arakcheyev, the ex-minister of war, Count Benixen, with rank of senior general, the Grand Duke, the Cesarevich Konstantin Pavlovich, Count Rumiantsev, the Chancellor Stein, who had been minister in Prussia, Armfelt, a Swedish general, Fool, the principal organizer of the plan of the campaign, Palucci, general adjutant and a Sardinian refugee, Woltzogen, and many others. Although these individuals were present without any special military function, still by their peculiar position, they wielded a powerful influence and oftentimes the chief of the corps, and even the commander-in-chief, did not know in what capacity Benixen, or the general duke, or Arakcheyev, or Prince Volkonsky, asked questions or proffered advice, and could not tell whether such and such an order, couched in the form of a piece of advice, emanated from the speaker or the sovereign, and whether it was incumbent upon him or not incumbent upon him to carry it out. But these were merely a stage accessory. The essential idea why the emperor was present, and all these men were present, was perfectly palpable to all from the point of view of courtiers, and, in the presence of the sovereign, all were courtiers. This idea was as follows. The monarch did not assume the title of commander-in-chief, but he exercised control over all the troops. The men who surrounded him were his aides. Arakcheyev was the faithful guardian of law and order, and the sovereign's bodyguard. Benixen was a landowner in the Vilno government, who, as it were, did les honneurs of the regent, and, in reality, was an excellent general, useful in council, and ready, in case he were needed, to take Barclay's place. The Grand Duke was there, because it was a pleasure for him to be. Ex-Minister Stein was there, because he was needed to give advice, and because the Emperor Alexander had a very high opinion of his personal qualities. Armfelt was Napoleon's bitter enemy, and a general possessed of great confidence in his own ability, which always had an influence upon Alexander. Palucci was there because he was bold and resolute in speech. The general adjutants were there because they were always attendant on the sovereign's movements. And, last and not least, Fool was there because he had conceived a plan for the campaign against Napoleon and had induced Alexander to place his confidence in the expedience of this plan, thereby directing the entire action of the war. Fool was attended by Volzogen, a keen, self-conceited cabinet theorist, who scorned all things and had the skill to dress Fool's schemes in a more pleasing form than Fool himself could. In addition to these individuals already mentioned, Russians and foreigners, especially foreigners, 
who each day proposed new and unexpected plans with that boldness characteristic of men engaged in activities in a land not their own. There were a throng of subordinates who were present with the army because their principals were there. Amid all the plans and voices in this tremendous, restless, brilliant, and haughty world, Prince Andre distinguished the following sharply outlined subdivisions of tendencies and parties. The first party consisted of Fool and his followers, military theorists, who believed that there was such a thing as a science of war, and that this science had its immutable laws, the laws for oblique movements, for outflanking, and so on. Fool and his followers insisted on retreating into the interior of the country according to definite principles prescribed by the so-styled science of war, and in every departure from this theory they saw nothing but barbarism, ignorance, or evil intentions. To this party belonged the German princes, and Volzogen, Vinzengeroda, and others, notably the Germans. The second party was diametrically opposed to the first, and, as always happens, they went to quite opposite extremes. The men of this party were those who insisted on making Vilno the base of a diversion into Poland, and demanded to be freed from all preconceived plans. Not only were the leaders of this party the representatives of the boldest activity, but at the same time they were also the representatives of nationalism, in consequence of which they showed all the more urgency in maintaining their side of the dispute. Such were the Russians Bagration, Yermolov, who was just beginning to come into prominence, and many others. It was at this time that Yermolov's famous jest was quoted extensively. It was said that he asked the emperor to grant him the favor of promoting him to be a German. The men of this party recalled Suvorov, and declared that there was no need of making plans or marking the map up with pins, but to fight, to beat the foe, not let him enter Russia, and not let the army lose heart. The third party, in which the sovereign placed the greatest confidence, consisted of those courtiers who tried to find a happy mean between the two previous tendencies. These men, for the most part civilians, and Rakcheyev was in their number, thought and talked as men usually talk who have no convictions and do not wish to show their lack of them. They declared that unquestionably the war, especially with such a genius as Bonaparte, for they now called him Bonaparte again, demanded the profoundest consideration and a thorough knowledge of the science and, in this respect, Fool was endowed with genius. But at the same time it was impossible not to acknowledge that theorists were apt to be one-sided, and, therefore, it was impossible to have perfect confidence in them. It was necessary to heed also what Fool's opposers had to say, and also what was said by men who had practical experience in military affairs, and then to balance the two. The men of this party insisted on retaining the camp along the Drissa, according to Fool's plan, but in changing the movements of the other divisions. The fourth decided tendency was the one of which the ostensible representative was the Grand Duke, the Cesarevich, Constantine, heir apparent to the throne, who could not forget his disappointment at the Battle of Austerlitz when he rode out at the head of his guards, dressed in cask and jacket as for a parade, expecting to drive the French gallantly before him, and, unexpectedly finding himself within range of the enemy's guns, was by main force involved in the general confusion. The men of this party showed in their opinions both sincerity and lack of sincerity. They were afraid of Napoleon, they saw that he was strong while they were weak, and they had no hesitation in saying so. They said, nothing but misfortune, ignominy and defeat will come out of all this. Here we have abandoned Vilno, we have abandoned Vitebsk. We shall abandon the Drissa in like manner. The only thing left for us to do in all reason is to conclude peace, and as speedily as possible, before we are driven out of Petersburg. This opinion, widely current in the upper spheres of the army, found acceptance also in Petersburg, and was supported by the Chancellor Rumyatsev, who for other reasons of state was also anxious for peace. A fifth party was formed by those who were partisans of Barclay de Tolly, not as a man, but simply because he was minister of war and commander-in-chief. These said, whatever he is, and that was the way they always began, he is an honest, capable man, and he has no superior. Give him actual power because the war can never come to any successful issue without someone in sole control, and then he will show what he can do, just as he proved it in Finland." We owe it to this Barclay, 
and to him alone, that our forces are well organized and powerful, and made the retreat to the Drissa without suffering any loss. If now Barclay is replaced by Benningson, all will go to rack and ruin, because Benningson made an exhibition of his incapacity in 1807, said the men of this party. A sixth party, the Benningsonists, claimed the contrary, that there was no one more capable and experienced than Benningson, and, however far they go out of his way, they'll have to return to him. Let them make their mistakes now. And the men of this party argued that our whole retreat to the Drissa was a disgraceful defeat and an uninterrupted series of blunders. The more blunders they make now, the better, or at least the sooner they will discover that things cannot go on in this way, said they. Such a man as Barclay is not needed, but a man like Benningson, who showed what he was in 1807. Napoleon himself has done him justice, and he is a man whose authority all would gladly recognize, and such a man is Benningson and no one else. The seventh party consisted of individuals such as are always found especially around young monarchs, and Alexander the Emperor had a remarkable number of such, namely generals and fugal adjutants, who were passionately devoted to their sovereign, not in his quality as emperor, but worshipped him as a man, heartily and disinterestedly, just as Rostov had worshipped him in 1805, and saw in him not only all virtues but all human qualities. These individuals, although they praised their sovereign's modesty in declining to assume the duties of commander-in-chief, still criticized this excess of modesty, and had only one desire which they insisted upon, that their adored monarch, overcoming his excessive lack of confidence in himself, should openly announce that he would take his place at the head of his armies, gather about him the appropriate staff of a commander-in-chief, and, while consulting in cases of necessity with theorists and practical men of experience, himself lead his troops, who by this mere fact would be roused to the highest pitch of enthusiasm. The eighth, and by all odds, the largest group of individuals, which in comparison with the others, all put together, would rank as ninety-nine to one, consisted of men who desired neither peace nor war, nor offensive operations, nor a defensive camp on the Drissa, or anywhere else, nor Barclay, nor the Sovereign, nor Fool, nor Benningson, but simply wished one and the same essential thing, the utmost possible advantages and enjoyments for themselves. In these troubled waters of intertangled and complicated intrigues, such as abounded at the Sovereign's headquarters, it became possible to succeed in many things which would have been infeasible at any other time. One whose sole desire was not to lose his advantageous position was today on fool's side, tomorrow allied with his opponent, on the day following, for the sake merely of shirking responsibility and pleasing the sovereign, would declare that he had no opinion in regard to some well-known matter. A second, anxious to curry favor, would attract the sovereign's attention by boisterously advocating at the top of his voice something which the sovereign had merely hinted at the day before, by arguing and yelling at the council meeting, pounding himself in the chest, and challenging to a duel any one who took the other side, and thereby show how ready he was to be a martyr for the public weal. A third would simply demand between two meetings of the council, and while his enemies were out of sight, a definitive subvention in return for his faithful service of the state, knowing very well that they would never be able to refuse him. A fourth would forever, by the merest chance, let the sovereign see how overwhelmed with work he was. A fifth, in order to attain his long-cherished ambition of being invited to dine at the sovereign's table, would stubbornly argue the right or wrong of some newly conceived opinion and bring up for this purpose more or less powerful and well-founded arguments. All the men of this party were hungry for rubles, honorary crosses, promotions, and in their pursuit of these things they watched the direction of the weathercock of the sovereign's favor, and just as soon as it was seen that the weathercock pointed in any one direction, all this population of military drones would begin to blow in the same direction, so that it was sometimes all the harder for the sovereign to change about to the other side. In this uncertainty of position, in presence of the real danger that was threatening and which impressed upon everything a peculiarly disquieting character, amid this vortex of intrigues, selfish ambitions, collusions, diverse opinions and feelings, with all the variety of nationalities represented by all these men, this eighth and by far the largest party of men, occupied with private interests, gave great complication and confusion to affairs in general. 
Whatever question came up, instantly the swarm of drones, before they had finished their buzzing over the previous theme, would fly off to the new one and deafen everyone, and entirely drown out the genuine voices who had something of worth to say. Just about the time that Prince Andrei arrived at the army, still a ninth party was forming out of all these others and beginning to let its voice be heard. This was the party of veteran statesmen, men of sound wisdom and experience, who sharing in none of all these contradictory opinions were able to look impartially upon all that was going on at headquarters and to devise means for escaping from this vagueness, indecision, confusion, and weakness. The men of this party said and thought that nothing but mischief resulted preeminently from the presence of the sovereign with the military court at the front, introducing into the army that indeterminate, conditional, and fluctuating irregularity of relations which, however useful at court, were ruinous to the troops, that it was the monarch's business to govern and not to direct the army, and that the only cure for all these troubles was for the sovereign and his court to take their departure, that the mere fact of the emperor being with the army paralyzed the movements of 50,000 men who were required to protect him from personal peril, that the most incompetent general-in-chief, if he were independent, would be better than the best, hampered by the sovereign's presence. While Prince Andrei was at Drissa, without stated position, Shishkov, the imperial secretary, who was one of the chief members of this faction, wrote the sovereign a letter which Balashov and Arakcheyev agreed to sign. Taking advantage of the permission accorded him by the sovereign to make suggestions concerning the general course of events, he respectfully, and under the pretext that it was necessary for the sovereign to stir the people of the capital to fresh enthusiasm for the war, in this letter proposed that he should leave the army. The fanning of the enthusiasm of the people by the sovereign and his summons to defend the fatherland, the very thing which led to the ultimate triumph of Russia, and to which so largely his personal presence in Moscow contributed, was therefore offered to the emperor and accepted by him as a pretext for quitting the army. End of chapter 9part 1 chapter 10 of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this librivox recording is in the public domain read by marianne chapter 10 this letter had not as yet been placed in the sovereign's hands when barclay at dinner informed bolkonsky that his majesty would be pleased to have a personal interview with him in order to make some inquiries concerning turkey and that he prince andrei was to present himself at Benningson's lodgings at six o'clock that evening. On that day a report had been brought to the sovereign's residence concerning a new movement on the part of Napoleon, which might prove dangerous for the army, a report which afterward proved to be false, however. And on that very same morning, Colonel Machaud, in company with the emperor, had ridden around the fortifications on the Drissa, and had proved conclusively to the sovereign that this fortified camp which had been laid out under fool's direction and had been up to that time considered a chef de war of tactical skill destined to be the ruin of napoleon that this camp was a piece of folly and a source of danger for the russian army prince andrei proceeded to the lodgings of general benixen who had established himself in a small villa on the very bank of the river neither benixen nor the sovereign was there but chernuishev the emperor's flugel adjutant received Bolkonsky, and explained that the sovereign had gone with General Benixen and the Marchese Pellucci for a second time that day on a tour of inspection of the fortified camp of the Drissa, as to the utility of which serious doubts had begun to be conceived. Chernuishev was sitting with a French novel at one of the windows of the front room. This room had at one time probably been a ballroom. There still stood in it an organ on which were piled a number of rugs, and in one corner stood the folding bed belonging to Benixen's adjutant. This adjutant was there. Apparently overcome by some merrymaking, or perhaps by work, he lay stretched out on the bed and was fast asleep. Two doors led from this hall, one directly to the former drawing-room, the other, to the right, into the library. Through the first voices were heard, conversing in German and occasionally in French. Yonder, in that former drawing-room, were gathered together at the sovereign's request, not a council of war, for the sovereign was fond of indefiniteness, but a meeting of a number of individuals whose opinions concerning the existing difficulties he was anxious of ascertaining. It was not a council of war, but a sort of committee of gentlemen convened to explain certain questions for the sovereign's personal gratification. 
To this semi-council were invited the Swedish General Armfelt, General Adjutant Volzogen, Vincent Garoda, whom Napoleon had called a fugitive French subject, Marchaud, Tall, who was also not at all a military man, Count Stein, and finally Fool himself, who, as Prince André had already heard, was La Cheville Ouvrerie, the mainspring of the whole affair. Prince André had an opportunity of getting a good look at him, as Fool arrived shortly after he did, and came into the drawing-room, where he stood for a minute or two, talking with Chernuyshev. Fool, dressed like a Russian general in a uniform that was clumsily constructed, and set on him without the slightest attempt at a graceful fit, seemed to Prince André at first glance like an old acquaintance, although he had never seen him before. He was the same type as Weirother, and Mack, and Schmidt, and many other German theorist generals, whom Prince André had seen in 1805, but he was more characteristic of the type than all the rest. Never in his life had Prince André seen a German theorist, who so completely united in himself all that was typical of those Germans. Fool was short and very thin, but big-boned, of coarse, healthy build, with a broad pelvis and prominent shoulder blades. His face was full of wrinkles, and he had deep-set eyes. His hair had been evidently brushed in some haste forward by the temples, but behind it stuck out in droll little tufts. Looking round sternly and nervously, he came into the room as though he were afraid of every one. With awkward gesture, grasping his sword, he turned to Chernuyshev and asked in German where the emperor was. It was evident that he was anxious to make the round of the room as speedily as possible, to put an end to the salutations and greetings, and to seat himself before the map, where alone he felt he was quite at home. He abruptly tossed his head in reply to Chernuyshev's answer, and smiled ironically at the report that the sovereign had gone to inspect the fortifications, which Fool himself had constructed in accordance with his theory. In a deep, gruff voice characteristic of all self-conceited Germans, he grumbled to himself, "'Stupid blockhead! Ruin the whole business! Pretty state of things will be the result!' Prince Andre did not listen to him, and was about to go, but Chernuyshev introduced him to Fool, remarking that he had just come from Turkey, where the war had been brought to a successful termination. Fool gave a fleeting glance, not so much at Prince Andre as through him, and muttered with a smile, "'That must have been a fine tactical campaign.' And, scornfully smiling, he went into the room where the voices were heard. Evidently Fool, who was always disposed to be ironical and irritable, was on this day especially stirred up, because they had dared without him to inspect his camp and criticize him. Prince André, simply by this brief interview with Fool, reinforced by his experiences at Austerlitz, had gained a sufficiently clear insight into the character of this man. Fool was one of those hopelessly, unalterably self-conceited men who would suffer martyrdom rather than yield his opinion, a genuine German, for the very reason that Germans alone are absolutely certain, in their own minds, of the solid foundation of that abstract idea, science, that is to say, the assumed knowledge of absolute truth. The Frenchman is self-conceited because he considers himself individually, both as regards mind and body, irresistibly captivating to either men or women. The Englishman is conceited through his absolute conviction that he is a citizen of the most fortunately constituted kingdom in the world, and because, as an Englishman, he knows always and in all circumstances what it is requisite for him to do, and also knows that all he does as an Englishman is correct beyond cavil. The Italian is conceited because he is excitable and easily forgets himself and others. The Russian is conceited for the precise reason that he knows nothing and wishes to know nothing, because he believes that it is impossible to know anything. But the German is conceited in a worse way than all the rest, because he imagines that he knows the truth, the science which he himself invented, but which for him is absolute truth. Evidently such a man was fool. He had his science, the theory of oblique movements, which he had deduced from the history of the wars of Frederick the Great, and everything that he saw in the warfare of more recent date seemed to him nonsense, barbarism, ignorant collisions, in which, on both sides, so many errors were committed that these wars had no right to be called wars. They did not come under his theory, and could not be judged as a subject for science. In 1806, Fool had been one of those who elaborated the plan of the campaign that culminated at Jena and Auerstadt, 
but the unfortunate issue of that campaign did not open his eyes to see the slightest fault in his theory. On the contrary, the fact that his theory had been, to a certain extent, abandoned, was in his mind the sole cause of the whole failure, and he said, in the tone of self-satisfied irony characteristic of him, Ich sagte, ja das die ganze Geschichte zum Teufel gehen werde. I predicted that the whole thing would go to the deuce. Fool was one of those theorists who are so in love with their theory that they forget the object of the theory, its relation to practice. In his fanatic devotion to his theory, he hated everything practical and could not listen to it. He even delighted in the failure of any enterprise because this failure, resulting from the abandonment of theory for practice, was proof positive to him of how correct his theory was. He spoke a few words with Prince Andre and Chernuashev about the existing war with the expression of a man who knew in advance that all was going to the dogs, and that he, for one, did not much regret the fact. The little tufts of unkept hair that stuck out on his occupant, and the hastily brushed love locks around his temples, spoke eloquently of this. He went into the adjoining room, and instantly they heard the deep-set and querulous sound of his voice. End of chapter 10